storm surge along with rain on top of that up to three to five inches across Louisiana into the Mississippi Valley. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So our temperature is very warm, and that's going to fuel that storm. San Antonio today, 100 degrees, watching a few storms across Nashville this afternoon. Tampa today, 94, partly sunny skies across Orlando. We'll continue to look at impacts coming up, guys. All right, Janessa, thank you. Uh, McDonald's is spicing up its menu with the addition of two new items. One is spicy McNuggets. Uh, the other is Chips Ahoy McFlurry. It marks the first time that it's added a new type of McNugget to the menu in the United States. They'll be available nationwide for a limited time starting September 16th. Now, fast food competitor Wendy's, they weighed in on the new spicy McNuggets on Twitter, writing, must have scraped up all of BK's leftovers and slapped the McPrice tag on it. You know, Man, that's <laughs> yeah, a dick. That is some shade there, but Wendy's has wow. some room to talk to. Wendy's spicy nuggets are no joke. No, they aren't. They aren't, them. but man, that is a low blow. Hey, it's a war. The fast food wars. Nugget there you go. Nugget war right there. <laughs> Leading the news, it's now been 166 days since police shot and killed Breonna Taylor in her own home. On Tuesday, hundreds of protesters took to the streets of Louisville, Kentucky, demanding justice. None of the officers who executed a no-knock warrant on Taylor's apartment in March has been charged. Two remain on the force, and a third has been fired. There is some good news in America's fight against coronavirus. According to data from Johns Hopkins University, coronavirus infections are falling. About 43,000 new cases are being reported daily across the country. That's down 21% from early August. The glimmer of hope comes as FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn is apologizing for comments he made about the benefits of convalescent plasma as a treatment for coronavirus. In a tweet, Hahn said, in part, I have been criticized for remarks I made Sunday night about the benefits of convalescent plasma. The criticism is entirely justified. Hahn was met with backlash from medical experts after stating that 35 lives out of every 100 people who get the treatment would survive the coronavirus. The North Dakota Health Department is urging those who attended the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally in South Dakota earlier this month to get tested and to monitor symptoms for coronavirus. More than 100 cases linked to the event have been found in eight states. More than 460,000 people and participants attended. Meanwhile, 13,000 fans will be allowed in Hard Rock Stadium in Florida for the Miami Dolphins and the Miami Hurricanes home openers this season amid the pandemic. The Dolphins announced the news in a tweet, adding that all fans will be required to wear a mask and smoking and tailgating will not be permitted. Here we are. Back to the movies. Tom Cruise sharing video there on social media of him attending a London screening of Christopher Nolan's new film, Tenet. The actor even gave his stamp of approval, telling a fan that he loved the movie. Tenet opens in more than 70 countries worldwide starting today. New York City has a new plan for its schools, public, private, and charter. Some classes will now be outside this fall, but how will that work? NBC's Kristen Dahlgren joins us now. Kristen, good morning. Good morning, Philip. Well, where I am in Vermont, they've been planning outdoor classrooms for a while. Getting kids outside is really a big part of the normal education, if you will. Uh, but it's not just rural areas that are now looking at this idea of bringing classes out a little bit more into nature. New York City actually trying to come up with its own plans. The city announced just on Monday that it would be allowing uh, schools to go outdoors for classrooms. By Tuesday morning, they had 243 schools that had already applied for this. So the response has absolutely been overwhelming. Principals have now been given until Friday, just until Friday, to try and come up with their school's plans. They're talking about having classes in parks, maybe 
blocking off streets and having the kids being able to spread out in the streets. I heard one principal talking about the possibility of talking to some restaurants that have outdoor dining spaces that they're not using during the day and maybe getting kids into those areas. So a lot of planning going on right now. Uh, all this is going on as the city is also saying that it's going to be testing every single classroom in New York City for ventilation. It's hoping to do that by next week. So a lot of moving parts, only a few weeks left until school starts, a lot of parents watching closely to see how this all evolves and whether or not their kids are going to be able to spread out outdoors and perhaps be a little bit safer from transmission, Philip. That's uncharted territory wow. for everybody, Kristen. Thank you. Yeah, and very, very complicated. It is a tight squeeze here in the city, yeah. more so with bikes, pedestrians, cars, everything out there. Too. So many things complicated. Wow. You know? yeah. In today's top stories, another night of unrest for Kenosha, Wisconsin. The governor said National Guard presence would be increased as protests escalate following the police shooting of Jacob Blake. There have been reports of shots fired overnight, but it is unclear who fired or if anyone is hurt. Blake's family gave an update on his condition. They say he is paralyzed from the waist down, though doctors aren't sure if it's permanent. The family is calling for the officers involved to be fired. Officials say cooler weather is helping firefighters in California. But as some evacuation orders are lifted, many people will not have a home to return to. At least 1,400 houses have been destroyed, and that number could grow to more than 3,000. At least seven people have died in the fires or fighting them. Now to a dream come true for Holocaust survivors. She created a new life in Connecticut, but one thing was missing until a school heard her story. Here's NBC's Katie Beck. At 88 years old, in a cap and gown, Miriam Schreiber savors a moment she's dreamed of for decades. Due to the events beyond my control, I was never able to get my high school diploma. This has been a profound regret of mine all my life. Schreiber's education disrupted by a desperate journey to survive the Holocaust. Her family living for years on the run, hiding from the Nazis, eventually sent to a slave labor camp in Siberia. And nobody would have faulted her for just giving up, but she didn't. Uh, she, of course, learned all the languages everywhere she went. Today, she's fluent in six, learning English when she immigrated to the United States to raise a family. The generations after live awed and inspired by her. Congratulations, buddy. This uh, honorary diploma uh, is, is well-deserved, and she certainly, in the school of life, has earned it. Perhaps a lesson that with perseverance and a grateful heart. It really means the world to me. Thank you so much. Our greatest moments are yet to come. Katie Beck, NBC News. Wow, perseverance and the will to survive right there and showing that right there it is never too late. Yeah, I can't imagine all the thoughts, all the memories that she had crossing her mind in that moment there. I mean, just what an incredible life lived. Uh, and six languages that she spoke. I mean, it just makes me think of all the people who we lost in the Holocaust and what their lives could have been. I mean, she's a glaring example of uh, all the achievements that can be accomplished. A testament you know? of something like yeah. that, too. So congratulations are well deserved. That's right. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Bracing for impact, Hurricane Laura grew to a Category 2 storm earlier than expected as it continues to build strength ahead of making landfall in about 20 hours. Do... Jacob, justice on this level and examine your hearts. The family of Jacob Blake speaks out after they said he was paralyzed after being shot in the back by police. Unrest and damage in Kenosha continued for a third day. First Lady Melania Trump topped off the Republicans' second night of their convention in a Rose Garden speech with a softer approach. New COVID-19 cases in the U.S. fall to the lowest level in more than two months. And a first for the 2020 Major League Baseball season. Some good news to cheer about as we kick off the last Wednesday of August. Early today starts right now. 
Glad you're with us. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. Breaking this morning, millions are under threat as Hurricane Laura churns towards the Gulf Coast as a Category 2 hurricane. It's expected to make landfall as a Category 3 storm. Officials in Houston are warning against what could be unprecedented devastation. That warning on the anniversary of two deadly hurricanes, Katrina and Harvey, that devastated Louisiana and Texas. Our Morgan Chesky is in Holly Beach, Louisiana with the latest. After Laura lashed the Caribbean, millions on the Gulf Coast digging in or getting out. It's better to prepare now instead of the last day go, oh, I'm out of time. The damage from Tropical Storm Marco, a mere warm up for what's to come. Laura now expected to hit Texas and Louisiana as a category three hurricane, prompting mandatory evacuations. If you're going to say, you know that beginning tomorrow, for sure by noon, don't doubt 911, no one's going to answer, okay? And you are on your own. Here in Port Arthur, people aren't taking any chances. With a population of more than 50,000 people, the goal is to get everyone on board these buses before Laura hits. The mission complicated by COVID-19. Those leaving town checked for fever and given a wristband. Each person scanned before boarding buses to shelters. You've seen Rita, you've seen Ike, you've seen Harvey. Mm -hmm, all of it. You're not waiting for this one. Mm -mm. No, it's time to go. Others doing whatever they can. Newlyweds Chris uh, yes, and Carol Ann Higgins yeah. hoping sandbags are enough to save their first home. Cover up the doors. All our openings, put these around there, and uh, hopefully just prepare for the flooding. With a storm surge estimated up to 13 feet high, Laura's already drawn comparisons to 2005's Hurricane Rita, which caused $12 billion in damage. The next 24 hours, telling. You need to be prepared for the possibility, not the probability, that you will be losing power. And we're here on the Louisiana coast where Laura's expected to make landfall as a category three hurricane, the exact same as Rita nearly 15 years ago. That storm so powerful, it pushed water nearly 50 miles inland. Philip. All right, Morgan, thank you. NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb joining us now. She's been tracking Hurricane Laura. Janessa, good morning. What areas are you most worried about here? You know, all of the Louisiana border to uh, East Texas really need to be on our radar, even though it might not be a direct hit on those locations. The tropical force winds, also the storm surge, still going to be a big issue. The storm system has really gained strength just in the last 24 hours. It has rapidly intensified, and now we're seeing a Cat 2 storm. This has come a little bit early, and we're not even done with that rapid intensification phase. Now, we're seeing sustained winds of 105 miles per hour. The current track from the National Hurricane Center continues to see the storm system increase to wind speeds of 120. Right now, we're looking at a potential landfall for Cameron, Louisiana, all the way into the Lake Charles area. The impacts will continue all the way into central Louisiana, where we're going to see devastating flooding and that storm surge in that area. We're going to continue to watch the track as it makes its way into the Mississippi Valley, but hurricane warnings for Lake Charles all the way into Galveston remain at this hour. Guys? All right. Still a lot of uh, intense hours to come. Thanks, Janessa, for the update. Let's turn now to breaking news in Wisconsin where police are warning people to clear the streets. Reports of shots ringing out in Kenosha. The sheriff says one person has died and two others are injured. Protests continue to escalate after the police shooting of Jacob Blake. And now we're hearing more from Blake's family. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has that update. Gabe? Francis, tensions are high in this community, and the family of Jacob Blake is now speaking out, demanding the officers involved be fired. The smoke obscured the sunrise. It was a second violent night in Kenosha, Wisconsin, after the shooting of Jacob Blake. His family says the 29-year-old spinal cord is severed and that he's paralyzed from the waist down, though doctors aren't sure it's permanent. He shot my son. Seven times, seven times. Like he didn't matter, but my son matters. Some protesters here ignored a curfew and clashed with police in riot gear. The state had deployed the National Guard, but it didn't stop the destruction. 
It's right before dawn and firefighters are here at the scene trying to put out hot spots. Much of this city block was looted and burned overnight. Blake's family is encouraging peaceful protests. Do Jacob justice on this level and examine your heart. This new video shows the shooting from a different angle, but it's still not clear exactly what was said between police and Blake or why he was walking around the front of his SUV. An officer fired at least seven shots, hitting Blake in the back while his children inside the car watched, including his son on his eighth birthday. He loves his family. You, you all took him from his family because you all stood by and let it happen. I just want my brother. Exactly three months after the death of George Floyd, Blake's shooting is the latest flashpoint over race and policing. Garcia Delgado says she ran out of her apartment with her young child, fearing for her life. It's heartbreaking. It's really heartbreaking. How, how can you destroy your city, your home? How can you do this? But for Bernadette Prince, a protester with three sons, the frustration has reached a boiling point. You get mad when we start destroying things. This is what happened when you do this, when you keep killing black people for no reason. No comment from Kenosha police and the Justice Department is now assisting state authorities with the investigation. The governor now says that there will be an increased National Guard presence here to help protect the city. Francis. All right, Gabe, thank you. It's now been 166 days since police shot and killed Breonna Taylor in her own home. On Tuesday, hundreds of protesters took to the streets of Louisville, Kentucky, demanding justice. None of the officers who executed that no-knock warrant on Taylor's apartment in March have been charged. Two remain on the force, and a third has been fired. The Republican National Convention is mounting the case for a second term for President Trump. Until Melania Trump's headlining speech, mention of the pandemic was largely sidelined. Speakers instead touting President Trump's economic accomplishments while blasting Joe Biden's record. President Trump gets things done. Our entire economy and dairy farming are once again roaring back. We simply cannot endure a Biden-induced recession. Inheriting a stagnant economy on the front end of recession, the economy was rebuilt in three years. Do you want economic health, prosperity, opportunity, and optimism? Or do you want to turn back to the dark days of stagnation, recession, and pessimism? My father does not run away from challenges, even in the face of outright hatred. Let us join our president in his vow that America will never be a socialist country. To the voiceless, shamed, censored, and canceled, my father will fight for you. And we'll turn now to NBC's Tracy Potts, who has more on what we can expect tonight. Hi, Tracy. Hey, Francis. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Tonight will feature the vice president. Mike Pence will speak from Fort McHenry in Baltimore, one more uh, location that the campaign's been criticized for using. Uh, patriotic speech uh, expected tonight. That is the theme, uh, but also a political speech on public property. Meantime, President Trump appeared twice uh, during Tuesday night's events on video. Uh, one was at the naturalization ceremony for five new American citizens. And also on video, he pardoned a Nevada felon. Here's more of that Plus, the other highlights in the speakers from last night, including First Lady Melania Trump. Join us as I grant John, I'm not sure you know this, a full pardon. You've earned the most prized, treasured, cherished, and priceless possession anywhere in the world. It's called American citizenship. As a soldier, I saw firsthand people desperate to flee to freedom. The way each of us can best ensure our freedoms is by electing leaders who don't just talk, but who deliver. As you have learned over the past five years, he's not a traditional politician. He doesn't just speak words. He demands action and he gets results. 
In addition to the First Lady, we also heard from Secretary of State Mike Pompeo last night in a recorded speech. He recorded that speech while on a state-sponsored trip to Jerusalem. And now Democrats say they want to investigate whether there were any violations with him doing that political speech while on the taxpayer's dime. Francis. All right, Tracy. Thank you. And Joe Biden's campaign is countering the RNC, turning speeches from night one into an attack on the Trump administration's pandemic response. This election is a battle for the soul of America. Across the country, healthcare workers say they're dealing with a shortage of masks, gowns, and gloves again. This president has a record of strength and success. They are dying. That's true. And you ha it is what it is. The best is yet to come. The pol political ad ending on when they say the best is yet to come, that's a threat. The Democratic nominee also called the convention an attempt to create a, quote, alternate reality to cover up for the president's failures on coronavirus. Janessa is watching a whole lot out there, and she's tracking a storm, the threat of Laura. Here she is back again. Hi, Janessa. Hey, you two. We are also watching the storm surge. That's the deadliest part of a hurricane. And we are forecasting right now 7 to 11 feet in parts of uh, western Louisiana to Galveston, Texas. Make sure you know your zone if evacuation orders come in place. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across Texas, 100 degrees for San Antonio, and that will feel this storm system. Also for Tampa, watching a little bit of severe weather this morning. Things should clear out by this afternoon. Uh, Charleston, South Carolina, 93. We'll continue to look at impacts of Laura coming up. All right. Thank you very much, Janessa. Now time for today's quick hits. The cast of The West Wing is reuniting for a special on HBO Max. The episode will be recorded at the Orpheum Theater in Los Angeles, and the special will benefit the nonpartisan When We All Vote initiative. For the first time in decades, the Girl Scouts have a new look. The Fashion Institute of Technology collaborated with the Girl Scouts for the outfits, adding functional changes to the entire collection. General Mills will sell pouches of marshmallows from Lucky Charms starting next month. No cereal, just the mellows, the company says. It'll be first available nationwide. On 0 2 to right field, Adam Angle is there! A no hitter! The 19th! New this morning, Lucas Giolito became the first player this season to toss a no hitter, leading the White Sox to a 4 0 win over the Pirates. He struck out 13 batters en route to the White Sox 19th no hitter in franchise history. Shame no one there to see it. Yep. Well, Hanato pivotal game five that played out in the NBA. A few of them here in the first game. Jamal Murray scored 42 points for the Nuggets with his nifty 360 layup, the most impressive there. <laughs> Denver slipped past Utah to fend off elimination. And in the late game, the Clippers scored early and often, scoring a playoff high 154 points to take the 3-2 series lead over the Mavericks. Three more Game 5s tip off today, starting with the Magic and the Bucks at 4 p.m. Are you ready for some football with fans in the stands? Well, just before the NFL kicks off, the Dolphins have announced 13,000 fans will be allowed in Hard Rock Stadium in Florida for the team's home opener next month. The team says all fans and stadium employees will be required to wear a mask. Other stadium changes include socially distanced seating, touchless sinks, and toilets. But sorry, smoking and tailgating still not permitted. Fans keeping their fingers crossed tight that nothing changes between now and then. Yeah. People from coming in. Mm -hmm. All right, Lionel Messi wants out. He told uh, Barcelona Tuesday that he wants to move on after nearly two decades with the team, despite having a contract until 2021. Messi reportedly wants to spend next season at Manchester City, but there are still hurdles that need to be cleared before he can make that move. Number one on the charts, I'm there vicariously. Oh, there they go. Biasly pushing negative narratives. I'm ready to. Cops want to pull me over. After its 11th week at number one on Billboard's Song of the Summer chart and gaining over 380 million streams, Spotify unveiled that this year's most streamed Song of the Summer goes to DaBaby's hit Rockstar featuring Roddy Rich. The Duchess of Sussex, Meghan Markle, is continuing her activism and using her voice to speak out about women's rights. Markle recently sat down with feminist icon Gloria Steinem for a backyard chat. 
People forget how hard women like you and so many others before you fought for us to just be where we are right now. Well, it's just, I mean, when you, if you don't vote, you don't exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. you know, it is the only place where we're all equal, the voting yeah. booth. In a preview clip shared on social media, the duo discussed representation, why each vote matters, and the importance of women voting in the upcoming election. Megan and Prince Harry's two dogs even made a cameo. The full conversation will be released later today. McDonald's is spicing up its menu with the addition of two new items. So the fast food chain will now offer a Chips Ahoy McFlurry and Spicy McNuggets. That marks the first time it's added a new type of McNugget to its menu in the United States. They will be available nationwide for a limited time starting September 16th. Not wasting any time, fast food competitor Wendy's weighed in on the new spicy McNuggets. So they did so on Twitter and they wrote, must have scraped up all of BK's leftovers and slapped them a price tag on it. Yeah, dig, 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 dig. They're getting ugly with those nugget wars. Yeah, that bar's pretty high though. With yeah. the spice level that yeah. Wendy's has, I don't know. See if McDonald's it's can bring it. It's a texture thing of the meat though. That's Something. The, the two of them. Oof. Good morning, everyone. If you're across the northern Gulf Coast, I want you to be ready this afternoon as Hurricane Laura potentially turns into a major hurricane. We'll be right back. In today's top stories, there is good news in America's fight against coronavirus. According to data from Johns Hopkins University, new coronavirus infections are falling. The data suggests about 43,000 new cases are being reported daily across the country. That's down 21 percent from early August. FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn is, has apologized for comments he made about the benefits of convalescent plasma as a treatment for coronavirus. In a tweet, Hahn said in part, I have been criticized for remarks I made Sunday night about the benefits of convalescent plasma. The criticism is entirely justified. Hahn was met with backlash from medical experts after stating 35 lives out of every 100 people who get the treatment would survive the coronavirus. The helicopter company responsible for the crash that killed Kobe Bryant and eight others is suing air traffic controllers. The company Island Express filed a cross complaint alleging that the January helicopter crash was the result of, quote, a series of erroneous acts and or omissions by two air traffic controllers. The lawsuit claims that one of the air traffic controllers declined the pilot's request for radar assistance. The company is currently facing lawsuits of its own from Bryant's family and other victims. Two retired NFL players have filed a lawsuit against the league alleging racial bias in its concussion payouts. Ex-players Kevin Henry and Najee Davenport say the doctors used two scales, one for black athletes and one for white athletes, to determine eligibility for dementia claims. Lawyers for the players say the two were denied awards based on a discriminatory testing regime. The settlement fund has paid $720 million to retired players for neurocognitive problems linked to NFL concussions. A league spokesman called this lawsuit entirely misguided. Some black female celebrities are getting candid about the discrimination black women face over their hair. I've been told it's too big. I've been asked, is it real? I've been told there is too much. I've been told it blocks people's view of the full day to watch in style. I love everything. Actresses Gabrielle Union, Kiki Palmer, Uzo Aduba, and Marseille Martin have teamed up to film that powerful PSA called I've Been Told. It's for Glamour magazine. The celebrities share anonymous stories from 13 different black women across America to highlight the far-stretching issues of microaggressions toward black hair. The full PSA will be released alongside Glamour's September cover story. It'll highlight the Crown Act, which was created in 2019 to protect against discrimination on race-based hairstyles. Let's celebrate some birthdays today. Comedian and former SNL writer John Mulaney turns 38. Chris Pine, a.k.a. Captain Kirk, is 40. Also turning 40, Macaulay Culkin. Melissa McCarthy, co-star of Bridesmaids, is 50 years old. And renowned jazz musician Branford Marcellus turns 60. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. 
It's go time for hundreds of thousands in the path of Hurricane Laura. Now a Category 2 storm, but will likely become a major Cat 3 hurricane by landfall in less than 24 hours. One person has died and two are injured as gunfire erupts during violent protests on the third night of unrest in Kenosha after Jacob Blake was shot in the back by police. And this morning, there's new video. Day two of the Republican convention focusing very much on the president's inner circle, close family, and a Rose Garden address from the first lady. The fate of Jerry Falwell Jr., the evangelical leader rocked by scandal, may walk away with millions. And is the West Wing getting ready for a reboot with the original cast? Early today starts right now. Good Wednesday morning. I'm Philip Mena. I'm Francis Rivera. We begin with breaking news. More chaos on the streets of Wisconsin. For a third night in a row, protesters defying an emergency curfew. And more fallout after the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Overnight reports of shots ringing out. The sheriff says one person has died and two others are injured. Police are investigating with the FBI. The night of unrest comes after an emotional day for the Black family. NBC's Dan Sheneman has this report on the Blake family. Another uneasy night in Kenosha after the shooting of Jacob Blake. The 29-year-old was shot seven times in the back Sunday. The incident captured on video. His family says he is paralyzed from the waist down. He shot my son. Seven times, seven times. Like he didn't matter, but my son matters. Police have said little, calling it a domestic incident that involved a shooting. An investigation is ongoing. The shooting ignited two nights of protests in Kenosha, protests that began peacefully, but grew violent and destructive. Never in a million years did I think that anything like this would ever happen in Kenosha. Never. After the sun came up, the smoke cleared. It was time to clean up, while the family of Jacob Blake pleaded for calm. If Jacob knew what was going on as far as that goes, the violence and the destruction, he would be very unpleased. A family asking for prayers, a community in need of peace. Dan Sheneman, NBC News. Also breaking millions under threat as Hurricane Laura turns towards the Gulf Coast as a Category 2 hurricane. It's expected to make landfall, though, as a Category 3 storm. Officials in Houston are warning against what could be unprecedented devastation. This comes on the anniversary of two deadly hurricanes, Katrina and Harvey, that devastated Louisiana and Texas. Our Morgan Chesky is in Holly Beach, Louisiana, with the latest. After Laura lashed the Caribbean, millions on the Gulf Coast digging in or getting out. It's better to prepare now instead of the last day go, oh, I'm out of time. The damage from Tropical Storm Marco, a mere warm up for what's to come. Laura now expected to hit Texas and Louisiana as a Category 3 hurricane, prompting mandatory evacuations. If you're going to stay, you know that beginning tomorrow, for sure, by noon, don't doubt 911, no one's going to answer. OK, and you are on your own here in Port Arthur. People aren't taking any chances with a population of more than 50,000 people. The goal is to get everyone on board these buses before Laura hits the mission complicated by COVID-19. Those leaving town checked for fever and given a wristband. Each person scanned before boarding buses to shelters. You've seen Rita, you've seen Ike, you've seen Harvey. Mm -hmm, all of it. You're not waiting for this one. Mm -mm. Now it's time to go. Others doing whatever they can. Newlyweds Chris uh, yes, and Carol Ann Higgins yeah. hoping sandbags are enough to save their first home. Cover up the doors, all our openings, put these around there, and uh, hopefully just prepare for the flooding. With a storm surge estimated up to 13 feet high, Laura's already drawn comparisons to 2005's Hurricane Rita, which caused $12 billion in damage. The next 24 hours telling you need to be prepared for the possibility, not the probability that you will be losing power. 
And we're here on the Louisiana coast where Laura's expected to make landfall as a Category 3 hurricane, the exact same as Rita nearly 15 years ago. That storm so powerful, it pushed water nearly 50 miles inland. Philip? All right, Morgan, thank you. NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb is tracking Laura for us. Janessa, good morning. Where do you expect this storm to hit? You know, the track is really starting to come into agreement. Those folks in Port Arthur, they're doing the exact right thing. We are seeing the forecast shift more out of Houston and that Galveston area, and it is headed towards Cameron Parish for a potential landfall. Overnight, though, Hurricane Laura has rapidly intensified. Now a Cat 2 with sustained winds of 105 miles per hour, and that is going to steadily increase uh, throughout the afternoon. Right now, it's about about 300 miles off the coast of Louisiana. I think when you see this forecast from the National Hurricane Center at our 5 a.m. update, that's going to change. You're going to start to see the impacts by this afternoon, then a potential landfall around 7 to that 10 p.m. hour tonight. But the impacts are going to be widespread, even though we're not going to see a direct hit for Houston or the Galveston area. Tropical force winds, the storm surge. That's the deadliest part of the storm. I'm going to talk about that coming up guys all right looking forward to hearing janessa thank you the republican national convention is mounting the case for a second term speakers touted president trump's economic accomplishments while blasting joe biden's record and the night closed on a softer tone from first lady melania trump since march our lives have changed drastically the invisible enemy covid 19 swept across our beautiful country. To those of you who want to stand up and fight the socialists poisoning our schools and burning our cities, join me in supporting President Trump. Let's rebuild America together. The Democrats want an America where your thoughts and opinions are censored when they do not align with their own. The Biden-Harris vision for America leaves no room for people of faith. NBC's Tracy Potts joins us with the latest from D.C. And Tracy, what can we expect tonight? So tonight we're going to hear from the vice president from Fort McHenry in Baltimore. So they're taking this outside of Washington, that on its own, causing some controversy because like the first lady and Mike Pompeo, uh, these Political events are happening on public property, on, on public trips. You can see here some of the speakers who are lined up for tonight. The theme for tonight is patriotism, a land of heroes. Now, President Trump popped up twice during the program on video last night, once during a naturalization ceremony for five new Americans, and also when he pardoned a Nevada felon who turned his life around and is now helping other felons re-enter uh, society. Society. President Trump saying that he deserves to be pardoned. Join us as I grant John, I'm not sure you know this, a full pardon. You've earned the most prized, treasured, cherished, and priceless possession anywhere in the world. It's called American citizenship. As a soldier, I saw firsthand people desperate to flee to freedom the way each of us can best ensure our freedoms is by electing leaders who don't just talk, but who deliver. As you have learned over the past five years, he's not a traditional politician. He doesn't just speak words. He demands action and he gets results. First Lady Melania Trump in the spotlight last night. Uh, now, you also saw that speech from Secretary of State Mike Pompeo that was recorded while he was in Jerusalem. This was on an official government trip, and now Democrats want to investigate whether there were any violations connected with that. All right, Tracy, thank you. Lead up to night two tonight. Thanks. Joe Biden's campaign is countering the RNC, turning speeches from night one into an attack on the Trump administration's pandemic response. This election is a battle for the soul of America. Across the country, healthcare workers say they're dealing with a shortage of masks, gowns, and gloves again. This president has a record of strength and success. They, they are dying. That's true. And you ha it is what it is. The best is yet to come. The political ad ending on when they say the best is yet to come, that's a threat. 
The Democratic nominee also called the convention an attempt to create a, quote, alternate reality to cover up for the president's failures on coronavirus. Another roadblock in Kanye West's quest to get on the ballot in the race for 2020. The rapper qualified to appear as an independent candidate in Tennessee and Minnesota, but he missed out in Missouri and Wyoming. He failed to acquire enough signatures to make the ballot in the two states. All right, NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb is back with us now. She's been looking at Laura. Janessa. Yeah, good morning, you two. The deadliest part of a hurricane storm surge, and that is going to be the greatest impact with Hurricane Laura, along with the high tide coming in behind that. Right now, forecasting 7 to 11 inches, and this is across the coastal areas of Louisiana all the way into East Texas. On top of that, we're talking about the flooding rain, where we can see isolated areas up to 5 inches. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So our temperatures across Texas this afternoon, 100 degrees, along with humidity very high across those Gulf Coast communities. A few storms for Charlotte this afternoon, clearing out for Raleigh, 93. We'll continue to look at impacts coming up, guys. All right, Janessa, thank you. Tom Cruise, he's been hitting the theaters. Here we are. Back to the movies. Got that Mission Impossible mask on. Looks kind of cool on him. The actor shared a video on social media of him attending a London screening of Christopher Nolan's new film, Tenet. He gave his stamp of approval, told the fan that he loved the movie. Tenet opens in more than 70 countries worldwide starting today. With that mask, he can get away incognito. Right. Not in the cab with those uh, fans out there, the girls on the bike. They That's positive. It. Leading the news after a contentious resignation, resignation, Jerry Falwell Jr.'s liberty may have come up with a lump sum. The Wall Street Journal reports that he could be owed a $10.5 million payout. According to a person close to Falwell, with knowledge of his employment contract, says he may be due his $1.25 million salary in the next two years, for the next two years, plus another $8 million of his responsibilities are reduced. A spokesman for Liberty University didn't respond to a request for comment from the paper. The evangelical leader resigned from the college his father founded under a cloud of scandal. Our Stephanie Gosk has the latest details. Jerry Falwell Jr. took over Liberty University, one of the largest evangelical schools in the world, over a decade ago after his father's death. Now he tells the Wall Street Journal that a group of self-righteous people are behind the push to remove him. The university is saying it has accepted his resignation in the wake of multiple scandals. Reuters reported that the Falwells became entangled with Giancarlo Granda over eight years ago after meeting the then 20-year-old at a Miami hotel. In a statement, Falwell said his wife Becky had an affair with Granda, who later tried to extort them. Granda denies the accusation, telling Reuters that Jerry knew about the affair and would sometimes watch him and Becky together. Granda sharing phone conversations with Reuters, including this exchange from 2018. His new thing is like telling me every time he hooks up with people, like, like I don't have feelings or something. You don't make yourself. Uh, yeah. All of this less than a month after Falwell posted and then deleted this photo on Instagram. Despite his defense that it was all in good fun, Liberty University put the 58-year-old on indefinite leave. In a statement Monday night, the school said additional matters came to light that made it clear that it would not be in the best interest of the university for him to return from leave. According to the university, Falwell responded by agreeing to resign immediately, but then instructed his attorneys not to send his resignation. In an interview with the Wall Street Journal late Monday, Falwell said he would indeed step down, acknowledging that some of his posts on social media had embarrassed the school. Liberty University says its new leaders are committed to being good stewards, while also offering heartfelt prayers to the Falwell family. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News. In today's Quick Hits, the cast of The West Wing is reuniting for a special on HBO Max. The episode will be recorded at the Orpheum Theater in Los Angeles and benefits the nonpartisan When We All Vote initiative. For the first time in decades, the Girl Scouts have a new look. 
The Fashion Institute of Technology collaborated with the Scouts for the outfits, adding functional changes to the entire collection. And General Mills will sell pouches of marshmallows from Lucky Charms starting next month. No cereal, just the marshmallows. The company says it'll be the first time they'll be available nationwide. Now to more fallout from the coronavirus, with some major layoffs about to take off from American Airlines. Here with the details, CNBC's Juliana Tattlebaum. Hi Juliana, good morning. Good morning, Philip. So American Airlines warned in July, you'll remember, that it would have to lay off up to 25,000 flight attendants, pilots, and other staff members this fall due to the steep decline in travel. Well, now the final number has come in, and it is lower than the initial 25,000 that was uh, it was touted, uh, but it is still a staggering 17,500. The CEO delivered the news yesterday saying, today is the hardest message we have had to share so far, the announcement of involuntary staff staffing reductions effective October 1st. Now, the only thing that could stop the layoffs is an extension of the payroll protection program the government approved earlier this year. The airline unions are fighting to extend the protection through March 31st. Now, in some lighter news, for the first time, McDonald's is spicing up a classic fan favorite, spicy chicken McNuggets and mighty hot sauce. They're also introducing a new Chips Ahoy McFlurry, which is going to be vanilla soft serve, caramels, topping, and Chips Ahoy cookie pieces, so very delicious. Now, both are going to be available September 16th at a, at a for a limited time at participating locations. But here's the kicker. Wendy's had a pretty spicy response to the news, tweeting, it must have scraped up all of BK's leftovers and slapped a McPrice tag on it. <laughs> Back to you guys. It's making me want to try it even more, though. Yeah. On the back and forth. I love it. Yeah. I love it when these social media accounts <laughs> just start uh, yep. We're going right scrapping out. it up. All right, Juliana, thank you. Good morning, everyone. The Louisiana coast, you're going to start to see impacts from Laura this afternoon, but the brunt of this is going to come in later on tonight. Look at Cameron, Louisiana, 104 miles per hour. Please know your zone and have a plan in place. We'll be right back. As Hurricane Laura continues to intensify in the Gulf this morning, the National Guard is gearing up to mobilize in what could be some of the hardest hit areas of Louisiana. They have set up regional headquarters in Lake Charles. Lake Charles is one of eight parishes under evacuation orders ahead of the hurricane. Our Jay Gray is there and Jay, now it looks like the come before the storm. Yeah, Francis, really calm here at this point, but we know that's going to change dramatically over the next several hours. Look, Louisiana, specifically here, Lake Charles, in the crosshairs right now, the current forecast track, the time to prepare, the time to evacuate, quickly running out here. Sandbags, boards, and building tensions along the Gulf Coast. Kind of nervous for Texas and the west side of Louisiana. That's where forecasters say Hurricane Laura will cross the shoreline. Millions in the strike zone on high alert right now. Brittany Thomas and her family locking down their house before landfall. They'll ride it out. We've got water. We've got all kinds of supplies. I mean, basically where we're at, it's, it's equivalent to a bomb shelter, so I'm okay with that. But many across the region... Now it's time to go. ...are moving to higher ground in some areas by the bus load. But... As families rush to shelters, the storm is not the only concern. Here we are in the middle of um, a possible um, hurricane and trying to actually think about COVID-2. Many areas are using more and larger facilities than in the past, making room for social distancing as the storm continues to churn in the Gulf. We expect the landfall to be just after midnight, Wednesday night into Thursday, and the high tide is at the same time as the expected landfall, so that's going to add additional water on top of that storm surge, a very dangerous situation developing. With Laura growing, gaining strength, and barreling toward the coast. Yeah, look, that storm surge expected to be between 9 and 13 feet at landfall, and that wall of water will pour into lakes and creeks and bayous here causing major problems inland. Back to you guys. Yeah, major problems in a time of pandemic as well. Jay, thank you.
Well, let's bring you some good news as we end this day. I'm going to start yours. Uh, baby eastern black rhinoceros was born at the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden on Friday. And the fact that the mother and father rhinos have produced two calves so far is a big deal because the species is critically endangered. We're talking a 90% drop in just three generations here. Uh, now, unlike many animals, rhinos stay in the womb for 16 months, and that's why it makes this population growth so much slower. Uh, okay, well, great news all around. We'll take it. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. On the move, hundreds of thousands are evacuating as Hurricane Laura gains steam and readies for landfall in less than 24 hours. Violent uprisings in Kenosha overnight as the family of Jacob Blake reveals that he may be paralyzed after being shot in the back by police. Day two at the Republican convention drew out even more Trumps to speak before a national stage, including the night's keynote from the First Lady. And Jerry Falwell Jr.'s dramatic exit and multi-million dollar payout. A busy Wednesday ahead. Early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Philip Mena. I'm Francis Rivera. Breaking this morning, Hurricane Laura strengthens in the Gulf, rekindling fears for millions in Texas and Louisiana. Laura is now a Category 2 hurricane and could make landfall as a Category 3 storm on the anniversary of Hurricanes Harvey and Katrina, two of the most devastating hurricanes to hit those states. Residents are torn between hunkering down in their homes or evacuating, evacuating and riding out the storm in a safer area. Travis Guillory of KJRH has more on what coastal communities are doing. Those with homes and camps here on Vermilion Bay have been here pretty much since the weekend trying to tie things down, boarding up windows and elevating furniture and appliances to some upper levels. Many home and camp owners actually cleared out their bottom levels and opened their garages and all of the doors so that way the water from the bay can actually flow through the house, which is actually going to cause less damage in the long run. But people here on the bay are not strangers to this. It's unfortunately one of the downfalls of choosing to live in a coastal community just feet away from the water. But with some still dealing with damage from Hurricane Barry last year, like Weldon Tokino, they expect what's going to be happening this week to be a lot worse, especially with the storm surge similar to Hurricane Rita from 2005. We had water three or four feet deep here on the road and, and wave action that did a lot of damage, brought in a tremendous amount of mud in our uh, workshops and garages and et cetera. So that would be the worst thing for us is the high water with the storm hitting to the west of us. And that was Travis Guillory of KJRH reporting. Let's turn now to NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb, who's tracking Hurricane Lauren. Janessa, where do you expect the storm to hit? You know, we're watching very closely the Texas and Louisiana border, but just happening in the last 30 minutes, we have a very healthy storm system. Hurricane Laura, now a Cat 2 hurricane. It has rapidly intensified in the last 24 hours. Right now, we are seeing sustained winds of 105 miles per hour. There's still that west-northwest movement at 17 miles per hour, and that is going to really be continuous uh, through the next uh, 24 hours. The cone of uncertainty has shrunk. But now we're expecting by this afternoon, it's going to sit in a warm body of water and really gain some more steam. Potentially a, ma a major hurricane turning into a Cat 3 by tonight and landfall expected possibility right now for Cameron, Louisiana to Lake Charles. It continues its trek and that's what's really going to cause the storm surge. We hope that land uh, acts as a, a letting it shred apart, but unfortunately we're not going to see that it still gains steam as it makes its way across the Mississippi Valley and then all the way into the Northeast. So watching the storm surge, that is going to be the big thing from New Orleans to Galveston, Texas, up to 7 to 11 feet, guys. All right, Janessa, thank you so much for that update. And we have more breaking news from Wisconsin where protests have escalated again. There were reports of shots fired near a gas station. It's unclear who fired or if anyone was injured. Earlier, officers appeared to use a large cloud of tear gas to clear another street. This unrest began after police shot Jacob Blake in the back. At an emotional press conference, Blake's family gave an update on his condition. 
there is a chance that the 29-year-old may never walk again. Here's NBC's Dan Sheneman. Another uneasy night in Kenosha after the shooting of Jacob Blake. The 29-year-old was shot seven times in the back Sunday. The incident captured on video. His family says he is paralyzed from the waist down. He shot my son seven times. Seven times. Like he didn't matter. But my son matters. Police have said little, calling it a domestic incident that involved a shooting. An investigation is ongoing. The shooting ignited two nights of protests in Kenosha, protests that began peacefully but grew violent and destructive. Never in a million years did I think that anything like this would ever happen in Kenosha. Never. After the sun came up, the smoke cleared. It was time to clean up while the family of Jacob Blake pleaded for calm. If Jacob knew what was going on as far as that goes, the violence and the destruction, he would be very unpleased. A family asking for prayers, a community in need of peace. Dan Sheneman, NBC News. There is more reaction from the sports world to the shooting of Jacob Blake. The Detroit Lions called off their practice, the team choosing to take a stand instead. You might step on some toes, you might rough some feathers, but uh, in, in order for change to happen, in order for something to happen, you know, someone has to be uncomfortable. And more NBA players are questioning their time in the bubble, with some considering a potential boycott. The bombastic case for a second term takes center stage as Vice President Mike Pence headlines night three of the Republican National Convention. Other big names include outgoing White House counselor Kellyanne Conway and Congressman Dan Crenshaw. Night two closed out on a decidedly softer note from First Lady Melania Trump. Since March, our lives have changed drastically. The invisible enemy, COVID-19, swept across our beautiful country. To those of you who want to stand up and fight the socialists poisoning our schools and burning our cities, join me in supporting President Trump. Let's rebuild America together. The Democrats want America where your thoughts and opinions are censored when they do not align with their own. The Biden-Harris vision for America leaves no room for people of faith. The night also defied tradition in several ways. NBC's Alice Barr has more. America. Night two of the Republican National Convention showcasing the Trump presidency and shattering norms. In a display of presidential power, he pardoned a Nevada man who leads a prisoner reentry program. You have done incredible work. Thank you, sir. He also presided over an immigration naturalization ceremony. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in a break with tradition that prohibits mixing campaign politics and U.S. policy, endorsing President Trump while on an official trip to Jerusalem, where the president delivered on a controversial campaign promise to relocate the U.S. Embassy. The president, too, moved the U.S. Embassy to this very city of God, Jerusalem, the rightful capital of the Jewish homeland. Turning a more personal spotlight on President Trump, two of the president's children fiercely defending him. Make America great again is not a slogan for my father. It is what drives him to keep his promise of doing what is right for American citizens. And First Lady Melania Trump headlining the night with an address from the White House Rose Garden before a live audience, again breaking precedent by using the White House as a campaign backdrop. To mothers and parents everywhere, you are warriors. In my husband, you have a president who will not stop fighting for you and your families. Republicans hoping the First Lady will appeal to female voters in key battleground states. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. After a contentious resignation, Jerry Falwell Jr.'s liberty may have come up with a lump sum. The Wall Street Journal reports he could be owed a $10.5 million payout. According to a person close to Falwell with knowledge of his employment contract, he may be due his $1.25 million salary for the next two years, plus another $8 million of his responsibilities are reduced. 
A spokesman for Liberty University didn't respond to requests for comment from the paper. The evangelical leader resigned from the college his father founded under a cloud of scandal. Our Stephanie Gosk has the latest. Jerry Falwell Jr. took over Liberty University, one of the largest evangelical schools in the world, over a decade ago after his father's death. Now he tells the Wall Street Journal that a group of self-righteous people are behind the push to remove him. The university is saying it has accepted his resignation in the wake of multiple scandals. Reuters reported that the Falwells became entangled with Giancarlo Granda over eight years ago after meeting the then 20-year-old at a Miami hotel. In a statement, Falwell said his wife Becky had an affair with Granda, who later tried to extort them. Granda denies the accusation, telling Reuters that Jerry knew about the affair and would sometimes watch him and Becky together. Granda sharing phone conversations with Reuters, including this exchange from 2018. His new thing is like telling me every time he hooks up with people, like, like I don't have feelings or something. You don't make a joke. Uh, yeah. All of this less than a month after Falwell posted and then deleted this photo on Instagram. Despite his defense that it was all in good fun, Liberty University put the 58-year-old on indefinite leave. In a statement Monday night, the school said additional matters came to light that made it clear that it would not be in the best interest of the university for him to return from leave. According to the university, Falwell responded by agreeing to resign immediately, but then instructed his attorneys not to send his resignation. In an interview with the Wall Street Journal late Monday, Falwell said he would indeed step down, acknowledging that some of his posts on social media had embarrassed the school. Liberty University says its new leaders are committed to being good stewards, while also offering heartfelt prayers to the Falwell family. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News. Our NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb joins us once again with the very latest on Hurricane Laura. Yeah, good morning, you two. We knew, now have a Cat 2 hurricane and hurricane warnings that are in place for East Texas all the way into portions of central Louisiana. That means these warnings take heed to them. It's going to be taking place later this afternoon into your evening. I think also potential for tomorrow morning as well. The storm surge along with rain on top of that up to three to five inches across Louisiana into the Mississippi Valley. That's a look at the big weather of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So our temperature is very warm, and that's going to fuel that storm. San Antonio today, 100 degrees, watching a few storms across Nashville this afternoon. Tampa today, 94, partly sunny skies across Orlando. We'll continue to look at impacts coming up, guys. All right, Janessa, thank you. Uh, McDonald's is spicing up its menu with the addition of two new items. One is spicy McNuggets. Uh, the other is Chips Ahoy McFlurry. It marks the first time that it's added a new type of McNugget to the menu in the United States. They'll be available nationwide for a limited time starting September 16th. Now, fast food competitor Wendy's, they weighed in on the new spicy McNuggets on Twitter, writing, must have scraped up all of BK's leftovers and slapped the McPrice tag on it. You know, Man, that's <laughs> yeah. a dip. That is some shade there, but Wendy's has wow. some room to talk. The Wendy's spicy nuggets are no joke. No, they aren't. They aren't, them. but man, that is a low blow. Hey, it's a war. The fast food wars. There Nug you go. Nugget war right there. <laughs> Leading the news, it's now been 166 days since police shot and killed Breonna Taylor in her own home. On Tuesday, hundreds of protesters took to the streets of Louisville, Kentucky, demanding justice. None of the officers who executed a no-knock warrant on Taylor's apartment in March has been charged. Two remain on the force, and a third has been fired. There is some good news in America's fight against coronavirus. According to data from Johns Hopkins University, coronavirus infections are falling. About 43,000 new cases are being reported daily across the country. That's down 21 percent from early August. The glimmer of hope comes as FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn is apologizing for comments he made about the benefits of convalescent plasma as a treatment for coronavirus. In a tweet, Hahn said, in part, I have been criticized for remarks I made Sunday night about the benefits of convalescent plasma. The criticism is entirely justified. Hahn was met with backlash from medical experts after stating that 35 lives out of every 100 people who get the treatment would survive the coronavirus. The North Dakota Health Department is urging those who attended the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally in South Dakota earlier this month to get tested and to monitor symptoms for coronavirus. 
More than 100 cases linked to the event have been found in eight states. More than 460,000 people and participants attended. Meanwhile, 13,000 fans will be allowed in Hard Rock Stadium in Florida for the Miami Dolphins and the Miami Hurricanes home openers this season amid the pandemic. The Dolphins announced the news in a tweet, adding that all fans will be required to wear a mask and smoking and tailgating will not be permitted. Here we are. Back to the movies. Thank you. Back in the movie theater, everybody. I loved it. Tom Cruise sharing video there on social media of him attending a London screening of Christopher Nolan's new film, Tenet. The actor even gave his stamp of approval, telling a fan that he loved the movie. Tenet opens in more than 70 countries worldwide starting today. New York City has a new plan for its schools, public, private, and charter. Some classes will now be outside this fall, but how will that work? NBC's Kristen Dahlgren joins us now. Kristen, good morning. Good morning, Philip. Well, where I am in Vermont, they've been planning outdoor classrooms for a while. Getting kids outside is really a big part of the normal education, if you will. Uh, but it's not just rural areas that are now looking at this idea of bringing classes out a little bit more into nature. New York City actually trying to come up with its own plans. The city announced just on Monday that it would be allowing uh, schools to go outdoors for classrooms. By Tuesday morning, they had 243 schools that had already applied for this. So the response has absolutely been overwhelming. Principals have now been given until Friday, just until Friday, to try and come up with their school's plans. They're talking about having classes in parks, maybe blocking off streets and having the kids being able to spread out in the streets. I heard one principal talking about the possibility of talking to some restaurants that have outdoor dining spaces that they're not using during the day and maybe getting kids into those areas. So a lot of planning going on right now. Uh, all this is going on as the city is also saying that it's going to be testing every single classroom in New York City for ventilation. It's hoping to do that by next week. So a lot of moving parts, only a few weeks left until school starts, a lot of parents watching closely to see how this all evolves and whether or not their kids are going to be able to spread out outdoors and perhaps be a little bit safer from transmission, Philip. That's uncharted territory wow. for everybody, Kristen. Thank you. Yeah, and very, very complicated. It is a tight squeeze here in the city, yeah. more so with bikes, pedestrians, cars, everything out there. So too. many things complicated. Wow. You know? yeah. In today's top stories, another night of unrest for Kenosha, Wisconsin. The governor said National Guard presence would be increased as protests escalate following the police shooting of Jacob Blake. There have been reports of shots fired overnight, but it is unclear who fired or if anyone is hurt. Blake's family gave an update on his condition. They say he is paralyzed from the waist down, though doctors aren't sure if it's permanent. The family is calling for the officers involved to be fired. Officials say cooler weather is helping firefighters in California. But as some evacuation orders are lifted, many people will not have a home to return to. At least 1,400 houses have been destroyed, and that number could grow to more than 3,000. At least seven people have died in the fires or fighting them. Now to a dream come true for Holocaust survivors. She created a new life in Connecticut, but one thing was missing until a school heard her story. Here's NBC's Katie Beck. At 88 years old, in a cap and gown, Miriam Schreiber savors a moment she's dreamed of for decades. Due to the events beyond my control, I was never able to get my high school diploma. This has been a profound regret of mine all my life. Schreiber's education disrupted by a desperate journey to survive the Holocaust. Her family living for years on the run, hiding from the Nazis, eventually sent to a slave labor camp in Siberia. And nobody would have faulted her for just giving up, but she didn't. Uh, she, of course, learned all the languages everywhere she went. 
Today, she's fluent in six, learning English when she immigrated to the United States to raise a family. The generations after live awed and inspired by her. Congratulations, buddy. This uh, honorary diploma uh, is, is well-deserved, and she certainly, in the school of life, has earned it. Perhaps a lesson that with perseverance and a grateful heart. It really means the world to me. Thank you so much. Our greatest moments are yet to come. Katie Beck, NBC News. Wow, perseverance and the will to survive right there and showing that right there it is never too late. Yeah, I can't imagine all the thoughts, all the memories that she had crossing her mind in that moment there. I mean, just what an incredible life lived. Uh, and six languages that she spoke. I mean, it just makes me think of all the people who we lost in the Holocaust and what their lives could have been. I mean, she's a glaring example of uh, all the achievements that can be accomplished. A testament you know? of something like yeah. that, too. So congratulations are well deserved. That's right. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Bracing for impact, Hurricane Laura grew to a Category 2 storm earlier than expected as it continues to build strength ahead of making landfall in about 20 hours. Do... Jacob, justice on this level and examine your hearts. The family of Jacob Blake speaks out after they said he was paralyzed after being shot in the back by police. Unrest and damage in Kenosha continued for a third day. First Lady Melania Trump topped off the Republicans' second night of their convention in a Rose Garden speech with a softer approach. New COVID-19 cases in the U.S. fall to the lowest level in more than two months. And a first for the 2020 Major League Baseball season. Some good news to cheer about as we kick off the last Wednesday of August. Early today starts right now. Glad you're with us. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. Breaking this morning, millions are under threat as Hurricane Laura churns towards the Gulf Coast as a Category 2 hurricane. It's expected to make landfall as a Category 3 storm. Officials in Houston are warning against what could be unprecedented devastation. That warning on the anniversary of two deadly hurricanes, Katrina and Harvey, that devastated Louisiana and Texas. Our Morgan Chesky is in Holly Beach, Louisiana with the latest. After Laura lashed the Caribbean, millions on the Gulf Coast digging in or getting out. It's better to prepare now instead of the last day go, oh, I'm out of time. The damage from Tropical Storm Marco, a mere warm up for what's to come. Laura now expected to hit Texas and Louisiana as a Category 3 hurricane, prompting mandatory evacuations. If you're going to stay, you know that beginning tomorrow for sure by noon, don't doubt 911, no one's going to answer, okay? and you are on your own. Here in Port Arthur, people aren't taking any chances. With a population of more than 50,000 people, the goal is to get everyone on board these buses before Laura hits. The mission complicated by COVID-19. Those leaving town checked for fever and given a wristband. Each person scanned before boarding buses to shelters. You've seen Rita, you've seen Ike, you've seen Harvey. Mm -hmm, all of it. You're not waiting for this one. Mm -mm. Now it's time to go. Others doing whatever they can. Newlyweds Chris uh, yes, and Carol Ann Higgins yeah. hoping sandbags are enough to save their first home. Cover up the doors, all our openings, put these around there, and uh, hopefully just prepare for the flooding. With the storm surge estimated up to 13 feet high, Laura's already drawn comparisons to 2005's Hurricane Rita, which caused $12 billion in damage. The next 24 hours, telling. You need to be prepared for the possibility, not the probability, that you will be losing power. And we're here on the Louisiana coast where Laura's expected to make landfall as a Category 3 hurricane, the exact same as Rita nearly 15 years ago. That storm so powerful, it pushed water nearly 50 miles inland. Philip. All right, Morgan, thank you. NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb joining us now. She's been tracking Hurricane Laura. Janessa, good morning. What areas are you most worried about here? 
you know, all of the Louisiana border to uh, East Texas really need to be on our radar, even though it might not be a direct hit on those locations. The tropical force winds, also the storm surge, still going to be a big issue. The storm system has really gained strength just in the last 24 hours. It has rapidly intensified, and now we're seeing a Cat 2 storm. This has come a little bit early, and we're not even done with that rapid intensification phase. Now, we're seeing sustained winds of 105 miles per hour. The current track from the National Hurricane Center continues to see the storm system increase to wind speeds of 120. Right now, we're looking at a potential landfall for Cameron, Louisiana, all the way into the Lake Charles area. The impacts will continue all the way into central Louisiana, where we're going to see devastating flooding and that storm surge in that area. We're going to continue to watch the track as it makes its way into the Mississippi Valley, but hurricane warnings for Lake Charles all the way into Galveston remain at this hour. Guys? All right. Still a lot of uh, intense hours to come. Thanks, Janessa, for the update. Let's turn now to breaking news in Wisconsin where police are warning people to clear the streets. Reports of shots swinging out in Kenosha. The sheriff says one person has died and two others are injured. Protests continue to escalate after the police shooting of Jacob Blake. And now we're hearing more from Blake's family. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has that update. Gabe? Francis, tensions are high in this community, and the family of Jacob Blake is now speaking out, demanding the officers involved be fired. The smoke obscured the sunrise. It was a second violent night in Kenosha, Wisconsin, after the shooting of Jacob Blake. His family says the 29-year-old spinal cord is severed and that he's paralyzed from the waist down, though doctors aren't sure it's permanent. He shot my son. Seven times, seven times, like he didn't matter, but my son matters. Some protesters here ignored a curfew and clashed with police in riot gear. The state had deployed the National Guard, but it didn't stop the destruction. It's right before dawn and firefighters are here at the scene trying to put out hot spots. Much of this city block was looted and burned overnight. Blake's family is encouraging peaceful protests. Do Jacob justice on this level and examine your hearts. This new video shows the shooting from a different angle, but it's still not clear exactly what was said between police and Blake or why he was walking around the front of his SUV. An officer fired at least seven shots, hitting Blake in the back, while his children inside the car watched, including his son on his eighth birthday. He loves his family. You, you all took him from his family. You all stood by and let it happen. I just want my brother... Exactly three months after the death of George Floyd, Blake's shooting is the latest flashpoint over race and policing. Garcia Delgado says she ran out of her apartment with her young child, fearing for her life. It's heartbreaking. It's really heartbreaking. How, how can you destroy your city, your home? How can you do this? But for Bernadette Prince, a protester with three sons, the frustration has reached a boiling point. You get mad when we start destroying things. This is what happened when you do this, when you keep killing black people for no reason. No comment from Kenosha police and the Justice Department is now assisting state authorities with the investigation. The governor now says that there will be an increased National Guard presence here to help protect the city. Francis. All right, Gabe, thank you. It's now been 166 days since police shot and killed Breonna Taylor in her own home. On Tuesday, hundreds of protesters took to the streets of Louisville, Kentucky, demanding justice. None of the officers who executed that no-knock warrant on Taylor's apartment in March have been charged. Two remain on the force, and a third has been fired. The Republican National Convention is mounting the case for a second term for President Trump. Until Melania Trump's headlining speech, mention of the pandemic was largely sidelined. Speakers instead touting President Trump's economic accomplishments while blasting Joe Biden's record. President Trump gets things done. Our entire economy 
and dairy farming are once again roaring back. We simply cannot endure a Biden-induced recession. Inheriting a stagnant economy on the front end of recession, the economy was rebuilt in three years. Do you want economic health, prosperity, opportunity, and optimism? Or do you want to turn back to the dark days of stagnation, recession, and pessimism? My father does not run away from challenges, even in the face of outright hatred. Let us join our president in his vow that America will never be a socialist country. To the voiceless, shamed, censored, and canceled, my father will fight for you. And we turn now to NBC's Tracy Potts, who has more on what we can expect tonight. Hi, Tracy. Hey, Francis. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Tonight will feature the vice president. Mike Pence will speak from Fort McHenry in Baltimore, one more uh, location that the campaign's been criticized for using uh, patriotic speech uh, expected tonight. That is the theme, uh, but also a political speech on public property. Meantime, President Trump appeared twice uh, during Tuesday night's events on video. Uh, one was at the naturalization ceremony for five new American citizens. And also on video, he pardoned a Nevada felon. Here's more of that Plus, the other highlights in the speakers from last night, including First Lady Melania Trump. Join us as I grant John, I'm not sure you know this, a full pardon. You've earned the most prized, treasured, cherished, and priceless possession anywhere in the world. It's called American citizenship. As a soldier, I saw firsthand people desperate to flee to freedom. The way each of us can best ensure our freedoms is by electing leaders who don't just talk, but who deliver. As you have learned over the past five years, he's not a traditional politician. He doesn't just speak words. He demands action and he gets results. In addition to the First Lady, we also heard from Secretary of State Mike Pompeo last night in a recorded speech. He recorded that speech while on a state-sponsored trip to Jerusalem. And now Democrats say they want to investigate whether there were any violations with him doing that political speech while on the taxpayer's dime. Francis. All right, Tracy. Thank you. And Joe Biden's campaign is countering the RNC, turning speeches from night one into an attack on the Trump administration's pandemic response. This election is a battle for the soul of America. Across the country, healthcare workers say they're dealing with a shortage of masks, gowns, and gloves again. This president has a record of strength and success. They, they are dying. That's true. And you ha it is what it is. The best is yet to come. The pol political ad ending on when they say the best is yet to come, that's a threat. The Democratic nominee also called the convention an attempt to create a, quote, alternate reality to cover up for the president's failures on coronavirus. Janessa is watching a whole lot out there, and she's tracking a storm, the threat of Laura. Here she is back again. Hi, Janessa. Hey, you two. We are also watching the storm surge. That's the deadliest part of a hurricane. And we are forecasting right now 7 to 11 feet in parts of uh, western Louisiana to Galveston, Texas. Make sure you know your zone if evacuation orders come in place. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across Texas, 100 degrees for San Antonio, and that will feel this storm system. Also for Tampa, watching a little bit of severe weather this morning. Things should clear out by this afternoon. Uh, Charleston, South Carolina, 93. We'll continue to look at impacts of Laura coming up. All right. Thank you very much, Janessa. Now time for today's quick hits. The cast of The West Wing is reuniting for a special on HBO Max. The episode will be recorded at the Orpheum Theater in Los Angeles, and the special will benefit the nonpartisan When We All Vote initiative. For the first time in decades, the Girl Scouts have a new look. The Fashion Institute of Technology collaborated with the Girl Scouts for the outfits, adding functional changes to the entire collection. General Mills will sell pouches of marshmallows from Lucky Charms starting next month. No cereal, just the mellows, the company says it'll be first available nationwide. On 0-2 to right field.
field. Adam Angle is there! A no-hitter! The 19th! New this morning, Lucas Giolito became the first player this season to toss a no-hitter, leading the White Sox to a 4 to nothing win over the Pirates. He struck out 13 batters en route to the White Sox' 19th no-hitter in franchise history. Shame no one there to see it. Well, and now to a pivotal game five that played out in the NBA. A few of them here in the first game. Jamal Murray scored 42 points for the Nuggets with this nifty 360 layup. The most impressive there. Denver slipped past Utah to fend off elimination. And in the late game, the Clippers scored early and often, scoring a playoff high 154 points to take the 3-2 series lead over the Mavericks. Three more game fives tip off today, starting with the Magic and the Bucks at 4 p.m. Are you ready for some football with fans in the stands? Well, just before the NFL kicks off, the Dolphins have announced 13,000 fans will be allowed in Hard Rock Stadium in Florida for the team's home opener next month. The team says all fans and stadium employees will be required to wear a mask. Other stadium changes include socially distanced seating, touchless sinks, and toilets. But sorry, smoking and tailgating still not permitted. Fans keeping their fingers crossed tight that nothing changes between now and then. Yeah. People from coming in. Mm -hmm. All right, Lionel Messi wants out. He told uh, Barcelona Tuesday that he wants to move on after nearly two decades with the team, despite having a contract until 2021. Messi reportedly wants to spend next season at Manchester City, but there are still hurdles that need to be cleared before he can make that move. Number one on the charts, I'm never vicariously. Oh, there they go. Bias the question, negative narratives. I'm ready to. Cops want to pull me over. After its 11th week at number one on Billboard's Song of the Summer chart and gaining over 380 million streams, Spotify unveiled that this year's most streamed Song of the Summer goes to the baby's hit Rockstar featuring Roddy Rich. The Duchess of Sussex, Meghan Markle, is continuing her activism and using her voice to speak out about women's rights. Markle recently sat down with feminist icon Gloria Steinem for a backyard chat. People forget how hard women like you and so many others before you fought for us to just be where we are right now. Well, it's just, I mean, when you, if you don't vote, you don't exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. you know, it is the only place where we're all equal, the voting yeah. booth. In a preview clip shared on social media, the duo discussed representation, why each vote matters, and the importance of women voting in the upcoming election. Meghan and Prince Harry's two dogs even made a cameo. The full conversation will be released later today. McDonald's is spicing up its menu with the addition of two new items. So the fast food chain will now offer a Chips Ahoy McFlurry and Spicy McNuggets. That marks the first time it's added a new type of McNugget to its menu in the United States. They will be available nationwide for a limited time starting September 16th. Not wasting any time, fast food competitor Wendy's weighed in on the new spicy McNuggets. So they did so on Twitter and they wrote, must have scraped up all of BK's leftovers and slapped the McPrice tag on it. Yeah, dig, 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 dig. They're yeah. getting ugly with those nugget wars. Yeah, that bar's pretty high though. With yeah. the spice level that yeah. Wendy's has, I don't know, Let's see if McDonald's it's can bring it. It's a thing of the meat though. That's Something. the difference of the two of them. Oof. Good morning, everyone. If you're across the northern Gulf Coast, I want you to be ready this afternoon as Hurricane Laura potentially turns into a major hurricane. We'll be right back. In today's top stories, there is good news in America's fight against coronavirus. According to data from Johns Hopkins University, new coronavirus infections are falling. The data suggests about 43,000 new cases are being reported daily across the country. That's down 21 percent from early August. FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn is, has apologized for comments he made about the benefits of convalescent plasma as a treatment for coronavirus. In a tweet, Hahn said in part, I have been criticized for remarks I made Sunday night about the benefits of convalescent plasma. The criticism is entirely justified. Hahn was met with backlash from medical experts after stating 35 lives out of every 100 people who get the treatment would survive the coronavirus. The helicopter company responsible for the crash that killed Kobe Bryant and eight others is suing air traffic controllers. The company Island Express filed a cross complaint alleging that the January helicopter crash was the result of, quote, a series of erroneous acts and or omissions by two air traffic controllers. The lawsuit claims that one of the air traffic controllers declined the pilot's request for radar assistance. 
The company is currently facing lawsuits of its own from Bryant's family and other victims. Two retired NFL players have filed a lawsuit against the league alleging racial bias in its concussion payouts. Ex-players Kevin Henry and Najee Davenport say the doctors used two scales, one for black athletes and one for white athletes to determine eligibility for dementia claims. Lawyers for the players say the two were denied awards based on a discriminatory testing regime. The settlement fund has paid $720 million to retired players for neurocognitive problems linked to NFL concussions. A league spokesman called this lawsuit entirely misguided. Some black female celebrities are getting candid about the discrimination black women face over their hair. I've been told it's too big. I've been asked, is it real? I've been told there is too much. I've been told it blocks people's view of the full day to wash in style. I love everything. Actresses Gabrielle Union, Kiki Palmer, Uzo Aduba, and Marseille Martin have teamed up to film that powerful PSA called I've Been Told. It's for Glamour magazine. The celebrities share anonymous stories from 13 different black women across America to highlight the far-stretching issues of microaggressions toward black hair. The full PSA will be released alongside Glamour's September cover story. It'll highlight the Crown Act, which was created in 2019 to protect against discrimination on race-based hairstyles. Let's celebrate some birthdays today. Comedian and former SNL writer John Mulaney turns 38. Chris Pine, a.k.a. Captain Kirk, is 40. Also turning 40, Macaulay Culkin. Melissa McCarthy, co-star of Bridesmaids, is 50 years old. And renowned jazz musician Branford Marcellus turns 60. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. It's go time for hundreds of thousands in the path of Hurricane Laura. Now a Category 2 storm, but will likely become a major Cat 3 hurricane by landfall in less than 24 hours. One person has died and two are injured as gunfire erupts during violent protests on the third night of unrest in Kenosha after Jacob Blake was shot in the back by police. And this morning, there's new video. Day two of the Republican convention focusing very much on the president's inner circle, close family, and a Rose Garden address from the First Lady. The fate of Jerry Falwell Jr., the evangelical leader rocked by scandal, may walk away with millions. And is the West Wing getting ready for a reboot with the original cast? Early today starts right now. Good Wednesday morning. I'm Philip Mena. I'm Francis Rivera. We begin with breaking news. More chaos on the streets of Wisconsin. For a third night in a row, protesters defying an emergency curfew. Add more fallout after the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Overnight reports of shots ringing out. The sheriff says one person has died and two others are injured. Police are investigating with the FBI. The night of unrest comes after an emotional day for the Black family. NBC's Dan Sheneman has this report on the Blake family. Another uneasy night in Kenosha after the shooting of Jacob Blake. The 29-year-old was shot seven times in the back Sunday. The incident captured on video. His family says he is paralyzed from the waist down. He shot my son seven times, seven times, like he didn't matter, but my son matters. Police have said little, calling it a domestic incident that involved a shooting. An investigation is ongoing. The shooting ignited two nights of protests in Kenosha, protests that began peacefully but grew violent and destructive. Never in a million years did I think that anything like this would ever happen in Kenosha. Never. After the sun came up, the smoke cleared. It was time to clean up, while the family of Jacob Blake pleaded for calm. If Jacob knew what was going on as far as that goes, the violence and the destruction, he would be very unpleased. A family asking for prayers, a community in need of peace. Dan Sheneman, NBC News.
Also breaking millions under threat as Hurricane Laura churns towards the Gulf Coast as a Category 2 hurricane. It's expected to make landfall, though, as a Category 3 storm. Officials in Houston are warning against what could be unprecedented devastation. This comes on the anniversary of two deadly hurricanes, Katrina and Harvey, that devastated Louisiana and Texas. Our Morgan Chesky is in Holly Beach, Louisiana, with the latest. After Laura lashed the Caribbean, millions on the Gulf Coast digging in or getting out. It's better to prepare now instead of the last day go, oh, I'm out of time. The damage from Tropical Storm Marco, a mere warm up for what's to come. Laura now expected to hit Texas and Louisiana as a category three hurricane, prompting mandatory evacuations. If you're going to say you know that beginning tomorrow, for sure by noon, don't doubt 911, no one's going to answer, okay? And you are on your own. Here in Port Arthur, people aren't taking any chances. With a population of more than 50,000 people, the goal is to get everyone on board these buses before Laura hits. The mission complicated by COVID-19. Those leaving town checked for fever and given a wristband. Each person scanned before boarding buses to shelters. You've seen Rita, you've seen Ike, you've seen Harvey. Mm -hmm, all of it. You're not waiting for this one. Mm -mm. No, it's time to go. Others doing whatever they can. Newlyweds Chris uh, yes, and Carol Ann Higgins yeah. hoping sandbags are enough to save their first home. Cover up the doors, all our openings, put these around there, and uh, hopefully just prepare for the flooding. With a storm surge estimated up to 13 feet high, Laura's already drawn comparisons to 2005's Hurricane Rita, which caused $12 billion in damage. The next 24 hours, telling. You need to be prepared for the possibility, not the probability, that you will be losing power. And we're here on the Louisiana coast where Laura's expected to make landfall as a Category 3 hurricane, the exact same as Rita nearly 15 years ago. That storm so powerful, it pushed water nearly 50 miles inland. Philip? All right, Morgan, thank you. NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb is tracking Laura for us. Janessa, good morning. Where do you expect this storm to hit? You know, the track is really starting to come into agreement. Those folks in Port Arthur, they're doing the exact right thing. We are seeing the forecast shift more out of Houston and that Galveston area, and it is headed towards Cameron Parish for a potential landfall. Overnight, though, Hurricane Laura has rapidly intensified. Now a Cat 2 with sustained winds of 105 miles per hour, and that is going to steadily increase uh, throughout the afternoon. Right now, it's about about 300 miles off the coast of Louisiana. I think when you see this forecast from the National Hurricane Center and our 5 a.m. update, that's going to change. You're going to start to see the impacts by this afternoon, then a potential landfall around 7 to that 10 p.m. hour tonight. But the impacts are going to be widespread. Even though we're not going to see a direct hit for Houston or the Galveston area, tropical force winds, the storm surge. That's the deadliest part of the storm. I'm going to talk about that coming up guys all right looking forward to hearing janessa thank you the republican national convention is mounting the case for a second term speakers touted president trump's economic accomplishments while blasting joe biden's record and the night closed on a softer tone from first lady melania trump since march our lives have changed drastically the invisible enemy covid 19 swept across our beautiful country. To those of you who want to stand up and fight the socialists poisoning our schools and burning our cities, join me in supporting President Trump. Let's rebuild America together. The Democrats want an America where your thoughts and opinions are censored when they do not align with their own. The Biden-Harris vision for America leaves no room for people of faith. NBC's Tracy Potts joins us with the latest from D.C. And Tracy, what can we expect tonight? So tonight we're going to hear from the vice president from Fort McHenry in Baltimore. So they're taking this outside of Washington, that on its own, causing some controversy because like the first lady and Mike Pompeo, uh, these 
political events are happening on public property on on public trips. You can see here some of the speakers who are lined up for tonight. The theme for tonight is patriotism, a land of heroes. Now, President Trump popped up twice during the program on video last night, once during a naturalization ceremony for five new Americans, and also when he pardoned a Nevada felon who turned his life around and is now helping other felons re-enter uh, society. President Trump saying that he deserves to be pardoned. Join us as I grant John, I'm not sure you know this, a full pardon. You've earned the most prized, treasured, cherished, and priceless possession anywhere in the world. It's called American citizenship. As a soldier, I saw firsthand people desperate to flee to freedom, the way each of us can best ensure our freedoms is by electing leaders who don't just talk, but who deliver. As you have learned over the past five years, he's not a traditional politician. He doesn't just speak words. He demands action and he gets results. First Lady Melania Trump in the spotlight last night. Uh, now, you also saw that speech from Secretary of State Mike Pompeo that was recorded while he was in Jerusalem. This was on an official government trip, and now Democrats want to investigate whether there were any violations connected with that. All right, Tracy, thank you. Lead up to night two tonight. Thanks. Joe Biden's campaign is countering the RNC, turning speeches from night one into an attack on the Trump administration's pandemic response. This election is a battle for the soul of America. Across the country, healthcare workers say they're dealing with a shortage of masks, gowns, and gloves again. This president has a record of strength and success. They are dying. That's true. And you ha it is what it is. The best is yet to come. The political ad ending on when they say the best is yet to come, that's a threat. The Democratic nominee also called the convention an attempt to create a, quote, alternate reality to cover up for the president's failures on coronavirus. Another roadblock in Kanye West's quest to get on the ballot in the race for 2020. The rapper qualified to appear as an independent candidate in Tennessee and Minnesota, but he missed out in Missouri and Wyoming. He failed to acquire enough signatures to make the ballot in the two states. All right, NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb is back with us now. She's been looking at Laura. Janessa. Yeah, good morning, you two. The deadliest part of a hurricane storm surge, and that is going to be the greatest impact with Hurricane Laura, along with the high tide coming in behind that. Right now, forecasting 7 to 11 inches, and this is across the coastal areas of Louisiana all the way into East Texas. On top of that, we're talking about the flooding rain, where we can see isolated areas up to five inches. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So our temperatures across Texas this afternoon, 100 degrees, along with humidity very high across those Gulf Coast communities. A few storms for Charlotte this afternoon, clearing out for Raleigh, 93. We'll continue to look at impacts coming up, guys. All right, Janessa, thank you. Tom Cruise, he's been hitting the theaters. Here we are. Back to the movies. Loved it. Got that Mission Impossible mask on. Looks mm -hmm. kind of cool on him. The actor shared a video on social media of him attending a London screening of Christopher Nolan's new film, Tenet. He gave his stamp of approval, told the fan that he loved the movie. Tenet opens in more than 70 countries worldwide starting today. With that mask, he can get away incognito. Right. Not in the cab with those uh, fans out there, the girls on the bike. They That's positive. Him. Leading the news after a contentious resignation, resignation, Jerry Falwell Jr.'s liberty may have come up with a lump sum. The Wall Street Journal reports that he could be owed a $10.5 million payout. 
according to a person close to Falwell with knowledge of his employment contract, says he may be due his $1.25 million salary in the next two years, for the next two years, plus another $8 million of his responsibilities are reduced. A spokesman for Liberty University didn't respond to a request for comment from the paper. The evangelical leader resigned from the college his father founded under a cloud of scandal. Our Stephanie Gosk has the latest details. Jerry Falwell Jr. took over Liberty University, one of the largest evangelical schools in the world, over a decade ago after his father's death. Now he tells the Wall Street Journal that a group of self-righteous people are behind the push to remove him. The university is saying it has accepted his resignation in the wake of multiple scandals. Reuters reported that the Falwells became entangled with Giancarlo Granda over eight years ago after meeting the then 20-year-old at a Miami hotel. In a statement, Falwell said his wife Becky had an affair with Granda, who later tried to extort them. Granda denies the accusation, telling Reuters that Jerry knew about the affair and would sometimes watch him and Becky together. Granda sharing phone conversations with Reuters, including this exchange from 2018. His new thing is like telling me every time he hooks up with people, like, like I don't have feelings or something. You don't make a joke. Uh, yeah. All of this less than a month after Falwell posted and then deleted this photo on Instagram. Despite his defense that it was all in good fun, Liberty University put the 58-year-old on indefinite leave. In a statement Monday night, the school said additional matters came to light that made it clear that it would not be in the best interest of the university for him to return from leave. According to the university, Falwell responded by agreeing to resign immediately, but then instructed his attorneys not to send his resignation. In an interview with the Wall Street Journal late Monday, Falwell said he would indeed step down, acknowledging that some of his posts on social media had embarrassed the school. Liberty University says its new leaders are committed to being good stewards, while also offering heartfelt prayers to the Falwell family. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News. In today's quick hits, the cast of The West Wing is reuniting for a special on HBO Max. The episode will be recorded at the Orpheum Theater in Los Angeles and benefits the nonpartisan When We All Vote initiative. For the first time in decades, the Girl Scouts have a new look. The Fashion Institute of Technology collaborated with the Scouts for the outfits, adding functional changes to the entire collection. And General Mills will sell pouches of marshmallows from Lucky Charms starting next month. No cereal, just the marshmallows. The company says it'll be the first time they'll be available nationwide. Now to more fallout from the coronavirus, with some major layoffs about to take off from American Airlines. Here with the details, CNBC's Juliana Tattlebaum. Hi, Juliana. Good morning. Good morning, Philip. So American Airlines warned in July, you'll remember, that it would have to lay off up to 25,000 flight attendants, pilots, and other staff members this fall due to the steep decline in travel. Well, now the final number has come in, and it is lower than the initial 25,000 that was uh, it was touted, uh, but it is still a staggering 17,500. The CEO delivered the news yesterday saying, today is the hardest message we have had to share so far, the announcement of involuntary staff staffing reductions effective October 1st. Now, the only thing that could stop the layoffs is an extension of the payroll protection program the government approved earlier this year. The airline unions are fighting to extend the protection through March 31st. Now, in some lighter news, for the first time, McDonald's is spicing up a classic fan favorite, spicy chicken McNuggets and mighty hot sauce. They're also introducing a new Chips Ahoy McFlurry, which is going to be vanilla soft serve, caramels, topping, and Chips Ahoy cookie pieces. So very delicious. Now, both are going to be available September 16th at a, at a for limited time at participating locations. But here's the kicker. Wendy's had a pretty spicy response to the news, tweeting, it must have scraped up all of BK's leftovers and slapped a McPrice tag on it. <laughs> Back to you guys. It's making me want to try it even more, though. Yeah. With the back and forth. I love it. Yeah. I love it when these social media accounts just start uh, <laughs> yep. We're going right scrapping at it. it up. All right, Juliana, thank you. Good morning, everyone. The Louisiana coast, you're going to start to see impacts from Laura this afternoon, but the brunt of this is going to come in later on tonight. Look at Cameron, Louisiana, 104 miles per hour. Please know your zone and have a plan in place. We'll be right back.
As Hurricane Laura continues to intensify in the Gulf this morning, the National Guard is gearing up to mobilize in what could be some of the hardest hit areas of Louisiana. They have set up regional headquarters in Lake Charles. Lake Charles is one of eight parishes under evacuation orders ahead of the hurricane. Our Jay Gray is there, and Jay, now it looks like the come before the storm. Yeah, Francis, really calm here at this point, but we know that's going to change dramatically over the next several hours. Look, Louisiana, specifically here, Lake Charles, in the crosshairs right now, the current forecast track, the time to prepare, the time to evacuate, quickly running out here. Sandbags, boards, and building tensions along the Gulf Coast. Kind of nervous for Texas and the west side of Louisiana. That's where forecasters say Hurricane Laura will cross the shoreline. Millions in the strike zone on high alert right now. Brittany Thomas and her family locking down their house before landfall. They'll ride it out. We've got water. We've got all kinds of supplies. I mean, basically where we're at, it's, it's equivalent to a bomb shelter, so I'm okay with that. But many across the region now it's time to go. are moving to higher ground in some areas by the bus load. But... As families rush to shelters, the storm is not the only concern. Here we are in the middle of um, a possible um, hurricane and trying to actually think about COVID too. Many areas are using more and larger facilities than in the past, making room for social distancing as the storm continues to churn in the Gulf. We expect the landfall to be just after midnight, Wednesday night into Thursday, and the high tide is at the same time as the expected landfall, so that's going to add additional water on top of that storm surge, a very dangerous situation developing. With Laura growing, gaining strength, and barreling toward the coast. Yeah, look, that storm surge expected to be between 9 and 13 feet at landfall, and that wall of water will pour into lakes and creeks and bayous here causing major problems inland. Back to you guys. Yeah, major problems in a time of pandemic as well. Jay, thank you. All right, let's bring you some good news as we end this day. I'm going to start yours. Uh, baby eastern black rhinoceros was born at the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden on Friday. And the fact that the mother and father rhinos have produced two calves so far is a big deal because the species is critically endangered. We're talking a 90% drop in just three generations here. Uh, now, unlike many animals, rhinos stay in the womb for 16 months, and that's why it makes this population growth so much slower. Uh, okay, well, great news all around. We'll take it. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. On the move, hundreds of thousands are evacuating as Hurricane Laura gains steam and readies for landfall in less than 24 hours. Violent uprisings in Kenosha overnight as the family of Jacob Blake reveals that he may be paralyzed after being shot in the back by police. Day two at the Republican convention drew out even more Trumps to speak before a national stage, including the night's keynote from the First Lady. And Jerry Falwell Jr.'s dramatic exit and multi-million dollar payout. A busy Wednesday ahead early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Philip Mena. I'm Francis Rivera. Breaking this morning, Hurricane Laura strengthens in the Gulf, rekindling fears for millions in Texas and Louisiana. Laura is now a Category 2 hurricane and could make landfall as a Category 3 storm on the anniversary of Hurricanes Harvey and Katrina, two of the most devastating hurricanes to hit those states. Residents are torn between hunkering down in their homes or evacuating, evacuating and riding out the storm in a safer area. Travis Guillory of KJRH has more on what coastal communities are doing. Those with homes and camps here on Vermilion Bay have been here pretty much since the weekend trying to tie things down, boarding up windows and elevating furniture and appliances to some upper levels. Many home and camp owners actually cleared out their bottom levels and opened their garages and all of the doors so that way the water from the bay can actually flow through the house, which is actually going to cause less damage in the long run. But people here on the bay are not strangers to this. It's unfortunately one of the downfalls of choosing to live in a coastal community just feet away from the water. But with some still dealing with damage from Hurricane Barry last year, like Weldon Tequino, 
They expect what's going to be happening this week to be a lot worse, especially with the storm surge similar to Hurricane Rita from 2005. We had water three or four feet deep here on the road and, and wave action that did a lot of damage, brought in a tremendous amount of mud in our uh, workshops and garages and etc. So that would be the worst thing for us is the high water with the storm hitting to the west of us. And that was Travis Guillory of KJRH reporting. Let's turn now to NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb, who's tracking Hurricane Lauren. Janessa, where do you expect the storm to hit? You know, we're watching very closely the Texas and Louisiana border, but just happening in the last 30 minutes, we have a very healthy storm system. Hurricane Laura, now a Cat 2 hurricane. It has rapidly intensified in the last 24 hours. Right now, we are seeing sustained winds of 105 miles per hour. There's still that west-northwest movement at 17 miles per hour, and that is going to really be continuous uh, through the next uh, 24 hours. The cone of uncertainty has shrunk. But now we're expecting by this afternoon, it's going to sit in a warm body of water and really gain some more steam. Potentially a, ma a major hurricane turning into a Cat 3 by tonight and landfall expected possibility right now for Cameron, Louisiana to Lake Charles. It continues its trek and that's what's really going to cause the storm surge. We hope that land uh, acts as a, a letting it shred apart, but unfortunately we're not going to see that it still gains steam as it makes its way across the Mississippi Valley and then all the way into the Northeast. So watching the storm surge, that is going to be the big thing from New Orleans to Galveston, Texas, up to 7 to 11 feet. Guys. All right, Janessa, thank you so much for that update. And we have more breaking news from Wisconsin where protests have escalated again. There were reports of shots fired near a gas station. It's unclear who fired or if anyone was injured. Earlier, officers appeared to use a large cloud of tear gas to clear another street. This unrest began after police shot Jacob Blake in the back. At an emotional press conference, Blake's family gave an update on his condition. There is a chance that the 29-year-old may never walk again. Here's NBC's Dan Shenneman. Another uneasy night in Kenosha after the shooting of Jacob Blake. The 29-year-old was shot seven times in the back Sunday. The incident captured on video. His family says he is paralyzed from the waist down. He shot my son seven times. Seven times. Like he didn't matter. But my son matters. Police have said little, calling it a domestic incident. That involved a shooting. An investigation is ongoing. The shooting ignited two nights of protests in Kenosha, protests that began peacefully but grew violent and destructive. Never in a million years did I think that anything like this would ever happen in Kenosha. Never. After the sun came up, the smoke cleared. It was time to clean up, while the family of Jacob Blake pleaded for calm. If Jacob knew what was going on as far as that goes, the violence and the destruction, he would be very unpleased. A family asking for prayers, a community in need of peace. Dan Sheneman, NBC News. There is more reaction from the sports world to the shooting of Jacob Blake. The Detroit Lions called off their practice, the team choosing to take a stand instead. You might step on some toes, you might rough some feathers, but uh, in, in order for change to happen, in order for something to happen, you know, someone has to be uncomfortable. And more NBA players are questioning their time in the bubble, with some considering a potential boycott. The bombastic case for a second term takes center stage as Vice President Mike Pence headlines night three of the Republican National Convention. Other big names include outgoing White House counselor Kellyanne Conway and Congressman Dan Crenshaw. Night two closed out on a decidedly softer note from First Lady Melania Trump. Since March, our lives have changed drastically. The invisible enemy, COVID-19, swept across our beautiful country. To those of you who want to stand up and fight the socialists poisoning our schools and burning our cities, join me in supporting President Trump. 
Let's rebuild America together. The Democrats want an America where your thoughts and opinions are censored when they do not align with their own. The Biden-Harris vision for America leaves no room for people of faith. The night also defied tradition in several ways. NBC's Alice Barr has more. America. Night two of the Republican National Convention showcasing the Trump presidency and shattering norms. In a display of presidential power, he pardoned a Nevada man who leads a prisoner reentry program. You have done incredible work. Thank you, sir. He also presided over an immigration naturalization ceremony. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in a break with tradition that prohibits mixing campaign politics and U.S. policy, endorsing President Trump while on an official trip to Jerusalem, where the president delivered on a controversial campaign promise to relocate the U.S. Embassy. The president, too, moved the U.S. Embassy to this very city of God, Jerusalem, the rightful capital of the Jewish homeland. Turning a more personal spotlight on President Trump, two of the president's children fiercely defending him. Make America great again is not a slogan for my father. It is what drives him to keep his promise of doing what is right for American citizens. And First Lady Melania Trump headlining the night with an address from the White House Rose Garden before a live audience, again breaking precedent by using the White House as a campaign backdrop. To mothers and parents everywhere, you are warriors. In my husband, you have a president who will not stop fighting for you and your families. Republicans hoping the First Lady will appeal to female voters in key battleground states. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. After a contentious resignation, Jerry Falwell Jr.'s liberty may have come up with a lump sum. The Wall Street Journal reports he could be owed a $10.5 million payout. According to a person close to Falwell with knowledge of his employment contract, he may be due his $1.25 million salary for the next two years, plus another $8 million of his responsibilities are reduced. A spokesman for Liberty University didn't respond to requests for comment from the paper. The evangelical leader resigned from the college his father founded under a cloud of scandal. Our Stephanie Gosk has the latest. Jerry Falwell Jr. took over Liberty University, one of the largest evangelical schools in the world, over a decade ago after his father's death. Now he tells the Wall Street Journal that a group of self-righteous people are behind the push to remove him. The university saying it has accepted his resignation in the wake of multiple scandals. Reuters reported that the Falwells became entangled with Giancarlo Granda over eight years ago after meeting the then 20-year-old at a Miami hotel. In a statement, Falwell said his wife Becky had an affair with Granda, who later tried to extort them. Granda denies the accusation, telling Reuters that Jerry knew about the affair and would sometimes watch him and Becky together. Granda sharing phone conversations with Reuters, including this exchange from 2018. His new thing is like telling me every time he hooks up with people, like, <laughs> like I don't have feelings or something. You don't make a joke. Uh, yeah. All of this less than a month after Falwell posted and then deleted this photo on Instagram. Despite his defense that it was all in good fun, Liberty University put the 58-year-old on indefinite leave. In a statement Monday night, the school said additional matters came to light that made it clear that it would not be in the best interest of the university for him to return from leave. According to the university, Falwell responded by agreeing to resign immediately, but then instructed his attorneys not to send his resignation. In an interview with the Wall Street Journal late Monday, Falwell said he would indeed step down, acknowledging that some of his posts on social media had embarrassed the school. Liberty University says its new leaders are committed to being good stewards, while also offering heartfelt prayers to the Falwell family. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News. Our NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb joins us once again with the very latest on Hurricane Laura. Yeah, good morning, you two. We knew, now have a Cat 2 hurricane and hurricane warnings that are in place for East Texas all the way into portions of central Louisiana. That means these warnings take heed to them. It's going to be taking place later this afternoon into your evening. I think also potential for tomorrow morning as well. The storm surge along with rain on top of that up to three to five inches across Louisiana into the Mississippi Valley. That's a look at the big weather of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. 
So our temperature is very warm, and that's going to fuel that storm. San Antonio today, 100 degrees, watching a few storms across Nashville this afternoon. Tampa today, 94, partly sunny skies across Orlando. We'll continue to look at impacts coming up, guys. All right, Janessa, thank you. Uh, McDonald's is spicing up its menu with the addition of two new items. One is spicy McNuggets. Uh, the other is Chips Ahoy McFlurry. It marks the first time that it's added a new type of McNugget to the menu in the United States. They'll be available nationwide for a limited time starting September 16th. Now, fast food competitor Wendy's, they weighed in on the new spicy McNuggets on Twitter, writing, must have scraped up all of BK's leftovers and slapped the McPrice tag on it. You know, Man, that's <laughs> yeah. a Dick. That is some shade there, but Wendy's has wow. some room to talk. The Wendy's spicy nuggets are no joke. No, they aren't. They aren't, but man, that is a low blow. Hey, it's a war. The fast food wars. Nugget there you go. Nugget war right there. <laughs> Leading the news, it's now been 166 days since police shot and killed Breonna Taylor in her own home. On Tuesday, hundreds of protesters took to the streets of Louisville, Kentucky, demanding justice. None of the officers who executed a no-knock warrant on Taylor's apartment in March has been charged. Two remained on the force, and a third has been fired. There is some good news in America's fight against coronavirus. According to data from Johns Hopkins University, coronavirus infections are falling. About 43,000 new cases are being reported daily across the country. That's down 21% from early August. The glimmer of hope comes as FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn is apologizing for comments he made about the benefits of convalescent plasma as a treatment for coronavirus. In a tweet, Hahn said in part, I have been criticized for remarks I made Sunday night about the benefits of convalescent plasma. The criticism is entirely justified. Hahn was met with backlash from medical experts after stating that 35 lives out of every 100 people who get the treatment would survive the coronavirus. The North Dakota Health Department is urging those who attended the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally in South Dakota earlier this month to get tested and to monitor symptoms for coronavirus. More than 100 cases linked to the event have been found in eight states. More than 460,000 people and participants attended. Meanwhile, 13,000 fans will be allowed in Hard Rock Stadium in Florida for the Miami Dolphins and the Miami Hurricanes home openers this season amid the pandemic. The Dolphins announced the news in a tweet, adding that all fans will be required to wear a mask and smoking and tailgating will not be permitted. Here we are. Back to the movies. Loved it. Right, Tom Cruise sharing video there on social media of him attending a London screening of Christopher Nolan's new film, Tenet. The actor even gave a stamp of approval, telling a fan that he loved the movie. Tenet opens in more than 70 countries worldwide starting today. New York City has a new plan for its schools, public, private, and charter. Some classes will now be outside this fall, but how will that work? NBC's Kristen Dahlgren joins us now. Kristen, good morning. Good morning, Philip. Well, where I am in Vermont, they've been planning outdoor classrooms for a while. Getting kids outside is really a big part of the normal education, if you will. Uh, but it's not just rural areas that are now looking at this idea of bringing classes out a little bit more into nature. New York City actually trying to come up with its own plans. The city announced just on Monday that it would be allowing uh, schools to go outdoors for classrooms. By Tuesday morning, they had 243 schools that had already applied for this. So the response has absolutely been overwhelming. Principals have now been given until Friday, just until Friday, to try and come up with their school's plans. They're talking about having classes in parks, maybe blocking off streets and having the kids being able to spread out in the streets. I heard one principal talking about the possibility of talking to some restaurants that have outdoor dining spaces that they're not using during the day and maybe getting kids into those areas. So a lot of planning going on right now. Uh, all this is going on as the city is also saying that it's going to be testing every single classroom 
in New York City for ventilation. It's hoping to do that by next week. So a lot of moving parts, only a few weeks left until school starts, a lot of parents watching closely to see how this all evolves and whether or not their kids are going to be able to spread out outdoors and perhaps be a little bit safer from transmission, Philip. That's uncharted territory wow. for everybody, Kristen. Thank you. Yeah, and very, very complicated. It is a tight squeeze here in the city, yeah. more so with bikes, pedestrians, cars, everything out there. Too. So many things complicated. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. In today's top stories, another night of unrest for Kenosha, Wisconsin. The governor said National Guard presence would be increased as protests escalate following the police shooting of Jacob Blake. There have been reports of shots fired overnight, but it is unclear who fired or if anyone is hurt. Blake's family gave an update on his condition. They say he is paralyzed from the waist down, though doctors aren't sure if it's permanent. The family is calling for the officers involved to be fired. Officials say cooler weather is helping firefighters in California. But as some evacuation orders are lifted, many people will not have a home to return to. At least 1,400 houses have been destroyed, and that number could grow to more than 3,000. At least seven people have died in the fires or fighting them. Now to a dream come true for Holocaust survivors. She created a new life in Connecticut, but one thing was missing until a school heard her story. Here's NBC's Katie Beck. At 88 years old, in a cap and gown, Miriam Schreiber savors a moment she's dreamed of for decades. Due to the events beyond my control, I was never able to get my high school diploma. This has been a profound regret of mine all my life. Schreiber's education disrupted by a desperate journey to survive the Holocaust. Her family living for years on the run, hiding from the Nazis, eventually sent to a slave labor camp in Siberia. And nobody would have faulted her for just giving up, but she didn't. Uh, she, of course, learned all the languages everywhere she went. Today, she's fluent in six, learning English when she immigrated to the United States to raise a family. The generations after live awed and inspired by her. Congratulations, buddy. This uh, honorary diploma uh, is, is well-deserved, and she certainly, in the school of life, has earned it. Perhaps a lesson that with perseverance and a grateful heart. It really means the world to me. Thank you so much. Our greatest moments are yet to come. Katie Beck, NBC News. Wow, perseverance and the will to survive right there and showing that right there it is never too late. Yeah, I can't imagine all the thoughts, all the memories that she had crossing her mind in that moment there. I just what an incredible life lived uh, in six languages that she spoke. I mean, it just makes me think of all the people who we lost in the Holocaust and what their lives could have been. You know, she's a glaring example of uh, all the achievements that can be accomplished. You know? Testament of something like yeah. that, too. So congratulations are well deserved. That's right. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Bracing for impact, Hurricane Laura grew to a Category 2 storm earlier than expected as it continues to build strength ahead of making landfall in about 20 hours. Do Jacob justice on this level and examine your heart. The family of Jacob Blake speaks out after they said he was paralyzed after being shot in the back by police. Unrest and damage in Kenosha continued for a third day. First Lady Melania Trump topped off the Republicans' second night of their convention in a Rose Garden speech with a softer approach. New COVID-19 cases in the U.S. fall to the lowest level in more than two months. And a first for the 2020 Major League Baseball season. Some good news to cheer about as we kick off the last Wednesday of August. Early today starts right now. Glad you're with us. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. Breaking this morning, millions are under threat as Hurricane Laura churns towards the Gulf Coast as a Category 2 hurricane. It's expected to make landfall as a Category 3 storm. Officials in Houston are warning against what could be unprecedented devastation. 
That warning on the anniversary of two deadly hurricanes, Katrina and Harvey, that devastated Louisiana and Texas. Our Morgan Chesky is in Holly Beach, Louisiana with the latest. After Laura lashed the Caribbean, millions on the Gulf Coast digging in or getting out. It's better to prepare now instead of the last day go, oh, I'm out of time. The damage from Tropical Storm Marco, a mere warm up for what's to come. Laura now expected to hit Texas and Louisiana as a category three hurricane, prompting mandatory evacuations. If you're going to stay, you know that beginning tomorrow for sure by noon, don't doubt 911, no one's going to answer, okay? And you are on your own. Here in Port Arthur, people aren't taking any chances. With a population of more than 50,000 people, the goal is to get everyone on board these buses before Laura hits. The mission complicated by COVID-19. Those leaving town checked for fever and given a wristband. Each person scanned before boarding buses to shelters. You've seen Rita, you've seen Ike, you've seen Harvey. Mm -hmm, all of it. You're not waiting for this one. Mm -mm. No, it's time to go. Others doing whatever they can. Newlyweds Chris uh, yes, and Carol Ann Higgins yeah. hoping sandbags are enough to save their first home. Cover up the doors, all our openings, put these around there, and uh, hopefully just prepare for the flooding. With the storm surge estimated up to 13 feet high, Laura's already drawn comparisons to 2005's Hurricane Rita, which caused $12 billion in damage. The next 24 hours, telling. You need to be prepared for the possibility, not the probability, that you will be losing power. And we're here on the Louisiana coast where Laura's expected to make landfall as a Category 3 hurricane, the exact same as Rita nearly 15 years ago. That storm so powerful, it pushed water nearly 50 miles inland. Philip. All right, Morgan, thank you. NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb joining us now. She's been tracking Hurricane Laura. Janessa, good morning. What areas are you most worried about here? You know, all of the Louisiana border to uh, East Texas really need to be on our radar, even though it might not be a direct hit on those locations. The tropical force winds, also the storm surge, still going to be a big issue. The storm system has really gained strength just in the last 24 hours. It has rapidly intensified, and now we're seeing a Cat 2 storm. This has come a little bit early, and we're not even done with that rapid intensification phase. Now, we're seeing sustained winds of 105 miles per hour. The current track from the National Hurricane Center continues to see the storm system increase to wind speeds of 120. Right now, we're looking at a potential landfall for Cameron, Louisiana, all the way into the Lake Charles area. The impacts will continue all the way into central Louisiana, where we're going to see devastating flooding and that storm surge in that area. We're going to continue to watch the track as it makes its way into the Mississippi Valley, but hurricane warnings for Lake Charles all the way into Galveston remain at this hour. Guys? All right, still a lot of uh, intense hours to come. Thanks, Janessa, for the update. Let's turn now to breaking news in Wisconsin where police are warning people to clear the streets. Reports of shots swinging out in Kenosha. The sheriff says one person has died and two others are injured. Protests continue to escalate after the police shooting of Jacob Blake. And now we're hearing more from Blake's family. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has that update. Gabe? Francis, tensions are high in this community, and the family of Jacob Blake is now speaking out, demanding the officers involved be fired. The smoke obscured the sunrise. It was a second violent night in Kenosha, Wisconsin, after the shooting of Jacob Blake. His family says the 29-year-old spinal cord is severed and that he's paralyzed from the waist down, though doctors aren't sure it's permanent. They shot my son. Seven times, seven times. Like he didn't matter, but my son matters. Some protesters here ignored a curfew and clashed with police in riot gear. The state had deployed the National Guard, but it didn't stop the destruction. It's right before dawn and firefighters are here at the scene trying to put out hotspots. Much of this city block was looted and burned overnight. Blake's family is encouraging peaceful protests. Do Jacob justice on this level and examine 
your hearts. This new video shows the shooting from a different angle, but it's still not clear exactly what was said between police and Blake or why he was walking around the front of his SUV. An officer fired at least seven shots, hitting Blake in the back, while his children inside the car watched, including his son on his eighth birthday. He loves his family. You, you all took him from his family because you all stood by and let it happen. I just want my brother. Exactly three months after the death of George Floyd, Blake's shooting is the latest flashpoint over race and policing. Christia Delgado says she ran out of her apartment with her young child, fearing for her life. It's heartbreaking. It's really heartbreaking. How, how can you destroy your city, your home? How can you do this? But for Bernadette Prince, a protester with three sons, the frustration has reached a boiling point. You get mad when we start destroying things. This is what happened when you do this, when you keep killing black people for no reason. No comment from Kenosha police and the Justice Department is now assisting state authorities with the investigation. The governor now says that there will be an increased National Guard presence here to help protect the city. Francis. All right, Gabe, thank you. It's now been 166 days since police shot and killed Breonna Taylor in her own home. On Tuesday, hundreds of protesters took to the streets of Louisville, Kentucky, demanding justice. None of the officers who executed that no-knock warrant on Taylor's apartment in March have been charged. Two remain on the force, and a third has been fired. The Republican National Convention is mounting the case for a second term for President Trump. Until Melania Trump's headlining speech, mention of the pandemic was largely sidelined. Speakers instead touting President Trump's economic accomplishments while blasting Joe Biden's record. President Trump gets things done. Our entire economy and dairy farming are once again roaring back. We simply cannot endure a Biden-induced recession. Inheriting a stagnant economy on the front end of recession, the economy was rebuilt in three years. Do you want economic health, prosperity, opportunity, and optimism? Or do you want to turn back to the dark days of stagnation, recession, and pessimism? My father does not run away from challenges, even in the face of outright hatred. Let us join our president in his vow that America will never be a socialist country. To the voiceless, shamed, censored, and canceled, my father will fight for you. And we turn now to NBC's Tracy Potts, who has more on what we can expect tonight. Hi, Tracy. Hey, Francis, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Tonight will feature the vice president. Mike Pence will speak from Fort McHenry in Baltimore, one more uh, location that the campaign's been criticized for using uh, patriotic speech uh, expected tonight. That is the theme, uh, but also a political speech on public property. Meantime, President Trump appeared twice uh, during Tuesday night's events on video. Uh, one was at the naturalization ceremony for five new American citizens. And also on video, he pardoned a Nevada felon. Here's more of that Plus, the other highlights in the speakers from last night, including First Lady Melania Trump. Join us as I grant John, I'm not sure you know this, a full pardon. You've earned the most prized, treasured, cherished, and priceless possession anywhere in the world. It's called American citizenship. As a soldier, I saw firsthand people desperate to flee to freedom. The way each of us can best ensure our freedoms is by electing leaders who don't just talk, but who deliver. As you have learned over the past five years, he's not a traditional politician. He doesn't just speak words. He demands action and he gets results. In addition to the First Lady, we also heard from Secretary of State Mike Pompeo last night in a recorded speech. He recorded that speech while on a state-sponsored trip to Jerusalem. And now Democrats say they want to investigate whether there were any violations with him doing that political speech while on the taxpayer's dime. Francis. All right, Tracy. Thank you. And Joe Biden's campaign is countering the RNC, turning speeches from night one into an attack on the Trump administration's pandemic response. 
This election is a battle for the soul of America. Across the country, health care workers say they're dealing with a shortage of masks, gowns, and gloves again. This president has a record of strength and success. They are dying. That's true. And you ha- it is what it is. The best is yet to come. The pol- political ad ending on when they say the best is yet to come, that's a threat. The Democratic nominee also called the convention an attempt to create a, quote, alternate reality to cover up for the president's failures on coronavirus. Janessa is watching a whole lot out there, and she's tracking a storm, the threat of Laura. Here she is back again. Hi, Janessa. Hey, you two. We are also watching the storm surge. That's the deadliest part of a hurricane. And we are forecasting right now 7 to 11 feet in parts of uh, western Louisiana to Galveston, Texas. Make sure you know your zone if evacuation orders come in place. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across Texas, 100 degrees for San Antonio, and that will feel this storm system. Also for Tampa, watching a little bit of severe weather this morning. Things should clear out by this afternoon. Uh, Charleston, South Carolina, 93. We'll continue to look at impacts of Laura coming up. All right. Thank you very much, Janessa. Now time for today's quick hits. The cast of The West Wing is reuniting for a special on HBO Max. The episode will be recorded at the Orpheum Theater in Los Angeles, and the special will benefit the nonpartisan When We All Vote initiative. For the first time in decades, the Girl Scouts have a new look. The Fashion Institute of Technology collaborated with the Girl Scouts for the outfits, adding functional changes to the entire collection. General Mills will sell pouches of marshmallows from Lucky Charms starting next month. No cereal, just the mellows, the company says it'll be first available nationwide. On 0-2, to right field, Adam Engel is there! A no-hitter! The 19th! New this morning, Lucas Giolito became the first player this season to toss a no-hitter, leading the White Sox to a 4 to nothing win over the Pirates. He struck out 13 batters en route to the White Sox, 19th no-hitter in franchise history. Shame no one there to see it. Well, and now to a pivotal game five that played out in the NBA. A few of them here in the first game. Jamal Murray scored 42 points for the Nuggets with this nifty 360 layup, the most impressive there. <laughs> Denver slipped past Utah to fend off elimination. And in the late game, the Clippers scored early and often, scoring a playoff high 154 points to take the 3-2 series lead over the Mavericks. Three more Game 5s tip off today, starting with the Magic and the Bucks at 4 p.m. Are you ready for some football with fans in the stands? Well, just before the NFL kicks off, the Dolphins have announced 13,000 fans will be allowed in Hard Rock Stadium in Florida for the team's home opener next month. The team says all fans and stadium employees will be required to wear a mask. Other stadium changes include socially distanced seating, touchless sinks, and toilets. But sorry, smoking and tailgating still not permitted. Fans keeping their fingers crossed tight that nothing changes between now and then. Yeah. People from coming in. Mm -hmm. All right, Lionel Messi wants out. He told uh, Barcelona Tuesday that he wants to move on after nearly two decades with the team, despite having a contract until 20. 2021. Messi reportedly wants to spend next season at Manchester City, but there are still hurdles that need to be cleared before he can make that move. Number one on the charts, I'm there vicariously. Oh, there they go. Biasly pushing negative narratives. I'm ready to. Cops want to pull me over. After its 11th week at number one on Billboard's Song of the Summer chart and gaining over 380 million streams, Spotify unveiled that this year's most streamed Song of the Summer goes to DaBaby's hit Rockstar featuring Roddy Rich. The Duchess of Sussex, Meghan Markle, is continuing her activism and using her voice to speak out about women's rights. Markle recently sat down with feminist icon Gloria Steinem for a backyard chat. People forget how hard women like you and so many others before you fought for us to just be where we are right now. Well, it's just, I mean, when you, if you don't vote, you don't exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it is the only place where we're all equal, the voting booth. In a preview clip shared on social media, the duo discussed representation, why each vote matters, and the importance of women voting in the upcoming election. Meghan and Prince Harry's two dogs even made a cameo. The full conversation will be released later today. 
McDonald's is spicing up its menu with the addition of two new items. So the fast food chain will now offer a Chips Ahoy McFlurry and Spicy McNuggets. That marks the first time it's added a new type of McNugget to its menu in the United States. They will be available nationwide for a limited time starting September 16th. Not wasting any time, fast food competitor Wendy's weighed in on the new spicy McNuggets. So they did so on Twitter and they wrote, must have scraped up all of BK's leftovers and slapped them a price tag on it. Yeah, dig, 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 dig. They're getting ugly with those nugget wars. Yeah, that bar's pretty high though. With yeah. the spice level that yeah. Wendy's has, I don't know, see if McDonald's it's can bring it. It's a texture thing of the meat though. That's Something. The, difference of the two of them. Oof. Good morning, everyone. If you're across the northern Gulf Coast, I want you to be ready this afternoon as Hurricane Laura potentially turns into a major hurricane. We'll be right back. In today's top stories, there is good news in America's fight against coronavirus. According to data from Johns Hopkins University, new coronavirus infections are falling. The data suggests about 43,000 new cases are being reported daily across the country. That's down 21 percent from early August. FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn is, has apologized for comments he made about the benefits of convalescent plasma as a treatment for coronavirus. In a tweet, Hahn said in part, I have been criticized for remarks I made Sunday night about the benefits of convalescent plasma. The criticism is entirely justified. Hahn was met with backlash from medical experts after stating 35 lives out of every 100 people who get the treatment would survive the coronavirus. The helicopter company responsible for the crash that killed Kobe Bryant and eight others is suing air traffic controllers. The company Island Express filed a cross complaint alleging that the January helicopter crash was the result of, quote, a series of erroneous acts and or omissions by two air traffic controllers. The lawsuit claims that one of the air traffic controllers declined the pilot's request for radar assistance. The company is currently facing lawsuits of its own from Bryant's family and other victims. Two retired NFL players have filed a lawsuit against the league alleging racial bias in its concussion payouts. Ex-players Kevin Henry and Najee Davenport say the doctors used two scales, one for black athletes and one for white athletes to determine eligibility for dementia claims. Lawyers for the players say the two were denied awards based on a discriminatory testing regime. The settlement fund has paid $720 million to retired players for neurocognitive problems linked to NFL concussions. A league spokesman called this lawsuit entirely misguided. Some black female celebrities are getting candid about the discrimination black women face over their hair. I've been told it's too big. I've been asked, is it real? I've been told there is too much. I've been told it blocks people's view the full day to watch in style. I love everything. Actresses Gabrielle Union, Kiki Palmer, Uzo Aduba, and Marseille Martin have teamed up to film that powerful PSA called I've Been Told. It's for Glamour magazine. The celebrities share anonymous stories from 13 different black women across America to highlight the far-stretching issues of microaggressions toward black hair. The full PSA will be released alongside Glamour's September cover story. It'll highlight the Crown Act, which was created in 2019 to protect against discrimination on race-based hairstyles. Well, let's celebrate some birthdays today. Comedian and former SNL writer John Mulaney turns 38. Chris Pine, a.k.a. Captain Kirk, is 40. Also turning 40, Macaulay Culkin. Melissa McCarthy, co-star of Bridesmaids, is 50 years old and renowned jazz musician. Branford Marcellus turns 60. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. On the move, hundreds of thousands are evacuating as Hurricane Laura gains steam and readies for landfall in less than 24 hours. Violent uprisings in Kenosha overnight as the family of Jacob Blake reveals that he may be paralyzed after being shot in the back by police. Day two at the Republican convention drew out even more Trumps to speak before a national stage, including the night's keynote from the First Lady. And Jerry Falwell Jr.'s dramatic exit and multi-million dollar payout. A busy Wednesday ahead. Early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Philip Mena. I'm Francis Rivera. Breaking this morning, Hurricane Laura strengthens in the Gulf, rekindling fears for millions in Texas and Louisiana. 
Laura is now a Category 2 hurricane and could make landfall as a Category 3 storm on the anniversary of Hurricanes Harvey and Katrina, two of the most devastating hurricanes to hit those states. Residents are torn between hunkering down in their homes or evacuating, evacuating and riding out the storm in a safer area. Travis Guillory of KJRH has more on what coastal communities are doing. Those with homes and camps here on Vermilion Bay have been here pretty much since the weekend trying to tie things down, boarding up windows and elevating furniture and appliances to some upper levels. Many home and camp owners actually cleared out their bottom levels and opened their garages and all of the doors. So that way the water from the bay can actually flow through the house, which is actually going to cause less damage in the long run. But people here on the bay are not strangers to this. It's unfortunately one of the downfalls of choosing to live in a coastal community just feet away from the water. But with some still dealing with damage from Hurricane Barry last year, like Weldon Tokino, they expect what's going to be happening this week to be a lot worse, especially with the storm surge similar to Hurricane Rita from 2005. We had water three or four feet deep here on the road and, and wave action that did a lot of damage, brought in a tremendous amount of mud in our uh, workshops and garages and etc. So that would be the worst thing for us is the high water with the storm hitting to the west of us. And that was Travis Guillory of KJRH reporting. Let's turn now to NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb, who's tracking Hurricane Lauren. Janessa, where do you expect the storm to hit? You know, we're watching very closely the Texas and Louisiana border, but just happening in the last 30 minutes, we have a very healthy storm system. Hurricane Laura, now a Cat 2 hurricane. It has rapidly intensified in the last 24 hours. Right now, we are seeing sustained winds of 105 miles per hour. There's still that west-northwest movement at 17 miles per hour, and that is going to really be continuous uh, through the next uh, 24 hours. The cone of uncertainty has shrunk. But now we're expecting by this afternoon, it's going to sit in a warm body of water and really gain some more steam. Potentially a, ma a major hurricane turning into a Cat 3 by tonight and landfall expected possibility right now for Cameron, Louisiana to Lake Charles. It continues its trek and that's what's really going to cause the storm surge. We hope that land uh, acts as a, a letting it shred apart, but unfortunately we're not going to see that it still gains steam as it makes its way across the Mississippi Valley and then all the way into the Northeast. So watching the storm surge, that is going to be the big thing from New Orleans to Galveston, Texas, up to 7 to 11 feet. Guys. All right, Janessa, thank you so much for that update. And we have more breaking news from Wisconsin where protests have escalated again. There were reports of shots fired near a gas station. It's unclear who fired or if anyone was injured. Earlier, officers appeared to use a large cloud of tear gas to clear another street. This unrest began after police shot Jacob Blake in the back. At an emotional press conference, Blake's family gave an update on his condition. There is a chance that the 29-year-old may never walk again. Here's NBC's Dan Sheneman. Another uneasy night in Kenosha after the shooting of Jacob Blake. The 29-year-old was shot seven times in the back Sunday. The incident captured on video. His family says he is paralyzed from the waist down. He shot my son seven times, seven times. Like he didn't matter, but my son matters. Police have said little, calling it a domestic incident that involved a shooting. An investigation is ongoing. The shooting ignited two nights of protests in Kenosha, protests that began peacefully, but grew violent and destructive. Never in a million years did I think that anything like this would ever happen in Kenosha, never. After the sun came up, the smoke cleared. It was time to clean up, while the family of Jacob Blake pleaded for calm. If Jacob knew what was going on as far as that goes, the violence and the destruction, he would be very unpleased. A family asking for prayers, a community in need of peace. Dan Sheneman, NBC News. There is more reaction from the sports world to the shooting of Jacob Blake. The Detroit Lions called off their practice, the team choosing to take a stand instead. 
you might step on some toes, you might rough some feathers, but uh, in, in order for change to happen, in order for something to happen, you know, someone has to be uncomfortable. And more NBA players are questioning their time in the bubble, with some considering a potential boycott. The bombastic case for a second term takes center stage as Vice President Mike Pence headlines night three of the Republican National Convention. Other big names include outgoing White House counselor Kellyanne Conway and Congressman Dan Crenshaw. Night two closed out on a decidedly softer note from First Lady Melania Trump. Since March, our lives have changed drastically. The invisible enemy, COVID-19, swept across our beautiful country. To those of you who want to stand up and fight the socialists poisoning our schools and burning our cities, join me in supporting President Trump. Let's rebuild America together. The Democrats want an America where your thoughts and opinions are censored when they do not align with their own. The Biden-Harris vision for America leaves no room for people of faith. The night also defied tradition in several ways. NBC's Alice Barr has more. America. Night two of the Republican National Convention showcasing the Trump presidency and shattering norms. In a display of presidential power, he pardoned a Nevada man who leads a prisoner reentry program. You have done incredible work. Thank you, sir. He also presided over an immigration naturalization ceremony. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in a break with tradition that prohibits mixing campaign politics and U.S. policy, endorsing President Trump while on an official trip to Jerusalem, where the president delivered on a controversial campaign promise to relocate the U.S. Embassy. The president, too move the U.S. Embassy to this very city of God, Jerusalem, the rightful capital of the Jewish homeland. Turning a more personal spotlight on President Trump, two of the president's children fiercely defending him. Make America Great Again is not a slogan for my father. It is what drives him to keep his promise of doing what is right for American citizens. And First Lady Melania Trump headlining the night with an address from the White House Rose Garden before a live audience, again breaking precedent by using the White House as a campaign backdrop. To mothers and parents everywhere, you are warriors. In my husband, you have a president who will not stop fighting for you and your families. Republicans hoping the First Lady will appeal to female voters in key battleground states. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. After a contentious resignation, Jerry Falwell Jr.'s liberty may have come up with a lump sum. The Wall Street Journal reports he could be owed a $10.5 million payout. According to a person close to Falwell with knowledge of his employment contract, he may be due his $1.25 million salary for the next two years, plus another $8 million of his responsibilities are reduced. A spokesman for Liberty University didn't respond to requests for comment from the paper. The evangelical leader resigned from the college his father founded under a cloud of scandal. Our Stephanie Gosk has the latest. Jerry Falwell Jr. took over Liberty University, one of the largest evangelical schools in the world, over a decade ago after his father's death. Now he tells the Wall Street Journal that a group of self-righteous people are behind the push to remove him. The university is saying it has accepted his resignation in the wake of multiple scandals. Reuters reported that the Falwells became entangled with Giancarlo Granda over eight years ago after meeting the then 20-year-old at a Miami hotel. In a statement, Falwell said his wife Becky had an affair with Granda, who later tried to extort them. Granda denies the accusation, telling Reuters that Jerry knew about the affair and would sometimes watch him and Becky together. Granda sharing phone conversations with Reuters, including this exchange from 2018. His new thing is like telling me every time he hooks up with people, like, like <laughs> I don't have feelings or something. You don't make it so. Yeah. All of this less than a month after Falwell posted and then deleted this photo on Instagram. Despite his defense that it was all in good fun, Liberty University put the 58-year-old on indefinite leave. In a statement Monday night, the school said additional matters came to light that made it clear that it would not be in the best interest of the university for him to return from leave. According to the university, Falwell responded by agreeing to resign immediately, but then instructed his attorneys not to send his resignation. 
In an interview with the Wall Street Journal late Monday, Falwell said he would indeed step down, acknowledging that some of his posts on social media had embarrassed the school. Liberty University says its new leaders are committed to being good stewards, while also offering heartfelt prayers to the Falwell family. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News. NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb joins us once again with the very latest on Hurricane Laura. Yeah, good morning, you two. We knew, now have a Cat 2 hurricane and hurricane warnings that are in place for East Texas all the way into portions of central Louisiana. That means these warnings take heed to them. It's going to be taking place later this afternoon into your evening. I think also potential for tomorrow morning as well. The storm surge along with rain on top of that up to three to five inches across Louisiana into the Mississippi Valley. That's a look at the big weather of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So our temperature is very warm, and that's going to fuel that storm. San Antonio today, 100 degrees, watching a few storms across Nashville this afternoon. Tampa today, 94, partly sunny skies across Orlando. We'll continue to look at impacts coming up, guys. All right, Janessa, thank you. Uh, McDonald's is spicing up its menu with the addition of two new items. One is spicy McNuggets. Uh, the other is Chips Ahoy McFlurry. It marks the first time that it's added a new type of McNugget to the menu in the United States. They'll be available nationwide for a limited time starting September 16th. Now, fast food competitor Wendy's, they weighed in on the new spicy McNuggets on Twitter, writing, must have scraped up all BK's leftovers and slapped them a price tag on it. You know, Man, that's <laughs> yeah. a dick. That is some shade there, but Wendy's has wow. some room to talk, though. Wendy's spicy nuggets are... No joke. No, they aren't. They aren't, them. but man, that is a low blow. Hey, it's a war. The fast food wars. There Nugget you go. Look at war right <laughs> there. Leading the news, it's now been 166 days since police shot and killed Breonna Taylor in her own home. On Tuesday, hundreds of protesters took to the streets of Louisville, Kentucky, demanding justice. None of the officers who executed a no-knock warrant on Taylor's apartment in March has been charged. Two remain on the force, and a third has been fired. There is some good news in America's fight against coronavirus. According to data from Johns Hopkins University, coronavirus infections are falling. About 43,000 new cases are being reported daily across the country. That's down 21 percent from early August. The glimmer of hope comes as FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn is apologizing for comments he made about the benefits of convalescent plasma as a treatment for coronavirus. In a tweet, Hahn said in part, I have been criticized for remarks I made Sunday night about the benefits of convalescent plasma. The criticism is entirely justified. Hahn was met with backlash from medical experts after stating that 35 lives out of every 100 people who get the treatment would survive the coronavirus. The North Dakota Health Department is urging those who attended the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally in South Dakota earlier this month to get tested and to monitor symptoms for coronavirus. More than 100 cases linked to the event have been found in eight states. More than 460,000 people and participants attended. Meanwhile, 13,000 fans will be allowed in Hard Rock Stadium in Florida for the Miami Dolphins and the Miami Hurricanes home openers this season amid the pandemic. The Dolphins announced the news in a tweet, adding that all fans will be required to wear a mask and smoking and tailgating will not be permitted. Here we are. Back to the movies. Loved it. All right, Tom Cruise sharing video there on social media of him attending a London screening of Christopher Nolan's new film, Tenet. The actor even gave a stamp of approval, telling a fan that he loved the movie. Tenet opens in more than 70 countries worldwide starting today. New York City has a new plan for its schools, public, private, and charter. Some classes will now be outside this fall, but how will that work? NBC's Kristen Dahlgren joins us now. Kristen, good morning. 
Good morning, Philip. Well, where I am in Vermont, they've been planning outdoor classrooms for a while. Getting kids outside is really a big part of the normal education, if you will. Uh, but it's not just rural areas that are now looking at this idea of bringing classes out a little bit more into nature. New York City actually trying to come up with its own plans. The city announced just on Monday that it would be allowing uh, schools to go outdoors for classrooms. By Tuesday morning, they had 243 schools that had already applied for this. So the response has absolutely been overwhelming. Principals have now been given until Friday, just until Friday, to try and come up with their school's plans. They're talking about having classes in parks, maybe blocking off streets and having the kids being able to spread out in the streets. I heard one principal talking about the possibility of talking to some restaurants that have outdoor dining spaces that they're not using during the day and maybe getting kids into those areas. So a lot of planning going on right now. Uh, all this is going on as the city is also saying that it's going to be testing every single classroom in New York City for ventilation. It's hoping to do that by next week. So a lot of moving parts, only a few weeks left until school starts. A lot of parents watching closely to see how this all evolves and whether or not their kids are going to be able to spread out outdoors and perhaps be a little bit safer from transmission, Philip. That's uncharted territory wow. for everybody, Kristen. Thank you. Yeah, and very, very complicated. It is a tight squeeze here in the city, yeah. more so with bikes, pedestrians, cars, everything out there. So too. many things complicated. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. In today's top stories, another night of unrest for Kenosha, Wisconsin. The governor said National Guard presence would be increased as protests escalate following the police shooting of Jacob Blake. There have been reports of shots fired overnight, but it is unclear who fired or if anyone is hurt. Blake's family gave an update on his condition. They say he is paralyzed from the waist down, though doctors aren't sure if it's permanent. The family is calling for the officers involved to be fired. Officials say cooler weather is helping firefighters in California. But as some evacuation orders are lifted, many people will not have a home to return to. At least 1,400 houses have been destroyed, and that number could grow to more than 3,000. At least seven people have died in the fires or fighting them. Now to a dream come true for a Holocaust survivor. She created a new life in Connecticut, but one thing was missing until a school heard her story. Here's NBC's Katie Beck. At 88 years old, in a cap and gown, Miriam Schreiber savors a moment she's dreamed of for decades. Due to the events beyond my control, I was never able to get my high school diploma. This has been a profound regret of mine all my life. Schreiber's education disrupted by a desperate journey to survive the Holocaust. Her family living for years on the run, hiding from the Nazis, eventually sent to a slave labor camp in Siberia. And nobody would have faulted her for just giving up, but she didn't. Uh, she, of course, learned all the languages everywhere she went. Today, she's fluent in six, learning English when she immigrated to the United States to raise a family. The generations after live awed and inspired by her. Congratulations, buddy. This uh, honorary diploma uh, is, is well-deserved, and she certainly, in the school of life, has earned it. Perhaps a lesson that with perseverance and a grateful heart. It really means the world to me. Thank you so much. Our greatest moments are yet to come. Katie Beck, NBC News. Wow, perseverance and the will to survive right there and showing that right there it is never too late. Yeah, I can't imagine all the thoughts, all the memories that she had crossing her mind in that moment there. I mean, just what an incredible life lived uh, in six languages that she spoke. I mean, it just makes me think of all the people who we lost in the Holocaust and what their lives could have been. And she's a glaring example of uh, all the achievements that can be accomplished. It's a testament you know? of something like yeah. that, too. So congratulations are well deserved. That's right. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. 
This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is the moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Bracing for impact, Hurricane Laura grew to a Category 2 storm earlier than expected as it continues to build strength ahead of making landfall in about 20 hours. Do Jacob justice on this level and examine your heart. The family of Jacob Blake speaks out after they said he was paralyzed after being shot in the back by police. Unrest and damage in Kenosha continued for a third day. First Lady Melania Trump topped off the Republicans' second night of their convention in a Rose Garden speech with a softer approach. New COVID-19 cases in the U.S. fall to the lowest level in more than two months. And a first for the 2020 Major League Baseball season. Some good news to cheer about as we kick off the last Wednesday of August. Early today starts right now. Glad you're with us. I'm Francis Rivera. And I'm Philip Mena. Breaking this morning, millions are under threat as Hurricane Laura churns towards the Gulf Coast as a Category 2 hurricane. It's expected to make landfall as a Category 3 storm. Officials in Houston are warning against what could be unprecedented devastation. That warning on the anniversary of two deadly hurricanes, Katrina and Harvey, that devastated Louisiana and Texas. Our Morgan Chesky is in Holly Beach, Louisiana with the latest. After Laura lashed the Caribbean, millions on the Gulf Coast digging in or getting out. It's better to prepare now instead of the last day go, oh, I'm out of time. The damage from Tropical Storm Marco, a mere warm up for what's to come. Laura now expected to hit Texas and Louisiana as a Category 3 hurricane, prompting mandatory evacuations. If you're going to stay, you know that beginning tomorrow, for sure, by noon, don't doubt 911, no one's going to answer, okay? And you are on your own. Here in Port Arthur, people aren't taking any chances. With a population of more than 50,000 people, the goal is to get everyone on board these buses before Laura hits. The mission complicated by COVID-19. Those leaving town checked for fever and given a wristband. 
each person scanned before boarding buses to shelters. You've seen Rita, you've seen Ike, you've seen Harvey. Mm -hmm, all of it. You're not waiting for this one. Mm -mm. No, it's time to go. Others doing whatever they can. Newlyweds Chris uh, yes, and Carol Ann Higgins yeah. hoping sandbags are enough to save their first home. Cover up the doors, all our openings, put these around there, and uh, hopefully just prepare for the flooding. With a storm surge estimated up to 13 feet high, Laura's already drawn comparisons to 2005's Hurricane Rita, which caused $12 billion in damage. The next 24 hours, telling. You need to be prepared for the possibility, not the probability, that you will be losing power. And we're here on the Louisiana coast where Laura's expected to make landfall as a Category 3 hurricane, the exact same as Rita nearly 15 years ago. That storm so powerful, it pushed water nearly 50 miles inland. Philip. All right, Morgan, thank you. NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb joining us now. She's been tracking Hurricane Laura. Janessa, good morning. What areas are you most worried about here? You know, all of the Louisiana border to uh, East Texas really need to be on our radar, even though it might not be a direct hit on those locations. The tropical force winds, also the storm surge, still going to be a big issue. The storm system has really gained strength just in the last 24 hours. It has rapidly intensified, and now we're seeing a Cat 2 storm. This has come a little bit early, and we're not even done with that rapid intensification phase. Now, we're seeing sustained winds of 105 miles per hour. The current track from the National Hurricane Center continues to see the storm system increase to wind speeds of 120. Right now, we're looking at a potential landfall for Cameron, Louisiana, all the way into the Lake Charles area. The impacts will continue all the way into central Louisiana, where we're going to see devastating flooding and that storm surge in that area. We're going to continue to watch the track as it makes its way into the Mississippi Valley, but hurricane warnings for Lake Charles all the way into Galveston remain at this hour. Guys? All right. Still a lot of uh, intense hours to come. Thanks, Janessa, for the update. Let's turn now to breaking news in Wisconsin where police are warning people to clear the streets. Reports of shots swinging out in Kenosha. The sheriff says one person has died and two others are injured. Protests continue to escalate after the police shooting of Jacob Blake. And now we're hearing more from Blake's family. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has that update. Gabe? Francis, tensions are high in this community, and the family of Jacob Blake is now speaking out, demanding the officers involved be fired. The smoke obscured the sunrise. It was a second violent night in Kenosha, Wisconsin, after the shooting of Jacob Blake. His family says the 29-year-old spinal cord is severed and that he's paralyzed from the waist down, though doctors aren't sure it's permanent. He shot my son. Seven times, seven times, like he didn't matter, but my son matters. Some protesters here ignored a curfew and clashed with police in riot gear. The state had deployed the National Guard, but it didn't stop the destruction. It's right before dawn and firefighters are here at the scene trying to put out hot spots. Much of this city block was looted and burned overnight. Blake's family is encouraging peaceful protests. Do Jacob justice on this level and examine your hearts. This new video shows the shooting from a different angle, but it's still not clear exactly what was said between police and Blake or why he was walking around the front of his SUV. An officer fired at least seven shots, hitting Blake in the back, while his children inside the car watched, including his son on his eighth birthday. He loves his family. You, you all took him from his family. You all stood by and let it happen. I just want my brother. Exactly three months after the death of George Floyd, Blake's shooting is the latest flashpoint over race and policing. Christia Delgado says she ran out of her apartment with her young child, fearing for her life. It's heartbreaking. It's really heartbreaking. How, how can you destroy your city, your home? How can you do this? 
But for Bernadette Prince, a protester with three sons, the frustration has reached a boiling point. You get mad when we start destroying things? This is what happened when you do this, when you keep killing black people for no reason. No comment from Kenosha police, and the Justice Department is now assisting state authorities with the investigation. The governor now says that there will be an increased National Guard presence here to help protect the city. Francis. All right, Gabe, thank you. It's now been 166 days since police shot and killed Breonna Taylor in her own home. On Tuesday, hundreds of protesters took to the streets of Louisville, Kentucky, demanding justice. None of the officers who executed that no-knock warrant on Taylor's apartment in March have been charged. Two remain on the force, and a third has been fired. The Republican National Convention is mounting the case for a second term for President Trump. Until Melania Trump's headlining speech, mention of the pandemic was largely sidelined. Speakers instead touting President Trump's economic accomplishments while blasting Joe Biden's record. President Trump gets things done. Our entire economy and dairy farming are once again roaring back. We simply cannot endure a Biden-induced recession. Inheriting a stagnant economy on the front end of recession, the economy was rebuilt in three years. Do you want economic health, prosperity, opportunity, and optimism? Or do you want to turn back to the dark days of stagnation, recession, and pessimism? My father does not run away from challenges, even in the face of outright hatred. Let us join our president in his vow that America will never be a socialist country. To the voiceless, shamed, censored, and canceled, my father will fight for you. And we turn now to NBC's Tracy Potts, who has more on what we can expect tonight. Hi, Tracy. Hey, Francis, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Tonight will feature the vice president. Mike Pence will speak from Fort McHenry in Baltimore, one more uh, location that the campaign's been criticized for using uh, patriotic speech uh, expected tonight. That is the theme, uh, but also a political speech on public property. Meantime, President Trump appeared twice uh, during Tuesday night's events on video. Uh, one was at the naturalization ceremony for five new American citizens. And also on video, he pardoned a Nevada felon. Here's more of that Plus, the other highlights in the speakers from last night, including First Lady Melania Trump. Join us as I grant John, I'm not sure you know this, a full pardon. You've earned the most prized, treasured, cherished, and priceless possession anywhere in the world. It's called American citizenship. As a soldier, I saw firsthand people desperate to flee to freedom. The way each of us can best ensure our freedoms is by electing leaders who don't just talk, but who deliver. As you have learned over the past five years, he's not a traditional politician. He doesn't just speak words. He demands action and he gets results. In addition to the First Lady, we also heard from Secretary of State Mike Pompeo last night in a recorded speech. He recorded that speech while on a state-sponsored trip to Jerusalem. And now Democrats say they want to investigate whether there were any violations with him doing that political speech while on the taxpayer's dime. Francis. All right, Tracy. Thank you. And Joe Biden's campaign is countering the RNC, turning speeches from night one into an attack on the Trump administration's pandemic response. This election is a battle for the soul of America. Across the country, healthcare workers say they're dealing with a shortage of masks, gowns, and gloves again. This president has a record of strength and success. They, they are dying. That's true. And you ha it is what it is. The best is yet to come. The pol political ad ending on when they say the best is yet to come, that's a threat. The Democratic nominee also called the convention an attempt to create a, quote, alternate reality to cover up for the president's failures on coronavirus. Janessa is watching a whole lot out there, and she's tracking a storm, the threat of Laura. Here she is back again. Hi, Janessa. 
Hey YouTube, we are also watching the storm surge. That's the deadliest part of a hurricane and we are forecasting right now 7 to 11 feet in parts of uh, western Louisiana to Galveston, Texas. Make sure you know your zone if evacuation orders come in place. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. Our temperatures across Texas, 100 degrees for San Antonio, and that will feel this storm system. Also for Tampa, watching a little bit of severe weather this morning. Things should clear out by this afternoon. Uh, Charleston, South Carolina, 93. We'll continue to look at impacts of Laura coming up. All right. Thank you very much, Janessa. Now time for today's quick hits. The cast of The West Wing is reuniting for a special on HBO Max. The episode will be recorded at the Orpheum Theater in Los Angeles, and the special will benefit the nonpartisan When We All Vote initiative. For the first time in decades, the Girl Scouts have a new look. The Fashion Institute of Technology collaborated with the Girl Scouts for the outfits, adding functional changes to the entire collection. General Mills will sell pouches of marshmallows from Lucky Charms starting next month. No cereal, just the mellows, the company says it'll be first available nationwide. On 0-2, to right field, Adam Engel is there! A no-hitter! The 19th! New this morning, Lucas Giolito became the first player this season to toss a no-hitter, leading the White Sox to a 4 to nothing win over the Pirates. He struck out 13 batters en route to the White Sox, 19th no-hitter in franchise history. Shame no one there to see it. Well, Hanato pivotal game five. The play out in the NBA, a few of them here in the first game, Jamal Murray scored 42 points for the Nuggets with this nifty 360 layup, the most impressive there. <laughs> Denver slipped past Utah to fend off elimination. And in the late game, the Clippers scored early and often, scoring a playoff high 154 points to take the 3-2 series lead over the Mavericks. Three more Game 5s tip off today, starting with the Magic and the Bucks at 4 p.m. Are you ready for some football with fans in the stands? Well, just before the NFL kicks off, the Dolphins have announced 13,000 fans will be allowed in Hard Rock Stadium in Florida for the team's home opener next month. The team says all fans and stadium employees will be required to wear a mask. Other stadium changes include socially distanced seating, touchless sinks, and toilets. But sorry, smoking and tailgating still not permitted. Fans keeping their fingers crossed tight that nothing changes between now and then. Keep yeah. People from coming in. Mm -hmm. All right, Lionel Messi wants out. He told uh, Barcelona Tuesday that he wants to move on after nearly two decades with the team, despite having a contract until 20. 2021. Messi reportedly wants to spend next season at Manchester City, but there are still hurdles that need to be cleared before he can make that move. Number one on the charts, I'm there vicariously. Oh, there they go. Biasly pushing negative narratives. I'm ready to. Cops want to pull me over. After its 11th week at number one on Billboard's Song of the Summer chart and gaining over 380 million streams, Spotify unveiled that this year's most streamed Song of the Summer goes to DaBaby's hit Rockstar featuring Roddy Rich. The Duchess of Sussex, Meghan Markle, is continuing her activism and using her voice to speak out about women's rights. Markle recently sat down with feminist icon Gloria Steinem for a backyard chat. People forget how hard women like you and so many others before you fought for us to just be where we are right now. Well, it's just, I mean, when you, if you don't vote, you don't exist. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, you know, it is the only place where we're all equal, the voting yeah. booth. In a preview clip shared on social media, the duo discussed representation, why each vote matters, and the importance of women voting in the upcoming election. Meghan and Prince Harry's two dogs even made a cameo. The full conversation will be released later today. McDonald's is spicing up its menu with the addition of two new items. So the fast food chain will now offer a Chips Ahoy McFlurry and Spicy McNuggets. That marks the first time it's added a new type of McNugget to its menu in the United States. They will be available nationwide for a limited time starting September 16th. Not wasting any time, fast food competitor Wendy's weighed in on the new spicy McNuggets. So they did so on Twitter and they wrote, must have scraped up all of BK's leftovers and slapped them a price tag on it. Yeah, dig, 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 dig. They're getting ugly with those nugget wars. Yeah, that bar's pretty high though. With yeah. the spice level that yeah. Wendy's has, I don't know, Let's see if McDonald's it's can bring it. It's extra thing of the meat though. That's Something. the difference of the two of them. Oof. 
Good morning, everyone. If you're across the northern Gulf Coast, I want you to be ready this afternoon as Hurricane Laura potentially turns into a major hurricane. We'll be right back. In today's top stories, there is good news in America's fight against coronavirus. According to data from Johns Hopkins University, new coronavirus infections are falling. The data suggests about 43,000 new cases are being reported daily across the country. That's down 21 percent from early August. FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn is, has apologized for comments he made about the benefits of convalescent plasma as a treatment for coronavirus. In a tweet, Hahn said in part, I have been criticized for remarks I made Sunday night about the benefits of convalescent plasma. The criticism is entirely justified. Hahn was met with backlash from medical experts after stating 35 lives out of every 100 people who get the treatment would survive the coronavirus. The helicopter company responsible for the crash that killed Kobe Bryant and eight others is suing air traffic controllers. The company, Island Express, filed a cross-complaint alleging that the January helicopter crash was the result of, quote, a series of erroneous acts and or omissions by two air traffic controllers. The lawsuit claims that one of the air traffic controllers declined the pilot's request for radar assistance. The company is currently facing lawsuits of its own from Bryant's family and other victims. Two retired NFL players have filed a lawsuit against the league alleging racial bias in its concussion payouts. Ex-players Kevin Henry and Najee Davenport say the doctors use two scales, one for black athletes and one for white athletes to determine eligibility for dementia claims. Lawyers for the players say the two were denied awards based on a discriminatory testing regime. The settlement fund has paid $720 million to retired players for neurocognitive problems linked to NFL concussions. A league spokesman called this lawsuit entirely misguided. Some black female celebrities are getting candid about the discrimination black women face over their hair. I've been told it's too big. I've been asked, is it real? I've been told there is too much. I've been told it blocks people's view of the full day to watch in style. I love everything. Actresses Gabrielle Union, Kiki Palmer, Uzo Aduba, and Marseille Martin have teamed up to film that powerful PSA called I've Been Told. It's for Glamour magazine. The celebrities share anonymous stories from 13 different black women across America to highlight the far-stretching issues of microaggressions toward black hair. The full PSA will be released alongside Glamour's September cover story. It'll highlight the Crown Act, which was created in 2019 to protect against discrimination on race-based hairstyles. Let's celebrate some birthdays today. Comedian and former SNL writer John Mulaney turns 38. Chris Pine, a.k.a. Captain Kirk, is 40. Also turning 40, Macaulay Culkin. Melissa McCarthy, co-star of Bridesmaids, is 50 years old and renowned jazz musician. Branford Marcellus turns 60. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. 
This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I gonna decide, take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. It's go time for hundreds of thousands in the path of Hurricane Laura. Now a Category 2 storm, but will likely become a major Cat 3 hurricane by landfall in less than 24 hours. One person has died and two are injured as gunfire erupts during violent protests on the third night of an arrest in Kenosha after Jacob Blake was shot in the back by police. And this morning, there's new video. Day two of the Republican convention focusing very much on the president's inner circle, close family, and a Rose Garden address from the First Lady. The fate of Jerry Falwell Jr., the evangelical leader rocked by scandal, may walk away with millions. And is the West Wing getting ready for a reboot with the original cast? Early today starts right now. Good Wednesday morning. I'm Phil Mena. I'm Francis Rivera. We begin with breaking news. More chaos on the streets of Wisconsin. For a third night in a row, protesters defying an emergency curfew. Add more fallout after the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Overnight reports of shots ringing out. The sheriff says one person has died and two others are injured. Police are investigating with the FBI. The night of unrest comes after an emotional day for the Black family. NBC's Dan Sheneman has this report on the Blake family. Another uneasy night in Kenosha after the shooting of Jacob Blake. The 29-year-old was shot seven times in the back Sunday. The incident captured on video. His family says he is paralyzed from the waist down. He shot my son seven times, seven times, like he didn't matter, but my son matters. Police have said little, calling it a domestic incident that involved a shooting. An investigation is ongoing. The shooting ignited two nights of protests in Kenosha, protests that began peacefully but grew violent and destructive. Never in a million years did I think that anything like this would ever happen in Kenosha. Never. After the sun came up, the smoke cleared. It was time to clean up, while the family of Jacob Blake pleaded for calm. If Jacob knew what was going on as far as that goes, the violence and the destruction, he would be very unpleased. A family asking for prayers, a community in need of peace. Dan Sheneman, NBC News. Also breaking millions under threat as Hurricane Laura turns towards the Gulf Coast as a Category 2 hurricane. It's expected to make landfall, though, as a Category 3 storm. Officials in Houston are warning against what could be unprecedented devastation. This comes on the anniversary of two deadly hurricanes, Katrina and Harvey, that devastated Louisiana and Texas. Our Morgan Chesky is in Holly Beach, Louisiana, with the latest. After Laura lashed the Caribbean, millions on the Gulf Coast digging in or getting out. It's better to prepare now instead of the last day go, oh, I'm out of time. The damage from Tropical Storm Marco 
a mere warm-up for what's to come. Laura now expected to hit Texas and Louisiana as a Category 3 hurricane, prompting mandatory evacuations. If you're going to say you know that beginning tomorrow, for sure by noon, don't dial 911, no one's going to answer, okay? And you are on your own. Here in Port Arthur, people aren't taking any chances. With a population of more than 50,000 people, the goal is to get everyone on board these buses before Laura hits. The mission complicated by COVID-19. Those leaving town checked for fever and given a wristband. Each person scanned before boarding buses to shelters. You've seen Rita, you've seen Ike, you've seen Harvey. Mm -hmm, all of them. You're not waiting for this one. Mm -mm. No, it's time to go. Others doing whatever they can. Newlyweds Chris uh, yes, and Carol Ann Higgins yeah. hoping sandbags are enough to save their first home. Cover up the doors, all our openings, put these around there, and uh, hopefully just prepare for the flooding. With the storm surge estimated up to 13 feet high, Laura's already drawn comparisons to 2005's Hurricane Rita, which caused $12 billion in damage. The next 24 hours, telling. You need to be prepared for the possibility, not the probability, that you will be losing power. And we're here on the Louisiana coast where Laura's expected to make landfall as a Category 3 hurricane, the exact same as Rita nearly 15 years ago. That storm so powerful, it pushed water nearly 50 miles inland. Philip. All right, Morgan, thank you. NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb is tracking Laura for us. Janessa, good morning. Where do you expect this storm to hit? You know, the track is really starting to come into agreement. Those folks in Port Arthur, they're doing the exact right thing. We are seeing the forecast shift more out of Houston and that Galveston area, and it is headed towards Cameron Parish for a potential landfall. Overnight, though, Hurricane Laura has rapidly intensified. Now a Cat 2 with sustained winds of 105 miles per hour, and that is going to steadily increase uh, throughout the afternoon. Right now, it's about about 300 miles off the coast of Louisiana. I think when you see this forecast from the National Hurricane Center and our 5 a.m. update, that's going to change. You're going to start to see the impacts by this afternoon, then a potential landfall around 7 to that 10 p.m. hour tonight. But the impacts are going to be widespread, even though we're not going to see a direct hit for Houston or the Galveston area. Tropical force winds, the storm surge. That's the deadliest part of the storm. I'm going to talk about that coming up guys all right looking forward to hearing Janessa thank you the Republican National Convention is mounting the case for a second term speakers touted President Trump's economic accomplishments while blasting Joe Biden's record and the night closed on a softer tone from First Lady Melania Trump since March our lives have changed drastically the invisible enemy COVID-19 swept across our beautiful country. To those of you who want to stand up and fight the socialists poisoning our schools and burning our cities, join me in supporting President Trump. Let's rebuild America together. The Democrats want an America where your thoughts and opinions are censored when they do not align with their own. The Biden-Harris vision for America leaves no room for people of faith. NBC's Tracy Potts joins us with the latest from D.C. And Tracy, what can we expect tonight? So tonight we're going to hear from the vice president from Fort McHenry in Baltimore. So they're taking this outside of Washington, that on its own, causing some controversy because like the first lady and Mike Pompeo, uh, these Political events are happening on public property, on, on public trips. You can see here some of the speakers who are lined up for tonight. The theme for tonight is patriotism, a land of heroes. Now, President Trump popped up twice during the program on video last night, once during a naturalization ceremony for five new Americans, and also when he pardoned a Nevada felon who turned his life around and is now helping other felons re-enter uh, society. President Trump saying that he deserves to be pardoned. Join us as I grant John, I'm not sure you know this, a full pardon. You've earned the most prized, treasured, cherished, and priceless possession anywhere in the world. It's called American citizenship. As a soldier, I saw firsthand people desperate to flee to freedom the way each of us 
can best ensure our freedoms is by electing leaders who don't just talk, but who deliver. As you have learned over the past five years, he's not a traditional politician. He doesn't just speak words. He demands action and he gets results. First Lady Melania Trump in the spotlight last night. Uh, now, you also saw that speech from Secretary of State Mike Pompeo that was recorded while he was in Jerusalem. This was on an official government trip, and now Democrats want to investigate whether there were any violations connected with that. All right, Tracy, thank you. Lead up to night two tonight. Thanks. Joe Biden's campaign is countering the RNC, turning speeches from night one into an attack on the Trump administration's pandemic response. This election is a battle for the soul of America. Across the country, healthcare workers say they're dealing with a shortage of masks, gowns, and gloves again. This president has a record of strength and success. They are dying. That's true. And you ha it is what it is. The best is yet to come. The political ad ending on when they say the best is yet to come, that's a threat. The Democratic nominee also called the convention an attempt to create a, quote, alternate reality to cover up for the president's failures on coronavirus. Another roadblock in Kanye West's quest to get on the ballot in the race for 2020. The rapper qualified to appear as an independent candidate in Tennessee and Minnesota, but he missed out in Missouri and Wyoming. He failed to acquire enough signatures to make the ballot in the two states. All right, NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb is back with us now. She's been looking at Laura. Janessa. Yeah, good morning, you two. The deadliest part of a hurricane storm surge, and that is going to be the greatest impact with Hurricane Laura, along with the high tide coming in behind that. Right now, forecasting 7 to 11 inches, and this is across the coastal areas of Louisiana all the way into East Texas. On top of that, we're talking about the flooding rain, where we could see isolated areas up to five inches. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So our temperatures across Texas this afternoon, 100 degrees, along with humidity very high across those Gulf Coast communities. A few storms for Charlotte this afternoon, clearing out for Raleigh, 93. We'll continue to look at impacts coming up, guys. All right, Janessa, thank you. Tom Cruise, he's been hitting the theaters. Here we are. Back to the movies. Loved it. Got that Mission Impossible mask on. Looks mm -hmm. kind of cool on him. The actor shared a video on social media of him attending a London screening of Christopher Nolan's new film, Tenet. He gave his stamp of approval, told the fan that he loved the movie. Tenet opens in more than 70 countries worldwide starting today. With that mask, he can get away incognito. Right. Not in the cab with those uh, fans out there, the girls on the bike. They That's positive. Him. Leading the news after a contentious resignation, resignation, Jerry Falwell Jr.'s liberty may have come up with a lump sum. The Wall Street Journal reports that he could be owed a $10.5 million payout. According to a person close to Falwell, with knowledge of his employment contract, says he may be due his $1.25 million salary in the next two years, for the next two years, plus another $8 million of his responsibilities are reduced. A spokesman for Liberty University didn't respond to a request for comment from the paper. The evangelical leader resigned from the college his father founded under a cloud of scandal. Our Stephanie Gosk has the latest details. Jerry Falwell Jr. took over Liberty University, one of the largest evangelical schools in the world, over a decade ago after his father's death. Now he tells the Wall Street Journal that a group of self-righteous people are behind the push to remove him. The university is saying it has accepted his resignation in the wake of multiple scandals. Reuters reported that the Falwells became entangled with Giancarlo Granda over eight years ago after meeting the then 20-year-old at a Miami hotel. In a statement, Falwell said his wife Becky had an affair with Granda, who later tried to extort them. 
Granda denies the accusation, telling Reuters that Jerry knew about the affair and would sometimes watch him and Becky together. Granda sharing phone conversations with Reuters, including this exchange from 2018. His new thing is like telling me every time he hooks up with people, like, <laughs> like I don't have feelings or something. You don't make a jealous, though. Yeah. Aww. All of this less than a month after Falwell posted and then deleted this photo on Instagram. Despite his defense that it was all in good fun, Liberty University put the 58-year-old on indefinite leave. In a statement Monday night, the school said additional matters came to light that made it clear that it would not be in the best interest of the university for him to return from leave. According to the university, Falwell responded by agreeing to resign immediately, but then instructed his attorneys not to send his resignation. In an interview with the Wall Street Journal late Monday, Falwell said he would indeed step down, acknowledging that some of his posts on social media had embarrassed the school. Liberty University says its new leaders are committed to being good stewards, while also offering heartfelt prayers to the Falwell family. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News. In today's quick hits, the cast of The West Wing is reuniting for a special on HBO Max. The episode will be recorded at the Orpheum Theater in Los Angeles and benefits the nonpartisan When We All Vote initiative. For the first time in decades, the Girl Scouts have a new look. The Fashion Institute of Technology collaborated with the Scouts for the outfits, adding functional changes to the entire collection. And General Mills will sell pouches of marshmallows from Lucky Charms starting next month. No cereal, just the marshmallows. The company says it'll be the first time they'll be available nationwide. Now to more fallout from the coronavirus, with some major layoffs about to take off from American Airlines. Here with the details, CNBC's Juliana Tattlebaum. Hi, Juliana. Good morning. Good morning, Philip. So American Airlines warned in July, you'll remember, that it would have to lay off up to 25,000 flight attendants, pilots, and other staff members this fall due to the steep decline in travel. Well, now the final number has come in, and it is lower than the initial 25,000 that was uh, it was touted, uh, but it is still a staggering 17,500. The CEO delivered the news yesterday saying, today is the hardest message we have had to share so far, the announcement of involuntary staff staffing reductions effective October 1st. Now, the only thing that could stop the layoffs is an extension of the payroll protection program the government approved earlier this year. The airline unions are fighting to extend the protection through March 31st. Now, in some lighter news, for the first time, McDonald's is spicing up a classic fan favorite, spicy chicken McNuggets and mighty hot sauce. They're also introducing a new Chips Ahoy McFlurry, which is going to be vanilla soft serve, caramels, topping, and Chips Ahoy cookie pieces. So very delicious. Now, both are going to be available September 16th at a, at a for limited time at participating locations. But here's the kicker. Wendy's had a pretty spicy response to the news, tweeting, it must have scraped up all of BK's leftovers and slapped a McPrice tag on it. <laughs> Back to you guys. It's making me want to try it even more, though. Yeah. With the back and forth. I love it. Yeah. I love it when these social media accounts just start uh, <laughs> yep, we're going right scrapping at it. it up. All right, Juliana, thank you. Good morning, everyone. The Louisiana coast, you're going to start to see impacts from Laura this afternoon, but the brunt of this is going to come in later on tonight. Look at Cameron, Louisiana, 104 miles per hour. Please know your zone and have a plan in place. We'll be right back. As Hurricane Laura continues to intensify in the Gulf this morning, the National Guard is gearing up to mobilize in what could be some of the hardest hit areas of Louisiana. They have set up regional headquarters in Lake Charles. Lake Charles is one of eight parishes under evacuation orders ahead of the hurricane. Our Jay Gray is there and Jay, now it looks like the come before the storm. Yeah, Francis, really calm here at this point, but we know that's going to change dramatically over the next several hours. Look, Louisiana, specifically here, Lake Charles, in the crosshairs right now, the current forecast track, the time to prepare, the time to evacuate, quickly running out here. Sandbags, boards, and building tensions along the Gulf Coast. Kind of nervous for Texas and the west side of Louisiana. That's where forecasters say Hurricane Laura will cross the shoreline. Millions in the strike zone on high alert right now. Brittany Thomas and her family locking down their house before landfall 
they'll ride it out. We've got water. We've got all kinds of supplies. I mean, basically where we're at, it's, it's equivalent to a bomb shelter, so I'm okay with that. But many across the region... Now it's time to go. ...are moving to higher ground in some areas by the bus load. But as families rush to shelters, the storm is not the only concern. Here we are in the middle of um, a possible um, hurricane and trying to actually think about COVID-2. Many areas are using more and larger facilities than in the past, making room for social distancing as the storm continues to churn in the Gulf. We expect the landfall to be just after midnight, Wednesday night into Thursday, and the high tide is at the same time as the expected landfall, so that's going to add additional water on top of that storm surge, a very dangerous situation developing. With Laura growing, gaining strength, and barreling toward the coast. Yeah, look, that storm surge expected to be between 9 and 13 feet at landfall, and that wall of water will pour into lakes and creeks and bayous here causing major problems inland. Back to you guys. Yeah, major problems in a time of pandemic as well. Jay, thank you. All right, let's bring you some good news as we end this day. I'm going to start yours. Uh, baby eastern black rhinoceros was born at the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden on Friday. And the fact that the mother and father rhinos have produced two calves so far is a big deal because the species is critically endangered. We're talking a 90% drop in just three generations here. Uh, now, unlike many animals, rhinos stay in the womb for 16 months, and that's why it makes this population growth so much slower. Uh, okay, well, great news all around. We'll take it. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment where we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news.
I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Amina, will look down from heaven and be proud. On the move, hundreds of thousands are evacuating as Hurricane Laura gains steam and readies for landfall in less than 24 hours. Violent uprisings in Kenosha overnight as the family of Jacob Blake reveals that he may be paralyzed after being shot in the back by police. Day two at the Republican convention drew out even more Trumps to speak before a national stage, including the night's keynote from the First Lady. And Jerry Falwell Jr.'s dramatic exit and multi-million dollar payout. A busy Wednesday ahead. Early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Philip Mena. I'm Francis Rivera. Breaking this morning, Hurricane Laura strengthens in the Gulf, rekindling fears for millions in Texas and Louisiana. Laura is now a Category 2 hurricane and could make landfall as a Category 3 storm on the anniversary of Hurricanes Harvey and Katrina, two of the most devastating hurricanes to hit those states. Residents are torn between hunkering down in their homes or evacuating, evacuating and riding out the storm in a safer area. Travis Guillory of KJRH has more on what coastal communities are doing. Those with homes and camps here on Vermilion Bay have been here pretty much since the weekend, trying to tie things down, boarding up windows, and elevating furniture and appliances to some upper levels. Many home and camp owners actually cleared out their bottom levels and opened their garages and all of the doors, so that way the water from the bay can actually flow through the house, which is actually going to cause less damage in the long run. But people here on the bay are not strangers to this. It's unfortunately one of the downfalls of choosing to live in a coastal community just feet away from the water. But with some still dealing with damage from Hurricane Barry last year, like Weldon Tequino, they expect what's going to be happening this week to be a lot worse, especially with the storm surge similar to Hurricane Rita from 2005. We had water three or four feet deep here on the road and, and wave action that did a lot of damage, brought in a tremendous amount of mud in our uh, workshops and garages and et cetera. So that would be the worst thing for us is the high water with the storm hitting to the west of us. And that was Travis Guillory of KJRH reporting. Let's turn now to NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb, who's tracking Hurricane Lauren. Janessa, where do you expect the storm to hit? You know, we're watching very closely the Texas and Louisiana border, but just happening in the last 30 minutes, we have a very healthy storm system. Hurricane Laura, now a Cat 2 hurricane. It has rapidly intensified in the last 24 hours. Right now, we are seeing sustained winds of 105 miles per hour. There's still that west-northwest movement at 17 miles per hour, and that is going to really be continuous uh, through the next uh, 24 hours. The cone of uncertainty has shrunk. But now we're expecting by this afternoon, it's going to sit in a warm body of water and really gain some more steam. Potentially a, ma a major hurricane turning into a Cat 3 by tonight and landfall expected possibility right now for Cameron, Louisiana to Lake Charles. It continues its trek and that's what's really going to cause the storm surge. We hope that land uh, acts as a, a letting it shred apart, but unfortunately we're not going to see that it still gains steam as it makes its way across the Mississippi Valley and then all the way into the Northeast. So watching the storm surge, that is going to be the big thing from New Orleans to Galveston, Texas, up to 7 to 11 feet. Guys. All right, Janessa, thank you so much for that update. And we have more breaking news from Wisconsin where protests have escalated again. There are reports of shots fired near a gas station. It's unclear who fired or if anyone was injured. Earlier, officers appeared to use a large cloud of tear gas to clear another street. This unrest began after police shot Jacob Blake in the back. At an emotional press conference, Blake's family gave an update on his condition. There is a chance that the 29-year-old may never walk again. Here's NBC's Dan Shenneman. Another uneasy night in Kenosha after the shooting of Jacob Blake. The 29-year-old was shot seven times in the back Sunday. The incident captured on video. His family says he is paralyzed from the waist down. He shot my son seven times, seven times. Like he didn't matter, but my son matters. Police have said little, 
calling it a domestic incident that involved a shooting. An investigation is ongoing. The shooting ignited two nights of protests in Kenosha, protests that began peacefully but grew violent and destructive. Never in a million years did I think that anything like this would ever happen in Kenosha. Never. After the sun came up, the smoke cleared. It was time to clean up while the family of Jacob Blake pleaded for calm. If Jacob knew what was going on as far as that goes, the violence and the destruction, he would be very unpleased. A family asking for prayers, a community in need of peace. Dan Sheneman, NBC News. There is more reaction from the sports world to the shooting of Jacob Blake. The Detroit Lions called off their practice, the team choosing to take a stand instead. You might step on some toes, you might rough some feathers, but uh, in, in order for change to happen, in order for something to happen, you know, someone has to be uncomfortable. And more NBA players are questioning their time in the bubble, with some considering a potential boycott. The bombastic case for a second term takes center stage as Vice President Mike Pence headlines night three of the Republican National Convention. Other big names include outgoing White House counselor Kellyanne Conway and Congressman Dan Crenshaw. Night two closed out on a decidedly softer note from First Lady Melania Trump. Since March, our lives have changed drastically. The invisible enemy, COVID-19, swept across our beautiful country. To those of you who want to stand up and fight the socialists poisoning our schools and burning our cities, join me in supporting President Trump. Let's rebuild America together. The Democrats want an America where your thoughts and opinions are censored when they do not align with their own. The Biden-Harris vision for America leaves no room for people of faith. The night also defied tradition in several ways. NBC's Alice Barr has more. America. Night two of the Republican National Convention showcasing the Trump presidency and shattering norms. In a display of presidential power, he pardoned a Nevada man who leads a prisoner reentry program. You have done incredible work. Thank you, sir. He also presided over an immigration naturalization ceremony. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in a break with tradition that prohibits mixing campaign politics and U.S. policy, endorsing President Trump while on an official trip to Jerusalem, where the president delivered on a controversial campaign promise to relocate the U.S. Embassy. The president, too, moved the U.S. Embassy to this very city of God, Jerusalem, the rightful capital of the Jewish homeland. Turning a more personal spotlight on President Trump, two of the president's children fiercely defending him. Make America Great Again is not a slogan for my father. It is what drives him to keep his promise of doing what is right for American citizens. And First Lady Melania Trump headlining the night with an address from the White House Rose Garden before a live audience, again breaking precedent by using the White House as a campaign backdrop. To mothers and parents everywhere, you are warriors. In my husband, you have a president who will not stop fighting for you and your families. Republicans hoping the First Lady will appeal to female voters in key battleground states. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. After a contentious resignation, Jerry Falwell Jr.'s liberty may have come up with a lump sum. The Wall Street Journal reports he could be owed a $10.5 million payout. According to a person close to Falwell with knowledge of his employment contract, he may be due his $1.25 million salary for the next two years, plus another $8 million of his responsibilities are reduced. A spokesman for Liberty University didn't respond to requests for comment from the paper. The evangelical leader resigned from the college his father founded under a cloud of scandal. Our Stephanie Gosk has the latest. Jerry Falwell Jr. took over Liberty University, one of the largest evangelical schools in the world, over a decade ago after his father's death. Now he tells the Wall Street Journal that a group of self-righteous people are behind the push to remove him. The university is saying it has accepted his resignation in the wake of multiple scandals. 
Reuters reported that the Falwells became entangled with Giancarlo Granda over eight years ago after meeting the then 20-year-old at a Miami hotel. In a statement, Falwell said his wife Becky had an affair with Granda, who later tried to extort them. Granda denies the accusation, telling Reuters that Jerry knew about the affair and would sometimes watch him and Becky together. Granda sharing phone conversations with Reuters, including this exchange from 2018. His new thing is like telling me every time he hooks up with people, like, <laughs> like I don't have feelings or something. You don't make yourself. Yeah. All of this less than a month after Falwell posted and then deleted this photo on Instagram. Despite his defense that it was all in good fun, Liberty University put the 58-year-old on indefinite leave. In a statement Monday night, the school said additional matters came to light that made it clear that it would not be in the best interest of the university for him to return from leave. According to the university, Falwell responded by agreeing to resign immediately, but then instructed his attorneys not to send his resignation. In an interview with the Wall Street Journal late Monday, Falwell said he would indeed step down, acknowledging that some of his posts on social media had embarrassed the school. Liberty University says its new leaders are committed to being good stewards, while also offering heartfelt prayers to the Falwell family. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News. Our NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb joins us once again with the very latest on Hurricane Laura. Yeah, good morning, you two. We knew, now have a Cat 2 hurricane and hurricane warnings that are in place for East Texas all the way into portions of central Louisiana. That means these warnings, take heed to them. It's going to be taking place later this afternoon into your evening. I think also potential for tomorrow morning as well. The storm surge along with rain on top of that up to three to five inches across Louisiana into the Mississippi Valley. That's a look at the big weather of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So our temperature is very warm, and that's going to fuel that storm. San Antonio today, 100 degrees, watching a few storms across Nashville this afternoon. Tampa today, 94, partly sunny skies across Orlando. We'll continue to look at impacts coming up, guys. All right, Janessa, thank you. Uh, McDonald's is spicing up its menu with the addition of two new items. One is spicy McNuggets. Uh, the other is Chips Ahoy McFlurry. It marks the first time that it's added a new type of McNugget to the menu in the United States. They'll be available nationwide for a limited time starting September 16th. Now, fast food competitor Wendy's, they weighed in on the new spicy McNuggets on Twitter, writing, must have scraped up all BK's leftovers and slapped them a price tag on it. You know, Man, that's <laughs> yeah, a dick. That is some shade there, but Wendy's has wow. some room to talk to. Wendy's spicy nuggets are no joke. No, they aren't. They aren't, them. but man, that is a low blow. Hey, it's a war. The fast food wars. Nugget there you go. Nugget <laughs> war right there. Leading the news, it's now been 166 days since police shot and killed Breonna Taylor in her own home. On Tuesday, hundreds of protesters took to the streets of Louisville, Kentucky, demanding justice. None of the officers who executed a no-knock warrant on Taylor's apartment in March has been charged. Two remain on the force, and a third has been fired. There is some good news in America's fight against coronavirus. According to data from Johns Hopkins University, coronavirus infections are falling. About 43,000 new cases are being reported daily across the country. That's down 21 percent from early August. The glimmer of hope comes as FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn is apologizing for comments he made about the benefits of convalescent plasma as a treatment for coronavirus. In a tweet, Hahn said, in part, I have been criticized for remarks I made Sunday night about the benefits of convalescent plasma. The criticism is entirely justified. Hahn was met with backlash from medical experts after stating that 35 lives out of every 100 people who get the treatment would survive the coronavirus. The North Dakota Health Department is urging those who attended the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally in South Dakota earlier this month to get tested and to monitor symptoms for coronavirus. More than 100 cases linked to the event have been found in eight states. More than 460,000 people and participants attended. Meanwhile, 13,000 fans will be allowed in Hard Rock Stadium in Florida for the Miami Dolphins and the Miami Hurricanes home openers this season amid the pandemic. The Dolphins announced the news in a tweet, adding that all fans will be required to wear a mask and smoking and tailgating will not be permitted. Here we are. Back to the movies. Back in the movie theater, everybody. Uh, 
I loved it. Tom Cruise sharing video there on social media of him attending a London screening of Christopher Nolan's new film, Tenet. The actor even gave his stamp of approval, telling a fan that he loved the movie. Tenet opens in more than 70 countries worldwide starting today. New York City has a new plan for its schools, public, private, and charter. Some classes will now be outside this fall, but how will that work? NBC's Kristen Dahlgren joins us now. Kristen, good morning. Good morning, Philip. Well, where I am in Vermont, they've been planning outdoor classrooms for a while. Getting kids outside is really a big part of the normal education, if you will. Uh, but it's not just rural areas that are now looking at this idea of bringing classes out a little bit more into nature. New York City actually trying to come up with its own plans. The city announced just on Monday that it would be allowing uh, schools to go outdoors for classrooms. By Tuesday morning, they had 243 schools that had already applied for this. So the response has absolutely been overwhelming. Principals have now been given until Friday, just until Friday, to try and come up with their school's plans. They're talking about having classes in parks, maybe blocking off streets and having the kids being able to spread out in the streets. I heard one principal talking about the possibility of talking to some restaurants that have outdoor dining spaces that they're not using during the day and maybe getting kids into those areas. So a lot of planning going on right now. Uh, all this is going on as the city is also saying that it's going to be testing every single classroom in New York City for ventilation. It's hoping to do that by next week. So a lot of moving parts, only a few weeks left until school starts. A lot of parents watching closely to see how this all evolves and whether or not their kids are going to be able to spread out outdoors and perhaps be a little bit safer from transmission, Philip. That's uncharted territory wow. for everybody, Kristen. Thank you. Yeah, and very, very complicated. It is a tight squeeze here in the city, yeah. more so with bikes, pedestrians, cars, everything out there. So too. many things complicated. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. In today's top stories, another night of unrest for Kenosha, Wisconsin. The governor said National Guard presence would be increased as protests escalate following the police shooting of Jacob Blake. There have been reports of shots fired overnight, but it is unclear who fired or if anyone is hurt. Blake's family gave an update on his condition. They say he is paralyzed from the waist down, though doctors aren't sure if it's permanent. The family is calling for the officers involved to be fired. Officials say cooler weather is helping firefighters in California. But as some evacuation orders are lifted, many people will not have a home to return to. At least 1,400 houses have been destroyed, and that number could grow to more than 3,000. At least seven people have died in the fires or fighting them. Now to a dream come true for Holocaust survivors. She created a new life in Connecticut, but one thing was missing until a school heard her story. Here's NBC's Katie Beck. At 88 years old, in a cap and gown, Miriam Schreiber savors a moment she's dreamed of for decades. Due to the events beyond my control, I was never able to get my high school diploma. This has been a profound regret of mine all my life. Schreiber's education disrupted by a desperate journey to survive the Holocaust. Her family living for years on the run, hiding from the Nazis, eventually sent to a slave labor camp in Siberia. And nobody would have faulted her for just giving up, but she didn't. Uh, she, of course, learned all the languages everywhere she went. Today, she's fluent in six, learning English when she immigrated to the United States to raise a family. The generations after live awed and inspired by her. Congratulations, buddy. This uh, honorary diploma uh, is, is well-deserved, and she certainly, in the school of life, has earned it. Perhaps a lesson that with perseverance and a grateful heart. It really means the world to me. Thank you so much. Our greatest moments are yet to come. Katie Beck, NBC News. Wow, perseverance and the will to survive right there and showing that right there it is never too late. Yeah, I can't imagine all the thoughts, all the memories that she had crossing her mind in that moment there. I mean, just what an incredible life lived. Uh, and six languages that she spoke. I mean, it just makes me think of all the people who we lost in the Holocaust yes. and what their lives could have been. And she's a glaring example of uh, all the achievements that can be accomplished. You know? Testament of something like yeah. that, too. So congratulations are well-deserved. That's right.
You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four year degree, but a four year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we could just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Residents along the Gulf Coast are bracing for potential devastation. Hurricane Laura gets set to make landfall tonight. It is intensifying rapidly and possibly ramping up to become a massive Category 4 hurricane. We've got complete coverage, but let's start with the man who's been following it all night long. Al, good morning. What do the maps show? Well, right now, guys, this is this is unfortunately coming to fruition the way we thought it would. Category two right now, they're in 15 miles south, southeast of Lake Charles. You can already see the feeder bands now pushing just to the south of Louisiana, 110 mile per hour winds moving northwest at 15. Category four storm by this afternoon around one o'clock. Winds and rain increased during the day from Corpus Christi all the way to New Orleans. Dangerous rain, wind gust, storm surge as this comes on shore Thursday morning around 1 a.m. Again, a category three, but don't worry about whether it's a three or four. It's going to cause major impacts. Catastrophic storm surge will make it up to 30 miles inland. 10 to 15 foot storm surge from Port Arthur into central Louisiana. 30 mile storm surge. That's almost to I-10. The storm surge is the water that gets piled up on top of the tides as those winds come in. It's the deadliest hurricane threat at three feet. That surge is considered life threatening, can cause major problems in a home by six feet. Those crashing waves push out the back walls of homes, breaking through doors and windows. Nine feet. This is where that surge can push further inland. Entire neighborhoods can be wiped out. Plus those destructive winds, damaging extreme winds could knock out 
power for days, guys. We're talking power outages. This is the outage potential map. You can see it goes all the way up into the Midwest as this system makes its way. And of course, the rain locally could be 15 inches of rain, widespread flash flooding, urban flooding, moderate to major river flooding as well. The closest we can compare this to, guys, is Hurricane Rita back in 2005. The surge went inland about 20 to 30 miles. This could actually go in 50 miles depending on this storm surge. So this is a very, very dangerous storm. We're going to continue to watch it. But again, don't pay attention to the categories. Pay attention to the impacts. Mm -hmm. Guys? Yeah, and what officials are telling you. Al, thank you very much. We move You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning, the coastal cities of Texas on edge. As Hurricane Laura looms just hours from making landfall. There will be a lot of devastation wrecked upon Texas as the storm sweeps through. Governor Greg Abbott warning residents to brace for a possible Category 4 hurricane, increasing the counties under a disaster declaration to nearly 60. Don't know where we're going, but we're going to get away, though. Laura's wind speeds expected to top triple digits, which could help fuel a potentially life-threatening 13-foot storm surge. The warning to residents, don't waste time, get out now. Some people may choose to stay at home, and I think that kind of scares me because we don't ever know what these storms could possibly bring. Most are listening. We've boarded the house now completely, and now we're just starting to haul away things that uh, we want to make sure survive. Some choosing to stay despite the threat of a major hurricane. We know that there's going to be an aftermath and there's going to be a lot of cleanup to do afterwards. And we think that it's important to stay around if we feel safe where we're at. Officials cautioning at a certain point, first responders can't save you. Don't doubt 911, no one's going to answer, okay? And you are on your own. Beaumont's mayor, Becky Ames, has led her now deserted city through many disruptive hurricanes. Wednesday night into Thursday, when this really ratchets up, what's keeping you up at night the most? Loss of life is the biggest um, concern that I would ever have when it comes to something like this. And there are fears, of course, of widespread power outages lasting for days. Governor Abbott here in Texas summoning some 9,000 utility workers with another 6,000 requested. And guys, you can expect them to be very busy over the coming days and potentially weeks. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Overnight, protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin turning deadly. Authorities clearing the streets after reports of gunshots. Police say at least two people are dead, one person injured. Hours earlier, the governor had declared a state of emergency, mobilizing more National Guard members. But some protesters ignored a curfew, authorities deploying tear gas. This was the third straight night of violent protests here, and this community is on edge. This is pathetic. This is pathetic for to happen in our country, and it's in the state of Wisconsin, and it's just anarchists going around and taking advantage of the situation. The chaos came despite Jacob Blake's family pleading for peaceful protests. He shot my son seven times, seven times. Like he didn't matter, but my son matters. His family is now demanding the officers involved in Sunday's shooting captured on the cell phone video be fired and the one who shot Blake in the back be arrested. The eyewitness who shot the video says he heard officers yell, drop the knife, but police haven't said if they ever recovered a weapon. He was not treated like a human that day. He was treated like some foreign object that didn't belong. Blake's family now says the 29-year-old spinal cord is severed and that he's paralyzed from the waist down, though doctors aren't sure it's permanent. Blake's mother tells us she'd last spoken to Jacob Sunday morning as he prepared to celebrate his son's eighth birthday. The boy was in the back seat when his father was shot. When you first walked into that hospital room and you saw your son, 
what went through your head? So many things. I was just so elated just simply being able to see him and he's alive. The U.S. Department of Justice is now assisting state authorities with the investigation. Wisconsin's Department of Justice says the officers are on administrative leave and are fully cooperating. Kenosha police officers do not wear body cameras, but the Blake family wants any dash cam footage or any other video of the incident released. Blake's family now plans to file a civil lawsuit. Now, over the last three days, the Kenosha Police Department has not commented, only to say that its officers were responding to a domestic incident. But again, two people dead, one person injured, following another night of unrest here, Savannah. All right, Gabe Gutierrez on a really devastating night there. Gabe, thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. First Lady Melania Trump solo in the spotlight with a strikingly different tone than her husband, offering condolences for those affected by the coronavirus pandemic and acknowledging how difficult it's been for millions of Americans. I know many people are anxious and some feel helpless. I want you to know you're not alone. Donald will not rest until he has done all he can to take care of everyone impacted by this terrible pandemic. Speaking from the newly renovated White House Rose Garden, the First Lady sharing her personal story. As an immigrant and a very independent woman, I understand what a privilege it is to live here and to enjoy the freedoms and opportunities that we have. And years after endorsing her husband's birther claims about Barack Obama, reflecting on the nation's racial unrest. I urge people to come together in a civil manner. I also ask people to stop the violence and looting being done in the name of justice and never make assumptions based on the color of a person's skin. The First Lady, whose Be Best campaign aims to combat cyberbullying, addressing how mean social media can be, while noting President Trump's unvarnished opinions. Total honesty is what we as citizens deserve from our president. Whether you like it or not, you always know what he's thinking. The president putting the powers of his office to work for his reelection from the unprecedented use of the White House grounds for his wife's convention speech to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo shattering a long-standing tradition that American diplomats do not participate in political conventions. Speaking from the site of an official trip to Jerusalem. President Trump has put his America First vision into action. It may not have made him popular in every foreign capital, but it's worked. The State Department insists Pompeo's partisan speech highlighting the president's policies was delivered in his personal capacity. President Trump also showcasing his pardon power, granting clemency to a convicted bank robber who founded a program that helps former inmates. As I grant John, I'm not sure you know this, a full pardon. And hosting a recorded naturalization ceremony for the primetime audience. So help me God. So help me God and helping celebrate their father, two of the president's children. As a recent graduate, I can relate to so many of you who might be looking for a job. My father built a thriving economy once, and believe me, he will do it again. I'd like to speak directly to my father. I miss working alongside you every single day, but I'm damn proud to be on the front lines of this fight. Eric Trump's message to his father last night. The First Lady's speech also drawing attention for the lack of social distancing of the Rose Garden and very limited mask wearing. At least some of those there were tested for the virus before attending, but the setup really seemed to minimize the threat of the pandemic. The president's top economic advisor earlier in the night even referring to it in the past tense. Savannah. All right, Peter. So we've had two nights down, two more to go. We're going to hear from the vice president tonight. But you can really tell a lot uh, by by watching the speakers who the campaign is trying to reach, where they think there's some fertile ground for their reelection strategy. What have you learned? 
Yes, and I think you're right. These first two nights have really been the sort of back and forth between those fiery speeches and trying to sell that softer version of the president, granting that pardon, hosting a naturalization ceremony for new citizens, all people of color. His kids speaking as well. The first lady's empathetic remarks. The goal here to both energize the base, to bring back those disaffected Republicans who may have been turned off by President Trump, and to speak directly to those suburban voters, particularly women who polls show have increasingly flocked to Joe Biden. Tonight, as you know, we're going to hear from the vice president, Mike Pence, the South Dakota governor, Christy Nome, and one of the president's fiercest defenders, Kellyanne Conway, just days before her departure from the White House. Savannah. All right, Peter, thank you. And a reminder, we'll have more on the first lady's message in our next half hour. And NBC's live coverage of the Republican National Convention continues tonight. And tomorrow we get started at 10 o'clock Eastern. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. It's long been said, maintain six feet of social distance. But depending on the circumstances, that might not be far enough. That's according to new research published in the British Medical Journal, finding COVID-19 particles can travel up to 26 feet. The viral particle concentrations can build up and infect somebody beyond that you know, magical six-foot ring we've been all talking about for the past couple months. When you talk, cough, breathe, or sneeze, two types of particles come out. Respiratory droplets fall quickly to the ground, most traveling no more than six feet. But aerosol particles can linger in the air for hours and travel even greater distances. Experts say it's useful to think of another type of aerosol, cigarette smoke. When it comes out of a smoker, it, it disperses, it doesn't fall to the ground like the droplets, and then... It does different things depending on the setting. If you're outdoors in a windy day, it goes away very quickly. Masks that fit well enough to filter out smoke may be even more important than washing hands. Researchers say aerosol transmission explains why so few super spreader events have been traced to outdoor gatherings. One of the biggest risk factors we have for this virus is time spent indoors. In fact, Nearly all of the outbreaks of three or more people occurred indoors. That's why air circulation in planes, offices and schools may be a critical factor. A government watchdog agency recently found over one third of public schools in the U.S. need improvements to their air systems for proper ventilation. Some districts are investing in new filters, but outdoor classrooms could be a simpler and safer solution. What I am shocked is that we don't have the National Guard basically setting up just open tents, just, just a roof with the sites open on all the schools around the country, you know, so that all the classes can be done outdoors. While in many circumstances, like being in a grocery store, restaurant, or even an airplane or an office space, there's only so much you can do to social distance. But experts say people should always avoid talking loudly and always wear a properly fitting mask whenever possible. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Giancarlo Granda is speaking out. In a statement to NBC News, Granda says the Falwells would have you believe that I seduced Becky into an affair without Jerry's knowledge and then spent the intervening seven years trying to extort them. Of course, the truth is they approached me. She invited me to their hotel room. Granda adding that as recently as last year, they participated in video calls where Mrs. Falwell was naked and Jerry was watching. Granda also calling Jerry Falwell Jr. a predator, alleging Falwell sent him an image of a Liberty University student exposing herself at their farm, calling it inappropriate conduct for someone overseeing the well-being of thousands of vulnerable and impressionable students. According to Reuters, the couple met Granda when he was 20 years old, working as a pool attendant at a Miami hotel. Just days after the story went public, Jerry Falwell Jr. is out as president and chancellor of Liberty University, the institution his father started in the 1970s. Falwell acknowledged his wife's affair with Granda to the Washington Examiner, calling it a fatal attraction type situation that led to extortion, but said he was not involved in the inappropriate personal relationship. Granda denies blackmailing the Falwells. 
In her first comments about the scandal, Becky Falwell tells the Associated Press she and her husband are more in love than ever, adding, we have the strongest relationship and Jerry is the most forgiving person I've ever met. In the same interview, Jerry Falwell claims he never broke a single rule that applies to staff members at Liberty, saying that's the only reason I resigned, because I don't want something my wife did to harm the school I've spent my whole life building. Falwell had been on an indefinite leave of absence from Liberty since early August after posting this now deleted photo on social media. In a statement Monday night, the school said additional matters came to light that made it clear that it would not be in the best interest of the university for him to return from leave. On Tuesday, the university said it had accepted Falwell's resignation effective immediately while offering heartfelt prayers to the Falwells, who are now dealing with a very public fall from grace. Jerry Falwell Jr. has not been reachable on this latest allegation. As for Granda, he also tells us he has not profited and doesn't intend to profit from telling this story. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. First Lady Melania Trump making her most personal appeal yet for her husband. I'm here because we need my husband to be our president and commander in chief for four more years. Looking to court a constituency President Trump has struggled with, suburban women. We must make sure that women are heard and that the American dream continues to thrive. For the first lady who spoke for more than 20 minutes, the speech was her longest to date and perhaps her most consequential. During the 2016 convention, Mrs. Trump was accused of lifting parts of Michelle Obama's speech from 2008. You do what you say you're going to do. And you do what you say. An aide was blamed for the mistake. This year, the first lady's advisors say she was heavily involved in writing the remarks. From the day that I met him, he has only wanted to make this country the best it can be. In her nearly four years at the White House, the First Lady has picked her moments to speak out carefully. Her largest initiative came in 2018 when she announced her Be Best anti-bullying campaign. Let us teach our children the difference between right and wrong and encourage them to be best in their individual paths in life. The move gained praise, but the first lady also faced questions about her husband's habit of tweeting insults at his rivals. I don't agree always what he posts, but his action is his action, and I tell him that. One of her loudest statements was not spoken at all, but rather these words written on the back of her jacket. I really don't care, do you? She wore it while visiting migrant children at the U.S.-Mexico border later explaining. It was for the people and for the left wing media who are criticizing me and I want to show them that I don't care. Melania Trump is often at her husband's side for critical moments on the world stage and at home, but she's also spoken out on her own. In 2018, saying she was blindsided by the zero tolerance policy, which led to family separations at the border, and more recently tweeting out an image of herself wearing a mask, weeks before her husband started wearing one in public. A Slovenian native and former model, the first lady did not immediately move move into the White House when her husband won the 2016 election, instead staying at Trump Tower in New York City to focus on her son, Barron. But according to former First Lady Laura Bush's chief of staff, once Mrs. Trump arrived in Washington, she quickly assumed a quiet but powerful presence. She's chosen to use her platform very strategically. And when she feels she can make a contribution without having to be the loudest voice in the room every day. Kristen, she really picks and chooses her moments. What do you expect her to do for the rest of the campaign? Do you think she'll be uh, high profile on the trail, even if it's a virtual one? Well, I think to some extent, Savannah, look, before the coronavirus hit, the first lady was expected to play a larger role on the trail than she did in 2016. You might recall she was for the most part out of sight then. Well, Mrs. Trump was expected to headline several fundraisers this spring. They got canceled because of the virus. Still, you can expect to see her engage in virtual campaign events, Savannah. For President Trump, she's really a key asset. She helps to humanize the president, and she's also defended him after some of his most controversial moment. So we'll be watching closely, Savannah. All right, Kristen, welcome with a closer look from the White House. Thanks, Kristen. 
You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Across the country, schools reversing their decision to hold in-person classes after COVID-19 outbreaks. At UNC Chapel Hill, classes abruptly halted just days after move-in. Students there not tested before coming back. But at Purdue University in Indiana, an unprecedented undertaking. Before all 40,000 students start classes this month, they're required to take a COVID test. Testing will be very, very important and will be a key element of protecting our, our college campuses. But unlike most COVID testing that involves a large, often uncomfortable swab, to get a sample from the back of the nose, Purdue students will just spit into this tiny tube, something they can do at home with this kit. The convenience of that, and so I think particularly for this generation of students, was a good one that allowed us to, to reach them where they were. Purdue is one of 65 schools working with Vault Health, formerly a men's health company, now offering this at-home COVID saliva test developed by Rutgers University. Is the saliva test a game changer? It is a game changer. First of all, it's a much easier test to administer. You're spitting into a tube, which just about everybody can do, even kids, and you're just giving us enough spit to be able to tell if there's virus in there. I ordered a kit from Vault's website. It arrived in two days. I have my materials here. What do I do? I set up a video okay, chat so with a clinician who made sure I did the test correctly. I made sure to not eat, drink, or put anything in my mouth for 30 minutes. So all you need to do now is go ahead and spit. Oh man, this is gonna take a while. I think the record was about 30 seconds. I was not so speedy. <laughs> How many times a day do you have to watch people do this? <laughs> Enough. <laughs> Two minutes later. Any tricks to this? Yeah, smelling pickles in a jar, thinking about food, smelling citrus. You should have told me to bring my pickles in a jar out sooner. I have nothing, I have nothing. All right, let me think about mouth-watering foods. I feel like it's working. It took some time to work right. up about a spoonful of saliva. Am I there? Oh, that's pretty good. Yes. You're there. A quick mix with a preservative to keep my sample fresh. Then I put it in a pre-addressed bag to be overnighted to the Rutgers lab in New Jersey. Vault says results are available in two to three days, a big advantage over swab tests that have seen delays up to 14 days. Vault's test is one of two strictly saliva tests given emergency authorization by the FDA. Yale University created the other one, but it's not an at-home test. How is this test better than what we've been seeing with the nasal swab? Well, the false negative rate is really what we're concerned with. Telling somebody that they're negative when actually they are sick is very dangerous. And so the saliva test has a 1% or even less than 1% false negative rate. But scientists caution there's not enough data yet to know how much virus is in saliva. They're generally very active accurate. They're probably a little bit less sensitive than the nasal swab, which is the term we use to mean that if people have very, very small amounts of virus, it's possible that the nasal swab would detect that, whereas the saliva wouldn't. The test is also pricey, $150 if you order it directly from the company. Right now, Vault is running about 80,000 tests a day, and they say as that number goes up, the cost will come down. For students like 18-year-old Clara Terry, who will be a freshman at Purdue, Spitting in the tube was easy. I've heard like with the nose one, um, like it hurts. This was not painful at all. Now, even though this test is done at home, a key part of Vault's test is you have to do it live over a video call with a clinician to ensure that you're doing it correctly and that it's your saliva. I got the results of my test two days later, negative. The PGA, <laughs> NBA, as you said, NHL are all among the pro sports leagues that are now using these saliva tests. And in large part, they're a lot easier and less invasive than that. I was going to say, no wonder the kids want them, but there's always a question of cost. So mm -hmm. how much would this cost? Yeah, it's $150, but it is open to anyone. So you just have to go on Vault's website and do that. So that means you don't have to be a professional athlete. You don't have to be a student. You can just clickety-clack and get the test? Yes, exactly. But the colleges and universities are investing millions of dollars. I mean, yeah. you're looking at 40,000 students at Purdue alone. They say it's a worthwhile investment to try to protect their students and staff. Okay, and is there a certain time frame, like students need to get this test by a certain time? For the Purdue students, they want them to take it within two weeks before going on uh. to campus. But as you know, Hoda, I mean, you could take the test, be negative, and then a few, day a few days later be positive. So yeah. there are limitations. Okay, all right, this is a good breakthrough. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. 
live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Residents along the Gulf Coast are bracing for potential devastation. Hurricane Laura gets set to make landfall tonight. It is intensifying rapidly and possibly ramping up to become a massive Category 4 hurricane. We've got complete coverage, but let's start with the man who's been following it all night long. Al, good morning. What do the maps show? Well, right now, guys, this is this is unfortunately coming to fruition the way we thought it would. Category two right now, they're in 15 miles south, southeast of Lake Charles. You can already see the feeder bands now pushing just to the south of Louisiana, 110 mile per hour winds moving northwest at 15. Category four storm by this afternoon around one o'clock. Winds and rain increased during the day from Corpus Christi all the way to New Orleans. Dangerous rain, wind gust, storm surge as this comes on shore Thursday morning around 1 a.m. Again, a category three, but don't worry about whether it's a three or four. It's going to cause major impacts. Catastrophic storm surge will make it up to 30 miles inland. 10 to 15 foot storm surge from Port Arthur into central Louisiana. 30 mile storm surge. That's almost to I-10. The storm surge is the water that gets piled up on top of the tides as those winds come in. It's the deadliest hurricane threat at three feet. That surge is considered life threatening, can cause major problems in a home. By six feet. Those crashing waves push out the back walls of homes, breaking through doors and windows. Nine feet. This is where that surge can push further inland. F entire neighborhoods can be wiped out. Plus those destructive winds, damaging extreme winds could knock out power for days, guys. We're talking power outages. This is the outage potential map. You can see it goes all the way up into the Midwest as this system makes its way. And of course, the rain locally could be 15 inches of rain 
widespread flash flooding, urban flooding, moderate to major river flooding as well. The closest we can compare this to, guys, is Hurricane Rita back in 2005. The surge went inland about 20 to 30 miles. This could actually go in 50 miles depending on this storm surge. So this is a very, very dangerous storm. We're going to continue to watch it. But again, don't pay attention to the categories. Pay attention to the impacts. Mm -hmm. Guys? Yeah, and what officials are telling you. Al, thank you very much. We move You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning, the coastal cities of Texas on edge. As Hurricane Laura looms just hours from making landfall. There will be a lot of devastation wrecked upon Texas as the storm sweeps through. Governor Greg Abbott warning residents to brace for a possible Category 4 hurricane, increasing the counties under a disaster declaration to nearly 60. Don't know where we're going, but we're going to get away, though. Laura's wind speeds expected to top triple digits, which could help fuel a potentially life-threatening 13-foot storm surge. The warning to residents, don't waste time, get out now. Some people may choose to stay at home, and I think that kind of scares me because we don't ever know what these storms could possibly bring. Most are listening. We've boarded the house now completely, and now we're just starting to haul away things that uh, we want to make sure survive. Some choosing to stay despite the threat of a major hurricane. We know that there's going to be an aftermath and there's going to be a lot of cleanup to do afterwards. And we think that it's important to stay around if we feel safe where we're at. Officials cautioning at a certain point, first responders can't save you. Don't doubt 911, no one's going to answer, okay? And you are on your own. Beaumont's mayor, Becky Ames, has led her now deserted city through many disruptive hurricanes. Wednesday night into Thursday, when this really ratchets up, what's keeping you up at night the most? Loss of life is the biggest um, concern that I would ever have when it comes to something like this. And there are fears, of course, of widespread power outages lasting for days. Governor Abbott here in Texas summoning some 9,000 utility workers with another 6,000 requested. And guys, you can expect them to be very busy over the coming days and potentially weeks. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Overnight, protest in Kenosha, Wisconsin turning deadly. Authorities clearing the streets after reports of gunshots. <laughs> Police say at least two people are dead, one person injured. Hours earlier, the governor had declared a state of emergency, mobilizing more National Guard members. But some protesters ignored a curfew, authorities deploying tear gas. This was the third straight night of violent protests here, and this community is on edge. This is pathetic. This is pathetic for to happen in our country, and it's in the state of Wisconsin, and it's just anarchists going around and taking advantage of the situation. The chaos came despite Jacob Blake's family pleading for peaceful protests. He shot my son. Seven times, seven times, like he didn't matter, but my son matters. His family is now demanding the officers involved in Sunday's shooting captured on the cell phone video be fired and the one who shot Blake in the back be arrested. The eyewitness who shot the video says he heard officers yell, drop the knife, but police haven't said if they ever recovered a weapon. He was not treated like a human that day. He was treated like some foreign object that didn't belong. Blake's family now says the 29-year-old spinal cord is severed and that he's paralyzed from the waist down, though doctors aren't sure it's permanent. Blake's mother tells us she'd last spoken to Jacob Sunday morning as he prepared to celebrate his son's eighth birthday. The boy was in the back seat when his father was shot. When you first walked into that hospital room and you saw your son, what went through your head? So many things. I was just so elated just simply 
being able to see him and he's alive. The U.S. Department of Justice is now assisting state authorities with the investigation. Wisconsin's Department of Justice says the officers are on administrative leave and are fully cooperating. Kenosha police officers do not wear body cameras, but the Blake family wants any dash cam footage or any other video of the incident released. Blake's family now plans to file a civil lawsuit. Now, over the last three days, the Kenosha Police Department has not commented, only to say that its officers were responding to a domestic incident. But again, two people dead, one person injured, following another night of unrest here, Savannah. All right, Gabe Gutierrez on a really devastating night there. Gabe, thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. First Lady Melania Trump solo in the spotlight with a strikingly different tone than her husband, offering condolences for those affected by the coronavirus pandemic and acknowledging how difficult it's been for millions of Americans. I know many people are anxious and some feel helpless. I want you to know you're not alone. Donald will not rest until he has done all he can to take care of everyone impacted by this terrible pandemic. Speaking from the newly renovated White House Rose Garden, the First Lady sharing her personal story. As an immigrant and a very independent woman, I understand what a privilege it is to live here and to enjoy the freedoms and opportunities that we have. And years after endorsing her husband's birther claims about Barack Obama, reflecting on the nation's racial unrest. I urge people to come together in a civil manner. I also ask people to stop the violence and looting being done in the name of justice and never make assumptions based on the color of a person's skin. The first lady whose Be Best campaign aims to combat cyberbullying, addressing how mean social media can be, while noting President Trump's unvarnished opinions. Total honesty is what we as citizens deserve from our president. Whether you like it or not, you always know what he's thinking. The president putting the powers of his office to work for his re-election. From the unprecedented use of the White House grounds for his wife's convention speech to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo shattering a long-standing tradition that American diplomats do not participate in political conventions. Speaking from the site of an official trip to Jerusalem. President Trump has put his America First vision into action. It may not have made him popular in every foreign capital, but it's worked. The State Department insists Pompeo's partisan speech highlighting the president's policies was delivered in his personal capacity. President Trump also showcasing his pardon power, granting clemency to a convicted bank robber who founded a program that helps former inmates. As I grant John, I'm not sure you know this, a full pardon and hosting a recorded naturalization ceremony for the primetime audience. So help me God. So help me God. And helping celebrate their father, two of the president's children. As a recent graduate, I can relate to so many of you who might be looking for a job. My father built a thriving economy once, and believe me, he will do it again. I'd like to speak directly to my father. I miss working alongside you every single day but I'm damn proud to be on the front lines of this fight. Eric Trump's message to his father last night. The First Lady's speech also drawing attention for the lack of social distancing of the Rose Garden and very limited mask wearing. At least some of those there were tested for the virus before attending, but the setup really seemed to minimize the threat of the pandemic. The president's top economic advisor earlier in the night even referring to it in the past tense. Savannah. All right, Peter. So we've had two nights down, two more to go. We're going to hear from the vice president tonight. But you can really tell a lot uh, by by watching the speakers who the campaign is trying to reach, where they think there's some fertile ground for their reelection strategy. What have you learned? 
Yes, and I think you're right. These first two nights have really been the sort of back and forth between those fiery speeches and trying to sell that softer version of the president, granting that pardon, hosting a naturalization ceremony for new citizens, all people of color. His kids speaking as well. The first lady's empathetic remarks. The goal here to both energize the base, to bring back those disaffected Republicans who may have been turned off by President Trump, and to speak directly to those suburban voters, particularly women who polls show have increasingly flocked to Joe Biden. Tonight, as you know, we're going to hear from the vice president, Mike Pence, the South Dakota governor, Kristi Noem, and one of the president's fiercest defenders, Kellyanne Conway, just days before her departure from the White House. Savannah. All right, Peter, thank you. And a reminder, we'll have more on the first lady's message in our next half hour. And NBC's live coverage of the Republican National Convention continues tonight. And tomorrow we get started at 10 o'clock Eastern. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. It's long been said, maintain six feet of social distance. But depending on the circumstances, that might not be far enough. That's according to new research published in the British Medical Journal, finding COVID-19 particles can travel up to 26 feet. The viral particle concentrations can build up and infect somebody beyond that you know, magical six-foot ring we've been all talking about for the past couple months. When you talk, cough, breathe, or sneeze, two types of particles come out. Respiratory droplets fall quickly to the ground, most traveling no more than six feet. But aerosol particles can linger in the air for hours and travel even greater distances. Experts say it's useful to think of another type of aerosol, cigarette smoke. When it comes out of a smoker, it, it disperses, it doesn't fall to the ground like the droplets, and then... It does different things depending on the setting. If you're outdoors in a windy day, it goes away very quickly. Masks that fit well enough to filter out smoke may be even more important than washing hands. Researchers say aerosol transmission explains why so few super spreader events have been traced to outdoor gatherings. One of the biggest risk factors we have for this virus is time spent indoors. In fact, Nearly all of the outbreaks of three or more people occurred indoors. That's why air circulation in planes, offices and schools may be a critical factor. A government watchdog agency recently found over one third of public schools in the U.S. need improvements to their air systems for proper ventilation. Some districts are investing in new filters, but outdoor classrooms could be a simpler and safer solution. What I am shocked is that we don't have the National Guard basically setting up just open tents, just, just a roof with the sides open on all the schools around the country, you know, so that all the classes can be done outdoors. While in many circumstances, like being in a grocery store, restaurant, or even an airplane or an office space, there's only so much you can do to social distance. But experts say people should always avoid talking loudly and always wear a properly fitting mask whenever possible. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Giancarlo Granda is speaking out. In a statement to NBC News, Granda says the Falwells would have you believe that I seduced Becky into an affair without Jerry's knowledge and then spent the intervening seven years trying to extort them. Of course, the truth is they approached me. She invited me to their hotel room. Granda adding that as recently as last year, they participated in video calls where Mrs. Falwell was naked and Jerry was watching. Granda also calling Jerry Falwell Jr. a predator, alleging Falwell sent him an image of a Liberty University student exposing herself at their farm, calling it inappropriate conduct for someone overseeing the well-being of thousands of vulnerable and impressionable students. According to Reuters, the couple met Granda when he was 20 years old, working as a pool attendant at a Miami hotel. Just days after the story went public, Jerry Falwell Jr. is out as president and chancellor of Liberty University, the institution his father started in the 1970s. Falwell acknowledged his wife's affair with Granda to the Washington Examiner, calling it a fatal attraction type situation that led to extortion, but said he was not involved in the inappropriate personal relationship. Granda denies blackmailing the Falwells. 
In her first comments about the scandal, Becky Falwell tells the Associated Press she and her husband are more in love than ever, adding, we have the strongest relationship and Jerry is the most forgiving person I've ever met. In the same interview, Jerry Falwell claims he never broke a single rule that applies to staff members at Liberty, saying that's the only reason I resigned, because I don't want something my wife did to harm the school I've spent my whole life building. Falwell had been on an indefinite leave of absence from Liberty since early August after posting this now deleted photo on social media. In a statement Monday night, the school said additional matters came to light that made it clear that it would not be in the best interest of the university for him to return from leave. On Tuesday, the university said it had accepted Falwell's resignation effective immediately while offering heartfelt prayers to the Falwells, who are now dealing with a very public fall from grace. Jerry Falwell Jr. has not been reachable on this latest allegation. As for Granda, he also tells us he has not profited and doesn't intend to profit from telling this story. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. First Lady Melania Trump making her most personal appeal yet for her husband. I'm here because we need my husband to be our president and commander in chief for four more years. Looking to court a constituency President Trump has struggled with, suburban women. We must make sure that women are heard and that the American dream continues to thrive. For the first lady who spoke for more than 20 minutes, the speech was her longest to date and perhaps her most consequential. During the 2016 convention, Mrs. Trump was accused of lifting parts of Michelle Obama's speech from 2008. You do what you say you're going to do. And you do what you say. An aide was blamed for the mistake. This year, the first lady's advisors say she was heavily involved in writing the remarks. From the day that I met him, He has only wanted to make this country the best it can be. In her nearly four years at the White House, the First Lady has picked her moments to speak out carefully. Her largest initiative came in 2018 when she announced her Be Best anti-bullying campaign. Let us teach our children the difference between right and wrong and encourage them to be best in their individual paths in life. The move gained praise, but the first lady also faced questions about her husband's habit of tweeting insults at his rivals. I don't agree always what he posts, but his action is his action, and I tell him that. One of her loudest statements was not spoken at all, but rather these words written on the back of her jacket. I really don't care, do you? She wore it while visiting migrant children at the U.S.-Mexico border later explaining. It was for the people and for the left wing media who are criticizing me and I want to show them that I don't care. Melania Trump is often at her husband's side for critical moments on the world stage and at home, but she's also spoken out on her own. In 2018, saying she was blindsided by the zero tolerance policy, which led to family separations at the border, and more recently tweeting out an image of herself wearing a mask, weeks before her husband started wearing one in public. A Slovenian native and former model, the first lady did not immediately move into the White House when her husband won the 2016 election, instead staying at Trump Tower in New York City to focus on her son, Barron. But according to former First Lady Laura Bush's chief of staff, once Mrs. Trump arrived in Washington, she quickly assumed a quiet but powerful presence. She's chosen to use her platform very strategically. And when she feels she can make a contribution without having to be the loudest voice in the room every day. Kristen, she really picks and chooses her moments. What do you expect her to do for the rest of the campaign? Do you think she'll be uh, high profile on the trail, even if it's a virtual one? Well, I think to some extent, Savannah, look, before the coronavirus hit, the first lady was expected to play a larger role on the trail than she did in 2016. You might recall she was for the most part out of sight then. Well, Mrs. Trump was expected to headline several fundraisers this spring. They got canceled because of the virus. Still, you can expect to see her engage in virtual campaign events, Savannah. For President Trump, she's really a key asset. She helps to humanize the president, and she's also defended him after some of his most controversial moment. So we'll be watching closely, Savannah. All right, Kristen, welcome with a closer look from the White House. Thanks, Kristen. 
You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Across the country, schools reversing their decision to hold in-person classes after COVID-19 outbreaks. At UNC Chapel Hill, classes abruptly halted just days after move-in. Students there not tested before coming back. But at Purdue University in Indiana, an unprecedented undertaking. Before all 40,000 students start classes this month, they're required to take a COVID test. Testing will be very, very important and will be a key element of protecting our, our college campuses. But unlike most COVID testing that involves a large, often uncomfortable swab to get a sample from the back of the nose, Purdue students will just spit into this tiny tube, something they can do at home with this kit. The convenience of that, and so I think particularly for this generation of students, was a good one that allowed us to, to reach them where they were. Purdue is one of 65 schools working with Vault Health, formerly a men's health company, now offering this at-home COVID saliva test developed by Rutgers University. Is the saliva test a game changer? It is a game changer. First of all, it's a much easier test to administer. You're spitting into a tube, which just about everybody can do, even kids, and you're just giving us enough spit to be able to tell if there's virus in there. I ordered a kit from Vault's website. It arrived in two days. I have my materials here. What do I do? I set up a video okay, chat so with a clinician who made sure I did the test correctly. The I made sure to not eat, drink, or put anything in my mouth for 30 minutes. So all you need to do now is go ahead and spit. Oh man, this is gonna take a while. I think the record was about 30 seconds. I was not so speedy. <laughs> How many times a day do you have to watch people do this? <laughs> Enough. <laughs> Two minutes later. Any tricks to this? Yeah, smelling pickles in a jar, thinking about food, smelling citrus. You should have told me to bring my pickles in a jar out sooner. I have nothing. I have nothing. All right, let me think about mouth-watering foods. I feel like it's working. It took some time to All work right. up about a spoonful of saliva. Am I there? Oh, that's pretty good. Yes. You're there. A quick mix with a preservative to keep my sample fresh. Then I put it in a pre-addressed bag to be overnighted to the Rutgers lab in New Jersey. Vault says results are available in two to three days, a big advantage over swab tests that have seen delays up to 14 days. Vault's test is one of two strictly saliva tests given emergency authorization by the FDA. Yale University created the other one, but it's not an at-home test. How is this test better than what we've been seeing with the nasal swab? Well, the false negative rate is really what we're concerned with. Telling somebody that they're negative when actually they are sick is very dangerous. And so the saliva test has a 1% or even less than 1% false negative rate. But scientists caution there's not enough data yet to know how much virus is in saliva. They're generally very active accurate. They're probably a little bit less sensitive than the nasal swab, which is the term we use to mean that if people have very, very small amounts of virus, it's possible that the nasal swab would detect that, whereas the saliva wouldn't. The test is also pricey, $150 if you order it directly from the company. Right now, Vault is running about 80,000 tests a day, and they say as that number goes up, the cost will come down. For students like 18-year-old Clara Terry, who will be a freshman at Purdue, Spitting in the tube was easy. I've heard like with the nose one, um, like it hurts. This was not painful at all. Now, even though this test is done at home, a key part of Vault's test is you have to do it live over a video call with a clinician to ensure that you're doing it correctly and that it's your saliva. I got the results of my test two days later, negative. The PGA, <laughs> NBA, as you said, NHL are all among the pro sports leagues that are now using these saliva tests. And in large part, they're a lot easier and less invasive than that. I was going to say, no wonder the kids want them, but there's always a question of cost. So mm -hmm. how much would this cost? Yeah, it's $150, but it is open to anyone. One, so you just have to go on Vault's website and do that. So that means you don't have to be a professional athlete, you don't have to be a student, you can just clickety-clack and get the test? Yes, exactly. But the colleges and universities are investing millions of dollars. I mean, you're yeah. looking at 40,000 students at Purdue alone. They say it's a worthwhile investment to try to protect their students and staff. Okay, and is there a certain time frame, like students need to get this test by a certain time? For the Purdue students, they want them to take it within two weeks before going on uh. to campus. But as you know, Hoda, I mean, you could take the test, be negative, and then a few, day a few days later be positive. So yeah. there are limitations. Okay, all right, this is a good breakthrough. Well, right 
now, guys, this is this is unfortunately coming to fruition the way we thought it would. Category two right now. They're in 15 miles south southeast of Lake Charles. You can already see the feeder bands now pushing just to the south of Louisiana. 110 mile per hour winds moving northwest at 15. Category four storm by this afternoon around one o'clock. Winds and rain increased during the day from Corpus Christi all the way to New Orleans. Dangerous rain, wind gust, storm surge as this comes on shore Thursday morning around 1 a.m. Again, a category three, but don't worry about whether it's a three or four. It's going to cause major impacts. Catastrophic storm surge will make it up to 30 miles inland. 10 to 15 foot storm surge from Port Arthur into central Louisiana. 30 mile storm surge. That's almost to I-10. The storm surge is the water that gets piled up on top of the tides as those winds come in. It's the deadliest hurricane threat at three feet. That surge is considered life threatening, can cause major problems in a home. By six feet, those crashing waves push out the back walls of homes, breaking through doors and windows. Nine feet, this is where that surge can push further inland. Entire neighborhoods can be wiped out. Plus those destructive winds, damaging extreme winds could knock out power for days, guys. We're talking power outages. This is the outage potential map. You can see it goes all the way up into the Midwest as this system makes its way. And of course, the rain locally could be 15 inches of rain, widespread flash flooding, urban flooding, moderate to major river flooding as well. The closest we can compare this to, guys, is Hurricane Rita back in 2005. The surge went inland about 20 to 30 miles. This could actually go in 50 miles, depending on this storm surge. So this is a very, very dangerous storm. We're going to continue to watch it. But again, don't pay attention to the categories. Pay attention to the impacts. Mm -hmm. Guys? Yeah, and what officials are telling you. Al, thank you very much. We move. This morning, the coastal cities of Texas on edge as Hurricane Laura looms just hours from making landfall. There will be a lot of devastation wrecked upon Texas as the storm sweeps through. Governor Greg Abbott warning residents to brace for a possible Category 4 hurricane, increasing the counties under a disaster declaration to nearly 60. Don't know where we're going, but we're going to get away, though. Laura's wind speeds expected to top triple digits, which could help fuel a potentially life-threatening 13-foot storm surge. The warning to residents, don't waste time, get out now. Some people may choose to stay at home, and I think that kind of scares me because we don't ever know what these storms could possibly bring. Most are listening. We've boarded the house now completely, and now we're just starting to haul away things that uh, we want to make sure survive. Some choosing to stay despite the threat of a major hurricane. We know that there's going to be an aftermath and there's going to be a lot of cleanup to do afterwards. And we think that it's important to stay around if we feel safe where we're at. Officials cautioning at a certain point, first responders can't save you. Don't doubt 911, no one's going to answer, okay? and you are on your own. Beaumont's mayor, Becky Ames, has led her now deserted city through many disruptive hurricanes. Wednesday night into Thursday, when this really ratchets up, what's keeping you up at night the most? Loss of life is the biggest um, concern that I would ever have when it comes to something like this. And there are fears, of course, of widespread power outages lasting for days. Governor Abbott here in Texas summoning some 9,000 utility workers with another 6,000 requested. And guys, you can expect them to be very busy over the coming days and potentially weeks. First Lady Melania Trump solo in the spotlight with a strikingly different tone than her husband, offering condolences for those affected by the coronavirus pandemic and acknowledging how difficult it's been for millions of Americans. I know many people are anxious and some feel helpless. I want you to know you're not alone. Donald will not rest until he has done all he can to take care of everyone impacted by this terrible pandemic. Speaking from the newly renovated White House Rose Garden, the First Lady sharing her personal story. As an immigrant and a very independent woman, 
I understand what a privilege it is to live here and to enjoy the freedoms and opportunities that we have. And years after endorsing her husband's birther claims about Barack Obama, reflecting on the nation's racial unrest. I urge people to come together in a civil manner. I also ask people to stop the violence and looting being done in the name of justice and never make assumptions based on the color of a person's skin. The first lady whose Be Best campaign aims to combat cyberbullying, addressing how mean social media can be, while noting President Trump's unvarnished opinions. Total honesty is what we as citizens deserve from our president. Whether you like it or not, you always know what he's thinking. The president putting the powers of his office to work for his re-election. From the unprecedented use of the White House grounds for his wife's convention speech to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo shattering a long-standing tradition that American diplomats do not participate in political conventions. Speaking from the site of an official trip to Jerusalem. President Trump has put his America First vision into action. It may not have made him popular in every foreign capital, but it's worked. The State Department insists Pompeo's partisan speech highlighting the president's policies was delivered in his personal capacity. President Trump also showcasing his pardon power, granting clemency to a convicted bank robber who founded a program that helps former inmates. As I grant John, I'm not sure you know this, a full pardon. And hosting a recorded naturalization ceremony for the primetime audience. So help me God. So help me God and helping celebrate their father, two of the president's children. As a recent graduate, I can relate to so many of you who might be looking for a job. My father built a thriving economy once, and believe me, he will do it again. I'd like to speak directly to my father. I miss working alongside you every single day, but I'm damn proud to be on the front lines of this fight. Eric Trump's message to his father last night. The First Lady's speech also drawing attention for the lack of social distancing of the Rose Garden and very limited mask wearing. At least some of those there were tested for the virus before attending, but the setup really seemed to minimize the threat of the pandemic. The president's top economic advisor earlier in the night even referring to it in the past tense. Savannah. All right, Peter. So we've had two nights down, two more to go. We're going to hear from the vice president tonight. But you can really tell a lot uh, by, by watching the speakers who the campaign is trying to reach, where they think there's some fertile ground for their reelection strategy. What have you learned? Yes, and I think you're right. These first two nights have really been the sort of back and forth between those fiery speeches and trying to sell that softer version of the president, granting that pardon, hosting a naturalization ceremony for new citizens, all people of color. His kids speaking as well. The first lady's empathetic remarks. The goal here to both energize the base, to bring back those disaffected Republicans who may have been turned off by President Trump and to speak directly to those suburban voters, particularly women who polls show have increasingly flocked to Joe Biden to Tonight, as you know, we're going to hear from the vice president, Mike Pence, the South Dakota governor, Christy Nome, and one of the president's fiercest defenders, Kellyanne Conway, just days before her departure from the White House. Savannah. All right, Peter, thank you. And a reminder, we'll have more on the first lady's message in our next half hour. And NBC's live coverage of the Republican National Convention continues tonight. And tomorrow we get started at 10 o'clock Eastern. First Lady Melania Trump making her most personal appeal yet for her husband. I'm here because we need my husband to be our president and commander in chief for four more years. Looking to court a constituency President Trump has struggled with, suburban women. We must make sure that women are heard and that the American dream continues to thrive. For the first lady who spoke for more than 20 minutes, the speech was her longest to date and perhaps her most consequential. During the 2016 convention, Mrs. Trump was accused of lifting parts of Michelle Obama's speech from 2008. You do what you say you're going to do. you do what you say. An aide was blamed for the mistake. This year, the first lady's advisors say she was heavily involved in writing the remarks. From the day that I met him, 
He has only wanted to make this country the best it can be. In her nearly four years at the White House, the First Lady has picked her moments to speak out carefully. Her largest initiative came in 2018 when she announced her Be Best anti-bullying campaign. Let us teach our children the difference between right and wrong and encourage them to be best in their individual paths in life. The move gained praise, but the first lady also faced questions about her husband's habit of tweeting insults at his rivals. I don't agree always what he posts, but his action is his action, and I tell him that. One of her loudest statements was not spoken at all, but rather these words written on the back of her jacket. I really don't care, do you? She wore it while visiting migrant children at the U.S.-Mexico border later explaining. It was for the people and for the left-wing media who are criticizing me and I want to show them that I don't care. Melania Trump is often at her husband's side for critical moments on the world stage and at home, but she's also spoken out on her own. In 2018, saying she was blindsided by the zero tolerance policy, which led to family separations at the border, and more recently tweeting out an image of herself wearing a mask, weeks before her husband started wearing one in public. A Slovenian native and former model, the first lady did not immediately move into the White House when her husband won the 2016 election, instead staying at Trump Tower in New York City to focus on her son, Barron. But according to former First Lady Laura Bush's chief of staff, once Mrs. Trump arrived in Washington, she quickly assumed a quiet but powerful presence. She's chosen to use her platform very strategically. And when she feels she can make a contribution without having to be the loudest voice in the room every day. Kristen, she really picks and chooses her moments. What do you expect her to do for the rest of the campaign? Do you think she'll be uh, high profile on the trail, even if it's a virtual one? Well, I think to some extent, Savannah, look, before the coronavirus hit, the first lady was expected to play a larger role on the trail than she did in 2016. You might recall she was for the most part out of sight then. Well, Mrs. Trump was expected to headline several fundraisers this spring. They got canceled because of the virus. Still, you can expect to see her engage in virtual campaign events, Savannah. For President Trump, she's really a key asset. She helps to humanize the president, and she's also defended him after some of his most controversial moment. So we'll be watching closely, Savannah. All right, Kristen Walker with a closer look from the White House. Thanks, Kristen. We all know Donald Trump makes no secrets about how he feels about things. Whether you like it or not, you always know what he's thinking. My deepest sympathy goes out to everyone who has lost a loved one. And my prayers are with those who are ill or suffering. The president has held China accountable for covering up the China virus and allowing it to spread death and economic destruction in America and around the world. Presidential leadership came swiftly and effectively with an extraordinary rescue for health and safety to successfully fight the COVID virus. Our economic health is coming back. With emergency spending and tax cuts, Americans are going back to work. And the economy soared to new heights, heights never seen before. Wages went through the roof. Unemployment reached the historic lows, especially for black Americans, Hispanic Americans, and women. Trade deals were ripped up and renegotiated. Lights were turned back on in abandoned factories across our country. As a recent graduate, I can relate to so many of you who might be looking for a job. My father built a thriving economy once, and believe me, he will do it again. I learned what was happening to me had a name. It was called being canceled, as in annulled, as in revoked, as in made void. Cancelled is what's happening to people around this country who refuse to be silenced by the far left. Many are being fired, humiliated, or even threatened. But I would not be cancelled. Let's make America great again. We believe in freedom of thought and expression. Think what you want. Seek out the truth. Learn from those with different opinions. And then freely make your voice heard to the world. 
Joe Biden is a politician who has been in government for 47 years. He's a career politician who's never signed the front of a check and does not know the slightest thing about the American worker or the American business. Compare President Trump with the disastrous record of Joe Biden, who's consistently called for more war. Joe Biden voted for the Iraq War, which President Trump has long called the worst geopolitical mistake of our generation. In the Middle East, when Iran threatened, the president approved a strike that killed the Iranian terrorist, Qasem Soleimani. Moving the embassy to Jerusalem, peace in the Middle East. Today, because of the president's determination and leadership, the ISIS caliphate is wiped out. It's gone. In North Korea, the president lowered the temperature and against all odds got the North Korean leadership to the table. No nuclear tests, no long-range missile tests. I have reflected on the racial unrest in our country. It is a harsh reality that we are not proud of parts of our history, focused on our future while still learning from our past. We must remember that today we are all one community comprised of many races, religions, and ethnicities. Our diverse and storied history is what makes our country strong, and yet we still have so much to learn from one another. With that in mind, I like to call on the citizens of this country to take a moment, pause, and look at things from all perspectives. I urge people to come together in a civil manner so we can work and live up to our standard American ideals. Overnight, protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin turning deadly. Authorities clearing the streets after reports of gunshots. Police say at least two people are dead, one person injured. Hours earlier, the governor had declared a state of emergency, mobilizing more National Guard members. But some protesters ignored a curfew, authorities deploying tear gas. This was the third straight night of violent protests here, and this community is on edge. This is pathetic. This is pathetic for to happen in our country, and it's in the state of Wisconsin, and it's just anarchists going around and taking advantage of the situation. The chaos came despite Jacob Blake's family pleading for peaceful protest. He shot my son seven times. Seven times. Like he didn't matter. But my son matters. His family is now demanding the officers involved in Sunday's shooting captured on the cell phone video be fired and the one who shot Blake in the back be arrested. The eyewitness who shot the video says he heard officers yell, drop the knife, but police haven't said if they ever recovered a weapon. He was not treated like a human that day. He was treated like some foreign object that didn't belong. Blake's family now says the 29-year-old spinal cord is severed and that he's paralyzed from the waist down, though doctors aren't sure it's permanent. Blake's mother tells us she'd last spoken to Jacob Sunday morning as he prepared to celebrate his son's eighth birthday. The boy was in the back seat when his father was shot. When you first walked into that hospital room and you saw your son, what went through your head? So many things. I was just so elated just simply being able to see him and he's alive. The U.S. Department of Justice is now assisting state authorities with the investigation. Wisconsin's Department of Justice says the officers are on administrative leave and are fully cooperating. Kenosha police officers do not wear body cameras, but the Blake family wants any dash cam footage or any other video of the incident released. Blake's family now plans to file a civil lawsuit. Now, over the last three days, the Kenosha Police Department has not commented, only to say that its officers were responding to a domestic incident. But again, two people dead, one person injured, following another night of unrest here, Savannah. All right, Gabe Gutierrez on a really devastating night there. Gabe, thank you.
It's long been said, maintain six feet of social distance. But depending on the circumstances, that might not be far enough. That's according to new research published in the British Medical Journal, finding COVID-19 particles can travel up to 26 feet. The viral particle concentrations can build up and infect somebody beyond that you know, magical six foot ring we've been all talking about for the past couple months. When you talk, cough, breathe, or sneeze, two types of particles come out. Respiratory droplets fall quickly to the ground, most traveling no more than six feet. But aerosol particles can linger in the air for hours and travel even greater distances. Experts say it's useful to think of another type of aerosol, cigarette smoke. When it comes out of a smoker, it, it disperses, it doesn't fall to the ground like the droplets, and then it does different things depending on the setting. If you're outdoors in a windy day, it goes away very quickly. Masks that fit well enough to filter out smoke may be even more important than washing hands. Researchers say aerosol transmission explains why so few super spreader events have been traced to outdoor gatherings. One of the biggest risk factors we have for this virus is time spent indoors. In fact, Nearly all of the outbreaks of three or more people occurred indoors. That's why air circulation in planes, offices and schools may be a critical factor. A government watchdog agency recently found over one third of public schools in the U.S. need improvements to their air systems for proper ventilation. Some districts are investing in new filters, but outdoor classrooms could be a simpler and safer solution. What I am shocked is that we don't have the National Guard basically setting up just open tents, just, just a roof with the sides open on all the schools around the country, you know, so that all the classes can be done outdoors. While in many circumstances, like being in a grocery store, restaurant, or even an airplane or an office space, there's only so much you can do to social distance. But experts say people should always avoid talking loudly and always wear a properly fitting mask whenever possible. Giancarlo Granda is speaking out. In a statement to NBC News, Granda says the Falwells would have you believe that I seduced Becky into an affair without Jerry's knowledge and then spent the intervening seven years trying to extort them. Of course, the truth is they approached me. She invited me to their hotel room. Granda adding that as recently as last year, they participated in video calls where Mrs. Falwell was naked and Jerry was watching. Granda also calling Jerry Falwell Jr. a predator, alleging Falwell sent him an image of a Liberty University student exposing herself at their farm, calling it inappropriate conduct for someone overseeing the well-being of thousands of vulnerable and impressionable students. According to Reuters, the couple met Granda when he was 20 years old, working as a pool attendant at a Miami hotel. Just days after the story went public, Jerry Falwell Jr. is out as president and chancellor of Liberty University, the institution his father started in the 1970s. Falwell acknowledged his wife's affair with Granda to the Washington Examiner, calling it a fatal attraction type situation that led to extortion, but said he was not involved in the inappropriate personal relationship. Granda denies blackmailing the Falwells. In her first comments about the scandal, Becky Falwell tells the Associated Press she and her husband are more in love than ever, adding, we have the strongest relationship and Jerry is the most forgiving person I've ever met. In the same interview, Jerry Falwell claims he never broke a single rule that applies to staff members at Liberty, saying that's the only reason I resigned, because I don't want something my wife did to harm the school I've spent my whole life building. Falwell had been on an indefinite leave of absence from Liberty since early August after posting this now deleted photo on social media. In a statement Monday night, the school said additional matters came to light that made it clear that it would not be in the best interest of the university for him to return from leave. On Tuesday, the university said it had accepted Falwell's resignation effective immediately while offering heartfelt prayers to the Falwells, who are now dealing with a very public fall from grace. Jerry Falwell Jr. has not been reachable on this latest allegation. As for Granda, he also tells us he has not profited and doesn't intend to profit from telling this story.
So, Dr. Azar, let's start with you. I wanted to squeeze this in here because it's a hot topic today. On Monday, uh, the CDC reversed guidance on COVID-19 testing, uh, now stating that healthy people who've been exposed for at least 15 minutes still do not necessarily need a test if they don't have symptoms. So this excludes, obviously, vulnerable people like the elderly and those with chronic medical conditions. Uh, and state and local health officials may still recommend a test. But a lot of people are buzzing about it, even here in the studio, what that means uh, for keeping transmission from increasing. Yeah, so I think one of the biggest concerns, Chanel, is that contact tracing efforts could very well be compromised by this. Mm. It appears that that part of the rationale behind this guideline is that if you are an exposed individual, individual, you're supposed to quarantine for 14 days. That hasn't changed. But the difference here is that what about your contacts, right? If you are exposed and you get tested and you test positive, your contacts need to go into quarantine, right? Mm -hmm. Or potentially get tested themselves. So if you're only going into quarantine, but you're not necessarily getting tested, we don't know about what's happening in terms of your potential to spread to others. We've talked about this a lot. Asymptomatic transmission is a very, 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 very real thing. That, I think, is one of the biggest concerns to come out of this. I think we'll be hearing about this for a couple of days. Absolutely. It seems like there's a gap there. All right. Let me ask you about the flu shot. This is a big deal. When yeah. should you get it? Will we have to worry about shortages? There are a lot of people, I promise you, who are watching right now who normally don't get one. You know, you're supposed right. to, but you just don't feel like dealing. But this year, I think people, you know, more people will be prone to get it. Yeah. Absolutely, Chanel. This year, more than ever, we are encouraging people to get their flu shots. For adults, remember, it decreases severity of illness, and it also reduces hospitalizations, which is so important because we need to preserve our resources given the underlying or overshadowing, I should say, COVID-19 pandemic. And for children especially, it's important. The flu shot can reduce mortality. In terms of when to get it, you know, experts generally say if you're if you're otherwise healthy, around September is appropriate. If you're older or have underlying medical conditions or are compromised, maybe you wait a little bit longer to early October. But by the end of October, CDC wants most people vaccinated. In terms of shortages, in the anticipation of this twindemic that we might have, uh, flu production has been ramped up, so we don't anticipate any shortages. I have time for one more question. Causing some confusion is that there's overlap in COVID-19 and flu symptoms. Mm -hmm. Can you quickly walk us through what those viruses have in common and then hit what seems to be distinct differences? Differences? Yeah. So I think it's kind of easy if you look at the graphic of, of symptoms. There's probably more similarity than differences. We're talking fever, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, sore throat, headache, GI symptoms. Both flu and COVID share those. And a test might be the only thing that can distinguish them in certain cases. But as we've learned with COVID, it's a very protean bug. That means it presents in a variety of different ways, particularly that loss of taste and smell that was so illuminating in the spring. But I think a few other aspects of it, just from an epidemiological perspective, you're probably contagious a little while longer with COVID than you are with flu. The incubation period is longer, two to 14 days, as opposed to one to four days with flu. And of course, the big thing with aerosol transmission, the concern about super spreading events, especially in small, enclosed, poorly ventilated areas, Areas that is a concern with COVID and not necessarily with flu. Oh, Dr. Azar, I wish we were talking about a happier topic, but it's, it's an important topic. I miss seeing your face. It's good to talk to you this morning. You too. All right. <laughs> Dylan, I'm just like, oh. I know. I think everybody <laughs> has that sentiment, Chanel. So yeah. there, there are a number of ways to get a flu shot this year. Vicki Wynn is here to let us know how. And Vicki, I know I always get my flu shot at work. Calvin, you know, and, and the kids, when they go to their doctor, they just end up getting a flu shot. Is it is it going to be the same this year? Things will be a little different this year, Dylan, because a lot of offices are still closed. So we're used to getting their flu shot at work. That may not be an option. The good news is tons of other places to get your flu shot. Walgreens, CVS, both saying they're anticipating 50 to 100 percent increases wow. in the number of people who want to get a flu shot, but they are prepared to meet that demand. If you are going to go to your doctor or pediatrician, ask if you can all get the shot at the same time. That helps to reduce the number of visits that you have to take to the doctor. And also check a website called vaccinefinder.org for locations that are near you. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people staying out of the doctor's office because they don't want to contract COVID-19. So, how do people stay safe when they are finally going to get the flu shot? Yeah, first thing, very important to call ahead and figure out what is the protocol. A lot of places are taking appointment only. Some will offer walk-in, but you need to be prepared. Ask if you can fill out any of those forms ahead of time electronically so you can limit your time in the office. 
Be prepared to wear a mask. And a lot of offices are asking you to stay outside or in your car until it's your turn to come in. Of course, you're going to want to wash your hands and make sure that you limit your time in that office. Try to get the first appointment of the day if you can. Mm -hmm. and, and what about cost? You know, because so many people are doing it a little bit differently this year, will there be an added cost? So generally, if you do have insurance, the good news here is that it will be covered. Your flu shot will not cost you a penny. You can also do a Google search or an internet search of uh, free flu shots in your area, your city, or your county. And also, Think if you're a college student and you are on campus, a lot of those campuses have free flu shots. Veterans, same thing. Go to your local VA. That's just going to be for the veteran, though, not the rest of the family. And if you don't have insurance, check GoodRx.com. They will have a location of free flu shots in the area. I also want to remind people, Costco, $19.99. You don't even have to be a member, and that's if you don't have insurance. Mm -hmm. And for our seniors, bring your ID. Ask about that senior discount. Wow, really good advice. Mm -hmm. Saving us money and... Saving our health, too. Yes, thank always. you very much, Vicki and Dr. Natalie Azar. Thank you as well. Across the country, schools reversing their decision to hold in-person classes after COVID-19 outbreaks. At UNC Chapel Hill, classes abruptly halted just days after move-in. Students there not tested before coming back. But at Purdue University in Indiana, an unprecedented undertaking before all 40,000 students start classes this month, they're required to take a COVID test. Testing will be very, very important and will be a key element of protecting our, our college campuses. But unlike most COVID testing that involves a large, often uncomfortable swab to get a sample from the back of the nose, Purdue students will just spit into this tiny tube, something they can do at home with this kit. The convenience of that, and so I think particularly for this generation of students, it was a good one that allowed us to, to reach them where they were. Purdue is one of 65 schools working with Vault Health, formerly a men's health company, now offering this at-home COVID saliva test developed by Rutgers University. Is the saliva test a game changer? It is a game changer. First of all, it's a much easier test to administer. You're spitting into a tube, which just about everybody can do, even kids, and you're just giving us enough spit to be able to tell if there's virus in there. I ordered a kit from Vault's website. It arrived in two days. I have my materials here. What do I do? I set up a video okay, chat so with a clinician who made sure I did the test correctly. The I made sure to not eat, drink, or put anything in my mouth for 30 minutes. So all you need to do now is go ahead and spit. Oh man, this is gonna take a while. I think the record was about 30 seconds. I was not so speedy. <laughs> How many times a day do you have to watch people do this? <laughs> Enough. <laughs> Two minutes later. Any tricks to this? Yeah, smelling pickles in a jar, thinking about food, smelling citrus. You should have told me to bring my pickles in a jar out sooner. I have nothing. I have nothing. All right, let me think about mouth-watering foods. I feel like it's working. It took some time to All work right. up about a spoonful of saliva. Am I there? Oh, that's pretty good. Yes. You're there. A quick mix with a preservative to keep my sample fresh. Then I put it in a pre-addressed bag to be overnighted to the Rutgers lab in New Jersey. Vault says results are available in two to three days, a big advantage over swab tests that have seen delays up to 14 days. Vault's test is one of two strictly saliva tests given emergency authorization by the FDA. Yale University created the other one, but it's not an at-home test. How is this test better than what we've been seeing with the nasal swab? Well, the false negative rate is really what we're concerned with. Telling somebody that they're negative when actually they are sick is very dangerous. And so the saliva test has a 1% or even less than 1% false negative rate. But scientists caution there's not enough data yet to know how much virus is in saliva. They're generally very active accurate. They're probably a little bit less sensitive than the nasal swab, which is the term we use to mean that if people have very, very small amounts of virus, it's possible that the nasal swab would detect that, whereas the saliva wouldn't. The test is also pricey, $150 if you order it directly from the company. Right now, Vault is running about 80,000 tests a day, and they say as that number goes up, the cost will come down. For students like 18-year-old Clara Terry, who will be a freshman at Purdue, Spitting in the tube was easy. I've heard like with the nose one, um, like it hurts. This was not painful at all. 
Now, even though this test is done at home, a key part of Vault's test is you have to do it live over a video call with a clinician to ensure that you're doing it correctly and that it's your saliva. I got the results of my test two days later, negative. The PGA, <laughs> NBA, as you said, NHL are all among the pro sports leagues that are now using these saliva tests. And in large part, they're a lot easier and less invasive than that. I was going to say, no wonder the kids want them, but there's always a question of cost. So mm -hmm. how much would this cost? Yeah, it's $150, but it is open to anyone. So you just have to go on Vault's website and do that. So that means you don't have to be a professional athlete. You don't have to be a student. You can just clickety-clack and get the test? Yes, exactly. But the colleges and universities are investing millions of dollars. I mean, you're yeah. looking at 40,000 students at Purdue alone. They say it's a worthwhile investment to try to protect their students and staff. Okay, and is there a certain time frame, like students need to get this test by a certain time? For the Purdue students, they want them to take it within two weeks before going on uh. to campus. But as you know, Hoda, I mean, you could take the test, be negative, and then a few, day a few days later be positive. So yeah. there are limitations. Okay, all right, this is a good breakthrough. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. The smoke obscured the sunrise. It was a second violent night in Kenosha, Wisconsin, after the shooting of Jacob Blake. His family says the 29-year-old's spinal cord is severed and that he's paralyzed from the waist down, though doctors aren't sure it's permanent. He shot my son seven times, seven times. Like he didn't matter, but my son matters. Overnight, some protesters here ignored a curfew and clashed with police in riot gear. The state had deployed the National Guard, but it didn't stop the destruction. 
It's right before dawn and firefighters are here at the scene trying to put out hot spots. Much of this city block was looted and burned overnight. Blake's family is encouraging peaceful protests. Do Jacob justice on this level and examine your hearts. This new video shows the shooting from a different angle, but it's still not clear exactly what was said between police and Blake or why he was walking around the front of his SUV. An officer fired at least seven shots, hitting Blake in the back while his children inside the car watched, including his son on his eighth birthday. He loves his family. You, you all took him from his family. You all stood by and let it happen. I just want my brother. Exactly three months after the death of George Floyd, Blake's shooting is the latest flashpoint over race and policing. Garcia Delgado says she ran out of her apartment with her young child, fearing for her life. It's heartbreaking. It's really heartbreaking. How, how can you destroy your city, your home? How can you do this? But for Bernadette Prince, a protester with three sons, the frustration has reached a boiling point. You get mad when we start destroying things. This is what happened when you do this, when you keep killing black people for no reason. No comment today from Kenosha police. The Justice Department is now assisting state authorities with the investigation. Tonight, the governor says there will be an increased National Guard presence here. The new analysis from researchers at MIT and the University of Oxford call the six-foot social distancing rule outdated science. In the just-published report, evidence suggests the coronavirus could travel up to 26 feet in the air. With viral spread amplified by someone coughing or shouting, several other factors like ventilation, room occupancy, and exposure time all play a role. One of the biggest risk factors we have for this virus is time spent indoors. In fact, nearly all of the outbreaks of three or more people occurred indoors. Multiple studies show when we talk, cough, or breathe, a stream of two type of droplets are sent through the air, respiratory and aerosol particles. Researchers say the smaller, lighter aerosol particles can linger in the air for hours, traveling much farther. The warning comes just as some students across the country return to the classroom and where mass mandates and ventilation systems are being scrutinized. With no one-size-fits-all rule, the new report suggests six feet apart should be a starting point, but increasing your social distance isn't always an option. The general public should not be scared about this, but they should certainly be aware. The more you can separate from other people, the less likely you are to get coronavirus. And for those returning to the office, no matter how far spread apart you are, experts agree wearing a mask gives you an extra layer of protection, minimizing your risk even when few others are around. Tonight, Americans encouraged to take a step back as our nation moves forward. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News, Los Angeles. Jerry Falwell Jr. took over Liberty University, one of the largest evangelical schools in the world, over a decade ago after his father's death. Now he tells the Wall Street Journal that a group of self-righteous people are behind the push to remove him. Today, the university is saying it has accepted his resignation in the wake of multiple scandals. Reuters reported that the Falwells became entangled with Giancarlo Granda over eight years ago after meeting the then 20-year-old at a Miami hotel. In a statement, Falwell said his wife Becky had an affair with Granda, who later tried to extort them. Granda denies the accusation, telling Reuters that Jerry knew about the affair and would sometimes watch him and Becky together. Granda sharing phone conversations with Reuters, including this exchange from 2018. His new thing is like telling me every time he has like, like, I don't have feelings or something. You don't make yourself, uh, yeah. All of this less than a month after Falwell posted and then deleted this photo on Instagram. Despite his defense that it was all in good fun, Liberty University put the 58-year-old on indefinite leave. In a statement Monday night, the school said additional matters came to light that made it clear that it would not be in the best interest of the university for him to return from leave. According to the university, Falwell responded by agreeing to resign immediately, but then instructed his attorneys not to send his resignation. 
In an interview with the Wall Street Journal late Monday, Falwell said he would indeed step down, acknowledging that some of his posts on social media had embarrassed the school. Tonight, Liberty University says its new leaders are committed to being good stewards, while also offering heartfelt prayers to the Falwell family. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News. At 88 years old, in a cap and gown, Miriam Schreiber savors a moment she's dreamed of for decades. Due to the events beyond my control, I was never able to get my high school diploma. This has been a profound regret of mine all my life. Schreiber's education disrupted by a desperate journey to survive the Holocaust. Her family living for years on the run, hiding from the Nazis, eventually sent to a slave labor camp in Siberia. And nobody would have faulted her for just giving up, but she didn't. Uh, she, of course, learned all the languages everywhere she went. Today, she's fluent in six, learning English when she immigrated to the United States to raise a family. The generations after live awed and inspired by her. Congratulations, buddy. This uh, honorary diploma uh, is, is well-deserved, and she certainly, in the school of life, has earned it. Perhaps a lesson that with perseverance and a grateful heart. It really means the world to me. Thank you so much. Our greatest moments are yet to come. Katie Beck, NBC News. Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. Got to get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. We actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Where there is so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. I think that twixt the Negroes of the South and the women at the North, all talking about rights, the white men will be in a fix pretty soon. 
But what's all this here talking about? What means this votes for women? Just this, the time has come when they may voice with free men concerns of land and home. Then snap the ancient tether enthralling us too long and stoutly pull together to right a grievous wrong. Once more awakes the spirit of the just and a worldwide flame is kindled from the dust. Women, for the right we know, for the duty that we owe, for all souls now here and coming, vote we must. Let us stand together, women, hard and fast. Let us vow to keep the faith until the last. By the trust the world has learned, by the falsehood it has spurned, we will vote and rise above the vanished past. Then, sisters of our nation, put forth your mightiest nerve. Remember with elation the glorious cause you serve. Enlist your best endeavor, whatever that may be. With votes for women ever, press on to victory. We the people, all the people, how, oh, how it sings. Sisters working for the light, brothers striving for the right. We the people, all the people, how, oh, how it rings. Hello to good morning. You can feel the energy and the excitement here on this centennial because history is being made. Central Park is 167 years old. And while there are plenty of statues of men here, this is the first time we're seeing the history and the contributions of real life women being honored. So I want to introduce you to Brenda Berkman. You are part of Monumental Women, the organization that made all of this possible. Brenda, this idea has been seven years in the making. And now on this day, you've got these barrier-breaking women like Secretary Clinton speaking right now. You're here. What does this day mean for you? Monumental Women is like over-the-top ecstatic that finally, in the midst of a pandemic, we've been able to put the first statue of real women in Central Park in its 167-year history. And it was not an easy journey, but, you know, for an all-volunteer nonprofit, small to raise a million and a half dollars and to carry out the, the sculptor crafting this beautiful work of art and creating an education program and a challenge to municipalities to honor more women and people of color in their public spaces. For monumental women to have accomplished that today is just a dream come true. And it's an accomplishment. I think it's also important for our audience to know that even with Sojourner Truth being here, that's also the first time that a black person is being honored as a statue inside the park. What do you hope that people take away when they walk past this money? So we really hope that people learn the history of women, and especially the women's suffragists that are portrayed and women's rights, anti-slavery advocates and organizers in here. And you see the three of them working together. And they, they never, they had tough times. We can't even imagine what they went through in order to accomplish what they did. They started a movement that was the largest peaceful enfranchisement of people in history. And it's to, to be able to take inspiration from them, particularly in this time, that we cannot lose hope, that working together in community, each bringing our own special skills, like organizing and speaking and writing. A message for today. A message for today. Because and these were three New York women who worked together. And these three women never themselves got the opportunity to legally vote. Well, today is the day that we get to honor them. Today is the day that we get to honor their contributions, the way that they work together and changed all of our lives. So will you do us the honor? Will you lead us off in the big reveal, Brenda? 
I will in a minute or two because we're just finishing up the speech by Secretary Clinton. Okay, and then once you actually, once Secretary Clinton finishes, then we're going to be able to show you guys these this incredible statue with these three women, as you mentioned, Elizabeth, Katie, Stanton. We're going to see Sojourner Truth. We're also going to see Susan B. Anthony, the women who paved the way for us to have these rights that we have here today. Okay, guys, hang that. Morgan, hang tight there. We'll come back to you. And but let's keep commemorating Women's Equality Day. And here is Renee Elise Goldsberry, also known as Angelica from the original <laughs> Hamilton Broadway cast, reciting words and anthems of the suffrage movement. Well, children, where there is so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. I think that twixt the Negroes of the South and the women at the North, all talking about rights, the white men will be in a fix pretty soon. But what's all this here talking about? What means this votes for women? Just this, the time has come when they may voice with free men concerns of land and home. Then snap the ancient tether enthralling us too long and stoutly pull together to right a grievous wrong. Once more awakes the spirit of the just, and a worldwide flame is kindled from the dust. Women, for the right we know, for the duty that we owe, for all souls now here and coming, vote we must. Let us stand together, women, hard and fast. Let us vow to keep the faith until the last by the trust the world has learned, by the falsehood it has spurned, we will vote and rise above the vanished past. Then, sisters of our nation, put forth your mightiest nerve. Remember with elation the glorious cause you serve. Enlist your best endeavor, whatever that may be. With votes for women ever, press on to victory. We the people, all the people, how, oh, how it sings. Sisters working for the light, brothers striving for the right. We the people, all the people, how, oh, how it rings. Wow. No, standing O. She deserves a standing O. Standing here on my arm. Oh, too. my gosh. Let's go back to Morgan. I know we're trying to uh, get that statue revealed. What's the latest? <laughs> That's right, Savannah. Now is the big moment that we've all been waiting for, that bronze ceiling being broken. Brenda, will you lead us off in the countdown? So I want everyone to start counting. Start counting. Five. Four. Three. working together, these three women who shared the stage. They went to the same conferences, and now their contribution to history is being made. And all these people are here today to see it and to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. Savannah, Oda, Craig. What a moment. 100 years in the making. It's beautiful. No kidding. And I just keep picturing little girls walking by that statue and going, oh, wait, who is that? Who is that? Who is that? Finally, statues of women in Central Park. Pretty cool. Women have been running for office in the U.S. before they were even granted the right to vote. But no woman has ever held the highest office or even served as vice president. In August, Senator Kamala Harris made history as the first black and Indian American woman on a major party ticket. But she isn't the first woman to tread these waters. Two other VP campaigns can teach us about how the media has historically treated women politicians. And they might give us a glimpse into what to expect in 2020. In 
1984, Geraldine Ferraro, a congresswoman from Queens, received a call from then-Democratic presidential candidate Walter Mondale asking her to be his running mate. She would become the first woman to run for VP for a major political party. The race was on. And then came the scrutiny. Ferraro was shamed for being a working mother. In an interview, Barbara Walters noted that Ferraro missed weekends with her kids because of her career and wondered why she'd kept her maiden name. The press secretary for Republican Vice President George Bush referred to her with a sexist slur in the Wall Street Journal. Bush tried to school her in international diplomacy in a famous debate clash. Let me help you with the difference, Ms. Ferraro, between Iran and the embassy in Lebanon. Let me just say, first of all, that I almost resent Vice President Bush, your patronizing attitude that you have to teach me about foreign policy. But the biggest scandal of Ferraro's campaign was not about Ferraro at all. It was about her husband, John Zaccaro. Here's what happened. They filed separate tax returns. She planned to release hers, he did not, and the media lost it. Rumors circulated about ties between her husband's business and organized crime. Notably, she was of Italian-American heritage, so it's hard to ignore the role her ethnicity played in these rumors. Ferraro held a marathon press conference. The scandal proved to be overblown. The Mondale Ferraro ticket lost to Ronald Reagan and George Bush by the second largest margin in election history. It wasn't until 24 years later, in 2008, when Republican Senator John McCain chose Alaska Governor Sarah Palin as his VP, that we'd see another woman on a major party's ticket. But the public still hadn't learned its lesson from the Ferraro campaign. Palin faced the same kinds of sexism, both overt and disguised. CNN anchor John Roberts suggested becoming a VP might take Palin away from her kids for too long. Vanity Fair editor Todd Purdom called her the, quote, first indisputably fertile female to dare to dance with the big dogs. Meanwhile, pundits fixated on Palin's sex appeal. She was the first woman in power that a lot of people felt was very physically attractive. Hmm. And people didn't know what to do with that. They never saw that before. They got one thing right. Society has always seen women in power as threatening. They question their competence, their sex appeal, their audacity to run for office. This year, we'll see if America can look past gender to evaluate candidates based on policy and merit, not sex appeal. After all, there are so many more important things to pay attention to. Residents along the Gulf Coast are bracing for potential devastation. Hurricane Laura gets set to make landfall tonight. It is intensifying rapidly and possibly ramping up to become a massive Category 4 hurricane. We've got complete coverage, but let's start with the man who's been following it all night long. Al, good morning. What do the maps show? Well, right now, guys, this is this is unfortunately coming to fruition the way we thought it would. Category two right now, they're in 15 miles south, southeast of Lake Charles. You can already see the feeder bands now pushing just to the south of Louisiana, 110 mile per hour winds moving northwest at 15. Category four storm by this afternoon around one o'clock. Winds and rain increased during the day from Corpus Christi all the way to New Orleans. Dangerous rain, wind gust, storm surge as this comes on shore Thursday morning around 1 a.m. Again, a Category 3, but don't worry about whether it's a 3 or 4. It's going to cause major impacts. Catastrophic storm surge will make it up to 30 miles inland. 10 to 15 foot storm surge from Port Arthur into central Louisiana. 30 mile storm surge, that's almost to I-10. The storm surge is the water that gets piled up on top of the tides as those winds come in. It's the deadliest hurricane threat. At 3 feet, that surge is considered life-threatening, can cause major problems in a home. By Six feet, those crashing waves push out the back walls of homes, breaking through doors and windows. Nine feet, this is where that surge can push further inland. Entire neighborhoods can be wiped out. Plus those destructive winds, damaging extreme winds, could knock out power for days, guys. We're talking power outages. This is the outage potential map. You can see it goes all the way up into the Midwest as this system makes its way. And of course, the rain. Locally, could be 15 inches of rain, widespread flash 
flooding, urban flooding, moderate to major river flooding as well. The closest we can compare this to, guys, is Hurricane Rita back in 2005. The surge went inland about 20 to 30 miles. This could actually go in 50 miles depending on this storm surge. So this is a very, very dangerous storm. We're going to continue to watch it. But again, don't pay attention to the categories. Pay attention to the impacts. Mm -hmm. Guys? Yeah, and what officials are telling you. Al, thank you very much. We move. This morning, the coastal cities of Texas on edge as Hurricane Laura looms just hours from making landfall. There will be a lot of devastation wrecked upon Texas as the storm sweeps through. Governor Greg Abbott warning residents to brace for a possible Category 4 hurricane, increasing the counties under a disaster declaration to nearly 60. Don't know where we're going, but we're going to get away, though. Laura's wind speeds expected to top triple digits, which could help fuel a potentially life-threatening 13-foot storm surge. The warning to residents, don't waste time, get out now. Some people may choose to stay at home, and I think that kind of scares me because we don't ever know what these storms could possibly bring. Most are listening. We've boarded the house now completely, and now we're just starting to haul away things that uh, we want to make sure survive. Some choosing to stay despite the threat of a major hurricane. We know that there's going to be an aftermath and there's going to be a lot of cleanup to do afterwards. And we think that it's important to stay around if we feel safe where we're at. Officials cautioning at a certain point, first responders can't save you. Don't doubt 911, no one's going to answer, okay? And you are on your own. Beaumont's mayor, Becky Ames, has led her now deserted city through many disruptive hurricanes. Wednesday night into Thursday, when this really ratchets up, what's keeping you up at night the most? Loss of life is the biggest um, concern that I would ever have when it comes to something like this. And there are fears, of course, of widespread power outages lasting for days. Governor Abbott here in Texas summoning some 9,000 utility workers with another 6,000 requested. And guys, you can expect them to be very busy over the coming days and potentially weeks. First Lady Melania Trump solo in the spotlight with a strikingly different tone than her husband, offering condolences for those affected by the coronavirus pandemic and acknowledging how difficult it's been for millions of Americans. I know many people are anxious and some feel helpless. I want you to know you're not alone. Donald will not rest until he has done all he can to take care of everyone impacted by this terrible pandemic. Speaking from the newly renovated White House Rose Garden, the First Lady sharing her personal story. As an immigrant and a very independent woman, I understand what a privilege it is to live here and to enjoy the freedoms and opportunities that we have. And years after endorsing her husband's birther claims about Barack Obama, reflecting on the nation's racial unrest. I urge people to come together in a civil manner. I also ask people to stop the violence and looting being done in the name of justice and never make assumptions based on the color of a person's skin. The first lady whose Be Best campaign aims to combat cyberbullying, addressing how mean social media can be, while noting President Trump's unvarnished opinions. Total honesty is what we as citizens deserve from our president. Whether you like it or not, you always know what he's thinking. The president putting the powers of his office to work for his re-election. From the unprecedented use of the White House grounds for his wife's convention speech to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo shattering a long-standing tradition that American diplomats do not participate in political conventions. Speaking from the site of an official trip to Jerusalem. President Trump has put his America First vision into action. It may not have made him popular in every foreign capital, but it's worked. The State Department insists Pompeo's partisan speech highlighting the president's policies was delivered in his personal capacity. 
President Trump also showcasing his pardon power, granting clemency to a convicted bank robber who founded a program that helps former inmates. As I grant John, I'm not sure you know this, a full pardon. And hosting a recorded naturalization ceremony for the primetime audience. So help me God. So help me God. And helping celebrate their father, two of the president's children. As a recent graduate, I can relate to so many of you who might be looking for a job. My father built a thriving economy once, and believe me, he will do it again. I'd like to speak directly to my father. I miss working alongside you every single day, but I'm damn proud to be on the front lines of this fight. Eric Trump's message to his father last night. The First Lady's speech also drawing attention for the lack of social distancing of the Rose Garden and very limited mask wearing. At least some of those there were tested for the virus before attending, but the setup really seemed to minimize the threat of the pandemic. The president's top economic advisor earlier in the night even referring to it in the past tense. Savannah. All right, Peter. So we've had two nights down, two more to go. We're going to hear from the vice president tonight. But you can really tell a lot uh, by by watching the speakers who the campaign is trying to reach, where they think there's some fertile ground for their reelection strategy. What have you learned? Yes, and I think you're right. These first two nights have really been the sort of back and forth between those fiery speeches and trying to sell that softer version of the president, granting that pardon, hosting a naturalization ceremony for new citizens, all people of color. His kids speaking as well. The first lady's empathetic remarks. The goal here to both energize the base, to bring back those disaffected Republicans who may have been turned off by President Trump and to speak directly to those suburban voters, particularly women who polls show have increasingly flocked to Joe Biden to Tonight, as you know, we're going to hear from the vice president, Mike Pence, the South Dakota governor, Christy Nome, and one of the president's fiercest defenders, Kellyanne Conway, just days before her departure from the White House. Savannah. All right, Peter, thank you. And a reminder, we'll have more on the first lady's message in our next half hour. And NBC's live coverage of the Republican National Convention continues tonight. And tomorrow we get started at 10 o'clock Eastern. First Lady Melania Trump making her most personal appeal yet for her husband. I'm here because we need my husband to be our president and commander in chief for four more years. Looking to court a constituency President Trump has struggled with, suburban women. We must make sure that women are heard and that the American dream continues to thrive. For the first lady who spoke for more than 20 minutes, the speech was her longest to date and perhaps her most consequential. During the 2016 convention, Mrs. Trump was accused of lifting parts of Michelle Obama's speech from 2008. You do what you say you're going to do. you do what you say. An aide was blamed for the mistake. This year, the first lady's advisors say she was heavily involved in writing the remarks. From the day that I met him, he has only wanted to make this country the best it can be. In her nearly four years at the White House, the First Lady has picked her moments to speak out carefully. Her largest initiative came in 2018 when she announced her Be Best anti-bullying campaign. Let us teach our children the difference between right and wrong and encourage them to be best in their individual paths in life. The move gained praise, but the first lady also faced questions about her husband's habit of tweeting insults at his rivals. I don't agree always what he posts, but his action is his action, and I tell him that. One of her loudest statements was not spoken at all, but rather these words written on the back of her jacket. I really don't care, do you? She wore it while visiting migrant children at the U.S.-Mexico border later explaining it was for the people and for the left wing media who are criticizing me and I want to show them that I don't care. Melania Trump is often at her husband's side for critical moments on the world stage and at home, but she's also spoken out on her own. In 2018, saying she was blindsided by the zero tolerance policy, which led to family separations at the border, and more recently tweeting out an image of herself wearing a mask, weeks before her husband started wearing one in public. A Slovenian native and former model, the first lady did not immediately 
move into the White House when her husband won the 2016 election, instead staying at Trump Tower in New York City to focus on her son, Barron. But according to former First Lady Laura Bush's chief of staff, once Mrs. Trump arrived in Washington, she quickly assumed a quiet but powerful presence. She's chosen to use her platform very strategically and when she feels she can make a contribution without having to be the loudest voice in the room every day. Kristen, she really picks and chooses her moments. What do you expect her to do for the rest of the campaign? Do you think she'll be uh, high profile on the trail, even if it's a virtual one? Well, I think to some extent, Savannah, look, before the coronavirus hit, the first lady was expected to play a larger role on the trail than she did in 2016. You might recall she was for the most part out of sight then. Well, Mrs. Trump was expected to headline several fundraisers this spring. They got canceled because of the virus. Still, you can expect to see her engage in virtual campaign events, Savannah. For President Trump, she's really a key asset. She helps to humanize the president, and she's also defended him after some of his most controversial moment. So we'll be watching closely, Savannah. All right, Kristen, welcome with a closer look from the White House. Thanks, Kristen. We all know Donald Trump makes no secrets about how he feels about things. Whether you like it or not, you always know what he's thinking. My deepest sympathy goes out to everyone who has lost a loved one. And my prayers are with those who are ill or suffering. The president has held China accountable for covering up the China virus and allowing it to spread death and economic destruction in America and around the world. Presidential leadership came swiftly and effectively with an extraordinary rescue for health and safety to successfully fight the COVID virus. Our economic health is coming back. With emergency spending and tax cuts, Americans are going back to work. And the economy soared to new heights, heights never seen before. Wages went through the roof. Unemployment reached the historic lows, especially for black Americans, Hispanic Americans, and women. Trade deals were ripped up and renegotiated. Lights were turned back on in abandoned factories across our country. As a recent graduate, I can relate to so many of you who might be looking for a job. My father built a thriving economy once, and believe me, he will do it again. I learned what was happening to me had a name. It was called being canceled, as in annulled, as in revoked, as in made void. Cancelled is what's happening to people around this country who refuse to be silenced by the far left. Many are being fired, humiliated, or even threatened. But I would not be cancelled. Let's make America great again. We believe in freedom of thought and expression. Think what you want. Seek out the truth. Learn from those with different opinions. And then freely make your voice heard to the world. Joe Biden is a politician who has been in government for 47 years. He's a career politician who's never signed the front of a check and does not know the slightest thing about the American worker or the American business. Compare President Trump with the disastrous record of Joe Biden, who has consistently called for more war. Joe Biden voted for the Iraq War, which President Trump has long called the worst geopolitical mistake of our generation. In the Middle East, when Iran threatened, the president approved a strike that killed the Iranian terrorist, Qasem Soleimani. Moving the embassy to Jerusalem, peace in the Middle East. Today, because of the president's determination and leadership, the ISIS caliphate is wiped out. It's gone. In North Korea, the president lowered the temperature and against all odds got the North Korean leadership to the table. No nuclear tests, no long-range missile tests. I have reflected on the racial unrest in our country. It is a harsh reality that we are not proud of parts of our history, focused on our future while still learning from our past. We must remember that today we are all one community comprised of many races, religions, and ethnicities. Our diverse and storied history is what makes our country strong, and yet 
we still have so much to learn from one another. With that in mind, I like to call on the citizens of this country to take a moment, pause, and look at things from all perspectives. I urge people to come together in a civil manner so we can work and live up to our standard American ideals. Overnight, protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin, turning deadly. Authorities clearing the streets after reports of gunshots. Police say at least two people are dead, one person injured. Hours earlier, the governor had declared a state of emergency, mobilizing more National Guard members. But some protesters ignored a curfew, authorities deploying tear gas. This was the third straight night of violent protests here, and this community is on edge. This is pathetic. This is pathetic for to happen in our country, and it's in the state of Wisconsin, and it's just anarchists going around and taking advantage of the situation. The chaos came despite Jacob Blake's family pleading for peaceful protest. He shot my son seven times. Seven times. Like he didn't matter. But my son matters. His family is now demanding the officers involved in Sunday's shooting captured on the cell phone video be fired and the one who shot Blake in the back be arrested. The eyewitness who shot the video says he heard officers yell, drop the knife, but police haven't said if they ever recovered a weapon. He was not treated like a human that day. He was treated like some foreign object that didn't belong. Blake's family now says the 29-year-old spinal cord is severed and that he's paralyzed from the waist down, though doctors aren't sure it's permanent. Blake's mother tells us she'd last spoken to Jacob Sunday morning as he prepared to celebrate his son's eighth birthday. The boy was in the back seat when his father was shot. When you first walked into that hospital room and you saw your son, what went through your head? So many things. I was just so elated just simply being able to see him and he's alive. The U.S. Department of Justice is now assisting state authorities with the investigation. Wisconsin's Department of Justice says the officers are on administrative leave and are fully cooperating. Kenosha police officers do not wear body cameras, but the Blake family wants any dash cam footage or any other video of the incident released. Blake's family now plans to file a civil lawsuit. Now, over the last three days, the Kenosha Police Department has not commented, only to say that its officers were responding to a domestic incident. But again, two people dead, one person injured, following another night of unrest here, Savannah. All right, Gabe Gutierrez on a really devastating night there. Gabe, thank you. It's long been said, maintain six feet of social distance, but depending on the circumstances, that might not be far enough. That's according to new research published in the British Medical Journal, finding COVID-19 particles can travel up to 26 feet. The viral particle concentrations can build up and infect somebody beyond that you know, magical six foot ring we've been all talking about for the past couple months. When you talk, cough, breathe, or sneeze, two types of particles come out. Respiratory droplets fall quickly to the ground, most traveling no more than six feet. But aerosol particles can linger in the air for hours and travel even greater distances. Experts say it's useful to think of another type of aerosol, cigarette smoke. When it comes out of a smoker, it, it disperses, it doesn't fall to the ground like the droplets, and then it does different things depending on the setting. If you're outdoors in a windy day, it goes away very quickly. Masks that fit well enough to filter out smoke may be even more important than washing hands. Researchers say aerosol transmission explains why so few super spreader events have been traced to outdoor gatherings. One of the biggest risk factors we have for this virus is time spent indoors. In fact, 
Nearly all of the outbreaks of three or more people occurred indoors. That's why air circulation in planes, offices and schools may be a critical factor. A government watchdog agency recently found over one third of public schools in the U.S. need improvements to their air systems for proper ventilation. Some districts are investing in new filters, but outdoor classrooms could be a simpler and safer solution. What I am shocked is that we don't have the National Guard basically setting up just open tents, just, just a roof with the sides open on all the schools around the country, you know, so that all the classes can be done outdoors. While in many circumstances, like being in a grocery store, restaurant, or even an airplane or an office space, there's only so much you can do to social distance. But experts say people should always avoid talking loudly and always wear a properly fitting mask whenever possible. So, Dr. Azar, let's start with you. I wanted to squeeze this in here because it's a hot topic today. On Monday, uh, the CDC reversed guidance on COVID-19 testing, uh, now stating that healthy people who've been exposed for at least 15 minutes still do not necessarily need a test if they don't have symptoms. So this excludes, obviously, vulnerable people like the elderly and those with chronic medical conditions. Uh, and state and local health officials may still recommend a test. But a lot of people are buzzing about it, even here in the studio, what that means uh, for keeping transmission from increasing. Yeah, so I think one of the biggest concerns, Chanel, is that contact tracing efforts could very well be compromised by this. Mm. It appears that, that part of the rationale behind this guideline is that if you are an exposed individual, individual, you're supposed to quarantine for 14 days. That hasn't changed. But the difference here is that what about your contacts, right? If you are exposed and you get tested and you test positive, your contacts need to go into quarantine, right? Mm -hmm. Or potentially get tested themselves. So if you're only going into quarantine, but you're not necessarily getting tested, we don't know about what's happening in terms of your potential to spread to others. We've talked about this a lot. Asymptomatic transmission is a very, 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 very real thing. That, I think, is one of the biggest concerns to come out of this. I think we'll be hearing about this for a couple of days. Absolutely. It seems like there's a gap there. All right. Let me ask you about the flu shot. This is a big deal. When yeah. should you get it? Will we have to worry about shortages? There are a lot of people, I promise you, who are watching right now who normally don't get one. You know, you're supposed right. to, but you just don't feel like dealing. But this year, I think people, you know, more people will be prone to get it. Yeah. Absolutely, Chanel. This year, more than ever, we are encouraging people to get their flu shots. For adults, remember, it decreases severity of illness, and it also reduces hospitalizations, which is so important because we need to preserve our resources given the underlying or overshadowing, I should say, COVID-19 pandemic. And for children especially, it's important. The flu shot can reduce mortality. In terms of when to get it, you know, experts generally say if you're if you're otherwise healthy, around September is appropriate. If you're older or have underlying medical conditions or are compromised, maybe you wait a little bit longer to early October. But by the end of October, CDC wants most people vaccinated. In terms of shortages, in the anticipation of this twindemic that we might have, uh, flu production has been ramped up, so we don't anticipate any shortages. I have time for one more question. Causing some confusion is that there's overlap in COVID-19 and flu symptoms. Mm -hmm. Can you quickly walk us through what those viruses have in common and then hit what seems to be distinct differences? Differences? Yeah. So I think it's kind of easy if you look at the graphic of, of symptoms. There's probably more similarity than differences. We're talking fever, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, sore throat, headache, GI symptoms. Both flu and COVID share those, and a test might be the only thing that can distinguish them in certain cases. But as we've learned with COVID, it's a very protean bug. That means it presents in a variety of different ways, particularly that loss of taste and smell that was so illuminating in the spring. But I think a few other aspects of it, just from an epidemiological perspective, you're probably contagious a little while longer with COVID than you are with flu. The incubation period is longer, two to 14 days, as opposed to one to four days with flu. And of course, the big thing with aerosol transmission, the concern about super spreading events, especially in small, enclosed, poorly ventilated areas, that is a concern with COVID and not necessarily with flu. Oh, Dr. Azar, I wish we were talking about a happier topic, but it's, it's an important topic. I miss seeing your face. It's good to talk to you this morning. You too. All right. <laughs> Dylan, I'm just like, oh. I know. I think everybody <laughs> has that sentiment, Chanel. So there, there are a number of ways to get a flu shot this year. Vicki Wynn is here to let us know how. And Vicki, I know 
I always get my flu shot at work. Calvin, you know, and, and the kids, when they go to their doctor, they just end up getting a flu shot. Is it is it going to be the same this year? Things will be a little different this year, Dylan, because a lot of offices are still closed, so we're used to getting their flu shot at work. That may not be an option. The good news is tons of other places to get your flu shot. Walgreens, CVS, both saying they're anticipating 50 to 100 percent increases wow. in the number of people who want to get a flu shot, but they are prepared to meet that demand. If you are going to go to your doctor or pediatrician, ask if you can all get the shot at the same time. That helps to reduce the number of visits that you have to take to the doctor. And also check a website called vaccinefinder.org for locations that are near you. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people staying out of the doctor's office because they don't want to contract COVID-19. So, How do people stay safe when they are finally going to get the flu shot? Yeah, first thing, very important to call ahead and figure out what is the protocol. A lot of places are taking appointment only. Some will offer walk-in, but you need to be prepared. Ask if you can fill out any of those forms ahead of time electronically so you can limit your time in the office. Be prepared to wear a mask. And a lot of offices are asking you to stay outside or in your car until it's your turn to come in. Of course, you're going to want to wash your hands and make sure that you limit your time in that office. Try to get the first appointment of the day if you can. Mm -hmm. And and what about cost? You know, because so many people are doing it a little bit differently this year, will there be an added cost? So generally, if you do have insurance, the good news here is that it will be covered. Your flu shot will not cost you a penny. You can also do a Google search or an internet search of uh, free flu shots in your area, your city, or your county. And also, Think if you're a college student and you are on campus, a lot of those campuses have free flu shots. Veterans, same thing. Go to your local VA. That's just going to be for the veteran, though, not the rest of the family. And if you don't have insurance, check GoodRx.com. They will have a location of free flu shots in the area. I also want to remind people, Costco, $19.99. You don't even have to be a member, and that's if you don't have insurance. Mm -hmm. And for our seniors, bring your ID. Ask about that senior discount. Wow, really good advice. Mm -hmm. Saving us money and saving our health, too. Yes, thank always. you very much, Vicki and Dr. Natalie Azar. Thank you as well. Across the country, schools reversing their decision to hold in-person classes after COVID-19 outbreaks. At UNC Chapel Hill, classes abruptly halted just days after move-in. Students there not tested before coming back. But at Purdue University in Indiana, an unprecedented undertaking Before all 40,000 students start classes this month, they're required to take a COVID test. Testing will be very, very important and will be a key element of protecting our our college campuses. But unlike most COVID testing that involves a large, often uncomfortable swab to get a sample from the back of the nose, Purdue students will just spit into this tiny tube, something they can do at home with this kit. The convenience of that, and so I think particularly for this generation of students. It was a good one that allowed us to to reach them where they were. Purdue is one of 65 schools working with Vault Health, formerly a men's health company, now offering this at-home COVID saliva test developed by Rutgers University. Is the saliva test a game changer? It is a game changer. First of all, it's a much easier test to administer. You're spitting into a tube, which just about everybody can do, even kids, and you're just giving us enough spit to be able to tell if there's virus in there. I ordered a kit from Vault's website. It arrived in two days. I have my materials here. What do I do? I set up a video chat with a clinician who made sure I did the test correctly. I made sure to not eat, drink, or put anything in my mouth for 30 minutes. So all you need to do now is go ahead and spit. Oh man, this is gonna take a while. I think the record was about 30 seconds. I was not so speedy. (laughs) How many times a day do you have to watch people do this? (laughs) Enough. (laughs) Two minutes later. Any tricks to this? Yeah, smelling pickles in a jar, thinking about food, smelling citrus. You should have told me to bring my pickles in a jar out sooner. I have nothing. I have nothing. All right, let me think about mouth-watering foods. I feel like it's working. It took some time to work up about a spoonful of saliva. Am I there? Oh, that's pretty good. Yes. You're there. A quick mix with a preservative to keep my sample fresh. Then I put it in a pre-addressed bag to be overnighted to the Rutgers lab in New Jersey. Vault says results are available in two to three days, a big advantage over swab tests that have seen delays up to 14 days. Vault's test is one of two strictly saliva tests given emergency authorization by the FDA. Yale University created the other one, but it's not an at-home test. How is this test better than what we've been seeing with the nasal swab? Well, the false negative rate is really what we're concerned with. Telling somebody that they're negative when actually they are sick is very dangerous. And so the saliva test has a 1% or even less than 1% false negative rate. But scientists caution there's not enough data yet 
to know how much virus is in saliva. They're generally very ac accurate. They're probably a little bit less sensitive than the nasal swab, which is the term we use to mean that if people have very, very small amounts of virus, it's possible that the nasal swab would detect that, whereas the saliva wouldn't. The test is also pricey, $150 if you order it directly from the company. Right now, Vault is running about 80,000 tests a day, and they say as that number goes up, the cost will come down. For students like 18-year-old Clara Terry, who will be a freshman at Purdue, spitting in the tube was easy. I've heard like with the nose one, um, like it hurts. This was not painful at all. Now, even though this test is done at home, a key part of Vault's test is you have to do it live over a video call with a clinician to ensure that you're doing it correctly and that it's your saliva. I got the results of my test two days later. Negative. The PGA, <laughs> NBA, as you said, NHL are all among the pro sports leagues that are now using these saliva tests. And in large part, they're a lot easier and less invasive than that. I was going to say, no wonder the kids want them. But there's always a question of cost. So mm -hmm. how much would this cost? Yeah, it's one hundred and fifty dollars, but it is open to anyone. One, so you just have to go on Vault's website and do that. So that means you don't have to be a professional athlete. You don't have to be a student. You can just clickety-clack and get the test? Yes, exactly. But the colleges and universities are investing millions of dollars. I mean, you're yeah. looking at 40,000 students at Purdue alone. They say it's a worthwhile investment to try to protect their students and staff. Okay, and is there a certain time frame, like students need to get this test by a certain time? For the Purdue students, they want them to take it within two weeks before going on uh. to campus. But as you know, Hoda, I mean, you could take the test, be negative, and then a few, day a few days later be positive. So yeah. there are limitations. Okay, all right, this is a good breakthrough. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. 
As we inch closer to the November election, millions of Americans, especially minorities, are depending on the Postal Service now more than ever. MSNBC correspondent Tremaine Lee joins me now. He is also the host of the Into America podcast. Tremaine, in your latest podcast, you talk about the Postal Service's impact on black families. Uh, tell us more about episode 61. That's right, Allison. For decades, the Postal Service has been a ladder into the middle class for many African Americans. And even till today, 20 uh, percent of the Postal Service is African American. Uh, but as we inch closer, as you mentioned, to the, the 2020 election and with COVID-19 hovering there, uh, the mail service will be even more important for those um, who, like the black community, who have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, but also live in environments uh, that are densely populated. So it may not be um, as safe to go to your polling place. At the very same time, uh, the Postmaster General Louis DeJoy has enacted a number of sweeping changes uh, that many fear uh, will not only, um, you know, slow the mail service, but also impact black voters who are trying to either vote absentee or vote by mail. And so on one side, you have this long history uh, of, of black folks being employed by the Postal Service. And on the other hand, in 2020, you have a situation where they may be adversely affected uh, when it comes to the mail and vote. Tremaine, I know you also spoke to a black postal worker from Chicago. What did he tell you? That's right. I spoke to Jay Thurman, who has uh, worked at the post, post Service for more than, than 20 years. Um, and he says, you know what, um, historically speaking, when you got that political mail, when you had the absentee um, votes or you had any kind of political mail, um, it's a high priority. But now, with all the changes, uh, with everything that's at stake in 2020, uh, he says the pressure's on. Let's take a listen. It's always scary when, you know, it's, they're going to make a change and you don't know what's going to happen. When they say no overtime and they were saying, well, we're not doing any overtime and we have to turn around and we, gotta, we have to get this mail out, that's even more pressure. It's like you can cut it with a knife. You feel like you can just cut it because it's so go, 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 go. Let's go. And so that's part of what the problem is here. When you talk to postal workers like Jay Thurman, he says there are so many changes that put the pressure on. And, and so many others say, you know, they see a clear political uh, connection between uh, what's happening with President Donald Trump saying, you know, he, he thinks there'd be uh, major fraud if more people vote by mail. And then you have Postmaster General Louis DeJoy uh, taking away mail service machines that are critical to sorting mail at one time, uh, taking away overtime for postal workers who usually spend um, extra hours making sure that we get our mail on time, especially that first class mail to get there the next day or so. And so uh, a lot of folks are feeling the pressure, not the least of which those who work for the Postal Service. No doubt. Uh, Tremaine, another great podcast. Thank you so much for coming on to talk to us about it. We'll see you soon. Thank you. How are you voting in the 2020 presidential election? NBC News is here to help. We've got a state-by-state -state guide called Plan Your Vote. It has information on voting rules, deadlines, and restrictions by state. You can check it out at NBCNews.com slash Plan Your Vote. Not in my hood. Not in my hood. Not on my block. Enough is enough. If one of us is not okay in the community, the rest of us is not okay. Racial injustice is on the forefront of media everywhere you look. It's on the, the lips and tongues of people around the world right now. And police brutality has been, has gone viral. So we see people demanding for structural change in light of the many George Floyds and the many men and women of color that we see abused by police. Um, so it's come to a culmination, it's come to a boiling point, and there has to be transformational change, there has to be a redirection of resources, and the people will not accept anything less than that. So when we move around as violence interrupters in the community, as human justice ambassadors in the community, as those who are connected to, dedicated to, uplifting our community, I think we're received warmly now, because people are ready for an alternative. Community groups like CCD and 696 Bill Queensbridge are the future of public safety. When you have these alternative ways to address issues on a preventative side, you see a whole new reality open up. So we're able to be in positions to negotiate conversations and truces and kind of put out fires in ways that law enforcement couldn't even approach.
my, my mother was a, 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 she had problems with substance abuse and I never really had a father, so I grew up in a community with the high risk, the young people that were out committing crimes and doing those atrocities. And as a result of that, I wound up um, doing 16 years of my life in prison. I've always had a stubborn attitude towards uh, any type of authority, but then K. Bain showed me that um, there's a different type of way that this program works and remaining with our credibility, not dealing with the authorities, that was the key thing that made me say I can do this because I figured that I can make a difference that the NYPD can't make, the nurses, the teachers, and the schools can't make because I was the same person that those young people were. So they can, and they know that, so they can identify with me. We saw people who had leadership skills that were laying dormant, that weren't being activated, and we're expert engagers that pulled them into the conversation and channeled some of those skill sets. So in 2017, we, do, we did uh, actually go, I think we surpassed the year without a shooting or homicide, and that got a lot of recognition. I think part of that recognition um, should have been placed on the culture shift that we were a part of. It's easy to measure and to quantify how many days go without a shooting. It's a little more difficult to look at how many mindsets have been awakened or inspired or opened up. My name is Tribe Gangster, a.k.a. Sean Duke McFadden. That's my government. I ain't got no problem saying it. The police know it. The streets know it. Today we have a shooting response and the importance of us coming together and mobilizing the community around a shooting response is that for too long it's been the norm that people get shot, violence happens, and we just continue as business as usual. And I was part of the problem in a major way. Well, a shooting response is breaking that norm and saying that any time an act of violence ha happens, we as a community have an obligation to denounce it, to step out. It is a big deal. We will not accept it, and we will not stand for it. Why is nobody tired? Why is everybody not tired as one? We lost up to like five people in the last two years. The shooting response that went on today, it was basically in remembrance of Money Mags, a.k.a. Hefe, a.k.a. Magdi. And, um, you know, we were just trying to get the community to recognize that if one is not okay, we're really not okay. And that we definitely do need to come together because this is like, it's, it's not okay, it's senseless. And that's what we're working on. Our, our mission is to change the community norm, which starts with changing mindsets. Believing in people, investing in people, supporting people produces outcomes that are undeniable. There's a shift right now for good reason. Society is acknowledging the fact that we have been doing things in ways that are not effective. So our responsibility and obligation right now as a society is to focus on putting people first, people before possessions, people before things, people before budgets. President Trump's very first executive orders dropped late on a Friday night, days after he had been sworn in, and it came to be known as the Muslim ban. The order banned migrants from seven Muslim-majority countries from visiting the United States for 90 days. It suspended the entry of Syrian refugees indefinitely and barred the entry of all refugees for 120 days, even for the 60,000 refugees who had visas in hand. It also capped the number of refugees in 2017 to 50,000 total. And within 48 hours, that order was blocked by a judge. So the president signed a new order exempting some refugees like people from Iraq and the courts blocked that as well. A judge has just blocked our executive order on travel and refugees coming into our country from certain countries. Regardless, we're going to keep our citizens safe, believe me. So he tried again and delivered Travel Ban 3.0. This version limited visas to travelers from five of the original seven countries, lifted restrictions on one of them, and added new limits on Venezuela and North Korea. And this time, he succeeded. The decision says that President Trump wins. The Supreme Court has upheld the president's travel ban. Earlier this year, the the administration added six more countries to the list. Even before the pandemic hit, the U.S. was well on its way to admitting fewer refugees than ever in 2020, and the, quote, travel ban is still in place, barring all people from these countries from obtaining immigrant visas. 
In the summer of 2018, the government reported that while arresting undocumented border crossers, they had separated at least 2,000 children from their parents in the past year. According to the ACLU, more than 200 of those children were under the age of five. American citizens that are jailed do not take their children to jail with them. Non-citizens who cross our borders unlawfully between our ports of entry with children are no exception. Pictures from inside the detention centers showed cramped, crowded conditions. ProPublica obtained an audio recording smuggled out of one of the detention centers in which children are begging for their parents. In response to public outcry, Trump signed an executive order ending family separation in June of 2018. You're going to have a lot of happy people. But the damage was done. Some reunification took months while other parents were deported without their children. In all, more than 2,800 children were taken from their parents by U.S. immigration officials. And because DHS didn't prioritize tracking children in its custody, the Department of Health and Human Services says the true number of children separated from their families may never be known. Kirsten Nielsen, the head of DHS at the time of peak family separation, was forced out of her job in 2019. Internal emails obtained by NBC News, Wolf was an, was an early architect of the Trump administration's family separation policy. The man who helped craft the family separation policy now has her job leading the agency in an acting capacity. Build that wall. 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 In the election of 2016, this promise was part of the foundation of President Trump's campaign. Who's going to pay for the wall? By the way, 100%. Four years later, the portions of the wall that have been built have been paid for by Americans. In early 2019, President Trump demanded $5.7 billion from Congress in a spending bill the Democratic-led House refused to pass. That led to a 35-day government shutdown and 80,000 furloughed government workers. Pay the workers furloughed Trump! In the end, President Trump backed down, signing a spending bill without getting the wall fully funded. But the very next day, he declared a national emergency on the border. We're talking about an invasion of our country. He used the order to pull billions from the Pentagon to pay for border wall projects, while a number of groups sued to stop that transfer of funds and the wall's construction. In July, the Supreme Court sided with Trump, allowing the administration to spend the more than $6 billion on the project. But construction has been slow, and around two-thirds of the land needed for the wall is still privately owned. As of August 10th, 275 miles of what Customs and Border Protection calls a border wall system have been built, which is roughly 12.5% of the southern U.S. border. But portions of the new construction has gone to replace some of the border fencing built during the Bush administration. When they come in once, we deport them. When they come in twice, they go to jail for five years. When they come in another one, it'll be 10 years. And you know what's going to happen? Sort of pretty simple. They hear they get caught again, they go to jail for five years. Guess what's going to happen? They're not coming back, folks. Trump talked a lot about deportations, and the impact of his rhetoric has been felt in communities around the country. They don't know if they're going to deport me or leave me here, so they're not sure what they're going to do with me. But on one important metric, the facts don't match the talk. Deportations. They've risen since the last year of Obama's tenure, but have come nowhere close to the more than 400,000 deportations during the peak years of Obama's presidency. And according to the most recent ICE numbers, interior removals, deportations that happen away from the border, are down from most of the Obama years as well. I stopped reporting this data for fiscal year 2020, but if the trend holds, then one of President Trump's key promises to deport more people has not been kept. President Trump targeting suburban women, a group he claims will vote for him come November, but will they? MSNBC senior national correspondent Chris Jansing is in Union County, North Carolina, where she's been talking with suburban women. Chris, Trump won Union County by 31 points back in 2016, but that county voted 10 points more Democratic in the 2019 congressional election. So here we are in 2020. How do suburban women there feel about President Trump right now? 
That's exactly what we wanted to find out. Look, we came to Trump country because we wanted to see how much of his base will Donald Trump hold. We know he has no hope of winning a state like North Carolina without holding that base. So we sat down with three Republican suburban women, one Democrat, to get their take. Here's part of what they told me. How do you all feel about Donald Trump's chances of getting reelected? The polls would suggest he's way down, but you're laughing. I don't believe the polls. Yeah. Those polls were, you know, way down for him four Against years Hillary. ago. <laughs> Things have changed a lot since then. Do you think there's more enthusiasm for Joe Biden than there was for Hillary? Yes. <laughs> So enthusiasm is something we hear from both Republicans and Democrats. Democrats believe there was a lack of enthusiasm for Hillary Clinton, that they expect more people will come out for Joe Biden. But they also know on the Republican side that Trump is unlikely to win with just his base. He has to also get some of the people who maybe felt like he couldn't win last time or have not been enthusiastic voters, what they call low propensity voters, and get them out as well, Allison. So it is going to be a fight in places like this. Chris, I know you also talked to these women about Trump's messaging on race in America. What do they say about that? Yeah, they're, they couldn't be on more different sides of this issue. This is a highly contentious one. Yesterday, when Trump came into town for the first day of the convention, just down the road in Charlotte, he talked a, a lot about this. Look, the Republicans truly believe that Donald Trump sees this the way they see this, which is that they have been put upon, that Democrats see them as somehow bad because of, of these contentious conversations. Let me play just a little bit of, of what was said. We are suddenly all bad. And so I think where, where white America feels frustrated makes us want to vote for Trump. So it's kind of backfiring. He wants to reinstate the United States back to where it should be. I don't know which America you are seeking. Mm -hmm. Is it 20 years ago? Is it 10 years ago? Is it the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s? So we were discriminated against. We were vilified. Mm -hmm. We do not want to go back to that. However, going back to a country that believes in the democracy, that's the country that we want to see. And just one way, Ellison, which is very, very real here, if you look behind me, this, uh, I think, 40-foot tall obelisk, is a monument to Confederate soldiers. There is an online petition. The NAACP has gotten involved. They want it taken down. For a lot of Republicans, this is all about history. They think these conversations are about being PC. But I will say that at least among these four women, they want to get together again, and they want to continue to have these kinds of conversations, Allison. Chris, I have to ask you before you go about mail-in voting. It has been such a hot topic over the past few uh -huh. weeks. How do the women feel about that? <laughs> Again, completely split. You know, Donald Trump has tried to say time and time and time again that it's going to be rife with fraud without any possible backup to that. So we had to ask the question because it's something, a question that has been raised here. They've had some questions in previous elections. Here's what they said about that. I do believe everyone should go be able to vote in person. I've always voted on election day. Um, I'm not real crazy about early voting. There's never been a study that suggested or in any way proven that there is a lack of integrity with mail-in voting. I definitely believe that you need to show your ID. You have to show your ID and everything else you do. But as Althea pointed out, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and it is definitely coming in a big way to North Carolina. We just got some new figures yesterday from one of the local stations. They say that 313,000 North Carolinians have made a request for mail-in ballots. That is 10 times what we saw in 2016. Wow. But you can see that the messaging on the Republican side, right? The re messaging on the Republican side seems to be working, because yeah. when you break that down, 53% of the requests are from Democrats, 31% from unaffiliated. Just 15% of those requests are coming from registered Republicans, Allison. Chris Jansing in Union County, North Carolina, thank you so much for sharing with us how voters there are feeling, suburban female voters, and thank you for being with us. Thank you.
we got a call uh, that January that we were going to lose, we were going to be shutting down iron making at the end of April. And iron making, steel making, we're all going to get laid off. A lot of those men that came in there are educated in that mill. Maybe in the real world, they don't have value, but because they come out of high school, a lot of them. But their life experience is irreplaceable. I'm very proud of Michigan. Dana's been around. I also like it because we happened to win here. So well, I was we thought happy. when Trump decided he was going to yeah, keep the mill. You know, protect the steel industry, the coal miners, the auto, and it just never, it just never appeared. He came to this area and he said, if you elect me, you'll see two and a half times, you'll see the steel industry, you guys will be fighting off orders. That's what he said. Check it out. Three years later, where are we now? These guys are out of work. They elected that guy and he lied. We just ended a nightmare known as NAFTA. They took our they took our jobs for a long time. Yeah, the nightmare continues, don't it? For guys who are getting laid off and like I said before, who basically have no skills other than in a steel mill, their nightmare is just beginning. If you get in a car accident, that cage, we make that steel. We make that family safe in there. And that's that's the pride that these guys and women have when they're making this steel. Heidi joins us now from Ecorse, Michigan. And Heidi, tell us more about what's going on there in Southeast Michigan. Yeah, Allison, the president may be talking tonight about the land of opportunity, but in 2016, he was trying to appeal to men like those who I talked to earlier this week, calling them the forgotten men and women of America, saying that he was going to bring back a bygone era of industrial glory. It was places like this where this steel complex behind me used to employ up to 16,000 employees in its heyday. This year, Ellison is going to be idling a huge portion of that, completely shutting down its steel and iron making business. And many of those workers, 1,500 this year alone, are going to lose their jobs, Ellison. And they say that this came as a surprise, not only because the president made all of these promises, about steel tariffs and cracking down on unfair trade practices, but because this company had taken unusual measures, uh, or the company, actually the city, to give the company tax credits to stay here. So it comes as a big blow to this community that's going to have a lot of impact, not just on these steel workers, but on all of the surrounding businesses, on the contractors who service the steel plant, on the companies where those contractors shop. This is a big disappointment for this community, Allison that is going to have big repercussions for families who live for generations around this steel mill. So Heidi, speaking of repercussions, how might this affect the November election? Right, so Trump won Michigan by such a hair. It was something like 10,000 to 11,000 votes, Ellison. And there were many of these white working class voters who had voted for Obama twice and then shipped it over to President Trump. It is these same voters who are seeing that despite the promises that were made about bringing back this era of prosperity for the middle class, that their sons and daughters are not getting the same opportunities that they had, like the gentleman that we featured in this steel mill. And so when you look at the polling right now, Joe Biden does have a definitive lead over President Trump in most polls. But a word of caution there, because Hillary Clinton also, according to the polls, had a lead over President or over candidate Trump at the time. And so the Democrats say that they absolutely cannot take this state for granted, but that this message that President Trump sold to so many of these working class voters has turned out to be a disappointment, at least in communities like this in Ecorse. Heidi, thank you so much for bringing us the latest uh, from the, that community and the uh, laid off steel workers there. I know uh, it's been a very tough time for them. Thanks for sharing their story. You bet. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see.
This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. New York City has a new plan for its schools, public, private, and charter. Some classes will now be outside this fall, but how will that work? NBC News correspondent Kristen Dahlgren joins me now. Kristen, tell us about this new learning program and where those outdoor classes will be. Hey, Allison. Well, it's still all in the works, but we're talking about putting kids outdoors anywhere they really can. We've heard principals mention parks. We've heard them mention closing off streets, uh, even maybe some outdoor dining places that aren't used during the day. It's really up to the principals. They have until Friday to come up with some type of plan. The mayor announced yesterday that he would be allowing schools to do this. And by this morning, they had already seen 243 applications from schools schools. We spoke with one assistant principal from Brooklyn, and here's how she described their plan. We are hoping to close down the adjoining streets around our school, as well as hoping to use parts of Brooklyn Bridge Park as much as possible. So the city also really pushing to get this outdoor learning into about 20. I'm asking people right now, uh, to pay attention to this storm, to get out of harm's way if there's an evacuation order in place, whether it's mandatory or voluntary, and understand our state uh, hasn't seen a storm surge like this uh, in many, many decades. We haven't seen uh, wind speeds like we're going to experience uh, in a very, very long time as well. Uh, so with that, I'm going to pause to take your questions uh, for a bit and, and we'll remind you that you can direct your questions to anyone on the team. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, we, we know that we've got about 2,000 uh, hotel and motel rooms tonight. 
that we've contracted for and, by, and we're continuing to contract for more as we find available rooms. Um, last night, uh, we, we put up more than 800 uh, in hotel rooms. Uh, and the vast majority of people, however, who evacuated are not asking the state uh, for assistance. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a little difference anytime you're in a different part of the state. Uh, the vast majority of people who are evacuating from southwest Louisiana, because we don't have a lot of public transportation there, they own their own vehicles and they're getting out on their own. So the best guess I can give you looking at the traffic from yesterday and what I've been told today by parish leaders, it's tens of thousands of people who have actually left southwest Louisiana, but it will, it will probably be by nightfall tonight uh, around 2,000 or so uh, that we have assisted in getting out and, and getting into a shelter. Um, and, and again, I think these numbers are going to go up after the storm once people have to be rescued from a house that is not habitable, uh, and then we're going to be putting them up in, sh in shelters. Again, uh, first priority will be uh, non-congregant sheltering, uh, but in order to transition and get them into those hotel and motel rooms where they're available, uh, we may have to at some point open up uh, congregant sheltering, which we will do. Uh, we're ready to do that if, if we have to. Yes, sir. We, we haven't activated the entire National Guard since Hurricane Isaac, uh, but we're doing it now because we anticipate uh, a need for very robust search and rescue efforts using um, the, the full array uh, that they have, aircraft, watercraft, uh, high water vehicles, uh, but also we're leaning forward to re restarting our community uh, based testing as soon as we possibly can. And so National Guardsmen are running those sites for us, both the federal surge sites and, and the sites that we're running uh, ourselves as, as a state. Uh, and they're also doing work at food banks. And so we, we, we still are in this pandemic emergency, and that's why we're going to have to have the entire National Guard for some period of time, uh, understanding that many National Guardsmen uh, in their uh, nine to five jobs, their regular jobs, are first responders. Um, and, and many of them uh, actually live in the areas that's actually being evacuated. So General Waddell is managing all of that and doing, doing uh, extremely well at it, I, I might add. And I've been very gratified to receive calls from neighboring governors offering their assistance. Um, and uh, we will be drawing up on uh, uh, their assets, uh, particularly in the National Guard, because not every state has the same type of equipment and the same type of, of uh, trained units. Um, you know, so we'll, we'll be looking for Mississippi, Arkansas, Texas, uh, and, and by the way, beyond that, uh, we have people on the ground in Louisiana now, not National Guard, uh, but search and rescue of uh, individuals from Tennessee um, and from elsewhere. And so that, so that we, have, we have staged uh, an awful lot of resources and assets uh, that we're going to be able to bring to bear uh, just as soon as it is safe to do so. Um, and, and look, we know we're going to have to do search and rescue, but I'm imploring the people in low-lying areas who, who've been asked to evacuate, uh, do that so that we don't have to come looking for you um, and, and we can go uh, spend, spend time on other individuals who, who may not live in an area uh, that is prone to flooding or for some other reason they just can't get out. But those people who can, you've got the time to do it now. So, so please do it. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, well, first of all, I'm always concerned about whether everyone's evacuating who needs to be evacuating, especially when you hear things like unsurvivable surge. Um, and, and we know that we're going to have life-threatening floodwaters in places that haven't seen it uh, in a very, very long time. And so, yeah, I'm concerned about that. That's why I started this press conference, uh, so I didn't want to wait the, the 40 minutes or so uh, to make the point. I wanted people to have that 40 minutes to, to start putting things in their vehicle and getting out of the area. So, yes, we are concerned. 
Um, look, we're going we're gonna to take advantage of all of the space available at hotels and motels that we can contract for, understanding that we have more uh, crew members in Louisiana prepositioned to restore electricity from various companies from, from across the country than we've ever had before a storm right now. So we're competing with them for space for uh, sheltering. Uh, but there's a lot of hotels and motels in Louisiana. We don't have a lot of, uh, of tourism going on right now because of COVID. We will use all of that available space. But look, we don't have to stop uh, inside the state line. So if we have to push people into uh, Texas or into Arkansas or Mississippi, we'll, we'll do that as well. And, and so we're, we're going to find the non-congregant sheltering uh, as best we can for as many people as we can as fast as we can because we want them to be safe from the storm and from COVID. And again, we will use our um, congregant shelters uh, as necessary, but hopefully for as short a period of time uh, as possible. Yes, sir. Uh, well, we own uh, shelters uh, in, in the Alexandria and Shreveport area, um, and, and I'm, I'm hesitant to tell you the answer to this because we don't want people driving up to those shelters yet uh, because we're, we're still directing people to hotels uh, and motels. But, but uh, you, know, you know where they are in Alexandria, the mass shelter facility we have there, the mega shelter, and also Joella up in, up in Shreveport. Um, and, and look, there are some parishes that have shelters open as well, but we really don't want people using that congregant shelter unless it's an absolute uh, last resort. And by the way, when we use them, we're going to make them as safe as they can possibly be uh, during COVID, but we cannot make them as safe as if people are able to uh, occupy a, a hotel room or a motel room and get those families uh, together and not in close proximity to people from outside the household. But we're going to have masks. We're going to have distancing to the maximum extent possible. The sanitation is going to be there um, and, and all of those things. But we just know that that environment is more conducive to the spread of, of the virus uh, than a hotel motel. Greg. You certainly may. In fact, I welcome that. Um, it's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I've been at this job for a while and done a lot of damage surveys, uh, mostly of tornadoes. Uh, I've been here on the coast for a couple of years. Uh, when you see a strong tornado and it's a much more localized event, uh, you know, speeds of that nature will completely level a house. Um, the difference here uh, with it, there's some physics difference, but the thing is, is uh, everyone needs to understand is that you're seeing sustained winds at 145. It's preying on every weak point of any structure, any weakness in any tree, and it's continuing and continuing and continuing for possibly multiple hours. Now, when the storm comes on shore, it's going to weaken. It's going to continue to weaken as it moves all the way up towards Shreveport before it finally uh, becomes a tropical storm and is no longer a hurricane, according to the current forecast. So what people need to understand is that first 50, 60 miles inland, um, I'm not saying that every single thing that stands right now is going to be laid to waste. But what people need to understand is, is a lot of structures are going to be leveled. Trees in large swaths are going to be down. Power lines down. So um, there are going to be neighborhoods. There's going to be places, uh, whether it be rural or in a town, that are going to be unrecognizable. You could drive by them today and drive by them in a couple of days and not realize you're in the same spot. And there's a history of this with all sorts of storms. Uh, I still like to use the recent one of Michael uh, on the Florida Panhandle and uh, in, into Georgia. Um, even to this day, they're still trying to rebuild and, and take care of things from that storm. 
Uh, though that was a slightly stronger storm, I still think it is a great uh, example for us to understand how widespread this damage may be and how significant the damage may be and that the risks are there um, beyond the water. So if you're inland, uh, these uh, extreme winds, again, may be seen well inland. Um, and that's something that most people don't assume. They assume with a hurricane, it, the extreme winds are at the coast, and if I live 30, 50 miles in, I'm okay. Um, I, I can't say that for this storm because it's moving at a fast clip. It's going to be moving at 15, 16, 17 miles per hour. So with 145 sustained and gusts over 170, uh, it's easy to have over 100 mile per hour winds 50, 60 miles inland, and then maybe a, a 20, 30 mile swath. Yes, sir. Uh, I talked to the president on um, Sunday. I spoke uh, with Administrator Gaynor yesterday. I also sp spoke with uh, Secretary Carson yesterday. I will speak with um, uh, Secretary of Commerce, uh, Wilbur Ross, later today. Um, so uh, I, I have not uh, spoken to the president with, since Sunday, but we, they've been paying a lot of attention to us here, especially out of FEMA Region 6 uh, in, in Texas. Uh, and so, um, you know, we, we, our communication uh, is, is good. Uh, it's more important right now that we're talking to the people in southwest Louisiana uh, because, quite frankly, what Washington can do for us, and, and, and they're already working on this is all post-storm um, relief now. Uh, we still have a few hours left, but, but that's all we've got is a few hours to get people in a better position. And that's what we're focused on uh, right now. Okay, so uh, look, I, I want to again uh, urge the people of Louisiana to take this storm with the seriousness that it clearly deserves. Uh, put yourself and your family in the best possible position in the next few hours. Uh, that means evacuating from those areas uh, that uh, are under an evacuation order, voluntary or mandatory. Um, and once, once it gets dark, understand the weather is going to degrade so fast and it's going to be so, so bad. The, the worst thing you can do at that point in time, if you're in southwest Louisiana, is to try to leave um, then because there will be many more hazards on the road. Um, and, and look, it's, it's going to be really, really tough uh, in your house as well, which is why we're trying to get you to make the, the right decision now, and, and that, is, that is to leave. Uh, the second thing is you may not have good communications uh, as the storm comes uh, ashore because uh, telephone lines and cell towers and, and so forth may be interrupted. But even if you have good communication and you try to call for help, uh, we don't typically send out first responders to help uh, while an emergency, is, uh, I'm sorry, while a hurricane is, is, is raging. Um, and so you're, you're not going to be able to avail yourself of assistance uh, should you need it. And so we're trying to get you to, to heed the warnings now so that that doesn't happen. And then uh, finally, I would encourage uh, people to pray uh, for uh, the, our state and for, for people uh, all across uh, our, our state, particularly in southwest Louisiana. Um, look, when you get a briefing like Ben just gave us on what to expect from this storm, it's kind of hard to know uh, what to pray for, but I know that we're faithful people here in Louisiana. We know how to pray um, and, and uh, for one another and, and for our families, and I encourage you to do that um, so, so that the impacts won't be uh, what we just heard discussed or that if those are the impacts that the people who are vulnerable to it uh, get out of the area so that we don't suffer the loss of life um, that would otherwise occur. So with, with that, we don't anticipate having another press conference today. We will if something changes, if there's information that we need to convey to you all. I would anticipate that we will have a press conference uh, tomorrow. We'll give you the, the exact time uh, on that. Um, but just because we're not going to have another press conference from here doesn't mean people shouldn't be paying attention. 
watch your local news, uh, look at the National Weather Service, pay attention for directives coming out of your offices of emergency preparedness and other local elected officials. And when you get that information, uh, use it to make the best possible decision uh, and make those decisions timely because our window is closing uh, over the next several hours. So, so God bless you. God bless our state. Uh, let's do the best we can. And, and I pray that the next time I speak to you all, uh, we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, how we were able to, to, to cope and, and the fact that, that people did heed the warning uh, and evacuate, that we were able to get them into safe shelters, safe from the storm and safe from COVID, all of those sorts of things. But we're only going to be able to have that conversation based on what people do over the next couple of hours. So God bless. We'll, we'll see you all tomorrow. Logic time scale. But the voyage into understanding how our world is shaped today by studying the fossil record isn't over yet. On this trip, we've seen examples of the power of fossils, how they inspire the pursuit. Residents along the Gulf Coast are bracing for potential devastation. Hurricane Laura gets set to make landfall tonight. It is intensifying rapidly and possibly ramping up to become a massive Category 4 hurricane. We've got complete coverage, but let's start with the man who's been following it all night long. Al, good morning. What do the maps show? Well, right now, guys, this is this is unfortunately coming to fruition the way we thought it would. Category two right now, they're in 15 miles south, southeast of Lake Charles. You can already see the feeder bands now pushing just to the south of Louisiana, 110 mile per hour winds moving northwest at 15. Category four storm by this afternoon around one o'clock. Winds and rain increased during the day from Corpus Christi all the way to New Orleans. Dangerous rain, wind gust, storm surge as this comes on shore Thursday morning around 1 a.m. Again, a Category 3, but don't worry about whether it's a 3 or 4. It's going to cause major impacts. Catastrophic storm surge will make it up to 30 miles inland. 10 to 15 foot storm surge from Port Arthur into central Louisiana. 30 mile storm surge, that's almost to I-10. The storm surge is the water that gets piled up on top of the tides as those winds come in. It's the deadliest hurricane threat. At 3 feet, that surge is considered life-threatening, can cause major problems in a home. By six feet. Those crashing waves push out the back walls of homes, breaking through doors and windows. Nine feet. This is where that surge can push further inland. Entire neighborhoods can be wiped out. Plus those destructive winds, damaging extreme winds could knock out power for days, guys. We're talking power outages. This is the outage potential map. You can see it goes all the way up into the Midwest as this system makes its way. And of course, the rain locally could be 15 inches of rain, widespread flash flooding, urban flooding, moderate to major river flooding as well. The closest we can compare this to, guys, is Hurricane Rita back in 2005. The surge went inland about 20 to 30 miles. This could actually go in 50 miles depending on this storm surge. So this is a very, very dangerous storm. We're going to continue to watch it. But again, don't pay attention to the categories. Pay attention to the impacts, mm -hmm. guys. Yeah, and what officials are telling you, Al, thank you very much. We move This morning, the coastal cities of Texas on edge as Hurricane Laura looms just hours from making landfall. There will be a lot of devastation wrecked upon Texas as the storm sweeps through. Governor Greg Abbott warning residents to brace for a possible Category 4 hurricane, increasing the counties under a disaster declaration to nearly 60. Don't know where we're going, but we're going to get away, though. Laura's wind speeds expected to top triple digits, which could help fuel a potentially life-threatening 13-foot storm surge. The warning to residents, don't waste time, get out now. Some people may choose to stay at home, and I think that kind of scares me because we don't ever know what these storms could possibly bring. Most are listening. We've boarded the house now completely, and now we're just starting to haul away things that uh, we want to make sure survive. 
Some choosing to stay despite the threat of a major hurricane. We know that there's going to be an aftermath and there's going to be a lot of cleanup to do afterwards. And we think that it's important to stay around if we feel safe where we're at. Officials cautioning at a certain point, first responders can't save you. Don't doubt 911. No one's going to answer. OK, and you are on your own. Beaumont's mayor Becky Ames has led her now deserted city through many disruptive hurricanes. Wednesday night into Thursday when this really ratchets up, what's keeping you up at night the most? Loss of life is the biggest um, concern that I would ever have when it comes to something like this. And there are fears, of course, of widespread power outages lasting for days. Governor Abbott here in Texas summoning some 9,000 utility workers with another 6,000 requested. And guys, you can expect them to be very busy over the coming days and potentially weeks. First Lady Melania Trump solo in the spotlight with a strikingly different tone than her husband, offering condolences for those affected by the coronavirus pandemic and acknowledging how difficult it's been for millions of Americans. I know many people are anxious and some feel helpless. I want you to know you're not alone. Donald will not rest until he has done all he can to take care of everyone impacted by this terrible pandemic. Speaking from the newly renovated White House Rose Garden, the First Lady sharing her personal story. As an immigrant and a very independent woman, I understand what a privilege it is to live here and to enjoy the freedoms and opportunities that we have. And years after endorsing her husband's birther claims about Barack Obama, reflecting on the nation's racial unrest. I urge people to come together in a civil manner. I also ask people to stop the violence and looting being done in the name of justice and never make assumptions based on the color of a person's skin. The first lady whose Be Best campaign aims to combat cyberbullying, addressing how mean social media can be, while noting President Trump's unvarnished opinions. Total honesty is what we as citizens deserve from our president. Whether you like it or not, you always know what he's thinking. The president putting the powers of his office to work for his re-election. From the unprecedented use of the White House grounds for his wife's convention speech to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo shattering a long-standing tradition that American diplomats do not participate in political conventions. Speaking from the site of an official trip to Jerusalem. President Trump has put his America First vision into action. It may not have made him popular in every foreign capital, but it's worked. The State Department insists Pompeo's partisan speech highlighting the president's policies was delivered in his personal capacity. President Trump also showcasing his pardon power, granting clemency to a convicted bank robber who founded a program that helps former inmates. As I grant John, I'm not sure you know this, a full pardon and hosting a recorded naturalization ceremony for the primetime audience. So help me God. So help me God. And helping celebrate their father, two of the president's children. As a recent graduate, I can relate to so many of you who might be looking for a job. My father built a thriving economy once, and believe me, he will do it again. I'd like to speak directly to my father. I miss working alongside you every single day but I'm damn proud to be on the front lines of this fight. Eric Trump's message to his father last night. The First Lady's speech also drawing attention for the lack of social distancing of the Rose Garden and very limited mask wearing. At least some of those there were tested for the virus before attending, but the setup really seemed to minimize the threat of the pandemic. The president's top economic advisor earlier in the night even referring to it in the past tense. Savannah. All right, Peter. So we've had two nights down, two more to go. We're going to hear from the vice president tonight. But you can really tell a lot uh, by, by watching the speakers who the campaign is trying to reach, where they think there's some fertile ground for their reelection strategy. What have you learned? 
Yes, and I think you're right. These first two nights have really been the sort of back and forth between those fiery speeches and trying to sell that softer version of the president, granting that pardon, hosting a naturalization ceremony for new citizens, all people of color. His kids speaking as well. The first lady's empathetic remarks. The goal here to both energize the base, to bring back those disaffected Republicans who may have been turned off by President Trump, and to speak directly to those suburban voters, particularly women who polls show have increasingly flocked to Joe Biden. Tonight, as you know, we're going to hear from the vice president, Mike Pence, the South Dakota governor, Kristi Noem, and one of the president's fiercest defenders, Kellyanne Conway, just days before her departure from the White House. Savannah. All right, Peter, thank you. And a reminder, we'll have more on the first lady's message in our next half hour. And NBC's live coverage of the Republican National Convention continues tonight. And tomorrow we get started at 10 o'clock Eastern. First Lady Melania Trump making her most personal appeal yet for her husband. I'm here because we need my husband to be our president and commander in chief for four more years. Looking to court a constituency President Trump has struggled with, suburban women. We must make sure that women are heard and that the American dream continues to thrive. For the first lady who spoke for more than 20 minutes, the speech was her longest to date and perhaps her most consequential. During the 2016 convention, Mrs. Trump was accused of lifting parts of Michelle Obama's speech from 2008. You do what you say you're going to do. you do what you say. An aide was blamed for the mistake. This year, the first lady's advisors say she was heavily involved in writing the remarks. From the day that I met him, he has only wanted to make this country the best it can be. In her nearly four years at the White House, the First Lady has picked her moments to speak out carefully. Her largest initiative came in 2018 when she announced her Be Best anti-bullying campaign. Let us teach our children the difference between right and wrong and encourage them to be best in their individual paths in life. The move gained praise, but the first lady also faced questions about her husband's habit of tweeting insults at his rivals. I don't agree always what he posts, but his action is his action, and I tell him that. One of her loudest statements was not spoken at all, but rather these words written on the back of her jacket. I really don't care, do you? She wore it while visiting migrant children at the U.S.-Mexico border later explaining. It was for the people and for the left wing media who are criticizing me and I want to show them that I don't care. Melania Trump is often at her husband's side for critical moments on the world stage and at home, but she's also spoken out on her own. In 2018, saying she was blindsided by the zero tolerance policy, which led to family separations at the border, and more recently tweeting out an image of herself wearing a mask, weeks before her husband started wearing one in public. A Slovenian native and former model, the first lady did not immediately move move into the White House when her husband won the 2016 election, instead staying at Trump Tower in New York City to focus on her son, Barron. But according to former First Lady Laura Bush's chief of staff, once Mrs. Trump arrived in Washington, she quickly assumed a quiet but powerful presence. She's chosen to use her platform very strategically. And when she feels she can make a contribution without having to be the loudest voice in the room every day. Kristen, she really picks and chooses her moments. What do you expect her to do for the rest of the campaign? Do you think she'll be uh, high profile on the trail, even if it's a virtual one? Well, I think to some extent, Savannah, look, before the coronavirus hit, the first lady was expected to play a larger role on the trail than she did in 2016. You might recall she was for the most part out of sight then. Well, Mrs. Trump was expected to headline several fundraisers this spring. They got canceled because of the virus. Still, you can expect to see her engage in virtual campaign events, Savannah. For President Trump, she's really a key asset. She helps to humanize the president, and she's also defended him after some of his most controversial moments moment. So we'll be watching closely, Savannah. All right, Kristen, welcome with a closer look from the White House. Thanks, Kristen. We all know Donald Trump makes no secrets 
about how he feels about things. Whether you like it or not, you always know what he's thinking. My deepest sympathy goes out to everyone who has lost a loved one. And my prayers are with those who are ill or suffering. The president has held China accountable for covering up the China virus and allowing it to spread death and economic destruction in America and around the world. Presidential leadership came swiftly and effectively with an extraordinary rescue for health and safety to successfully fight the COVID virus. Our economic health is coming back with emergency spending and tax cuts, Americans are going back to work. And the economy soared to new heights, heights never seen before. Wages went through the roof. Unemployment reached the historic lows, especially for black Americans, Hispanic Americans, and women. Trade deals were ripped up and renegotiated. Lights were turned back on in abandoned factories across our country. As a recent graduate, I can relate to so many of you who might be looking for a job. My father built a thriving economy once, and believe me, he will do it again. I learned what was happening to me had a name. It was called being canceled, as in annulled, as in revoked, as in made void. Canceled is what's happening to people around this country who refuse to be silenced by the far left. Many are being fired, humiliated, or even threatened. But I would not be canceled. Let's make America great again. We believe in freedom of thought and expression. Think what you want, seek out the truth, learn from those with different opinions, and then freely make your voice heard to the world. Joe Biden is a politician who has been in government for 47 years. He's a career politician who's never signed the front of a check and does not know the slightest thing about the American worker or the American business. Compare President Trump with the disastrous record of Joe Biden, who's consistently called for more war. Joe Biden voted for the Iraq War, which President Trump has long called the worst geopolitical mistake of our generation. In the Middle East, when Iran threatened, the president approved a strike that killed the Iranian terrorist, Qasem Soleimani. Moving the embassy to Jerusalem, peace in the Middle East. Today, because of the president's determination and leadership, the ISIS caliphate is wiped out. It's gone. In North Korea, the president lowered the temperature and against all odds got the North Korean leadership to the table. No nuclear tests, no long-range missile tests. I have reflected on the racial unrest in our country. It is a harsh reality that we are not proud of parts of our history, focused on our future while still learning from our past. We must remember that today we are all one community comprised of many races, religions, and ethnicities. Our diverse and storied history is what makes our country strong, and yet we still have so much to learn from one another. With that in mind, I like to call on the citizens of this country to take a moment, pause, and look at things from all perspectives. I urge people to come together in a civil manner so we can work and live up to our standard American ideals. Overnight, protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin turning deadly. Authorities clearing the streets after reports of gunshots. Police say at least two people are dead, one person injured. Hours earlier, the governor had declared a state of emergency, mobilizing more National Guard members. But some protesters ignored a curfew, authorities deploying tear gas. This was the third straight night of violent protests here, and this community is on edge. This is pathetic. This is pathetic for to happen in our country, and it's in the state of Wisconsin, and it's just anarchists going around and taking advantage of the situation. The chaos came despite Jacob Blake's family pleading for peaceful protests. I shot my son seven times. Seven times. 
like he didn't matter. But my son matters. His family is now demanding the officers involved in Sunday's shooting captured on the cell phone video be fired and the one who shot Blake in the back be arrested. The eyewitness who shot the video says he heard officers yell, drop the knife, but police haven't said if they ever recovered a weapon. He was not treated like a human that day. He was treated like some foreign object that didn't belong. Blake's family now says the 29-year-old spinal cord is severed and that he's paralyzed from the waist down, though doctors aren't sure it's permanent. Blake's mother tells us she'd last spoken to Jacob Sunday morning as he prepared to celebrate his son's eighth birthday. The boy was in the back seat when his father was shot. When you first walked into that hospital room and you saw your son, what went through your head? So many things. I was just so elated just simply being able to see him and he's alive. The U.S. Department of Justice is now assisting state authorities with the investigation. Wisconsin's Department of Justice says the officers are on administrative leave and are fully cooperating. Kenosha police officers do not wear body cameras, but the Blake family wants any dash cam footage or any other video of the incident released. Blake's family now plans to file a civil lawsuit. Now, over the last three days, the Kenosha Police Department has not commented, only to say that its officers were responding to a domestic incident. But again, two people dead, one person injured, following another night of unrest here, Savannah. All right, Gabe Gutierrez on a really devastating night there. Gabe, thank you. It's long been said, maintain six feet of social distance. But depending on the circumstances, that might not be far enough. That's according to new research published in the British Medical Journal, finding COVID-19 particles can travel up to 26 feet. The viral particle concentrations can build up and infect somebody beyond that you know, magical six-foot ring we've been all talking about for the past couple months. When you talk, cough, breathe, or sneeze, two types of particles come out. Respiratory droplets fall quickly to the ground, most traveling no more than six feet. But aerosol particles can linger in the air for hours and travel even greater distances. Experts say it's useful to think of another type of aerosol, cigarette smoke. When it comes out of a smoker, it, it disperses, it doesn't fall to the ground like the droplets, and then... It does different things depending on the setting. If you're outdoors in a windy day, it goes away very quickly. Masks that fit well enough to filter out smoke may be even more important than washing hands. Researchers say aerosol transmission explains why so few super spreader events have been traced to outdoor gatherings. One of the biggest risk factors we have for this virus is time spent indoors. In fact, Nearly all of the outbreaks of three or more people occurred indoors. That's why air circulation in planes, offices and schools may be a critical factor. A government watchdog agency recently found over one third of public schools in the U.S. need improvements to their air systems for proper ventilation. Some districts are investing in new filters, but outdoor classrooms could be a simpler and safer solution. What I am shocked is that we don't have the National Guard basically setting up just open tents, just, just a roof with the sides open on all the schools around the country, you know, so that all the classes can be done outdoors. While in many circumstances, like being in a grocery store, restaurant, or even an airplane or an office space, there's only so much you can do to social distance. But experts say people should always avoid talking loudly and always wear a properly fitting mask whenever possible. So, Dr. Azar, let's start with you. I wanted to squeeze this in here because it's a hot topic today. On Monday, uh, the CDC reversed guidance on COVID-19 testing, uh, now stating that healthy people who've been exposed for at least 15 minutes still do not necessarily need a test if they don't have symptoms. So this excludes, obviously, vulnerable people like the elderly and those with chronic medical conditions. Uh, and state and local health officials may still recommend a test. But a lot of people are buzzing about it, even here in the studio, what that means uh, for keeping transmission from increasing. 
Yeah, so I, I think one of the biggest concerns, Chanel, is that contact tracing efforts could very well be compromised by this. Mm. It appears that, that part of the rationale behind this guideline is that if you are an exposed individual, individual, you're supposed to quarantine for 14 days. That hasn't changed. But the difference here is that what about your contacts, right? If you are exposed and you get tested and you test positive, your contacts need to go into quarantine, right? Mm -hmm. Or potentially get tested themselves. So if you're only going into quarantine, but you're not necessarily getting tested, we don't know about what's happening in terms of your potential to spread to others. We've talked about this a lot. Asymptomatic transmission is a very, 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 very real thing. That I think is one of the biggest concerns to come out of this. I think we'll be hearing about this for a couple of days. Absolutely. It seems like there's a gap there. All right. Let me ask you about the flu shot. This is a big deal. When yes. should you get it? Will we have to worry about shortages? There are a lot of people, I promise you, who are watching right now who normally don't get one. You know, you're supposed right. to, but you just don't feel like dealing. But this year, I think people, you know, more people will be prone to get it. Yeah. Absolutely, Chanel. This year, more than ever, we are encouraging people to get their flu shots. For adults, remember, it decreases severity of illness, and it also reduces hospitalizations, which is so important because we need to preserve our resources given the underlying or overshadowing, I should say, COVID-19 pandemic. And for children especially, it's important. The flu shot can reduce mortality. In terms of when to get it, you know, experts generally say if you're if you're otherwise healthy, around September is appropriate. If you're older or have underlying medical conditions or are compromised, maybe you wait a little bit longer to early October. But by the end of October, CDC wants most people vaccinated. In terms of shortages, in the anticipation of this twindemic that we might have, uh, flu production has been ramped up, so we don't anticipate any shortages. I have time for one more question. Causing some confusion is that there's overlap in COVID-19 and flu symptoms. Mm -hmm. Can you quickly walk us through what those viruses have in common and then hit what seems to be distinct differences? Differences? Yeah. So I think it's kind of easy if you look at the graphic of, of symptoms. There's probably more similarity than differences. We're talking fever, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, sore throat, headache, GI symptoms. Both flu and COVID share those, and a test might be the only thing that can distinguish them in certain cases. But as we've learned with COVID, it's a very protean bug. That means it presents in a variety of different ways, particularly that loss of taste and smell that was so illuminating in the spring. But I think a few other aspects of it, just from an epidemiological perspective, you're probably contagious a little while longer with COVID than you are with flu. The incubation period is longer, two to 14 days, as opposed to one to four days with flu. And of course, the big thing with aerosol transmission, the concern about super spreading events, especially in small, enclosed, poorly ventilated areas, Areas that is a concern with COVID and not necessarily with flu. Oh, Dr. Azar, I wish we were talking about a happier topic, but it's, it's an important topic. I miss seeing your face. It's good to talk to you this morning. You too. All right. <laughs> Dylan, I'm just like, oh. I know. I think everybody has that sentiment, Chanel. So <laughs> yeah. there, there are a number of ways to get a flu shot this year. Vicki Wynn is here to let us know how. And Vicki, I know I always get my flu shot at work. Calvin, you know, and, and the kids, when they go to their doctor, they just end up getting a flu shot. Is it is it going to be the same this year? Things will be a little different this year, Dylan, because a lot of offices are still closed. So we're used to getting their flu shot at work. That may not be an option. The good news is tons of other places to get your flu shot. Walgreens, CVS, both saying they're anticipating 50 to 100 percent increases wow. in the number of people who want to get a flu shot, but they are prepared to meet that demand. If you are going to go to your doctor or pediatrician, ask if you can all get the shot at the same time. That helps to reduce the number of visits that you have to take to the doctor. And also check a website called vaccinefinder.org for locations that are near you. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people staying out of the doctor's office because they don't want to contract COVID-19. So, how do people stay safe when they are finally going to get the flu shot? Yeah, first thing, very important to call ahead and figure out what is the protocol. A lot of places are taking appointment only. Some will offer walk-in, but you need to be prepared. Ask if you can fill out any of those forms ahead of time electronically so you can limit your time in the office. Be prepared to wear a mask. And a lot of offices are asking you to stay outside or in your car until it's your turn to come in. Of course, you're going to want to wash your hands and make sure that you limit your time in that office. Try to get the first appointment of the day if you can. Mm -hmm. and, and what about cost? You know, because so many people are doing it a little bit differently this year. Will there be an added cost? So generally, if you do have insurance, the good news here is that it will be covered. Your flu shot will not cost you a penny. You can also do a Google search or an Internet search of uh, free flu shots in your area, your city or your county. And also, 
think if you're a college student and you are on campus, a lot of those campuses have free flu shots. Veterans, same thing. Go to your local VA. That's just going to be for the veteran, though, not the rest of the family. And if you don't have insurance, check GoodRx.com. They will have a location of free flu shots in the area. I also want to remind people, Costco, $19.99. You don't even have to be a member, and that's if you don't have insurance. Mm -hmm. And for our seniors, bring your ID. Ask about that senior discount. Wow, really good advice. Mm -hmm. Saving us money and saving our health, too. Yes, <laughs> thank always. you very much, Vicki and Dr. Natalie Azar. Thank you as well. Across the country, schools reversing their decision to hold in-person classes after COVID-19 outbreaks. At UNC Chapel Hill, Classes abruptly halted just days after move-in. Students there not tested before coming back. But at Purdue University in Indiana, an unprecedented undertaking. Before all 40,000 students start classes this month, they're required to take a COVID test. Testing will be very, very important and will be a key element of protecting our, our college campuses. But unlike most COVID testing that involves a large, often uncomfortable swab, to get a sample from the back of the nose, Purdue students will just spit into this tiny tube, something they can do at home with this kit. The convenience of that, and so I think particularly for this generation of students, it was a good one that allowed us to, to reach them where they were. Purdue is one of 65 schools working with Vault Health, formerly a men's health company, now offering this at-home COVID saliva test developed by Rutgers University. Is the saliva test a game changer? It is a game changer. First of all, it's a much easier test to administer. You're spitting into a tube, which just about everybody can do, even kids, and you're just giving us enough spit to be able to tell if there's virus in there. I ordered a kit from Vault's website. It arrived in two days. I have my materials here. What do I do? I set up a video okay, chat so with a clinician who made sure I did the test correctly. I made sure to not eat, drink, or put anything in my mouth for 30 minutes. So all you need to do now is go ahead and spit. Oh man, this is gonna take a while. I think the record was about 30 seconds. I was not so speedy. <laughs> How many times a day do you have to watch people do this? <laughs> Enough. <laughs> Two minutes later. Any tricks to this? Yeah, smelling pickles in a jar, thinking about food, smelling citrus. You should have told me to bring my pickles in a jar out sooner. I have nothing, I have nothing. All right, let me think about mouth-watering foods. I feel like it's working. It took some time to All work right. up about a spoonful of saliva. Am I there? Oh, that's pretty good. Yes. You're there. A quick mix with a preservative to keep my sample fresh. Then I put it in a pre-addressed bag to be overnighted to the Rutgers lab in New Jersey. Vault says results are available in two to three days, a big advantage over swab tests that have seen delays up to 14 days. Vault's test is one of two strictly saliva tests given emergency authorization by the FDA. Yale University created the other one, but it's not an at-home test. How is this test better than what we've been seeing with the nasal swab? Well, the false negative rate is really what we're concerned with. Telling somebody that they're negative when actually they are sick is very dangerous. And so the saliva test has a 1% or even less than 1% false negative rate. But scientists caution there's not enough data yet to know how much virus is in saliva. They're generally very active accurate. They're probably a little bit less sensitive than the nasal swab, which is the term we use to mean that if people have very, very small amounts of virus, it's possible that the nasal swab would detect that, whereas the saliva wouldn't. The test is also pricey, $150 if you order it directly from the company. Right now, Vault is running about 80,000 tests a day, and they say as that number goes up, the cost will come down. For students like 18-year-old Clara Terry, who will be a freshman at Purdue, spitting in the tube was easy. I've heard like with the nose one, um, like it hurts. This was not painful at all. Now, even though this test is done at home, a key part of Vault's test is you have to do it live over a video call with a clinician to ensure that you're doing it correctly and that it's your saliva. I got the results of my test two days later, negative. The PGA, <laughs> NBA, as you said, NHL are all among the pro sports leagues that are now using these saliva tests. And in large part, they're a lot easier and less invasive than that. I was going to say, them. no wonder the kids want them, but there's always a question of cost. So mm -hmm. how much would this cost? Yeah, it's $150, but it is open to anyone. So you just have to go on Vault's website and do that. 
So that means you don't have to be a professional athlete, you don't have to be a student, you can just clickety-clack and get the test? Yes, exactly. But the colleges and universities are investing millions of dollars. I mean, yeah. you're looking at 40,000 students at Purdue alone. They say it's a worthwhile investment to try to protect their students and staff. Okay, and is there a certain time frame, like students need to get this test by a certain time? For the Purdue students, they want them to take it within two weeks before going on uh. to campus. But as you know, Hoda, I mean, you could take the test, be negative, and then a few, data, a few days later be positive. So yeah. there are limitations. Okay, all right, this is a good breakthrough. Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four year degree, but a four year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. We actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. The smoke obscured the sunrise. It was a second violent night in Kenosha, Wisconsin, after the shooting of Jacob Blake. His family says the 29-year-old spinal cord is severed and that he's paralyzed from the waist down, though doctors aren't sure it's permanent. He shot my son seven times, seven times. Like he didn't matter, but my son matters. Overnight, some protesters here ignored a curfew and clashed with police in riot gear. The state had deployed the National Guard, but it didn't stop the destruction. It's right before dawn, and firefighters are here at the scene trying to put out hot spots. Much of this city block was looted and burned overnight. Blake's family is encouraging peaceful protests. Do Jacob justice on this level and examine your hearts. This new video shows the shooting from a different angle, but it's still not clear exactly what was said between police and Blake or why he was walking around the front of his SUV. An officer fired at least seven shots, hitting Blake in the back while his children inside the car watched, including his son on his eighth birthday. 
He loves his family. You, you all took him from his family. You all stood by and let it happen. I just want my brother. Exactly three months after the death of George Floyd, Blake's shooting is the latest flashpoint over race and policing. Garcia Delgado says she ran out of her apartment with her young child, fearing for her life. It's heartbreaking. It's really heartbreaking. How, how can you destroy your city, your home? How can you do this? But for Bernadette Prince, a protester with three sons, the frustration has reached a boiling point. You get mad when we start destroying things. This is what happened when you do this, when you keep killing black people for no reason. No comment today from Kenosha police. The Justice Department is now assisting state authorities with the investigation. Tonight, the governor says there will be an increased National Guard presence here. The new analysis from researchers at MIT and the University of Oxford call the six-foot social distancing rule outdated science. In the just-published report, evidence suggests the coronavirus could travel up to 26 feet in the air. With viral spread amplified by someone coughing or shouting, several other factors like ventilation, room occupancy, and exposure time all play a role. One of the biggest risk factors we have for this virus is time spent indoors. In fact, nearly all of the outbreaks of three or more people occurred indoors. Multiple studies show when we talk, cough, or breathe, a stream of two type of droplets are sent through the air, respiratory and aerosol particles. Researchers say the smaller, lighter aerosol particles can linger in the air for hours, traveling much farther. The warning comes just as some students across the country return to the classroom and where mass mandates and ventilation systems are being scrutinized. With no one-size-fits-all rule, the new report suggests six feet apart should be a starting point, but increasing your social distance isn't always an option. The general public should not be scared about this, but they should certainly be aware. The more you can separate from other people, the less likely you are to get coronavirus. And for those returning to the office, no matter how far spread apart you are, experts agree wearing a mask gives you an extra layer of protection, minimizing your risk even when few others are around. Tonight, Americans encouraged to take a step back as our nation moves forward. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News, Los Angeles. Jerry Falwell Jr. took over Liberty University, one of the largest evangelical schools in the world, over a decade ago after his father's death. Now he tells the Wall Street Journal that a group of self-righteous people are behind the push to remove him. Today, the university is saying it has accepted his resignation in the wake of multiple scandals. Reuters reported that the Falwells became entangled with Giancarlo Granda over eight years ago after meeting the then 20-year-old at a Miami hotel. In a statement, Falwell said his wife Becky had an affair with Granda, who later tried to extort them. Granda denies the accusation, telling Reuters that Jerry knew about the affair and would sometimes watch him and Becky together. Granda sharing phone conversations with Reuters, including this exchange from 2018. His new thing is like telling me every time he hooks up with people, like, <laughs> like I don't have feelings or something. You don't make it jealous, though. Yeah. Aww. All of this less than a month after Falwell posted and then deleted this photo on Instagram. Despite his defense that it was all in good fun, Liberty University put the 58-year-old on indefinite leave. In a statement Monday night, the school said additional matters came to light that made it clear that it would not be in the best interest of the university for him to return from leave. According to the university, Falwell responded by agreeing to resign immediately, but then instructed his attorneys not to send his resignation. In an interview with the Wall Street Journal late Monday, Falwell said he would indeed step down, acknowledging that some of his posts on social media had embarrassed the school. Tonight, Liberty University says its new leaders are committed to being good stewards, while also offering heartfelt prayers to the Falwell family. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News. At 88 years old, in a cap and gown, Miriam Schreiber savors a moment she's dreamed of for decades. Due to the events beyond my control, I was never able to get my high school diploma. This has been 
a profound regret of mine all my life. Schreiber's education disrupted by a desperate journey to survive the Holocaust. Her family living for years on the run, hiding from the Nazis, eventually sent to a slave labor camp in Siberia. And nobody would have faulted her for just giving up, but she didn't. Uh, she, of course, learned all the languages everywhere she went. Today, she's fluent in six, learning English when she immigrated to the United States to raise a family. The generations after live awed and inspired by her. Congratulations, buddy. This uh, honorary diploma uh, is, is well-deserved, and she certainly, in the school of life, has earned it. Perhaps a lesson that with perseverance and a grateful heart. It really means the world to me. Thank you so much. Our greatest moments are yet to come. Katie Beck, NBC News. Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we could just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Too often. Hoda, good morning. You can feel the energy and the excitement here on this centennial because history is being made. Central Park is 167 years old, and while there are plenty of statues of men here, this is the first time we're seeing the history and the contributions of real life women being honored. So I want to introduce you to Brenda Berkman. You are part of Monumental Women, the organization that made all of this possible. Brenda, this idea has been seven years in the making, and now on on this day, you've got these barrier-breaking women so like Secretary Clinton speaking right now. You're here. What does this day mean for you? 
And know their Monumental Women is like over the top ecstatic that finally, in the midst of a pandemic, so we've been able to Susan, put the first Elizabeth statue of real women in Central Park in its 167-year history. And it was not an easy journey, but, you know, for an all-volunteer nonprofit, small, to raise a million and a half dollars and to carry out the, the sculptor crafting this beautiful work of art and creating an education program and a challenge to municipalities to honor more women and people of color in their public spaces. For monumental women to have accomplished that today is just a dream come true. And it's an accomplishment. I think it's also important for our audience to know that even with Sojourner Truth being here, that's also the first time that a black person is being honored inside, as a statue inside the park. What do you hope that people take away when they walk past this one? So we really hope that people learn the history of women, and especially the women's suffragists that are portrayed, and women's rights, anti-slavery advocates and organizers in here. And you see the three of them working together, and they, they never... They had they tough times. We can't even imagine they what they went through in order to accomplish what they did. They started they a movement that was the largest peaceful enfranchisement of people in history. And it's to, to be able to take inspiration from them, particularly in this time, that we cannot lose hope, that working together in community, each bringing our own special skills of organizing and speaking and writing. A message for today. A message for today. Because and these were three New York women who worked together. And these three women never themselves got the opportunity to legally vote. Well, today is the day that we get to honor them. Today is the day that we get to honor their contributions, the way that they worked together and changed all of our lives. So will you do us the honor? Will you lead us off in the big reveal, Brenda? I will in a minute or two because we're just finishing up the speech by Secretary Clinton. Okay, and then one once you actually, once Secretary Clinton finishes, then we're going to be able to show you guys these, this incredible statue with these three women, as you mentioned, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. We're going to see Sojourner Truth. We're also going to see Susan B. Anthony, the women who paved the way for us to have these rights that we have here today. Okay, guys, hang that. Morgan, hang tight there. We'll come back to you. And but let's keep commemorating Women's Equality Day. And here is Renee Elise Goldsberry, also known as Angelica from the original <laughs> Hamilton Broadway cast, reciting words and anthems of the suffrage movement. Well, children, where there is so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. I think that twixt the Negroes of the South and the women at the North, all talking about rights, the white men will be in a fix pretty soon. But what's all this here talking about? What means this votes for women? Just this. The time has come when they may voice with free men concerns of land and home. Then snap the ancient tether enthralling us too long and stoutly pull together to right a grievous wrong. Once more awakes the spirit of the just and a worldwide flame is kindled from the dust. Women, for the right we know, for the duty that we owe, for all souls now here and coming, vote we must. Let us stand together, women, hard and fast. Let us vow to keep the faith until the last. By the trust the world has learned, by the falsehood it has spurned, we will vote and rise above the vanished past. Then, sisters of our nation, put forth your mightiest nerve. Remember with elation the glorious cause you serve. Enlist your best endeavor, whatever that may be. With votes for women ever, press on to victory. We the people, all the people, how Sisters work 
striving for the light, brothers striving for the right. We the people, all the people, how, how it rings. Wow. So, standing O. She deserves a standing O. Standing here on my arm. Oh, my gosh. Let's go back to Morgan. I know we're trying to uh, get that statue revealed. What's the latest? <laughs> That's right, Savannah. Now is the big moment that we've all been waiting for, that bronze ceiling being broken. Brenda, will you lead us off in the countdown? So I want everyone to start counting. Start counting. Five, four, three, two. working together, these three women who shared the stage. They went to the same conferences, and now their contribution to history is being made. And all these people are here today to see it and to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. Savannah, Oda, Craig. What a moment. 100 years in the making. It's a beautiful No statue. kidding. And I just keep picturing little girls walking by that statue and going, oh, wait, who is that? Who is that? Who is that? Finally, statues of women in Central Park. Pretty cool. Women have been running for office in the U.S. before they were even granted the right to vote. But no woman has ever held the highest office or even served as vice president. In August, Senator Kamala Harris made history as the first black and Indian American woman on a major party ticket. But she isn't the first woman to tread these waters. Two other VP campaigns can teach us about how the media has historically treated women politicians. And they might give us a glimpse into what to expect in 2020. In 1984, Geraldine Ferraro, a congresswoman from Queens, received a call from then-Democratic presidential candidate Walter Mondale asking her to be his running mate. She would become the first woman to run for VP for a major political party. The race was on. And then came the scrutiny. Ferraro was shamed for being a working mother. In an interview, Barbara Walters noted that Ferraro missed weekends with her kids because of her career and wondered why she'd kept her maiden name. The press secretary for Republican Vice President George Bush referred to her with a sexist slur in the Wall Street Journal. Bush tried to school her in international diplomacy in a famous debate clash. Let me help you with the difference, Ms. Ferraro, between Iran and the embassy in Lebanon. Let me just say, first of all, that I almost resent Vice President Bush, your patronizing attitude that you have to teach me about foreign policy. But the biggest scandal of Ferraro's campaign was not about Ferraro at all. It was about her husband, John Zaccaro. Here's what happened. They filed separate tax returns. She planned to release hers, he did not, and the media lost it. Rumors circulated about ties between her husband's business and organized crime. Notably, she was of Italian-American heritage, so it's hard to ignore the role her ethnicity played in these rumors. Ferraro held a marathon press conference. The scandal proved to be overblown. The Mondale Ferraro ticket lost to Ronald Reagan and George Bush by the second largest margin in election history. It wasn't until 24 years later, in 2008, when Republican Senator John McCain chose Alaska Governor Sarah Palin as his VP, that we'd see another woman on a major party's ticket. But the public still hadn't learned its lesson from the Ferraro campaign. Palin faced the same kinds of sexism, both overt and disguised. CNN anchor John Roberts suggested becoming a VP might take Palin away from her kids for too long. Vanity Fair editor Todd Purdom called her the, quote, first indisputably fertile female to dare to dance with the big dogs. Meanwhile, pundits fixated on Palin's sex appeal. She was the first woman in power that a lot of people felt was very physically attractive. Hmm. And people didn't know what to do with that. They never saw that before. They got one thing right. Society has always seen women in power as threatening. They questioned their competence, their sex appeal, their audacity to run for office. This year, we'll see if America can look past gender to evaluate candidates based on policy and merit, not sex appeal. After all, there are so many more important things to pay attention to.
We all know Donald Trump makes no secrets about how he feels about things. Whether you like it or not, you always know what he's thinking. My deepest sympathy goes out to everyone who has lost a loved one. And my prayers are with those who are ill or suffering. The president has held China accountable for covering up the China virus and allowing it to spread death and economic destruction in America and around the world. Presidential leadership came swiftly and effectively with an extraordinary rescue for health and safety to successfully fight the COVID virus. Our economic health is coming back with emergency spending and tax cuts, Americans are going back to work. And the economy soared to new heights, heights never seen before. Wages went through the roof. Unemployment reached the historic lows, especially for black Americans, Hispanic Americans, and women. Trade deals were ripped up and renegotiated. Lights were turned back on in abandoned factories across our country. As a recent graduate, I can relate to so many of you who might be looking for a job. My father built a thriving economy once, and believe me, he will do it again. I learned what was happening to me had a name. It was called being canceled, as in annulled, as in revoked, as in made void. Canceled is what's happening to people around this country who refuse to be silenced by the far left. Many are being fired, humiliated, or even threatened. But I would not be canceled. Let's make America great again. We believe in freedom of thought and expression. Think what you want, seek out the truth, learn from those with different opinions, and then freely make your voice heard to the world. Joe Biden is a politician who has been in government for 47 years. He's a career politician who's never signed the front of a check and does not know the slightest thing about the American worker or the American business. Compare President Trump with the disastrous record of Joe Biden, who's consistently called for more war. Joe Biden voted for the Iraq War, which President Trump has long called the worst geopolitical mistake of our generation. In the Middle East, when Iran threatened, the president approved a strike that killed the Iranian terrorist, Qasem Soleimani. Moving the embassy to Jerusalem, peace in the Middle East. Today, because of the president's determination and leadership, the ISIS caliphate is wiped out. It's gone. In North Korea, the president lowered the temperature and against all odds got the North Korean leadership to the table. No nuclear tests, no long-range missile tests. I have reflected on the racial unrest in our country. It is a harsh reality that we are not proud of parts of our history, focused on our future while still learning from our past. We must remember that today we are all one community comprised of many races, religions, and ethnicities. Our diverse and storied history is what makes our country strong, and yet we still have so much to learn from one another. With that in mind, I like to call on the citizens of this country to take a moment, pause, and look at things from all perspectives. I urge people to come together in a civil manner so we can work and live up to our standard American ideals. First Lady Melania Trump solo in the spotlight with a strikingly different tone than her husband, offering condolences for those affected by the coronavirus pandemic and acknowledging how difficult it's been for millions of Americans. I know many people are anxious and some feel helpless. I want you to know you're not alone. Donald will not rest until he has done all he can to take care of everyone impacted by this terrible pandemic. Speaking from the newly renovated White House Rose Garden, the First Lady sharing her personal story. As an immigrant and a very independent woman, I understand what a privilege it is to live here and to enjoy the freedoms and opportunities that we have. And years after endorsing her husband's birther claims about Barack Obama, reflecting on the nation's racial unrest. I urge people to come together in a civil manner. 
I also ask people to stop the violence and looting being done in the name of justice and never make assumptions based on the color of a person's skin. The First Lady, whose Be Best campaign aims to combat cyberbullying, addressing how mean social media can be, while noting President Trump's unvarnished opinions. Total honesty is what we as citizens deserve from our president. Whether you like it or not, you always know what he's thinking. The president putting the powers of his office to work for his re-election. From the unprecedented use of the White House grounds for his wife's convention speech to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo shattering a long-standing tradition that American diplomats do not participate in political conventions. Speaking from the site of an official trip to Jerusalem. President Trump has put his America First vision into action. It may not have made him popular in every foreign capital, but it's worked. The State Department insists Pompeo's partisan speech highlighting the president's policies was delivered in his personal capacity. President Trump also showcasing his pardon power, granting clemency to a convicted bank robber who founded a program that helps former inmates. As I grant John, I'm not sure you know this, a full pardon. And hosting a recorded naturalization ceremony for the primetime audience. So help me God. So help me God and helping celebrate their father, two of the president's children. As a recent graduate, I can relate to so many of you who might be looking for a job. My father built a thriving economy once, and believe me, he will do it again. I'd like to speak directly to my father. I miss working alongside you every single day, but I'm damn proud to be on the front lines of this fight. Eric Trump's message to his father last night. The First Lady's speech also drawing attention for the lack of social distancing in the Rose Garden and very limited mask wearing. At least some of those there were tested for the virus before attending, but the setup really seemed to minimize the threat of the pandemic. The president's top economic advisor earlier in the night even referring to it in the past tense. Savannah. All right, Peter. So we've had two nights down, two more to go. We're going to hear from the vice president tonight. But you can really tell a lot uh, by by watching the speakers who the campaign is trying to reach, where they think there's some fertile ground for their reelection strategy. What have you learned? Yes, and I think you're right. These first two nights have really been the sort of back and forth between those fiery speeches and trying to sell that softer version of the president, granting that pardon, hosting a naturalization ceremony for new citizens, all people of color. His kids speaking as well. The First Lady's empathetic remarks. The goal here to both energize the base, to bring back those disaffected Republicans who may have been turned off by President Trump, and to speak directly to those suburban voters, particularly women who polls show have increasingly flocked to Joe Biden. Tonight as you know, we're going to hear from the vice president, Mike Pence, the South Dakota governor, Kristi Noem, and one of the president's fiercest defenders, Kellyanne Conway, just days before her departure from the White House. Savannah. All right, Peter, thank you. And a reminder, we'll have more on the first lady's message in our next half hour. And NBC's live coverage of the Republican National Convention continues tonight. And tomorrow we get started at 10 o'clock Eastern. Overnight, protest in Kenosha, Wisconsin, turning deadly. Authorities clearing the streets after reports of gunshots. <laughs> Police say at least two people are dead, one person injured. Hours earlier, the governor had declared a state of emergency, mobilizing more National Guard members. Some protesters ignored a curfew. Authorities deploying tear gas. This was the third straight night of violent protests here, and this community is on edge. This is pathetic. This is pathetic for to happen in our country, and it's in the state of Wisconsin, and it's just anarchists going around and taking advantage of the situation. The chaos came despite Jacob Blake's family pleading for peaceful protests. He shot my son. Seven times, seven times, like he didn't matter, but my son matters. His family is now demanding the officers involved in Sunday's shooting captured on the cell phone video be fired and the one who shot Blake in the back be arrested. 
The eyewitness who shot the video says he heard officers yell, drop the knife, but police haven't said if they ever recovered a weapon. He was not treated like a human that day. He was treated like some foreign object that didn't belong. Blake's family now says the 29-year-old spinal cord is severed and that he's paralyzed from the waist down, though doctors aren't sure it's permanent. Blake's mother tells us she'd last spoken to Jacob Sunday morning as he prepared to celebrate his son's eighth birthday. The boy was in the back seat when his father was shot. When you first walked into that hospital room and you saw your son, what went through your head? So many things. I was just so elated just simply being able to see him and he's alive. The U.S. Department of Justice is now assisting state authorities with the investigation. Wisconsin's Department of Justice says the officers are on administrative leave and are fully cooperating. Kenosha police officers do not wear body cameras, but the Blake family wants any dash cam footage or any other video of the incident released. Blake's family now plans to file a civil lawsuit. Now, over the last three days, the Kenosha Police Department has not commented, only to say that its officers were responding to a domestic incident. But again, two people dead, one person injured, following another night of unrest here, Savannah. All right, Gabe Gutierrez on a really devastating night there. Gabe, thank you. Among the chaos that I found the father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in depth. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. I'm gonna help protect Kenosha. Uh, Tuesday, we put up a fence around this building. All of you were allowed to come in through the gates. 
And the reason we put the fence around here is, like I said earlier, this is a focal point for protesting, and it still was last night. They, the protesters want to come here, say their piece, which is wonderful. No one in law enforcement, no one in Stamp of Freedom Day has any issues with uh, peaceful groups coming in here and protesting. We support that. Uh, I know that about a month ago, Mayor and I went over to one, and we, we kneeled for the Kneel for Nine with the group of people that were there. We were there supporting. The fence that's around these buildings, what it actually allows us to do, because this building holds inmates, and if somehow the structure got caught on fire, um, we can't move these people that quickly to get them to a safe spot. We have to protect the inmates. And we put the fence up to help protect this campus. The first night, there was probably about $300,000 damage to this campus alone. And uh, what the fence also does is it allows us to take the resources we needed to protect it, to move them out into the field on the outside of the fence and, and do an even better job of, of uh, uh, working with, with the people in our community. Last night, with the fence up, we were much more assertive in the way we handled things. Uh, shortly after 8 o'clock, the curfew went into effect. At 8 o'clock, uh, we moved out an armored car, and we basically said, you need to leave. Curfew is 8 o'clock. You're in violation of the curfew. Uh, and uh, if you don't, we will be taken into custody. Uh, then uh, some left, several left. We watched on, uh, on the screen. We watched several leaving. They followed the orders. And then we, uh, when some didn't come, I don't know if I saw it live, but I don't know if you saw it, they started pelting the uh, officers over the fence with um, stones and bricks, and, and the armored car was pelted. There were Molotov cocktails thrown. Um, we gave them we gave them probably about another 10, 15 minutes, and then we, we did tear gas to help disperse the crowd. That was a, it's not something we wanted to do, but with the, with the damage and the, um, everything that went on Monday night, it was something we had to do. We had to disperse the crowd and get them moving out. The longer we let them go, the longer we let them uh, build, the uh, more dangerous the situation became. Tonight, we're changing the curfew to 7 o'clock. We will uh, gladly support all the peaceful protests that are really throughout Kenosha County um, up until 7 o'clock. And after that, we asked everybody to go home. Last night, the I'm very proud of the people of Kenosha. Last night, when I went and moved from this building out to the command post, I drove down the streets and there was no one on it. The people of Kenosha let law enforcement and, and all our partners do our job. They let us um, do truthfully a much better job last night than we could we could do on Monday night. And the people went stayed home. They moved their cars. They did everything we asked them to. And I want to thank the people of Kenosha for doing that. Tonight we're moving it to seven o'clock. 7 o'clock, the curfew will allow us to disperse whoever's gathered. Maybe there'll be no one, and I hope that's true, but disperse who's ever gathered in daylight. So it'll help us to be able to see better. It'll help the people to be able to see better. They won't be dispersing in dark. And we also find that after dark, we have many more issues with, with violence and, and things that go on. Um, last night during... Uh, some of the, a lot of the, we had several hundred law enforcement, um, several, a few hundred uh, National Guard, and again, I watched on, on TV, I watched these hundreds of, of law enforcement go out there and calmly go out there and, first of all, try to get people to leave, and then they assisted, some, many were taken into custody. And for some, it was, it was truly just a, uh, a curfew violation. But we're going to be very assertive in taking these people. If you don't follow the curfew, we're going to do our best to take you into custody for that violation. Wednesday, we have additional staffing coming from around the state. Unbelievable the amount of sheriffs and police departments that 
come and I've offered to come both with equipment and people to come down here and help protect Kenosha County. As the mayor said, we have got the National Guard, FBI, uh, U.S. Marshal, uh, DNR, Wisconsin State Patrol, all and, and agencies throughout the state helping to protect this city. Last night, every day we get better. In Kenosha, we are not accustomed to riots. We're not accustomed to it. We, are, we pulled resources, we pulled knowledge from federal and state agencies, uh, and, and the cooperation between all of them have been incredible. Uh, there's some misinformation that, as the mayor pointed out, that, that the state isn't helping or the federal government isn't helping. Everyone's helping. Everyone is helping. Can all these different agencies round up uh, the numbers we would you know, have loved to have had on Monday night? They can't. They don't, they don't work like police agencies do. So with a few days' notice, um, these agencies were able to get more resources here. What we have been finding, and yesterday I did a couple of interviews, is social media. I don't do social media. I don't do Facebook. I think I'd be too upset all the time if I did it. Uh, but the uh, one thing that we found is that we do, get, we do get information from those sources, but there's also a lot of misinformation coming from those sources. Yesterday, as the day went on, it started off in the morning, there was very, there was almost no social media about anything happening yesterday, almost none. By noon, it had grown. By uh, early afternoon, it had multiplied again. And some of the things is, all of you get, and uh, the people of Kenosha get uh, Facebook updates and, and uh, social media updates from other people, and it gets passed and passed and passed. And we were getting the same misinformation on uh, Facebook uh, that, again, hundreds of times, we get the same thing, and they would actually even say, there's 30 vehicles at this location, and we'd send a squad car there, and there was no one there. So the, whoever's doing this put out this to, to scare the people of Kenosha, and it's working. It's working. What I want the people of Kenosha to know, though, is that uh, we are working hard. We're working very hard, and we're getting, we're getting better at this. And we've got more resources coming in. And we are not, like the mayor said too, we're not going to put up with what we saw Monday night. We're not going to. Is, does that mean we're going to stop it all? We aren't going to, it depends on numbers that come. We're not going to be able to stop it all, but we're going to be assertive in helping to protect the city of Kenosha and Kenosha County and our neighbors from around the the county, state, and country are here to help, too. Um, we blocked off the interstate, and uh, uh, we picked that up. Other, other larger cities did that, and it seemed effective. And when I talked to other agencies on, on the state and federal level, they seemed that that worked. And uh, it's an inconvenience for our local people. I am so sorry. Sorry that we did that, but there's a reason for it. It was to help protect you. The, um, uh, yesterday, I had a person call me and say, why don't you deputize citizens who have guns to come out and patrol the city of Kenosha? And I'm like, oh, hell no. The, uh, and what happened last night, and I think Chief Miskinnis is going to talk about it, is probably the perfect reason why I wouldn't. Once I deputize somebody, they fall under the Constitution of the state of Wisconsin. They fall under the county of Kenosha. They fall under my guidance. They have to follow my policies. They have to follow my supervisors. They are a liability to me and the county and the state of Wisconsin. I don't know this for sure, but the incident that happened last night where two People lost their lives. I think they were part of this group that wanted me to deputize them. As a part of this, the county of Kenosha, that would have been, in reality, two deputy sheriffs who killed two people. 
That would, it would have been a, one, one deputy sheriff who killed two people. Sorry about that. And the liability that goes with that would have been immense. So that's one of the things that was brought up to me, and I just I said, there's no way. There's no way that I would deputize uh, people. One of the things that, that we had problems with last night is a lot of protesters come to the show. I mean, there, there's good protesters that come and pray and kneel and do all that stuff, and, and they chant, and I got no issue with that. I was, I was doing it several weeks ago, and I'm good with that. But there are some, and we've got several that come here from outside Kenosha. They come from Illinois. They come from north of us. However, we've heard uh, some people may have been arrested from Green Bay, Milwaukee. Uh, they're coming here. They have no desire to protest. And I go back to social media. One of the invitations looked like a party invitation, something you would get from your brother to come and see your niece's uh, graduation or her birthday. Come, wear your black, uh, wear your black outfits, wear black masks, bring your backpacks filled with Molotov cocktails, rocks, uh, and whatever else they may have in those backpacks. So that was the invitation that, that went out, out. And I think there's something going on tonight. I'm not exactly sure what it was. But I go back to, I think some people are thinking that I should deputize. We should have these people out there with guns under my authority. What a scary, scary thought that would be in my world. And part of, the, part of the problem with this group is they create confrontation. The people walking around with guns, if I walk around with a uniform with a gun, all of you probably wouldn't be too intimidated by it because you're used to officers having guns. But if I put out my wife with an AR-15 or my brother with a, uh, a shotgun or whatever it would be walking through the streets, you guys would wonder what the heck is going on. That doesn't help us. Um, we are set up. We're going to do the curfew until uh, Sunday right now. It can change. This is all fluid. We're going to do the 7 p.m. curfew until Sunday. And it might continue afterwards. It might continue before. It is for, it is, is to this point, it's the interstate and east, a 7 p.m. curfew. For those that, that this... Uh, puts a hardship on, I'm sorry, I really, really am, but it's something we have to do. Um, I'm going to turn over to General uh, Knapp right now and let him explain what, from the National Guard. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, hello, I'm Major General Paul Knapp. General for the state of Wisconsin in charge of uh, emergency management for the state. Number one, I want to express my condolences to the families of those involved in the tragic events of Kenosha. Next, I want to talk about with the Wisconsin National Guard and our role in supporting local authorities in Kenosha. On August 24th, Governor Evers uh, called the Wisconsin National Guard to state active duty to serve in a supporting role and assist local law enforcement in preserving public safety and the ability of individuals to exercise their First Amendment rights to peacefully demonstrate. The Wisconsin National Guard is fully engaged to serve and protect the citizens of Wisconsin on this very important mission. For the last two nights, we've sent soldiers and airmen to support local law enforcement in the city of Kenosha in protecting lives and property. We're working diligently to provide additional assistance, and we're committed to meeting all the requests that we receive from civil authorities. The Wisconsin National Guard responds to formal requests from county uh, emergency managers, and these requests are submitted to the State Emergency Operations Center. And then with the approval of the governor, National Guard resources can be committed to support civil authorities. The Wisconsin National Guard does not self-deploy and always serves in a supporting role. We don't choose on our own where or in what capacity to engage. Uh, however, these are fluid situations, and we remain responsive to requests with the governor's approval. When arriving on scene, the National Guard plays a supporting role to the local law enforcement uh, and re who remains in charge of the mission. Guard personnel will remain on mission in Kenosha for as long as civil authorities require our support. 
For operational security purposes, the Wisconsin National Guard will not discuss troop numbers uh, as it relates to this mission. However, we are uh, mobilizing additional forces in accordance with requests submitted by civil authorities uh, from, through, from and through appropriate channels. At the direction of Governor Evers, we're also working together by Emergency Management Assistance Compact, otherwise known as an EMAC request, to bring in additional resources from surrounding states uh, to augment the mil military police forces as needed. The events in Kenosha are tragic, and our thoughts and prayers to all those involved go out to all those involved. The members of the Wisconsin National Guard are proud to serve the citizens of this great state. We stand ready to continue to support assistance to local authorities in times of crisis. The bottom line is we're your neighbors, we're your citizens of Wisconsin. We care about what happens here and throughout the state, and we are here to support uh, the local authorities in bringing this to a peaceful conclusion. Thank you. I'd like to introduce uh, Kenosha Police Department Chief Dan Muskinis. Good afternoon. You'll notice that there, there's a theme here in that uh, there's, uh, there's concern for the public, for those that have been injured um, by the Kenosha Police Department, those injured by civilians, and the injuries inflicted upon the community itself by arsonists, Molotov cocktails, looting, all of the violence that goes on. So I want to be very clear with that. Everybody that stands before you is very committed to bringing a peaceful resolution to the issue at hand. We understand there are underlying issues that are driving this. We're not going to fix them overnight, but the commitment is here from the leaders here to do something about it. So with that, uh, there's a clear understanding that Kenosha is full of good people. Kenosha is not a community of violent people. The residents here, are, they're scared, they're confused, but they're not violent. Peaceful protests are welcome. It is a way, it has always been a way for the American public to speak their mind. We support that. I support that as an individual. We cannot support violence. When the line getting one's opinions to taking violent actions and, and hurting people, damaging property, and generally unruly behavior, that, that must stop. It, not only is it bad for the community, it detracts from the message. The message here, the underlying message, is about racial tension and police violence. Whether or not that's a contributing factor, whether it is here in Kenosha and across the nation, those are issues that need to be worked on and addressed. When things become lost, it becomes all about violence. And that, that's clearly not what Kenosha is about. The, this, the people here are good people, and we're here to protect them. We've called in necessary resources to do that, and we will continue to do that to stand strong to protect all people here in Kenosha. So by now, everybody is aware that the Kenosha Police Department, uh, one of our officers, shot an individual here in the city of Kenosha, which is, the, for lack of a better term, the event that triggered the unrest. Thankfully, Mr. Blake is alive and recovering from that, that incident. Um, I don't have a lot of great details about the incident because I wasn't there. The, uh, the state of Wisconsin has a, a statute and a procedure that removes the law enforcement agency in, involved in the use of force from the investigation. So you heard Sheriff Beth speak about how they came in in a supporting role. They controlled the scene to control evidence to protect the scene, to make sure that justice would be served in the end. No matter what that evidence showed, that was his job. The Kenosha Police Department steps back from that, and we become the people investigated rather than those doing the investigation. That is a recent change statutorily here in Wisconsin, one that I support, and I believe it adds transparency and uh, a greater um, oversight by some. Unfortunately, what that also brings is what you see before you today a chief who doesn't have details about the incident. So the Wisconsin Department of Justice Criminal uh, Division of Criminal Investigation, or DCI, is the investigating agency here. They are the ones who are collecting evidence, interviewing all those involved, whether it's the officer, Mr. Blake, witnesses, any host of things. 
They're the ones doing the, in the investigation to give it that outside view, that outside demand for justice. So I support that, and uh, we will continue to uh, um, participate in that cooperation. They will continue doing what they need to do. Um, but again, I, I don't have details to share because of the way the system works. The, uh, the support process here with DCI for us is very limited. The Sheriff's Department controls the scene. I, as a chief, have policies. We have procedures to cooperate, and that is what we do. We're not hiding behind what has been referred to by some across this nation over the years as a blue line of silence. It doesn't exist. We, we don't want bad cops. There, there aren't cops here who want to go out and hurt people. right? So I, I understand that there's a difference of view, and there may be some underlying political issues that Again, as I said before, not going to be solved. Um, I, I ask for everybody in this room, everybody listening, and the citizens here that are affected to allow for time for that process to play out. The decisions in that case will be made based upon evidence collected by an outside agency presented to somebody else to make that decision. The Kenosha Police Department will not come out and make a ruling one way or, in, or the other in that. So that process is in place. I believe it's fair. And I believe it's, it's a good thing for not only the citizens of Kenosha, but those across this nation. Since the incident, there have been peaceful protests and prayer vigils. There's a lot of good people out there. And there are a lot of good people who want to draw attention to underlying issues, to draw attention for the need for change, and to draw, line, or draw attention to the need for the potential for police reform, if necessary. And I bring that last statement into effect and that I think most people I've talked to believe that there may be the need for reform, but they're not racing to judgment. They will bring up ideas, and much of it is of what we've talked about or I've heard from, from citizens are at place. They do exist. There's just perhaps not enough communication. And this, today's meeting is somewhat about that. So you have my commitment that we will try to do our best to share more information. It's just difficult when you're removed from the process to do that. So I ask, again, as we move forward, that today's theme is about progress toward restoring healing and having a community that comes out of this stronger. Um, so over the last few days, Kenosha also experienced, unfortunately, looting, arson, Molotov cocktails, violence, persons injured. In addition, last night, in, in a situation that began peaceful and, and turned somewhat unruly, and then the, the sheriff spoke about things that were thrown, hammers, bricks, violence toward law enforcement and toward the National Guard who was assisting and controlling judgment, or con controlling the, uh, the scene here and protecting those who were rightfully speaking their mind, persons who were out after the curfew became engaged in some type of disturbance and, and persons were shot. Everybody involved was out after the curfew. I'm, I'm not going to make a great deal of that, but the point is the curfew is in place to protect. Had persons not been out involved in, in violation of that, perhaps the situation that, that unfolded would not have happened. Um, so the last night, a 17-year-old individual from Antioch, Illinois, was involved in the use of firearms to reserve, to, excuse me, to, uh, to resolve whatever conflict was in place. The result of it was two people NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Hey, everyone. I'm Allison Mars. You're watching NBC News Now. Let's go to NBC News correspondent Savannah Sellers. She's got the very latest headlines for us from NBCNews.com. Savannah, what have you got today? Hi, Allison. Just like we have the rest of this week, we're kicking it off with the Republican National Convention. It's day three. Tonight, we'll hear from members of President Trump's inner circle, including Vice President Mike Pence, Senior Advisor Kellyanne Conway, and White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany. Second Lady Karen P Pence will also speak. She hinted at what she'll talk about earlier today. 
I get to talk a little bit about our military community, and I, I know that you know that's uh, near and dear to my heart, and I've worked a lot with military spouses to uh, help them with employment, and I've also done a lot of work with veterans uh, on preventing suicide. So uh, it'll be an exciting night to highlight the heroes in this. Now to a devastating milestone. An NBC News tally shows that more than 180,000 Americans have died from the coronavirus. The University of Washington predicts that number will grow to 300,000 by the end of this year. And if that's the case, COVID-19 will likely become the third leading cause of death in the United States. But as the death toll rises, researchers are working hard to create a coronavirus vaccine. Today, Moderna said they're witnessing promising results in a small trial with elderly patients. The biotech company says the patients produce COVID-19 antibodies, which some scientists believe is the key to immunity. But it's worth noting the study is still in the early stages and it hasn't been published in a peer-reviewed journal yet. Meanwhile, President Trump says he's sending the National Guard to Kenosha, Wisconsin, to oversee protests that turned deadly overnight. At least two people were killed and one person was hurt after gunshots rang out during the unrest. Police say they've now arrested a 17-year-old in connection to last night's incident. Of course, these protests come after a video showing Kenosha police shooting 29-year-old Jacob Blake this past Sunday. Law enforcement says they were responding to a, quote, domestic incident, but they haven't given other details. In the meantime, the officers involved were placed on administrative leave. Now, turning to Davos, Switzerland, where the World Economic Forum's annual meeting is now postponed. The event was supposed to take place in January, but it's now delayed to summer 2021 due to coronavirus concerns. The summit typically hosts several global leaders. President Trump and climate activist Greta Thunberg were just some of the big names who spoke earlier this year. And finally, there's an update in the helicopter crash that killed Kobe Bryant and eight others back in January. The helicopter company says was hit with multiple lawsuits following the crash, but now they're the ones taking action. Express helicopters say they're suing the air traffic controllers working that day, arguing they are the ones at fault for making a series of errors. In response to the suit, an FAA spokesperson said the administration, quote, does not comment on pending litigation. That's something we will, of course, be keeping tabs on. On Allison. All right, Savannah, thank you so much. I know we'll see you in about another hour. Appreciate it. See you then. The National Hurricane Center issuing a serious warning for both Texas and Louisiana. Laura, now a powerful Category 4 hurricane, expected to bring unsurvivable storm surge. NBC News correspondent Chris Pallone is in Lafayette, Louisiana. Chris, uh, how are things there right now, and how is Lafayette bracing for what's to come? Hi, Allison. Yeah, the conditions are starting to deteriorate here in Lafayette, which is... Uh, uh, quite a bit inland compared to some of the coastal communities that will see the results of this storm first. But we are starting to see rain bands move into the area. Even in some parts of uh, Louisiana inland, there have been tornado warnings already as these storms in the northeast quadrant often kick off uh, some, some uh, you know, what meteorologists would probably call weak tornadoes. But there have been tornado warnings already. The rain is starting to fall a little bit from one of these outer bands. The storm still uh, approximately 200 miles still offshore, expected to make landfall tonight near the Texas-Louisiana border. All right, it looks like we lost Chris there. We'll try to get him back. In the meantime, Hurricane Laura has been getting stronger by the hour. As we've said, it is now officially a Category 4 storm with winds over 140 miles per hour. MSNBC meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins me now. Michelle, it is so wonderful to see you. It's been a while. Unfortunately, not great circumstances uh, that we're talking to you under. Where is Storm Laura right now, and when is this Category 4 hurricane expected to make landfall? 
Hi there, Allison. So, so good to see you. Yeah, and I do wish it was on better circumstances. We have a tough day, week, months ahead of us in some parts of the Gulf Coast states. Chris really did a good job letting you know what was happening right now in Louisiana. We are starting to see those outer rain bands. We do have tornado warnings. They are short-lived. That's what happens with these hurricanes. Unfortunately, this is going to happen overnight as well. So we are going to have a rough night ahead of us. Let's look at the latest of what's happening with the storm. We are looking at a Category 4 storm. So it is a huge storm, right? It's very, very strong, and we are looking at winds at 140 miles per hour. Right now, it's 190 miles south, southeast of Port Arthur, Texas, and it's moving northwest at 16 miles per hour. That's the only saving grace. It is moving quickly, but before it gets out of here, we are going to see a lot of destruction. So, Allison, you said it's storm surge, unsurvivable, catastrophic, life threatening, destructive. These are not just words, these are expectations and predictions that we're going to see as we go through the next couple of days. So, for the rest of the day, we we are looking at Laura intensifying approaching land. We're looking at dangerous rain uh, bands. We're looking at wind gusts and storm surge impacts to the coastline, impacts inland as well. So by Thursday, we will see it move inland. We're expecting Laura to make landfall overnight. Again, we could see tornadoes. We could see power outages for months and weeks. Then by Thursday, it moves inland. We're going to see heavy rains, still the threat of tornadoes and strong winds in the Mississippi River Valley, and still on Friday, seeing the risk for tornadoes, a flood threat continues for the Ohio Valley, eventually impacting the Northeast by Tuesday. This is what the watches and warnings look like right now. Where you see the red, that's your hurricane warning. So Lake Charles, Lafayette, uh, we're looking at Port Arthur, also Beaumont, some cities that really need to heed the warnings. If you have not heeded them yet, you need to uh, heed them because your window is closing. We're also looking at tropical storm warnings stretching very far as well. So storm surge, we cannot say enough about about this. This is the deadliest weather impact when it comes to hurricanes and storms. This is where we see the most catastrophic events. We see loss of life with this as well. So we are now looking at the potential of a 15 to 20 foot storm surge. When you think about that, that's four of me. I'm five foot three. So that would be four of me stacked on top of each other. And it's a deadly wall of water coming wow. towards you. So it has immense power with this wall. And this storm surge could go 30 miles. I mean, that's almost hard to think of. So just putting it to perspective, that's all the way up to I-10. So what is storm surge? Uh, it really, in plain terms, is a deadly wall of water. And you really only need three feet of water to cause some light threatening events. We're going to see up to 20 feet in some spots. So there's three feet, six feet. That's where you start to see the water breaking windows, water uh, breaking doors, you know, kind of impacting some of the homes. And then by nine feet, we could see entire neighborhoods being destroyed. And when we're talking about Laura, we could see some small towns being destroyed, not just neighborhoods. So we're certainly going to watch this. So that's one of it, storm surge. Now we have wind. We have hurricane force winds arriving tonight. We could see the winds all the way up to Lake Charles in addition to that storm surge, so where you see the red, that's your hurricane storm, uh, destructive winds kind of spanning out. And where you see the orange up to Shreveport, even, you're seeing uh, some tropical storm winds. We could see potential power outages. So where you see the red, that's extensive. Where you see the light red, that's widespread. We're talking days and even months in some spots. So we are in August, we are in a pandemic, and we're going to see power outages for months in some spots. Uh, 15 inches of rain locally through Lake Charles up to Shreveport, Little Rock. So this stretches even into the Tennessee Valley, the Mississippi Valley, and then potentially up to parts of the upper uh, Mississippi Valley. So as we go throughout time here, we're going to watch that eye wall. This is what it's going to look at, like at 4 o'clock. Look at that eye wall. When you have a very clear eye wall, that just means you have a strong storm. So Allison, think about this. We're in the home stretch, right? So we're going to see this landfall within the next 10 hours as we're preparing for this. It's intense it is possible we could see this as a Category 5 storm. But regardless, Category 4 storm, this is a historical storm. We are literally seeing history unfold in front of our eyes. And we're going to watch this very, very closely as we go throughout the next several days. I mean, I literally have chills as we, as we talk about this. This is a tough one. And it's going to be tough for a lot of people along the Gulf Coast states. Yeah, Michelle, the way you describe uh, that storm surge, I mean, just thinking of what four of you uh, stacked up, that's how high the water is going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, folks there are yeah. really in for a lot. Thank you so much for the update. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks, Allison. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos that I found a father 
trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four year degree, but a four year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. The White House wants to restart coronavirus relief talks. Chief of Staff Mark Meadows saying his office has reached out to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to get those negotiations going again. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Leanne Caldwell joins me now. Leanne, what's the latest here? Has the speaker responded? It doesn't look like she has yet, and it doesn't look like they're taking this really mm, as okay. a serious offer anyway. Um, so this is what the speaker said about it today. She said... Uh, Democrats have compromised in these negotiations. We offered to come down a trillion dollars if the White House would come up a trillion dollars. We would welcome the White House back to the negotiating table, but they must meet us halfway. And that's from Speaker Pelosi's spokesperson, Drew Hamill. Another thing that, uh, that uh, senior Pelosi aide said is that, sure, uh, Meadows staff did call the Speaker's office yesterday, but they didn't ask to start talks again. They asked for the correct cell phone number of her chief of staff. So while uh, Mark Meadows, the chief of staff, said that uh, he has made another outreach to the speaker, uh, the Democrats aren't looking at this as something that is completely legitimate and an honest attempt to get back to the table, Allison. Leanne, you have to have the right cell phone number to at least get things started. So, so we'll start there and see how things go. <laughs> uh, would you mind reminding our viewers where the if, right? <laughs> Got to call the right number if you want the talks to start. Uh, would you kindly remind our viewers where these talks left off? It's been a little while. Uh, what are some of the key yeah. issues that the White House and the Democrats are still having trouble agreeing on? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, it has been a while. It's been almost. Um, uh, uh, Four weeks now, I think, since uh, people have not gotten their unemployment wow. insurance benefit. Um, and where they left out was hardly any progress being made on so many key issues, including this top price tag. 
The reason that's important is because if you can't agree on the top line number, then it's difficult to agree on all the details. The Democrats want to spend $3.4 trillion. That's their opening number. And then the uh, Republicans, they want to spend $1 trillion. That's their opening number. And that's why you heard Speaker Pelosi say once again, which has been her position for a few weeks now, if we come down a trillion, about 2.4. You guys come up a trillion, about then they're at two trillion, and that's a good negotiating range. Uh, here is uh, Kevin Brady, a uh, top Republican on a key committee, and what he said on MSNBC today. I was really disappointed that our small businesses, our unemployed workers, were just ignored for Congress to rush back for a fake post uh, post office crisis that didn't exist. So he mentioned some of the specific issues, again, the lack of unemployment insurance, uh, people wanting these direct payments, uh, small businesses need more help, kids are going back to school all across the country, there needs to be more money for schools, uh, states uh, want more money to address the, the lack of funds they're receiving because of COVID. The list goes on and on, Allison, and it is a long list for them to come together, and they are not at the negotiating table. All right, so Leanne, this is super premature because they're not even really talking yet. But let's just say negotiations restart. They reach a deal. What are you hearing about whether Mitch McConnell and the Senate Republicans will, will even approve it? Yeah, well, Mitch McConnell is still trying to get the support of Senate Republicans on anything, something that he has not been able to do, even his $1 trillion bill that he floated and then, or he introduced, and then he floated a smaller bill just a week ago that's less than a trillion dollars that is still unclear if he has the support of his Republican members. So you have these two levels here, Allison. While uh, the administration is trying to negotiate with the Democrats, with the support of McConnell, actually, McConnell, on the other hand, is trying to corral his members and give them enough uh, motivation to try to get on board and pressure the administration and put some pressure on both sides to get something done. But the political will at this moment doesn't quite seem to be there, Allison. Leanne, we just need them to call the right phone and get things started. Uh, <laughs> seems like they haven't gotten much further than that. Leanne Caldwell, thank you so much. It's always great to have you on. Thank you. Vice President Mike Pence headlines night three of the Republican National Convention, addressing his party from historic Fort McHenry in Baltimore. It's the site that inspired the Star Spangled Banner. NBC News political reporter Monica Alba is there. Monica, what can we expect to hear from the vice president at this historic site tonight? Well, tonight's theme, Allison, is land of heroes. So you're going to have a focus on the military and on national security, we're told. And of course, the vice president will be making a lot of reference to the location of his speech, as you mentioned, this historic national monument and shrine, Fort McHenry, which will serve as quite the patriotic backdrop for his speech and his remarks. We're told the vice president is also going to be speaking to the national moment. He will be talking about not just his role as the chair of the coronavirus task force, but also struggles that the current country is going through, and then also how he is able to tout the accomplishments in their eyes of the Trump administration. He will speak to his partnership with the president, of course. And then we're also going to hear tonight from two White House officials that you could say raise some eyebrows in terms of how appropriate it is for them to be addressing the Republican National Convention, but both of them will be doing so in their personal capacity. And that's Counselor Kellyanne Conway, who's actually scheduled to leave the White House in this role next week, and the current press secretary, Kaylee McEnany, who was not on any of the original lists. We just learned about her addition to the schedule today. So that's some of the highlights and key things that we're looking for here in Baltimore, Allison. The president will have an audience tonight. What do you know about the coronavirus precautions, rather? Will masks or social distancing be required? We didn't see much of that when the first lady spoke at the White House yesterday. 
Exactly, and we're learning a lot more about what health and safety protocols were put into place last night for that address from the Rose Garden. There were about 108 people in attendance, and we understand that only those who really interacted with the president, the first lady, the vice president, and the second lady were actually tested for coronavirus in advance of the speech. And now the reason that may be a little bit unusual is because you're having these larger crowds, again, these live audiences for these speeches come together while we still have a pandemic going on. So we're told they were screened in some ways, but the actual tests only applied to people who came into direct contact. So we've posed that question to the vice president's office about what they plan to do for tonight, where we expect as many as 130 or 140 people to be here at Fort McHenry behind me. The chairs, very much like what we saw last night. They're set apart, but they're not a quite full six feet apart. And yes, masks, we have asked whether those will be required, and we believe they will be strongly encouraged, but not something that's mandatory, just like what you saw last night, which not many people took them up on. So this, the coronavirus pandemic really hangs over all of the entirety of this speech. The fort has not been open to the public or the visitor center here for months because of the pandemic. So that just shows you how much this really touches all corners of this. But you also have here Fort McHenry, uh, not a White House backdrop or location, which comes in contrast with last night, what we saw in terms of the Rose Garden and tomorrow night, of course, on the South Lawn when we expect the president to formally accept his renomination, Allison. Monica, the White House has been under fire today for some unconventional moments during the RNC so far. Could you talk to us about what the issues are here and, and how the White House uh, is defending itself? Certainly, you have a lot of ethical considerations here, and a lot of those stem from the Hatch Act. And the problem, some critics might argue with that, is that they're not entirely enforceable when you violate those guidelines. People receive strongly worded letters, for example, when they do have a violation. Kellyanne Conway, for example, who we were just talking about, she on several occasions has done that by campaigning for the president, essentially, and not necessarily being clear that it was in her personal capacity or for other members of the administration. But what you saw last night was that video that was a naturalization ceremony that took place at the White House with the acting Department of Homeland Security Secretary Chad Wolf. A lot of questions about why Marines were also featured in the video, some saying they were used as political props, but then also questions about why the White House has developed this strategy seemingly to sidestep the considerations, which is that they film the videos in advance, they put them publicly on YouTube, and then that way the campaign can sort of grab them and argue they're publicly available. That's why we can include them in the Republican National Convention. So the White House did put out a statement on this saying they believe everything was done properly, and they're claiming they are official events that were put on the schedule, and that's one of the ways they're trying to justify that, but certainly creating some controversy on the first couple of nights, Allison. All right, Monica, I'm going to ask you some uh, non-RNC-related uh, things. At least 20 million people are in Hurricane Laura's path, a big concern for the Gulf Coast tonight. What is President Trump saying about that storm threat today? Anything from the White House? The president is closely monitoring the hurricane. We're told he's been briefed several times, and he tweeted earlier today about the concern, warning everybody really in its path to heed uh, the directions of local officials and really evacuate if that is what is necessary. This is a very severe storm, Category 4, likely making landfall overnight. And we're told that as of now, there are no changes to the expected plans, either for the speech tonight from the vice president or the president's speech tomorrow night on the South Lawn. They will continue to monitor the situation. It's something we could hear them both talk about, or other speakers certainly may reference that, given it is on the top of so many minds today. But we're told for the time being, the plan stays the same while the White House continues to stay very, very close to this rapidly uh, aggressive hurricane, Allison. All right, Monica Alba in a beautifully green Fort McHenry, Baltimore. Thank you so much for being with us. You got it. Our special coverage of the third night of the Republican National Convention starts tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern. That's with Chuck Todd. Then we'll have a network primetime special at 10 p.m. Eastern. You can watch it all right here on NBC News Now. In 2016, Circleville, Ohio, overwhelmingly voted for Donald Trump, who campaigned on reviving the local economy. But Circleville has lost hundreds of factory jobs since then. NBC News political reporter Vaughn Hilliard spoke to some of the city's still undecided voters. I think there's a, so much the protest and anger 
and um, dissatisfaction over so many things. I would very much like to see that go away, and I honestly don't think with Donald Trump as president for four more years, it's going to, because he's going to be the same. Now here in November, you have Joe Biden, Barack Obama's former vice president, mm -hmm. versus Donald Trump. That's a hard one. Um, I'm hoping, that I'm paying a lot more attention to both debates. Um, I'm hoping that Trump will still keep the economy going like the things that he has brought to it. I'm open to see what Biden says. Um, it's so early right now, I can't really say if, who I'm really swaying to or from. I don't like the way, some of the ways that he's presenting himself. But I always have that big word, but. And then I look at what has happened and what he promised. And uh, I can go right down the list. No need for me to do it. I won't remember them all. <laughs> but uh, he, he has done what he said he would do. With, with Donald, I, I think if he could just calm down his rhetoric, there would be no question as to what, how people would vote. Vaughn is live now in Circleville. Vaughn, you spoke with voters there after the 2016 election and again this year. How have their political views changed? Allison, let's work through this here. Why Circleville, Ohio? Why Pickaway County? I visited here uh, just after the inauguration of Donald Trump back in February of 2017. And the very first place I went to was actually the Methodist Church right over our camera shot of our photog Paul Rigney. And I went in and listened to the service. And then some of the folks in the congregation welcomed me to Sunday school. And 12 out of the 13 in that Sunday school class you spoke up and said that they voted for Donald Trump. And one of those was that very first woman you heard from, Linda Kennedy. At the time, she said that, in her way of phrasing it, was confessing to voting for Donald Trump for the first time. And she said when she cast that vote, she had questions about whether God was going to, quote, strike her down because she was so displeased with the way that the president or the then candidate conducted himself and spoke. But as you heard her say, she ended up voting for him. And he won this county by 42 percentage points. By comparison, Mitt Romney won it by just 19 percentage points. And that is why I wanted to come back here, because we focus a lot on those swing counties, ones that went for Obama, then for Trump, or those counties that saw a, a, a depressed turnout in more of those urban corridors. But you can make a case that it's places like Pickaway County, a town of 12,000 people, with the classic tale of you know, three out of their four factories closing, losing hundreds of jobs, and folks hoping amid an opioid crisis that their community would be able to come back. That's why it was important to come back. And I'll note, when we're looking at polling, this is a place that is 95% white, this county. 85% uh, of folks here uh, do not have college uh, educations. And so far, what we have seen are advances for Joe Biden uh, among this particular demographic closing that gap by 10 percentage points compared to where Hillary Clinton was at four years ago. Vaughn, we just heard from some voters about the economy. What other issues will they be voting on come November? Uh, ha have they sort of stacked them up for you in terms of what they are most concerned about uh, and, and what may be the deciding thing that just sort of pushes them in, in, uh, with one ticket or the other? That second woman you heard from was Megan Edgington. She's a mother of three, born and raised here in Circleville. And she actually voted for Barack Obama. And then she was part of that jump of Trump support. Here she voted for Donald Trump. And she's now weighing which direction to go this time. The issue that she named was health care, particularly amid this pandemic, as a mother of three holding on to her job, trying to ensure that those in her community have health care. That's the issue where she says that she wants to better listen to debates. Of course, we can have a conversation about what those policies are. But the reality is, is that you have a likely voter here who is a little unclear about where the two candidates stand when it comes to health care. And that's why I think these debates will be significant, because there are still millions of voters that perhaps aren't following it like I am as a journalist every single day. But they want to better understand those policies. Linda Kennedy, she's actually a lifelong Republican. And she said the idea of voting for a Democrat is pretty crazy. She said that she appreciates that this conservative administration has brought on these conservatives like Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh onto the Supreme Court. At the same time, she is the grandmother now 
of eight grandkids, and she said that she cannot bear to hear the way the president speaks about others, and she is frustrated by the, as she used the word, turmoil in the, quote, anger that she is singing in communities like her own towards other Americans, and that's why she said right now she is leaning towards Joe Biden. So, Vaughn, let me ask you this. I see that Biden for president at sign behind you. You talk about some voters leaning uh, for Biden. What do they like about the Biden-Harris ticket? What uh, do, are some of their concerns with the Biden-Harris ticket? You know, look, if you're the Democrats, they had more than 20 candidates up on that stage. And there were a great number of folks from within the Democratic Party that hoped to have Joe Biden walk away because they thought that he was the most palatable to places like this. Communities from the Midwest, 95% white, industrial, and Joe Biden is the nominee that they wound up with. And I've heard from folks who have suggested uh, that Joe Biden is somebody who they think does understand the plight of the Midwest and some of the towns like this. At the same time, that third gentleman that you heard from, Jerry Leist, you know, when I talked to him, this is a man who also attended that Methodist church that Democrats hoped that they'd be able to pick off. Yet at the same time, he said that he believes that Joe Biden uh, is going to be largely controlled by other factions of the Democratic Party, uh, believing that there shouldn't be such issues as free college tuition, uh, and that the Joe Biden is of the past is not the same Joe Biden within the current uh, Democratic uh, uh, Party. At the same time as you said it, there's a couple of these Joe Biden signs around. And while the Biden campaign doesn't necessarily look as Pickaway County as being the place where they're going to invest the resources, if they're able to chip off at least some of that support, I'll repeat it. Mitt Romney won it by 19 percentage points. And then four years later, Donald Trump won it by 42 percentage points. If they're able to chip mm -hmm. into some of that support in places like here, that gives them a chance here in a place like Ohio, a place where Barack Obama won just eight years ago. Allison. Vaughn, thank you so much for giving us a, another slice, another view of, of how folks are, are feeling there in the Midwest. I know you've been traveling across the country so we can understand what voters are thinking ahead of November. Our big thanks to you and, of course, to Paul, too. Tell him we say hi. Thanks, my friend. How and when are you voting in the 2020 presidential election? It's more important than ever to understand your options. NBC has a great new tool to help you out. It's called Plan Your Vote, a state-by-state -state guide on voting rules, deadlines, and restrictions. Check it out at NBCNews.com slash Plan Your Vote. A suspect arrested in Kenosha, Wisconsin, police there confirming that two people were killed, another seriously injured in a shooting at the protest last night. Just a warning, the footage you're about to see is disturbing. It shows a man sitting in the middle of the street waving a gun at people running by. No! Now, NBC News can't confirm what happened before or after that recording, or if this is, in fact, the weapon and the gunman responsible for the fatal shooting. Meanwhile, this afternoon, President Trump says he's sending federal law enforcement and the National Guard to Kenosha, Wisconsin, to restore law and order. The president tweeting, we will not stand for looting, arson, violence, and lawlessness on American streets. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster joins me now from Kenosha, Wisconsin. Shaq, I know it has been a very busy day. Let's start with the suspected shooter. What do you know about that suspected shooter and what happened last night? Well, we know that the suspected shooter is in custody. It's a 17-year-old from Antioch, Illinois, which is about 30 minutes from where we're standing right now in Kenosha. And uh, they're not giving many details on what happened, what led to the shooting, the details surrounding it. But they're saying that the two people who he shot and killed or who he's alleged of shooting and killing are 26 years old and 36 years old. And we know that at least one other person was injured in that shooting last night. Police said last night that the shooting happened around 11.45 p.m. It happened after this park that I'm in right now. This is a place, it's been the flashpoint of protests uh, for since Sunday night. And after police cleared out this park and protesters and other people went into the different streets and different areas around here, that is when that shooting happened. There's lots of video out there that people have been piecing together but they're not giving an official record 
of exactly what happened, but they are saying that he is in custody at this point. He will be charged, and court records show that he'll likely have a court hearing uh, later this week. I believe it's on Friday. Allison? All right, Chuck, we also know there was a press conference in Kenosha this afternoon. What did you hear there? That's right, press conference that just wrapped up. And, you know, we, we learned a, a few different things uh, related to the case. One thing in terms of the original shooting of Mr. Jacob Blake, the uh, county or the police chief made very clear he would like to give more information, but it wasn't his department that did the investigating. In Wisconsin, when there's a police shooting, uh, the custody of the crime scene is then shifted over to another department. And we know now that the state is handling the investigation right now. So the police chief said he just doesn't have any details about what the scene looked like and what the causes were. They didn't talk to the police officers because they wanted a separate investigation. But we also heard from the mayor and the county superintendent. Listen to what the mayor said at that press conference. Violence in the community is not acceptable. Violence to property, violence to people, absolutely unacceptable. And it is up to us to make sure that that does not continue. When you watch that press conference, they started with the turmoil here in Kenosha. They talked about a 7 p.m. curfew that is now in place. That's the third night of a curfew. And they're actually moving it up an hour, they explained, because they wanted uh, to start help clearing people out of parks like these. They wanted that process to start in daylight rather than nightfall. We know the pattern has been peaceful protests by day, some clashes during the evening, and that destruction and last night death that occurs at night. They want to avoid that and do what they can to avoid that. And that's what the officials announced earlier today. Allison. All right, Shaq, let's take it back a little earlier today and talk about the president's tweets. He says he spoke with the governor who agreed to accept federal assistance. Uh, what else can you tell us about this incoming federal law enforcement? Yeah, you know, there's some discrepancy over exactly what that tweet meant and exactly what is going to happen. And I'll tell you, we saw that tweet from the president and minutes earlier, we saw a statement from the governor, the governor saying that he was upping the amount of National Guardsmen he was sending to Kenosha. Yesterday, there were 250 Guard members in place. Today, it will be 500 members from the National Guard who will be here in this county. But the president saying that Tony Evers, the governor here, accepted his request to send federal assistance. There's some discrepancy because the governor's office is saying there hasn't been any accepting of federal resources. He increased the amount of National Guard and those troops involved. Uh, so there's some discrepancy, some uh, uncertainty about what exactly was announced, what was announced by the president, and also uh, what was announced by the governor. The governor is still saying, though, that with the influx in National Guard troops, they're hoping that can help uh, both assist local law enforcement, but it can also help prevent some of the scenes mm -hmm. that we saw both last night and the prior three nights. Allison. Shaq, this, of course, is all happening because police shot Jacob Blake on Sunday. I, I can't let you yep. go without asking, how is Blake doing today? What are we hearing about his condition? What are we hearing from his family? Well, we heard from his family this morning, Allison. His family said he is in a lot of pain right now. They say he is doing better in terms of his overall condition, but they say he is not out of the woods just yet. His family yesterday had that press conference, very emotional press conference, where they went through and gave us a thorough account of his condition. They said he was shot at least seven times, that he had a bullet lodged in his vertebrae, that he suffered kidney damage, liver damage, uh, damage to his intestines. Uh, he, they, they made clear that he has a long road of recovery ahead of him. They said during that press conference that it would be a miracle if he is able to walk again. But then they also asked for the prayers of people here in Kenosha, and people all across the country, they know the long road to recovery that he'll have to have, the many surgeries that, and procedures that he'll have to do, including as recently as yesterday when he had a spinal procedure. They know it's going to be a lot of work, a long recovery ahead, but they are uh, asking for prayers and asking for people to continue thinking about him. And in doing that, they're calling for peace and uh, for any protest in his name to be peaceful because they want the focus to be on the underlying issue here. Allison. Yeah. Well, Shaq, we know people around the country are absolutely praying for Jacob Blake to get better. Thank you so much uh, for all of the updates today. A whole lot going on there in Kenosha, Wisconsin. We appreciate it. Thank you. 
It's working for the NBA and the NHL. So could a simple saliva test help colleges and universities tame outbreaks on their campuses? NBC News investigative and consumer correspondent Vicki Wynn shows us how this spit test works. Across the country, schools reversing their decision to hold in-person classes after COVID-19 outbreaks. At UNC Chapel Hill, classes abruptly halted just days after move-in. Students there not tested before coming back. But at Purdue University in Indiana, an unprecedented undertaking. Before all 40,000 students start classes this month, they're required to take a COVID test. Testing will be very, very important and will be a key element of protecting our, our college campuses. But unlike most COVID testing that involves a large, often uncomfortable swab to get a sample from the back of the nose, Purdue students will just spit into this tiny tube, something they can do at home with this kit. And the convenience of that, and so I think particularly for this generation of students, was a good one that allowed us to, to reach them where they were. Purdue is one of 65 schools working with Vault Health, formerly a men's health company, now offering this at-home COVID saliva test developed by Rutgers University. Is the saliva test a game changer? It is a game changer. First of all, it's a much easier test to administer. You're spitting into a tube, which is that everybody can do, even kids, and you're just giving us enough spit to be able to tell if there's virus in there. I ordered a kit from Vault's website. It arrived in two days. I have my materials here. What do I do? I set up a okay. video chat so with a clinician who made sure I did the test correctly. The I made sure to not eat, drink, or put anything in my mouth for 30 minutes. So all you need to do now is go ahead and spit. Oh man, this is gonna take a while. I think the record was about 30 seconds. I was not so speedy. <laughs> How many times a day do you have to watch people do this? <laughs> Enough. Two minutes later. Any tricks to this? Yeah, smelling pickles in a jar, thinking about food, smelling citrus. You should have told me to bring my pickles in a jar out sooner. I have nothing. I have nothing. All right, let me think about mouth-watering foods. I feel like it's working. It took some time to work right. up about a spoonful of saliva. Am I there? Oh, that's pretty good. Yes. You're there. A quick mix with a preservative to keep my sample fresh. Then I put it in a pre-addressed bag to be overnighted to the Rutgers lab in New Jersey. Vault says results are available in two to three days, a big advantage over swab tests that have seen delays up to 14 days. Vault's test is one of two strictly saliva tests given emergency authorization by the FDA. Yale University created the other one, but it's not an at-home test. How is this test better than what we've been seeing with the nasal swab? Well, the false negative rate is really what we're concerned with. Telling somebody that they're negative when actually they are sick is very dangerous. And so the saliva test has a 1% or even less than 1% false negative rate. But scientists caution there's not enough data yet to know how much virus is in saliva. They're generally very active accurate. They're probably a little bit less sensitive than the nasal swab, which is the term we use to mean that if people have very, very small amounts of virus, it's possible that the nasal swab would detect that, whereas the saliva wouldn't. The test is also pricey, $150 if you order it directly from the company. Right now, Vault is running about 80,000 tests a day, and they say as that number goes up, the cost will come down. For students like 18-year-old Clara Terry, who will be a freshman at Purdue, spitting in the tube was easy. I've heard like with the nose one, um, like it hurts. This was not painful at all. And Vicki joins me now. Vicki, this test gives faster results. It's not as uncomfortable as the nasal swabs. But let's talk a little bit more about doctors' concerns with these saliva tests. What are they worried about here? Yeah, the primary concern, Allison, is that there may not be enough of the virus in your saliva. If there are small amounts, it depends on when you take the test. It may not be as sensitive as the nasal swab. Another thing we should mention is for first-time consumers like myself who took this test, uh, they pair you up with a clinician who does watch you to make sure you're doing it correctly and also to make sure that it's you that's actually spitting in the vial. Vicki, are these schools just using the saliva test here or are some schools using both the nasal swab and the spit test and kind of trying out both options? 
Yeah, in the case of Purdue, they are going with this vault test. They're requiring students to take them within two weeks of coming back to campus this month. So that's very interesting because imagine that undertaking 40,000 students. They're offering it free of charge, but it's costing the yeah. university millions and others as well. But they all tell us that it is a worthwhile investment to try and help ensure the health of their staff and their students. But we have heard of other campuses that are using both. And here's the frustration that I've also heard from some parents of students who have tested positive in one test, then negative in another. They want to know what are they supposed to do. And in that situation, it really should be up to the health care provider. They should go to their doctor. If they're experiencing any symptoms at all, even if they get a negative test, then they should isolate. Vicky, I have a dear friend whose son goes to Purdue. I'm dying to reach out to him after this and ask him what he thought about to make sure that he could salivate for the test. I love that you were saying you were having a little bit of trouble there and trying to think of foods that would make that happen. The second someone tells you you need to fill two milliliters of a vial with your saliva, suddenly your mouth is dry as a bone. But that trick he told me really did help. It did work. And I am curious to hear what your friend from Purdue says. I'll, I'll report back, I promise. I kept thinking, what would I do? Like steak, nachos? I don't know. What would it take to, I mean, that's, that's a, a decent amount of spit you got to come up with. Thinking of sour things. I think sour things make your mouth water the most. All right, I'll find out what he did. Vicky, thank you so much. I guess <laughs> you got to go with pickles. That's the way to go. Thank you. <laughs> take care. The CDC now saying healthy people who have been exposed to COVID-19 don't necessarily need a test. Here's what former FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb said about that today. We're talking about people who are in contact with someone known to have COVID. Um, that's an essential component of case-based interventions, doing effective tracking and tracing. And so if we want to use case-based interventions to try to control the epidemic, we need to get people who may be at high risk of contracting the infection tested to make sure that they're not asymptomatic carriers, because we know while they're less likely to transmit the infection if they're asymptomatic, they can still transmit the infection. NBC News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres joins me now. Dr. John, what's your reaction to the CDC's new guidance here? And my reaction is essentially the reaction you're seeing across the country, especially with public health experts, is a bit of a head scratching going, you know, trying to figure out exactly why they made this change. They did it very quietly, put it out on their website, and it is a substantial change from what they had before. Because before, if you were exposed, they said, go ahead and get tested. We can make sure that if you're asymptomatic, you're not spreading it, because we know that up to half of the cases are being spread from asymptomatic patients. But now what they're saying is, okay, you have to have that extended period of exposure, and then you have have to have symptoms on top of that, and then you should get tested. And the reason this is a concern, exactly what uh, Dr. Scott Gottlieb was talking about, is when it comes to that contact tracing, that we know we have not been doing a very good job of getting that contact tracing under control. A crucial part of that is finding out who might be right now have coronavirus and who could be spreading it, even though they don't have symptoms. Well, if you're taking out that that equation, the part of the equation where people don't have symptoms, aren't getting tested, that's going to leave a big deficit there. So I think going forward, you're going to see a lot of concern as to, OK, how, what do we do now if people aren't getting tested? And hopefully as we get more and more tests and we certainly have more now than we had a few months ago, hopefully as time goes on, we get more tests and these saliva type tests and other ones, we start getting back to, OK, let's get more people tested, even those that don't have symptoms, because we know they, in fact, can spread the virus as well, Allison. Dr. John, I want to ask you about the saliva tests we've been talking so much about. The NHL, the NBA are using them. Colleges are trying them. Uh, people can get this test at home and get results in, in a matter of minutes. Uh, what do you make of these spit tests? Is this the coronavirus test of the future? I think it's going to be one of the coronavirus tests of the future, Alice, and I think it's going to take a combined effort of a bunch of different tests. And as you and I have talked about, when it comes to what we call diagnostic tests, which are the tests that are used to find mm -hmm. out if you have an infection right now, if you actively have an infection and could spread it to others, there's two different kinds, PCR and antigen. The antigen are the ones that we know that aren't quite as effective, but they seem to be there a lot faster. You can get them quicker. The PCR tests are more, uh, more sensitive, more effective, but at the same time, they're harder to get. These saliva tests, both of them, the ones that have been uh, 
had gotten the emergency use authorization are PCR tests. So they're going to be more accurate, which is good. This one that she talked about that Purdue and other universities are using, it, it's a take-home test in the sense that you collect a sample at home, but you still have to send it in and wait a couple of days. Yale School of Public Health actually just came out with one, and it's not test equipment per se. It's a protocol showing labs around the country how they can do it using equipment and chemicals that they have in sight right now. And hopefully over the next couple of weeks, we see more of that. The beauty of this one is it's quick. They can do 90 tests, they say, in under three or four hours, and it costs around $10 per test. So we're seeing the pricing come down. We're seeing the speed of the results going up. And so I think over time, especially over the next couple of months, you're going to see more and more of this, and you're going to see more people getting tested in situations like the universities, the NBA, the NFL, all these places are doing, again, to try and keep this under control, Allison. Dr. John, a new report from MIT and Oxford says that six feet of social distancing just might not be enough. Uh, why not? And what does this study tell us about how the virus is transmitted? And what the study actually looked at, Allison, is how the virus, especially once it gets to those smaller particles, not necessarily the respiratory mm -hmm. particles that we know go about six feet, but the smaller particles that can linger in the air for longer, where are we most likely to catch it because of those particles? And they're saying in certain situations, indoor, crowded areas, especially where people aren't wearing masks, then we have to worry about that. But the big concern is if we start putting out a message saying in one situation you need six feet, in another situation you need 12 feet, a third situation you need 18 feet, it's going to get very confusing. And so the experts I have talked to are saying six feet is the minimum, more is better. And they equate it to cigarette smoking. If you're next to somebody, you can smell the smoke. If you're six feet away, not so much. If you're 20 feet away, you can hardly smell it. It's the same with the virus. Six feet minimum distance. If you can do more, that's even better, Allison. So, Dr. John, if this is the case, if in certain situations six feet might not be far enough and you can't get further than six feet from someone, what else should you be doing to protect yourself? What are the other things uh, we have in our arsenal to make sure that we're keeping ourselves as safe as possible? Well, I think the obvious answer from a public health perspective is try not to get in those situations, as in bars and other indoor events yeah. where you can't get that six feet of separation. But if you can't for some reason, if you happen to be in there for whatever reason, make sure you wear a mask, other people are wearing masks as well. Ventilation is important. Opening up windows to try and get that fresh air through is extremely important. Those can help. But the bottom line is if you're within that six foot distance, then your chances do go up of getting coronavirus. So you want to try to avoid those as best as possible. All right, Dr. John, thank you so much for the great advice always. You bet. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle-class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we could just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? 
What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Today, we celebrate Women's Equality Day. 100 years ago, women were officially given the right to vote, but the fight for equal rights didn't end with the 19th Amendment. Here's a look at how we got here and how far we still need to go. It was not easy to be a suffrage activist, and it's an epic fight. It didn't end in 1920. We can commemorate this, this wonderful anniversary, but it's not the end of the story. We might be misled to think that this is sort of happenstance or it's all COVID, but voter suppression in the U.S. has a long and disturbing history. A century later, we're, we're reliving it. Ordinary women, these are grassroots women, these are teachers, factory workers, and farm girls. They become activists when it's really dangerous for them to be. But black women had a whole movement of their own, but their feminism is defined in a completely different way. Their feminism must embrace both the issue of race and gender. They can't separate the two because you'd be splitting them in half. What black women know is that no 19th Amendment will get to them to the polls if intimidation and violence continue to be the order of the day in the American South. And that proves to be precisely what happens after 1920. The 1920 election was coming up in the fall. They knew if they didn't get it then, um, that it might not happen. Seeing how the suffragists had to handle the pandemic, they had to change and, and do things by mail. And the, the country was also swinging away from progressivism. It was becoming more conservative and the suffragists saw that. So they play hardball. That's sort of what we saw happening this summer across the nation with demonstrations in Lafayette Park, I thought, oh my God, Alice Paul. Alice Paul and, and her compatriots are really, um, you know, masters of, of political theater. And they are prepared to pay a price, um, you know, personally, physically to stage that theater. And so she leads them in picketing the White House, in demonstrations every day in Lafayette Park. They're arrested, they are tortured in prison. Hundreds of women are in prison for asking for the vote. What will happen is the 19th Amendment does give the vote to all women citizens. The problem is it will be undermined. Black women technically could vote, but in reality they couldn't because of that dirty two-letter word, voter suppression. Black women, even in 1919, right, they're already organizing to um, understand literacy tests and poll taxes. And that's a sure sign to us that they understood the limits of the 19th Amendment. The Klan will organize itself and it will target black women, their leaders, their institutions, deliberately to keep black women from the polls. Black women and men will be fighting for another four and a half decades. 
for Asian American women and for Native American women, they are not considered citizens in 1920. So the 19th Amendment does not help them until that gets remedied. And that takes decades more. They were forced to wait in line long hours, and then the polls would close. Does it sound familiar to you? That is not so different, right, than 1920 in the sense that uh, Black Americans are working on multiple fronts. People who are disenfranchised are going to not only fight for the vote, they're going to make other kinds of politics in order to secure the kind of influence and resources and access they think they are due. A century later, we're, we're reliving it. It's a question of equality and representation. Black Americans were asked to risk their lives to try and vote. They were required to risk their lives. And that COVID, you know, has up the stakes for many things, including voting rights. It's a, a deeply disturbing parallel that people are going to be asked to risk their lives to vote in November. And Black Americans, it turns out, are going to disproportionately bear the risk of that. This is the, the real stress test for democracy. So I'd say it's time to uh, get those banners out and those sashes to say that as a nation, voting rights is, is crucially important. Hey everyone, I'm Allison Mars. You're watching NBC News Now. Let's go to NBC News correspondent Savannah Sellers. She's got the very latest headlines for us from NBCnews.com. Savannah, what have you got today? Hi, Allison. Just like we have the rest of this week, we're kicking it off with the Republican National Convention. It's day three. Tonight, we'll hear from members of President Trump's inner circle, including Vice President Mike Pence, Senior Advisor Kellyanne Conway, and White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany. Second Lady Karen P Pence will also speak. She hinted at what she'll talk about earlier today. I get to talk a little bit about our military community, and I, I know that you know that's uh, near and dear to my heart, and I've worked a lot with military spouses to uh, help them with employment, and I've also done a lot of work with veterans uh, on preventing suicide. So uh, it'll be an exciting night to highlight the heroes in this. Now to a devastating milestone. An NBC News tally shows that more than 180,000 Americans have died from the coronavirus. The University of Washington predicts that number will grow to 300,000 by the end of this year. And if that's the case, COVID-19 will likely become the third leading cause of death in the United States. But as the death toll rises, researchers are working hard to create a coronavirus vaccine. Today, Moderna said they're witnessing promising results in a small trial with elderly patients. The biotech company says the patients produce COVID-19 antibodies, which some scientists believe is the key to immunity. But it's worth noting the study is still in the early stages and it hasn't been published in a peer-reviewed journal yet. Meanwhile, President Trump says he's sending the National Guard to Kenosha, Wisconsin, to oversee protests that turned deadly overnight. At least two people were killed and one person was hurt after gunshots rang out during the unrest. Police say they've now arrested a 17-year-old in connection to last night's incident. Of course, these protests come after a video showing Kenosha police shooting 29-year-old Jacob Blake this past Sunday. Law enforcement says they were responding to a, quote, domestic incident, but they haven't given other details. In the meantime, the officers involved were placed on administrative leave. Now, turning to Davos, Switzerland, where the World Economic Forum's annual meeting is now postponed. The event was supposed to take place in January, but it's now delayed to summer 2021 due to coronavirus concerns. The summit typically hosts several global leaders. President Trump and climate activist Greta Thunberg were just some of the big names who spoke earlier this year. And finally, there's an update in the helicopter crash that killed Kobe Bryant and eight others back in January. The helicopter company says was hit with multiple lawsuits following the crash, but now they're the ones taking action. Express helicopters say they're suing the air traffic controllers working that day, arguing they are the ones at fault for making a series of errors. In response to the suit, an FAA spokesperson said the administration, quote, does not comment on pending litigation. That's something we will, of course, be keeping tabs on. On Allison. All right, Savannah, thank you so much. I know we'll see you in about another hour. Appreciate it. See you then.
White House wants to restart coronavirus relief talks. Chief of Staff Mark Meadows saying his office has reached out to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to get those negotiations going again. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Leanne Caldwell joins me now. Leanne, what's the latest here? Has the speaker responded? It doesn't look like she has yet, and it doesn't look like they're taking this really mm, as okay. a serious offer anyway. Um, so this is what the speaker said about it today. She said, uh, Democrats have compromised in these negotiations. We offered to come down a trillion dollars if the White House would come up a trillion dollars. We would welcome the White House back to the negotiating table, but they must meet us halfway. And that's from Speaker Pelosi's spokesperson, Drew Hamill. Another thing that uh, that uh, senior Pelosi aide said is that, sure, uh, Meadows staff did call the speaker's office yesterday, but they didn't ask to start talks again. They asked for the correct cell phone number of her chief of staff. So while uh, Mark Meadows, the chief of staff, said that uh, he has made another outreach to the speaker, uh, the Democrats aren't looking at this as something that is completely legitimate and an honest attempt to get back to the table, Allison. Leanne, you have to have the right cell phone number to at least get things started. So, so we'll start there and see how things go. <laughs> uh, would you mind reminding our viewers where the right? <laughs> Got to call the right number if you want the talks to start. Uh, would you kindly remind our viewers where these talks left off? It's been a little while. Uh, what are some of the key yeah. issues that the White House and the Democrats are still having trouble agreeing on? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, it has been a while. It's been almost. Um, uh, uh, Four weeks now, I think, since uh, people have not gotten their unemployment wow. insurance benefit. Um, and where they left out was hardly any progress being made on so many key issues, including this top price tag. The reason that's important is because if you can't agree on the top line number, then it's difficult to agree on all the details. The Democrats want to spend $3.4 trillion. That's their opening number. And then the uh, Republicans, they want to spend $1 trillion. That's their opening number. And that's why you heard Speaker Pelosi say, once again, which has been her position for a few weeks now, if we come down a trillion, about 2.4, you guys come up a trillion, about then they're at 2 trillion. And that's a good negotiating range. Uh, here is uh, Kevin Brady, a uh, top Republican on a key committee and what he said on MSNBC today. I was really disappointed that our small businesses, our unemployed workers were just ignored for Congress to rush back for a fake post, uh, post office crisis that didn't exist. So he mentioned some of the specific issues, again, the lack of unemployment insurance, uh, people wanting these direct payments, uh, small businesses need more help, kids are going back to school all across the country, there needs to be more money for schools. Uh, states uh, want more money to address the, the lack of funds they're receiving because of COVID. The list goes on and on, Allison, and it is a long list for them to come together, and they are not at the negotiating table. All right, so, Leanne, this is super premature because they're not even really talking yet, but let's just say negotiations restart. They reach a deal. What are you hearing about whether Mitch McConnell and the Senate Republicans will, will even approve it? Yeah, well, Mitch McConnell is still trying to get the support of Senate Republicans on anything, something that he has not been able to do, even his $1 trillion bill that he floated and then, or he introduced, and then he floated a smaller bill just a week ago that's less than a trillion dollars that is still unclear if he has the support of his Republican members. So you have these two levels here, Allison. While uh, the administration is trying to negotiate, with the Democrats, with the support of McConnell, actually. McConnell, on the other hand, is trying to corral his members and give them enough uh, motivation to try to get on board and pressure the administration and put some pressure on both sides to get something done. But the political will at this moment doesn't quite seem to be there, Allison. Leanne, we just need them to call the right phone and get things started. Uh, <laughs> seems like they haven't gotten much further than that. Leanne Caldwell, thank you so much. It's always great to have you on. Thank you.
Hurricane Laura has been getting stronger by the hour. As we've said, it is now officially a Category 4 storm with winds over 140 miles per hour. MSNBC meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins me now. Michelle, it is so wonderful to see you. It's been a while. Unfortunately, not great circumstances uh, that we're talking to you under. Where is Storm Laura right now, and when is this Category 4 hurricane expected to make landfall? Hi there, Allison. So, so good to see you. Yeah, I do wish it was on better circumstances. We have a tough day, week, months ahead of us in some parts of the Gulf Coast states. Chris really did a good job letting you know what was happening right now in Louisiana. We are starting to see those outer rain bands. We do have tornado warnings. They are short-lived. That's what happens with these hurricanes. Unfortunately, this is going to happen overnight as well. So we are going to have a rough night ahead of us. Let's look at the latest of what's happening with the storm. We are looking at a Category 4 storm. So it is a huge storm, right? It's very, very strong, and we are looking at winds at 140 miles per hour. Right now, it's 190 miles south, southeast of Port Arthur, Texas, and it's moving northwest at 16 miles per hour. That's the only saving grace. It is moving quickly, but before it gets out of here, we are going to see a lot of destruction. So, Allison, you said it's storm surge, unsurvivable, catastrophic, life threatening, destructive. These are not just words, these are expectations and predictions that we're going to see as we go through the next couple of days. So, for the rest of the day, we we are looking at Laura intensifying approaching land. We're looking at dangerous rain uh, bands. We're looking at wind gusts and storm surge impacts to the coastline, impacts inland as well. So by Thursday, we will see it move inland. We're expecting Laura to make landfall overnight. Again, we could see tornadoes. We could see power outages for months and weeks. Then by Thursday, it moves inland. We're going to see heavy rain, still the threat of tornadoes and strong winds in the Mississippi River Valley, and still on Friday seeing the risk for tornadoes, a flood threat continues for the Ohio Valley, eventually impacting the Northeast by Tuesday. This is what the watches and warnings look like right now. Where you see the red, that's your hurricane warning. So Lake Charles, Lafayette, uh, we're looking at Port Arthur, also Beaumont, some cities that really need to heed the warnings. If you have not heeded them yet, you need to uh, heed them because your window is closing. We're also looking at tropical storm warnings stretching very far as well. So storm surge, we cannot say enough about about this. This is the deadliest weather impact when it comes to hurricanes and storms. This is where we see the most catastrophic events. We see loss of life with this as well. So we are now looking at the potential of a 15 to 20 foot storm surge. When you think about that, that's four of me. I'm five foot three. So that would be four of me stacked on top of each other. And it's a deadly wall of water coming wow. towards you. So it has immense power with this wall. And this storm surge could go 30 miles. I mean, that's almost hard to think of. So just putting it to perspective, that's all the way up to I-10. So what is storm surge? Uh, it really, in plain terms, is a deadly wall of water. And you really only need three feet of water to cause some light threatening events. We're going to see up to 20 feet in some spots. So there's three feet, six feet. That's where you start to see the water breaking windows, water uh, breaking doors, you know, kind of impacting some of the homes. And then by nine feet, we could see entire neighborhoods being destroyed. And when we're talking about Laura, we could see some small towns being destroyed, not just neighborhoods. So we're certainly going to watch this. So that's one of it, storm surge. Now we have wind. We have hurricane force winds arriving tonight. We could see the winds all the way up to Lake Charles, in addition to that storm surge, so where you see the red, that's your hurricane storm, uh, destructive winds kind of spanning out. And where you see the orange up to Shreveport, even, you're seeing uh, some tropical storm winds. We could see potential power outages. So where you see the red, that's extensive. Where you see the light red, that's widespread. We're talking days and even months in some spots. So we are in August, we are in a pandemic, and we're going to see power outages for months in some spots. Uh, 15 inches of rain locally through Lake Charles up to Shreveport, Little Rock. So this stretches even into the Tennessee Valley, the Mississippi Valley, and then potentially up to parts of the upper uh, Mississippi Valley. So as we go throughout time here, we're going to watch that eye wall. This is what it's going to look at, like at 4 o'clock. Look at that eye wall. When you have a very clear eye wall, that just means you have a strong storm. So Allison, think about this. We're in the home stretch, right? So we're going to see this landfall within the next 10 hours as we're preparing for this. It's intense it is possible we could see this as a Category 5 storm. But regardless, Category 4 storm, this is a historical storm. We are literally seeing history unfold in front of our eyes. And we're going to watch this very, very closely as we go throughout the next several days. I mean, I literally have chills as we, as we talk about this. This is a tough one. And it's going to be tough for a lot of people along the Gulf Coast states. 
Yeah, Michelle, the way you describe uh, that storm surge, I mean, just thinking of what four of you uh, stacked up, that's how high the water is going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, folks there are yeah. really in for a lot. Thank you so much for the update. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks, Allison. Vice President Mike Pence headlines night three of the Republican National Convention, addressing his party from historic Fort McHenry in Baltimore. It's the site that inspired the Star Spangled Banner. NBC News political reporter Monica Alba is there. Monica, what can we expect to hear from the vice president at this historic site tonight? Well, tonight's theme, Allison, is land of heroes. So you're going to have a focus on the military and on national security, we're told. And of course, the vice president will be making a lot of reference to the location of his speech, as you mentioned, this historic national monument and shrine, Fort McHenry, which will serve as quite the patriotic backdrop for his speech and his remarks. We're told the vice president is also going to be speaking to the national moment. He will be talking about not just his role as the chair of the coronavirus task force, but also struggles that the current country is going through, and then also how he is able to tout the accomplishments in their eyes of the Trump administration. He will speak to his partnership with the president, of course. And then we're also going to hear tonight from two White House officials that you could say raise some eyebrows in terms of how appropriate it is for them to be addressing the Republican National Convention, but both of them will be doing so in their personal capacity. And that's Counselor Kellyanne Conway, who's actually scheduled to leave the White House in this role next week, and the current press secretary, Kaylee McEnany, who was not on any of the original list. We just learned about her addition to the schedule today. So that's some of the highlights and key things that we're looking for here in Baltimore, Allison. The president will have an audience tonight. What do you know about the coronavirus precautions, rather? Will masks or social distancing be required? We didn't see much of that when the first lady spoke at the White House yesterday. Exactly. And we're learning a lot more about what health and safety protocols were put into place last night for that address from the Rose Garden. There were about 108 people in attendance. And we understand that only those who really interacted with the president, the first lady, the vice president and the second lady were actually tested for coronavirus in advance of the speech. And now the reason that may be a little bit unusual is because you're having these larger crowds, again, these live audiences for these speeches come together while we still have a pandemic going on. So we're we're told they were screened in some ways, but the actual tests only applied to people who came into direct contact. So we've posed that question to the vice president's office about what they plan to do for tonight, where we expect as many as 130 or 140 people to be here at Fort McHenry behind me. The chairs very much like what we saw last night. They're set apart, but they're not a quite full six feet apart. And yes, masks, we have asked whether those will be required and we believe they will be strongly encouraged, but not something that's mandatory, just like what you saw last night, which not many people took them up on. So this, the coronavirus pandemic really hangs over all of the entirety of this speech. The fort has not been open to the public or the visitor center here for months because of the pandemic. So that just shows you how much this really touches all corners of this. But you also have here Fort McHenry, uh, not a White House backdrop or location, which comes in contrast with last night, what we saw in terms of the Rose Garden and tomorrow night, of course, on the South Lawn, when we expect the president to formally accept his renomination, Allison. Monica, the White House has been under fire today for some unconventional moments during the RNC so far. Could you talk to us about what the issues are here and, and how the White House uh, is defending itself? Certainly, you have a lot of ethical considerations here, and a lot of those stem from the Hatch Act. And the problem, some critics might argue with that, is that they're not entirely enforceable when you violate those guidelines. People receive strongly worded letters, for example, when they do have a violation. Kellyanne Conway, for example, who we were just talking about, she on several occasions has done that by campaigning for the president, essentially, and not necessarily being clear that it was in her personal capacity or for other members of the administration. But what you saw last night was that video that was a naturalization ceremony that took place at the White House with the acting Department of Homeland Security Secretary Chad Wolf. A lot of questions about why Marines were also featured in the video, some saying they were used as political props, but then also questions about why the White House has developed this strategy seemingly to sidestep the considerations, which is that they film the videos in advance, they put them publicly on YouTube, and then that way the campaign can sort of grab them and argue they're publicly available. That's why we can include them in the Republican National Convention. So the White House did put out a statement on this saying they believe 
believe everything was done properly, and they're claiming they are official events that were put on the schedule, and that's one of the ways they're trying to justify that, but certainly creating some controversy on the first couple of nights, Allison. All right, Monica, I'm going to ask you some uh, non-RNC-related uh, things. At least 20 million people are in Hurricane Laura's path, a big concern for the Gulf Coast tonight. What is President Trump saying about that storm threat today? Anything from the White House? The president is closely monitoring the hurricane. We're told he's been briefed several times, and he tweeted earlier today about the concern, warning everybody really in its path to heed uh, the directions of local officials and really evacuate if that is what is necessary. This is a very severe storm, Category 4, likely making landfall overnight. And we're told that as of now, there are no changes to the expected plans, either for the speech tonight from the vice president or the president's speech tomorrow night on the South Lawn. They will continue to monitor the situation. It's something we could hear them both talk about, or other speakers certainly may reference that, given it is on the top of so many minds today. But we're told for the time being, the plan stays the same while the White House continues to stay very, very close to this rapidly uh, aggressive hurricane, Allison. All right, Monica Alba in a beautifully green Fort McHenry, Baltimore. Thank you so much for being with us. You got it. Our special coverage of the third night of the Republican National Convention starts tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern. That's with Chuck Todd. Then we'll have a network primetime special at 10 p.m. Eastern. You can watch it all right here on NBC News Now. In 2016, Circleville, Ohio, overwhelmingly voted for Donald Trump, who campaigned on reviving the local economy. But Circleville has lost hundreds of factory jobs since then. NBC News political reporter Vaughn Hilliard spoke to some of the city's still undecided voters. I think there's a, so much the protests and anger and um, dissatisfaction over so many things. I would very much like to see that go away, and I honestly don't think with Donald Trump as president for four more years, it's going to, because he's going to be the same. Now here in November, you have Joe Biden, Barack Obama's former vice president, mm -hmm. versus Donald Trump. That's a hard one. Um, I'm hoping, I'm paying a lot more attention to both debates. Um, I, I'm hoping that Trump will still keep the economy going like the things that he has brought to it. I'm open to see what Biden says. Um, it's so early right now, I can't really say if, who I'm really swaying to or from. I don't like the way, some of the ways that he's presenting himself. But I always have that big word, but. And then I look at what has happened and what he promised. And uh, I can go right down the list. No need for me to do it. I won't remember them all. <laughs> but uh, he, he has done what he said he would do. With, with Donald, I, I think if he could just calm down his rhetoric, there would be no question as to what, how people would vote. Vaughn is live now in Circleville. Vaughn, you spoke with voters there after the 2016 election and again this year. How have their political views changed? Allison, let's work through this here. Why Circleville, Ohio? Why Pickaway County? I visited here uh, just after the inauguration of Donald Trump back in February of 2017. And the very first place I went to was actually the Methodist Church right over our camera shot of our photog, Paul Rigney. And I went in and listened to the service. And then some of the folks in the congregation welcomed me to Sunday school. And 12 out of the 13 in that Sunday school class spoke up and said that they voted for Donald Trump. And one of those was that very first woman you heard from, Linda Kennedy. At the time, she said that, in her way of phrasing it, was confessing to voting for Donald Trump for the first time. And she said when she cast that vote, she had questions about whether God was going to, quote, strike her down because she was so displeased with the way that the president or the then candidate conducted himself and spoke. But as you heard her say, she ended up voting for him. And he won this county by 42 percentage points. By comparison, Mitt Romney won it by just 19 percentage points. And that is why I wanted to come back here, because we focus a lot on those swing counties, ones that went for Obama, then for Trump, or those counties that saw a, a, a depressed turnout in more of those urban corridors. But you can make a case that it's places like Pickaway County, a town of 12,000 people, with the classic tale of 
you know, three out of their four factories closing, losing hundreds of jobs and folks hoping amid an opioid crisis that their community would be able to come back. That's why it was important to come back. And I'll note, when we're looking at polling, this is a place that is 95 percent white, this county. Uh, 85 percent of folks here uh, do not have college uh, educations. And so far, what we have seen are advances for Joe Biden uh, among this particular demographic, closing that gap by 10 percentage points compared to where Hillary Clinton was at four years ago. Vaughn, we just heard from some voters about the economy. What other issues will they be voting on come November? Uh, ha have they sort of stacked them up for you in terms of what they are most concerned about uh, and, and what may be the deciding thing that just sort of pushes them in, in, uh, with one ticket or the other? That second woman you heard from was Megan Edgington. She's a mother of three, born and raised here in Circleville. And she actually voted for Barack Obama. And then she was part of that jump of Trump support here. She voted for Donald Trump. And she's now weighing which direction to go this time. The issue that she named was health care, particularly amid this pandemic, as a mother of three holding on to her job, trying to ensure that those in her community have health care. That's the issue where she says that she wants to better listen to debates. Of course, we can have a conversation about what those policies are. But the reality is, is that you have a likely voter here who is a little unclear about where the two candidates stand when it comes to health care. And that's why I think these debates will be significant, because there are still millions of voters that perhaps aren't following it like I am as a journalist every single day, but they want to better understand those policies. Linda Kennedy, she's actually a lifelong Republican, and she said the idea of voting for a Democrat is pretty crazy. She said that she appreciates that this conservative administration has brought on these conservatives like Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh onto the Supreme Court. At the same time, she is the grandmother now of eight grandkids, and she said that she cannot bear to hear the way the president speaks about others, and she is frustrated by the, as she used the word, turmoil in the, quote, anger that she is singing in communities like her own towards other Americans, and that's why she said right now she is leaning towards Joe Biden. So, Vaughn, let me ask you this. I see that Biden for president at sign behind you. You talk about some voters leaning uh, for Biden. What do they like about the Biden-Harris ticket? What uh, do, are some of their concerns with the Biden-Harris ticket? You know, look, if you're the Democrats, they had more than 20 candidates up on that stage. And there were a great number of folks from within the Democratic Party that hoped to have Joe Biden walk away because they thought that he was the most palatable to places like this. Communities from the Midwest, 95% white, industrial, and Joe Biden is the nominee that they wound up with. And I've heard from folks who have suggested uh, that Joe Biden is somebody who they think does understand the plight of the Midwest and some of the towns like this. At the same time, that third gentleman that you heard from, Jerry Lice, you know, when I talk to him, this is a man who also attended that Methodist church that Democrats hoped that they'd be able to pick off. Yet at the same time, he said that he believes that Joe Biden uh, is going to be largely controlled by other factions of the Democratic Party, uh, believing that there shouldn't be such issues as free college tuition, uh, and that the Joe Biden is of the past is not the same Joe Biden within the current uh, Democratic uh, uh, Party. At the same time as you said it, there's a couple of these Joe Biden signs around. And while the Biden campaign doesn't necessarily look as pickaway county as being the place where they're going to invest the resources, if they're able to chip off at least some of that support, I'll repeat it. Mitt Romney won it by 19 percentage points. And then four years later, Donald Trump won it by 42 percentage points. If they're able to chip mm -hmm. into some of that support in places like here, that gives them a chance here in a place like Ohio, a place where... Barack Obama won just eight years ago. Allison. Vaughn, thank you so much for giving us uh, another slice, another view of, of how folks are, are feeling there in the Midwest. I've been traveling across the country so we can understand what voters are thinking ahead of November. Our big thanks to you and, of course, to Paul, too. Tell him we say hi. Thanks, my friend. 
How and when are you voting in the 2020 presidential election? It's more important than ever to understand your options. NBC has a great new tool to help you out. It's called Plan Your Vote, a state-by-state -state guide on voting rules, deadlines, and restrictions. Check it out at NBCNews.com slash Plan Your Vote. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. Got to get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. We actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we could just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. A suspect arrested in Kenosha, Wisconsin, police there confirming that two people were killed, another seriously injured in a shooting at the protests last night. Just a warning, the footage you're about to see is disturbing. It shows a man sitting in the middle of the street waving a gun at people running by. No!
Now, NBC News can't confirm what happened before or after that recording, or if this is, in fact, the weapon and the gunman responsible for the fatal shooting. Meanwhile, this afternoon, President Trump says he's sending federal law enforcement and the National Guard to Kenosha, Wisconsin, to restore law and order. The president tweeting, we will not stand for looting, arson, violence, and lawlessness on American streets. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster joins me now from Kenosha, Wisconsin. Shaq, I know it has been a very busy day. Let's start with the suspected shooter. What do you know about that suspected shooter and what happened last night? Well, we know that the suspected shooter is in custody. It's a 17-year-old from Antioch, Illinois, which is about 30 minutes from where we're standing right now in Kenosha. And uh, they're not giving many details on what happened, what led to the shooting, the details surrounding it. But they're saying that the two people who he shot and killed or who he's alleged of shooting and killing are 26 years old and 36 years old. And we know that at least one other person was injured in that shooting last night. Police said last night that the shooting happened around 11.45 p.m. It happened after this park that I'm in right now. This is a place, it's been the flashpoint of protests uh, for, since Sunday night. And after police cleared out this park and protesters and other people went into the different streets and different areas around here, that is when that shooting happened. There's lots of video out there that people have been piecing together, but they're not giving an official record of exactly what happened. But they are saying that he is in custody at this point, he will be charged, and court records show that he'll likely have a court hearing uh, later this week. I believe it's on Friday. Allison? All right, Shaq, we also know there was a press conference in Kenosha this afternoon. What did you hear there? That's right, press conference that just wrapped up. And, you know, we, we learned a, a few different things uh, related to the case. One thing in terms of the original shooting of Mr. Jacob Blake, the uh, county or the police chief made very clear he would like to give more information, but it wasn't his department that did the investigating. In Wisconsin, when there's a police shooting, uh, the custody of the crime scene is then shifted over to another department. And we know now that the state is handling the investigation right now. So the police chief said he just doesn't have any details about what the scene looked like and what the causes were. They didn't talk to the police officers because they wanted a separate investigation. But we also heard from the mayor and the county superintendent. Listen to what the mayor said at that press conference. Violence in the community is not acceptable. Violence to property, violence to people, absolutely unacceptable. And it is up to us to make sure that that does not continue. When you watch that press conference, they started with the turmoil here in Kenosha. They talked about a 7 p.m. curfew that is now in the place. That's the third night of a curfew. And they're actually moving it up an hour, they explained, because they wanted uh, to start help clearing people out of parks like these. They wanted that process to start in daylight rather than nightfall. We know the pattern has been peaceful protests by day, some clashes during the evening, and that destruction and last night death that occurs at night. They want to avoid that and do what they can to avoid that. And that's what the officials announced earlier today. Allison. All right, Shaq, let's take it back a little earlier today and talk about the president's tweets. He says he spoke with the governor who agreed to accept federal assistance. Uh, what else can you tell us about this incoming federal law enforcement? Yeah, you know, there's some discrepancy over exactly what that tweet meant and exactly what is going to happen. And I'll tell you, we saw that tweet from the president and minutes earlier we saw a statement from the governor, the governor saying that he was upping the amount of National Guardsmen he was sending to Kenosha. Yesterday, there were 250 Guard members in place. Today, it will be 500 members from the National Guard who will be here in this county. But the president saying that Tony Evers, the governor here, accepted his request to send federal assistance. There's some discrepancy because the governor's office is saying there hasn't been any accepting of federal resources. He increased the amount of National Guard and those troops involved. Uh, so there's some discrepancy, some uh, uncertainty about what exactly was announced, what was announced by the president, and also uh, what was announced by the governor. The governor is still saying, though, that with the influx in National Guard troops, they're hoping that can help uh, both assist local law enforcement, but it can also help prevent some of the scenes mm -hmm. that we saw both last night and the prior three nights. Allison. 
Check. This, of course, is all happening because police shot Jacob Blake on Sunday. I, I can't let you yep. go without asking, how is Blake doing today? What are we hearing about his condition? What are we hearing from his family? Well, we heard from his family this morning, Allison. His family said he is in a lot of pain right now. They say he is doing better in terms of his overall condition, but they say he is not out of the woods just yet. His family yesterday had that press conference, very emotional press conference, where they went through and gave us a thorough account of his condition. They said he was shot at least seven times, that he had a bullet lodged in his vertebrae, that he suffered kidney damage, liver damage, uh, damage to his intestines. Uh, he, they, they made clear that he has a long road of recovery ahead of him. They said during that press conference that it would be a miracle if he is able to walk again. But then they also asked for the prayers of people here in Kenosha and people all across the country. They know the long road to recovery that he'll have to have, the many surgeries that, and procedures that he'll have to do, including as recently as yesterday when he had a spinal procedure. They know it's going to be a lot of work, a long recovery ahead. But they are uh, asking for prayers and asking for people to continue thinking about him. And in doing that, they're calling for peace and uh, for any protest in his name to be peaceful because they want the focus to be on the underlying issue here. Allison. Yeah. Well, Shaq, we know people around the country are absolutely praying for Jacob Blake to get better. Thank you so much uh, for all of the updates today. A whole lot going on there in Kenosha, Wisconsin. We appreciate it. Thank you. It's working for the NBA and the NHL, so could a simple saliva test help colleges and universities tame outbreaks on their campuses? NBC News investigative and consumer correspondent Vicki Wynn shows us how this spit test works. Across the country, schools reversing their decision to hold in-person classes after COVID-19 outbreaks. At UNC Chapel Hill, classes abruptly halted just days after move-in. Students there not tested before coming back. But at Purdue University in Indiana, an unprecedented undertaking. Before all 40,000 students start classes this month, they're required to take a COVID test. Testing will be very, very important and will be a key element of protecting our, our college campuses. But unlike most COVID testing that involves a large, often uncomfortable swab to get a sample from the back of the nose, Purdue students will just spit into this tiny tube, something they can do at home with this kit. The convenience of that, and so I think particularly for this generation of students, was a good one that allowed us to, to reach them where they were. Purdue is one of 65 schools working with Vault Health, formerly a men's health company, now offering this at-home COVID saliva test developed by Rutgers University. Is the saliva test a game changer? It is a game changer. First of all, it's a much easier test to administer. You're spitting into a tube, which just about everybody can do, even kids, and you're just giving us enough spit to be able to tell if there's a virus in there. I ordered a kit from Vault's website. It arrived in two days. I have my materials here. What do I do? I set up a okay. video chat so with a clinician who made sure I did the test correctly. The I made sure to not eat, drink, or put anything in my mouth for 30 minutes. So all you need to do now is go ahead and spit. Oh, man, this is going to take a while. I think the record was about 30 seconds. I was not so speedy. <laughs> How many times a day do you have to watch people do this? <laughs> Enough. <laughs> Two minutes later. Any tricks to this? Yeah, smelling pickles in a jar, thinking about food, smelling citrus. You should have told me to bring my pickles in a jar out sooner. I have nothing. I have nothing. All right, let me think about mouth-watering foods. I feel like it's working. It took some time to All work right. up about a spoonful of saliva. Am I there? Oh, that's pretty good. Yes. You're there. A quick mix with a preservative to keep my sample fresh. Then I put it in a pre-addressed bag to be overnighted to the Rutgers lab in New Jersey. Vault says results are available in two to three days, a big advantage over swab tests that have seen delays up to 14 days. Vault's test is one of two strictly saliva tests given emergency authorization by the FDA. Yale University created the other one, but it's not an at-home test. How is this test better than what we've been seeing with the nasal swab? Well, the false negative rate is really what we're concerned with. Telling somebody that they're negative when actually they are sick is very dangerous. And so the saliva test has a 1% or even less than 1% false negative rate. But scientists caution there's not enough data yet to know how much virus is in saliva. They're generally very active accurate. They're probably a little bit less sensitive than the nasal swab, which is the term we use to mean that if people have 
very, very small amounts of virus, it's possible that the nasal swab would detect that, whereas the saliva wouldn't. The test is also pricey, $150 if you order it directly from the company. Right now, Vault is running about 80,000 tests a day, and they say as that number goes up, the cost will come down. For students like 18-year-old Clara Terry, who will be a freshman at Purdue, spitting in the tube was easy. I've heard like with the nose one, um, like it hurts. This was not painful at all. And Vicky joins me now. Vicky, this test gives faster results. It's not as uncomfortable as the nasal swabs. But let's talk a little bit more about doctors' concerns with these saliva tests. What are they worried about here? Yeah, the primary concern, Allison, is that there may not be enough of the virus in your saliva. If there are small amounts, it depends on when you take the test. It may not be as sensitive as the nasal swab. Another thing we should mention is for first-time consumers like myself who took this test, uh, they pair you up with a clinician who does watch you to make sure you're doing it correctly and also to make sure that it's you that's actually spitting in the vial. Vicki, are these schools just using the saliva test here or are some schools using both the nasal swab and the spit test and kind of trying out both options? Yeah, in the case of Purdue, they are going with this vault test. They're requiring students to take them within two weeks of coming back to campus this month. So that's very interesting because imagine that undertaking, 40,000 students. They're offering it free of charge, but it's costing the yeah. university millions and others as well. But they all tell us that it is a worthwhile investment to try and help ensure the health of their staff and their students. But we have heard of other campuses that are using both. And here's the frustration that I've also heard from some parents of students who have tested positive in one test, then negative in another. They want to know what are they supposed to do. And in that situation, it really should be up to the healthcare provider. They should go to their doctor. If they're experiencing any symptoms at all, even if they get a negative test, then they should isolate. Vicki, I have a dear friend whose son goes to Purdue. I'm dying to reach out to him after this and ask him what he thought about to make sure that he could salivate for the test. I love that you were saying you were having a little bit of trouble there and trying to think of foods that would make that happen. The second someone tells you you need to fill two milliliters of a vial with your saliva, suddenly your mouth is dry as a bone. But that trick, he told me, really did help. It did work. And I am curious to hear what your friend from Purdue says. I'll, I'll report back, I promise. I kept thinking, what would I do? Like steak, nachos? I don't know. What would it take to, I mean, that's, that's a, a decent amount of spit you got to come up with. Thinking of sour things. I think sour things make your mouth water the most. All right, I'll find out what he did. Vicky, thank you so much. I guess <laughs> you got to go with pickles. That's the way to go. Thank you. <laughs> take care. The CDC now saying healthy people who have been exposed to COVID-19 don't necessarily need a test. Here's what former FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb said about that today. We're talking about people who are in contact with someone known to have COVID. Um, that's an essential component of case-based interventions, doing effective tracking and tracing. And so if we want to use case-based interventions to try to control the epidemic, we need to get people who may be at high risk of contracting the infection tested to make sure that they're not asymptomatic carriers, because we know while they're less likely to transmit the infection if they're asymptomatic, they can still transmit the infection. NBC News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres joins me now. Dr. John, what's your reaction to the CDC's new guidance here? And my reaction is essentially the reaction you're seeing across the country, especially with public health experts, is a bit of a head scratching going, you know, trying to figure out exactly why they made this change. They did it very quietly, put it out on their website, and it is a substantial change from what they had before. Because before, if you were exposed, they said, go ahead and get tested. We can make sure that if you're asymptomatic, you're not spreading it, because we know that up to half of the cases are being spread from asymptomatic patients. But now what they're saying is, okay, you have to have that extended period of exposure, and then you have have to have symptoms on top of that, and then you should get tested. And the reason this is a concern, exactly what uh, Dr. Scott Gottlieb was talking about, is when it comes to that contact tracing, that we know we have not been doing a very good job of getting that contact tracing under control. A crucial part of that is finding out who might be right now have coronavirus and who could be spreading it, even though they don't have symptoms. Well, if you're taking out that that equation, the part of the equation where people don't have symptoms, aren't getting tested, that's going to leave a big deficit there. So I think going forward, you're going to see a lot of concern as to, OK, how, what do we do now if people aren't getting tested? And hopefully as we get more and more tests and we certainly have more now than we had a few months ago, hopefully as time goes on, we get more tests and these saliva type tests and other ones, we start getting back to, OK, let's get more 
people tested, even those that don't have symptoms, because we know they, in fact, can spread the virus as well, Allison. Dr. John, I want to ask you about the saliva tests we've been talking so much about. The NHL, the NBA are using them. Colleges are trying them. Uh, people can get this test at home and get results in, in a matter of minutes. Uh, what do you make of these spit tests? Is this the coronavirus test of the future? I think it's going to be one of the coronavirus tests of the future, Allison. I think it's going to take a combined effort of a bunch of different tests. And as you and I have talked about, when it comes to what we call diagnostic tests, which are the tests that are used to find mm -hmm. out if you have an infection right now, if you actively have an infection and could spread it to others, there's two different kinds, PCR and antigen. The antigen are the ones that we know that aren't quite as effective, but they seem to be there a lot faster. You can get them quicker. The PCR tests are more, uh, more sensitive, more effective, but at the same time, they're harder to get. These saliva tests, both of them, the ones that have been uh, had gotten the emergency use authorization, are PCR tests. So they're going to be more accurate, which is good. This one that she talked about that Purdue and other universities are using, it, it's a take-home test in the sense that you collect a sample at home, but you still have to send it in and wait a couple of days. Yale School of Public Health actually just came out with one, and it's not test equipment per se. It's a protocol showing labs around the country how they can do it using equipment and chemicals that they have in sight right now. And hopefully over the next couple of weeks, we see more of that. The beauty of this one is it's quick. They can do 90 tests, they say, in under three or four hours, and it costs around $10 per test. So we're seeing the pricing come down. We're seeing the speed of the results going up. And so I think over time, especially over the next couple of months, you're going to see more and more of this, and you're going to see more people getting tested in situations like the universities, the NBA, the NFL, all these places are doing, again, to try and keep this under control, Allison. Dr. John, a new report from MIT and Oxford says that six feet of social distancing just might not be enough. Uh, why not? And what does this study tell us about how the virus is transmitted? And what the study actually looked at, Allison, is how the virus, especially once it gets to those smaller particles, not necessarily the respiratory mm -hmm. particles that we know go about six feet, but the smaller particles that can linger in the air for longer, where are we most likely to catch it because of those particles? And they're saying in certain situations, indoor, crowded areas, especially where people aren't wearing masks, then we have to worry about that. But the big concern is if we start putting out a message saying in one situation you need six feet, in another situation you need 12 feet, a third situation you need 18 feet, it's going to get very confusing. And so the experts I have talked to are saying six feet is the minimum, more is better. And they equate it to cigarette smoking. If you're next to somebody, you can smell the smoke. If you're six feet away, not so much. If you're 20 feet away, you can hardly smell it. It's the same with the virus. Six feet minimum distance. If you can do more, that's even better, Allison. So, Dr. John, if this is the case, if in certain situations six feet might not be far enough and you can't get further than six feet from someone, what else should you be doing to protect yourself? What are the other things uh, we have in our arsenal to make sure that we're keeping ourselves as safe as possible? Well, I think the obvious answer from a public health perspective is try not to get in those situations, as in bars and other indoor events yeah. where you can't get that six feet of separation. But if you can't for some reason, if you happen to be in there for whatever reason, make sure you wear a mask, other people are wearing masks as well. Ventilation is important. Opening up windows to try and get that fresh air through is extremely important. Those can help. But the bottom line is if you're within that six foot distance, then your chances do go up of getting coronavirus. So you want to try to avoid those as best as possible. All right, Dr. John, thank you so much for the great advice always. You bet. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families 
have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Today, we celebrate Women's Equality Day 100 years ago. Women were officially given the right to vote, but the fight for equal rights didn't end with the 19th Amendment. Here's a look at how we got here and how far we still need to go. It was not easy to be a suffrage activist, and it's an epic fight. It didn't end in 1920. We can commemorate this, this wonderful anniversary, but it's not the end of the story. We might be misled to think that this is sort of happenstance or it's all COVID, but voter suppression in the U.S. has a long and disturbing history. A century later, we're, we're reliving it. Ordinary women, these are grassroots women, these are teachers, factory workers, and farm girls. They become activists when it's really dangerous for them to be. But black women had a whole movement of their own, but their feminism is defined in a completely different way. Their feminism must embrace both the issue of race and gender. They can't separate the two because you'd be splitting them in half. What black women know is that no 19th Amendment will get to them to the polls if intimidation and violence continue to be the order of the day in the American South. And that proves to be precisely what happens after 1920. The 1920 election was coming up in the fall. They knew if they didn't get it then, um, that it might not happen. Seeing how the suffragists had to handle the pandemic, they had to change and, and do things by mail. And the, the country was also swinging away from progressivism. It was becoming more conservative and the suffragists saw that. So they play hardball. That's sort of what we saw happening this summer across the nation with demonstrations in Lafayette Park, I thought, oh my God, Alice Paul, 
Alice Paul and, and her compatriots are really, um, you know, masters of, of political theater, and they are prepared to pay a price, um, you know, personally, physically, to stage that theater. And so she leads them in picketing the White House, in demonstrations every day in Lafayette Park. They're arrested, they are tortured in prison. Hundreds of women are in prison for asking for the vote. What will happen is the 19th Amendment does give the vote to all women citizens. The problem is it will be undermined. Black women technically could vote, but in reality they couldn't because of that dirty two-letter word, voter suppression. Black women, even in 1919, right, they're already organizing to um, understand literacy tests and poll taxes. And that's a sure sign to us that they understood the limits of the 19th Amendment. The Klan will organize itself and it will target black women, their leaders, their institutions, deliberately to keep black women from the polls. Black women and men will be fighting for another four and a half decades. For Asian American women and for Native American women, they are not considered citizens in 1920. So the 19th Amendment does not help them until that gets remedied and that takes decades more. They were forced to wait in line long hours and then the polls would close. Does it sound familiar to you? That is not so different, right, than 1920 in the sense that uh, Black Americans are working on multiple fronts. People who are disenfranchised are going to not only fight for the vote, they're going to make other kinds of politics in order to secure the kind of influence and resources and access they think they are due. A century later, we're, we're reliving it. It's a question of equality and representation. Black Americans were asked to risk their lives to try and vote. They were required to risk their lives. And COVID, you know, has up the stakes for many things, including voting rights. It's a, a deeply disturbing parallel that people are going to be asked to risk their lives to vote in November. And Black Americans, it turns out, are going to disproportionately bear the risk of that. This is the, the real stress test for democracy. So I'd say it's time to uh, get those banners out and those sashes to say that as a nation, voting rights is, is crucially important. This is an NBC News special report. Here's Lester Holt. Good afternoon, everyone. It's 5 o'clock in the east. We're coming on the air to update you on what has become a major hurricane bearing down on the Gulf Coast along the Texas-Louisiana border. Hurricane Laura has been gathering strength all day, now a Category 4 storm and growing. It will make landfall just hours from now. It's expected to bring high winds, torrential rain, and a potentially catastrophic record-breaking storm surge putting millions of Americans in harm's way. Al Roker is standing by with the very latest. Al, what can you tell us about this storm? Lester, the National Hurricane Center said that this is an unsurvivable storm surge potential for Laura. Right now, it's uh, 155 miles south of Lake Charles, Louisiana. It spreads out 400 miles in diameter, 145 mile per hour winds moving northwest at 15. Landfall about Thursday morning, 1 a.m., with 150 mile per hour winds, dangerous rain, winds, and gusts. We're talking about this system moving in as still a tropical storm inland, bringing flood threats and tornadoes as it moves into the upper Mississippi River Valley. The biggest thing we're concerned about is the storm surge, 15 to 20 feet, and that could move 30 miles inland. The storm surge, that wall of water that's pushed in by the winds of the hurricane in the northeast quadrant, three feet will bring considerable life-threatening surges. Six feet blows out back walls, moves buildings off of foundations, breaking down doors and windows, and nine feet plus moves third further inland because of that surge and entire neighborhoods get wiped out. The peak wind gusts 
Lake Charles could see a 107 mile per hour wind gust, uh, Fort Polk as well. As you move further away, those winds drop off. But power outages will be a big problem, Lester. Starts stretching from the Gulf Coast all the way into the mid Mississippi River Valley and heavy rain, widespread flash flooding, urban flooding from the Gulf Coast to the Mississippi River Valley with moderate to major river flooding. We're talking some areas, Lester, picking up 15 inches of rain. But the big story is going to be the storm surge. This at 20 feet will make it probably one of the worst storm surges in this region. Laura will be the strongest hurricane to make landfall along the Texas-Louisiana border. Lester? Not a pretty picture you paint. Let's find out how people are preparing right now. NBC's Morgan Chesky is in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Morgan, what can you tell us? Yeah, Lester, from Lake Charles all the way down the Texas coast to Galveston, the message is get out while you still can. A deceptively sunny moment here in Lake Charles after we've experienced the first few bands of this catastrophic hurricane uh, bringing high winds and heavy rain that's only going to intensify in the coming hours before it makes at landfall as Al mentioned around 1 a.m. Now right now evacuations have been underway since yesterday uh, starting here in Lake Charles. People who didn't have the means to get to the Civic Center were bused from various neighborhoods before being taken about 100 miles north of where I am right now where they'll be able to uh, find hopefully a safe space and shelters but that is posing a problem Lester. We know that COVID-19 is forcing less uh, shelters to have to socially distance and as a result of that not as many people are able to be fit inside we're already seeing issues as far as Texas of shelters running out of room in the meantime for those people who choose to stay here uh, they face a very real threat in that storm surge everyone thinking back to 2005 when Hurricane Rita pushed its surge more than 50 miles inland flooding a vast portion of this community here in Lake Charles everyone doing what they can to close up board up up their windows and find a safe place to hunker down because as we're finding out if it wasn't taken seriously already as a category three whenever we saw the upgrade to a category four today it was enough to give even uh, seasoned people here who have experienced these hurricanes serious pause because they know what's to come in just a few hours lester all right morgan you and the team take care out there thanks stay with us nbc station for the latest on hurricane laura i'll be back with complete details on nbc nightly news and again tonight at 10 Eastern time during our coverage of the Republican National Convention. For now, I'm Lester Holt, NBC News, New York. Good day, everyone. Hey, everyone, I'm Allison Morris. You are watching NBC News Now. Let's go right over to NBC News correspondent Savannah Sellers. She has the very latest headlines from NBCNews.com. Savannah, what's going on this hour? Hey, Allison, kicking this off again with the Republican National Convention continuing tonight, featuring headliners like President Mike Pence, senior advisor Kellyanne Conway, and White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany. Tonight's theme is, quote, land of the heroes, and we expect to hear speeches from the worlds of national security and the military. Now to the Midwest, where police have arrested a 17-year-old from Illinois in connection with a shooting overnight in Kenosha, Wisconsin. At least two people were killed and one was hurt after gun shots rang out during a protest over the shooting of Jacob Blake. President Trump says he's now sending in the National Guard to monitor the unrest. This was all sparked by a video showing Kenosha police shooting 29-year-old Jacob Blake this past Sunday. Law enforcement says they were responding to a, quote, domestic incident, but they haven't given any other details. In the meantime, the officers involved were placed on administrative leave. Kenosha's mayor addressed the community's outrage earlier today. Kenosha is a community that in the long run will recover. We will work together to resolve our issues. We will work with the minority community to continue to move forward. And we will make this a better place to live. Turning to the CDC, which quietly changed some of its guidance on COVID-19 this week. They now say those exposed to the virus might not need testing if they're asymptomatic. This contradicts an earlier recommendation that anyone exposed to COVID-19 should be screened, regardless of symptoms. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is urging people to ignore these new guidelines, claiming the CDC is trying to downplay the number of cases. 
That's politics. That's this president saying, if you don't test, if we don't test, then we won't see the number go up, and then we'll have this false comfort, right? President Trump has been saying we only know that we have cases because we test. Meanwhile, there's a new report out this week questioning the current guidelines on social distancing. Researchers at the University of Massachusetts and the University of Oxford found that staying six feet apart might not be enough to prevent catching COVID-19. The report suggests that ventilation, crowd size, and wearing masks are also major factors that can impact exposure. Just another example that scientists are still learning how this pandemic spreads and a reminder of how much we still don't know. And finally, some tragic news out of Fort Hood, Texas. We told you last week that Sergeant Elder Fernandez was missing from the military post. Well, now police have said they discovered a body they believe to be his based on identification at the scene. Authorities said they don't suspect foul play, but didn't specify a cause of death. Fort Hood has been the site of a series of soldiers' disappearances and deaths in the last year, and Sergeant Fernandez's family's attorney is calling for a congressional investigation. Allison. All right, Savannah, thank you so much. The theme for night three of the RNC, Land of Heroes. The Trump campaign promising an optimistic message tonight. Vice President Mike Pence will headline from Fort McHenry, Baltimore, which inspired the national anthem. NBC News White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell joins me now. Kelly, what can we expect from the vice president tonight? Well, this is certainly one of the biggest nights in the political life of Mike Pence, getting his showcase at the convention where he can address a lot of the issues that the administration has been working on. And it really is his night in many ways. The setting, as you described it, is an important part of the backdrop here because they plan to honor veterans, military service. He has a son who's a Marine. That's often something we hear from him. And he'll be able to try to talk about ways in which the president has supported men and women in uniform. So expect some of that. This would be a strong defense, as we've been told to anticipate, from Mike, to Mike Pence about the administration's work over these years. And that is something that we expect will be political, but also in the voice of Mike Pence, where he tends to not be quite as harsh as some other members of the administration. Also tonight, we expect to hear from his wife, Karen Pence, the second lady. We also expect to hear from the president's daughter-in-law, Laura Trump, as well as press secretary Kayleigh McEnany, but in her personal capacity, not here speaking as the press secretary. That's been one of the distinctions we've been seeing from this uh, Republican National Convention, where the lines of typical government separate from politics have really been distorted here. And typically, you would not have some of these figures who have government jobs doing these political speeches and being a part of the political presentation. But that is the times we're in, and those norms have been certainly broken by this administration, trying to focus in some ways on the popular figures in the conservative community. And Kayleigh McEnany's gotten a lot of attention in conservative press and among the president's supporters. Also, Kellyanne Conway, who will be leaving the administration to spend more time with her family, she was the campaign manager in 2016 at the time of their victory, and she has been a counselor to the president during the years of their time in office. So that's some of what we expect tonight from uh, night three, gearing up for tomorrow, where the president will have his big night. Uh, it still remains to be seen how we'll see the president tonight, how that will all play out. We've been told to expect some surprises. Allison? All right, we'll be ready for surprises. Uh, Kelly, last night, a number of speakers downplayed the coronavirus threat. Vice President Pence heads the coronavirus task force. How do you expect that he'll handle COVID tonight? Well, because of his role as the head of the task force, we do expect that he will deliver a defense of the president and the administration's work on that front. He has been at the table every day of these months of working on the task force. And there's been a lot of controversy, of course, has there been enough testing? Has there been a fast enough response? Has there been enough of an acknowledgement of steps that are necessary? Pence has been a sometimes mask wearer, but not very often. And it, we expect that he will talk about what the administration has done. That will likely bring out a lot of the facts and figures where they talk about ventilators and personal protective equipment and steps where the administration has used the Defense Production Act to get some of the equipment made. There's a lot of criticism about the federal response. 
but there will certainly be a story that Pence will tell about how they have responded and how they've supported frontline workers and healthcare workers and so forth. So do expect that to be part of his presentation tonight. Uh, Kelly, an unconventional question for you, if you'll forgive the pun. We heard that fencing was installed near the White House today. Do we have any idea what's going on there, what that fencing is all about? Well, that's the domain of the National Park Service, and one of the things they do is they erect temporary fencing that's quite tall, sort of modular, at times when they think there is a need to keep crowd control. This is usually in advance of anticipated big events where there's going to be a lot of members of the public. And in this instance, there's a couple of things happening. The South Lawn of the White House will be the venue for tomorrow night's big speech by President Trump. Again, that unusual use of the White House. But it is an area that can be visible from public spaces. And so having additional fencing can help to protect that from any un unusual level of crowds. And then a march uh, this weekend on Washington where they expect to have a large number of people. And part of what they're anticipating is because this will be an outdoor venue for the president tomorrow with the South Lawn having some sight lines to areas that are open to the general public, by having additional fencing, it's a layer of security and a way to keep the crowds who will attend or will gather at a distance that they can't break barriers. We've certainly seen how earlier in the year when there were certainly social justice protests that some of those got sure. violent and and so they're taking those steps in anticipation of these events uh, around the white house tomorrow allison kelly o'donnell with all the updates from the white house and the rnc thank you so much good to be with you our special coverage of day three of the Republican National Convention starts tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern with Chuck Todd. Then we have a network primetime special at 10 p.m. Eastern. You can, of course, watch it all right here on NBC News Now. Voters 65 and older helped Donald Trump secure a win back in 2016, but new polling shows that in 2020, more of those voters support Joe Biden. NBC News Now correspondent Dasha Burns spoke with some seniors in Newport Ritchie, Florida. Hey, Allison, it turns out if you want to get seniors in sweltering hot Florida to talk to you about politics, you catch them at the pool after they've done a couple of laps or a little bit of water aerobics. And that is exactly what we did. This is an area that has a large population of voters over the age of 65, and they are largely what helped Trump uh, really expand the margin of victory for the GOP here. He won by 21 points. Compare that to 2012 with Mitt Romney when he only won by seven points here. And the question I came here with is is that uh, is that enthusiasm holding? And the answer that I got, Allison, is largely a resounding yes. And when I talk to voters about some of the priorities, considering uh, the coronavirus pandemic has hit this state and uh, this demographic particularly hard, uh, take a listen to, to some of what I heard. How worried are you about the coronavirus I'm pandemic? I'm not. You're not? Why not? Now I'm not because I've seen what happens. A lot of people that they say are dying of it are not. They're just putting that down on the death certificate. Are, are, are you saying you, you you don't believe that as many people have died from it as, as Oh, definitely they not. What, what concerns me are those folks that are naysayers or, or people that don't believe that we've got a problem. Those that believe it's a hoax, so to speak. Um, those that say, well, I don't know anybody that's had the virus, so it must not be a virus. I have someone that's passed away from the virus. I've had people that have been hospitalized by the virus. I know it's real. And Allison, of course, uh, that soundbite about uh, deaths uh, is an example of, of the spread of misrepresentation. NBC News has been gathering data from health departments across the country and is now reporting more than 180,000 uh, people dead from this virus. But interestingly, this did not seem to be the top priorities for voters that I've talked to here. Uh, instead, uh, there were folks focused on, on something else. Take a listen. What is your top concern? What is it that keeps you up at night? The lawless in the cities where the uh, mayors and governors of Portland, Seattle, uh, Minnesota, where they don't stop it. They just let it keep on going on. 
and I'm afraid it'll come here. This way the things going on in the United States right now is happening in other states and it's spreading over the nation. I just don't like it. And what, what, do you, what are you referring to? Well, the riots and stuff like that. So, Allison, clearly uh, the president's law and order message, while it may not be working in some places, does seem uh, to resonate with folks here. Allison? How are you voting in the 2020 presidential election? NBC News has a great new tool to help you figure that out. It's called Plan Your Vote, a state-by-state -state guide on voting rules, deadlines, and restrictions. Check it out at NBCNews.com slash Plan Your Vote. White House negotiators say they're ready to talk again, reaching out to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to restart COVID relief negotiations. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Leanne Caldwell joins me now. Leanne, what happened today? What, what is giving us that indication that they're ready to go? Well, uh, the White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows said that he reached out to Speaker Pelosi, or his staff reached out to Speaker Pelosi's office yesterday. He said that on a Politico uh, interview uh, earlier this morning. Well, a spokesperson to uh, Nancy Pelosi said that uh, members of Mark Meadows' staff did reach out to uh, their office yesterday, but did not indicate that they wanted to start talks again. Instead, they wanted to find out the phone number of one of Pelosi's top staffers. Uh, but Pelosi and her office maintains that they are ready to go. We'll get back to the table if the White House is willing to meet them halfway. And they say that they have gotten no indication that that is part of the process yet. So as of now, still stalled, Allison. Leanne, I'm hearing that Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is also talking about coronavirus relief today. What's he saying? Yeah, he did talk about it. He's been out back in Kentucky for a couple of weeks now. Remember, he has a, a campaign to run an election coming up in November as well. And he indicated that he is supportive of uh, the administration and Democrats getting back to it and trying to get something done. This is how he put it. And one of the reasons we need another package is because we need to deal with this unemployment insurance plus up issue far beyond the next five weeks. And I've recommended a proposal that would spend about an additional trillion dollars overall, which is no small amount of money. Our Democrat friends in the House want to spend $3 trillion, which would double what we've already done. And you've noticed we're at an impasse. Uh, one of the many reasons we need to get past this impasse and get a deal is to deal with this unemployment issue. Um, the coronavirus is not interested in the American election. Super interesting that McConnell is talking about the need for expanded unemployment insurance. Uh, this was a big hang up in the negotiations where Democrats wanted less money than the six or Republicans, excuse me, wanted less money than the six hundred dollars a week and uh, extra benefit that uh, people were getting until it expired at the end of July. So that's a real signal that people are starting to feel the pain and that politicians are hearing it. Also, Allison, uh, the CARES Act, the first big relief package that was passed several months ago, it was an extremely popular piece mm -hmm. of legislation. And so a lot of these Republicans who are running in tough reelection races in November, they know that another big benefit mm -hmm. package will just help them. Leanne, one last question for you. Treasury Secretary Mnuchin set to testify on Capitol Hill next week. Yeah. What could you tell us about that? This is part of the oversight. There's been a select committee created in the House of Representatives to have oversight of the $2.2 trillion CARES Act that was passed a couple months ago. And so it's Mnuchin's turn to come in the hot seat and explain how some of the programs went, especially those Treasury programs and those Federal Reserve programs that doled out hundreds of billions of dollars to corporations to keep them afloat during this. But this is also the first time that Congress is going to hear from Mnuchin uh, since these negotiations on a new relief package has been stalled. And so he's going to get a lot of questions on what the administration wants, what they're going or what they're perhaps willing 
to negotiate on in the future, as well as questions on the oversight component of what has already been passed, Allison. Leanne, it certainly has not been a quiet summer on Capitol Hill, that is for sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, that I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we could just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Schools around the world are reopening with strict new coronavirus standards to keep students safe. NBC News foreign correspondent Kelly Kobiea shows us the new normal in classrooms overseas. From Asia to the Middle East to Europe, schools are learning how to bring students and teachers back together. In Thailand, population 69 million, they have one of the lowest COVID infection rates in the world, just over 3,000 cases and fewer than 60 deaths. Yet they're taking no chances at school. There are temperature checks for students. Everyone wears a mask. They have hand washing stations and plastic screens around desks where students have lessons and their lunch. There are no staggered classes, capacity limits, or social distancing rules because Thailand has not had a single case of COVID transmission in the community in two months. A different story in Israel, population 8.7 million, more than 103,000 cases, more than 830 deaths. They invited all students back to school in May. The result, an explosion in infections. Now they're adjusting. 
Some religious schools are already open with desks spread apart and masks for teachers and older students. In public schools, they're disinfecting for the first day back next week. To keep class sizes small, in Tel Aviv, every student will go to school three or four times a week with the rest of their learning online. They're able to socialize, they're able to have contact with their teachers. That will definitely improve uh, their learning experience. The system has to work because there's no other alternative. We can't keep 70,000 kids at home. The economy won't survive it, the society won't survive it. The view in Britain, staying out of school is more dangerous to a child's health than catching COVID. There is overwhelmingly clear evidence that the chances of children dying from COVID are incredibly small. The evidence that not going to school damages children in the long run is overwhelming. The UK has one of the worst COVID rates in the world. Population 67,327,000 cases and more than 41,000 deaths. All students are now heading back to school to find more hand washing and desk cleaning. A new study by Public Health England found out of more than a million preschoolers and elementary kids in school in June, only 70 children and 128 staff tested positive for coronavirus. The study also found that kids are more likely to get infected at home. In parts of the UK, masks are mandatory for some older students in hallways, but not classrooms. Personally, I don't think that I would choose to wear on um, in front of my class. Um, I think lots of teaching is based around facial expressions and um, praise, positive praise, and I just don't think that the people should be able to read that. Across Great Britain and Northern Ireland, social distancing rules are left to local school administrators. The new rules that we have to follow, they're good for us. I mean, they're, they're there to keep us safe, but they're very different to what I'm used to, so it's going to take a little bit of time to get into it. No strategy is perfect. South Korea has been praised for its handling of the coronavirus. Population 51 million, 17,000 cases, just over 300 deaths. But schools are temporarily closing again in the capital Seoul after daily COVID cases jumped up into the hundreds. As the United States continues to debate the reopening of schools with different paths being taken in states and districts, the rest of the world is forging ahead, trying to get as close to normal as possible. A 17-year-old is in custody in connection with last night's deadly shooting at the protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Two people died. Another was seriously injured when a man opened fire in the middle of the street. Just a warning, the footage you are about to see is disturbing. NBC News can't confirm what happened before or after that recording or if the apparent shooter in that video is the person in custody tonight. Here's Kenosha's police chief on the arrest. Persons who were out after the curfew became engaged in some type of disturbance and, and persons were shot. A 17-year-old individual from Antioch, Illinois, was involved in the use of firearms to reserve, to, excuse me, to... Uh, to resolve whatever conflict was in place. What I can't tell you is what led to the disturbance that led to the, the person, and if both deaths are related to the same person. I don't know that at this point. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster joins me now from Kenosha. Shaq, what can you tell us about the suspect, his arrest, that deadly shooting? What do you know? Well, you can hear that the details are still being investigated, but we do know that that 17-year-old named Kyle Reidenhouse is now in custody. He is charged with first-degree intentional homicide for the death of those two protesters or two individuals who uh, were killed in the shooting 
after yesterday's protests. And I'll just give you a sense of what happened last night. The protest was here. We knew there was an 8 p.m. curfew. And in this park here, things are very quiet and peaceful right now. But in this park, this is where you saw a lot of the clashes between protesters and police. And once police cleared this area about two hours after the uh, curfew, that's when people started going off into different side streets. And you saw different groups, people with guns who were protecting property, people with guns who were saying they were protecting protesters, lots of guns that were out there. And apparently there was some sort of altercation that then led to that shooting. But police saying now that the person who shot and killed the two individuals, uh, 126, the other 36 years old, uh, he is now in custody, 17 years old, charged with that intentional homicide. Allison. Shaq, these protests, of course, are over the police shooting of Jacob Blake on Sunday. Kenosha police didn't give any more right. details today about the Blake shooting. Why not? You know, it was very interesting because they scheduled the press conference. It was somewhat last minute, and we thought we would hear something, some more detail about exactly what happened on Sunday night. Remember, we haven't heard anything since that initial statement, anything official since that initial statement on Sunday night right after the shooting. We've seen the video that has circulated. We've heard from different witnesses who tell different stories or it's usually a consistent story, but different details in those stories. But police just haven't confirmed the actual details. Well, the police chief today in that press conference said the reason that is is because he doesn't know. He was not there for the investigation. What happens in Wisconsin after a police shooting is it then goes into another body. So the, co the county, or as we know right now, the state is handling the investigation to help uh, make it more transparent, to help it, uh, to decrease the conflict of interest there and having uh, some, to the current department investigate their own shooting. So because of that, he is not able to release any more information. The people who can release information, it's that state division of criminal investigation under the state's Department of Justice. They say they aren't going to be releasing any more information. We do know that there's about a 30-day timeline from the date of the shooting. They have 30 days to issue a report to a district attorneys and the prosecutors. If prosecutors choose not to charge, uh, file charges against the officers, then that report becomes public. Uh, there's signals that we're not going to see any new information, any details until that report or until possible charges are filed. Allison. Shaq, Joe Biden tweeted about Jacob Blake today. What did he say? He did. He put up, we'll put up the tweet right now, but you, he released a full video. We first know that Vice President Biden and Senator Kamala Harris both met with the family, or sorry, excuse me, they both had a phone call with the family, uh, with the mom of Mr. Jacob Blake. And he put up a tweet and uh, we'll put, it was a full video that went on for about a minute and a half. And I'm actually starting to play it right now. So let me mute that for you guys. But in the tweet, he says, <laughs> Hold on, I'm having te technological troubles right now. But in the tweet, he says, uh, once again, a black man, Jacob Blake, was shot by the police in front of his children. It makes me sick. He says, is this the country we want to be? He talks about the violence. Needless violence won't heal us. We need to end violence and come together to demand justice. So you see Vice President Biden and Senator Kamala Harris, who's nominated for vice president on that ticket, uh, they've been talking about this issue. They've been trying uh, to call it, they've been calling for unity, but also condemning the violence. It is important to note that we have not heard from President Trump on the shooting. We've heard him talk about the violence afterwards, saying that he was going to send federal resources. The governor saying that there won't be federal resources, but there'll be an increase in National Guard troops uh, who will be here. But as far as the shooting of Mr. Jacob Blake, President Trump has not commented, as we've heard from Vice President Biden and Senator Kamala Harris. Allison. Yeah, and Shaq, I want to ask you about a question about the NBA, the Milwaukee Bucks, who normally, if yes. this was a normal season, play not all that far uh, from Kenosha, apparently didn't show up today. And we believe this is a Jacob Blake protest. What do you know about that? That's right. Milwaukee, not that far away, just about 30, 40 minutes north from where we are right now. And the Milwaukee Bucks, they were scheduled to have a game today. It's one of the three teams in the playoffs. Game five, uh, they're up 3-1, and they did not show up. They arrived, but they did not take the court. They were boycotting 
this game. And the NBA has now said that all three playoffs game, playoff games that were scheduled for tonight will now be postponed. There was a lot of support that you saw once uh, Milwaukee decided not to take the court. You saw other players chime in. LeBron James tweeted saying that this was ridiculous and he needs that we want to see uh, the end to these shootings. Um, so you see the NBA taking a stand. There's also a comment that we're hearing from the uh, senior vice president of the Milwaukee Bucks. He says, some things are bigger than basketball. The stand taken today by the players and organizations shows that we are fed up. Enough is enough. Change needs to happen. You're seeing the NBA League, which has been very progressive. You saw, if you watch any of the games, you see yeah. Black Lives Matter emblazoned on the court. You see the logos that they have. Some of the players have opted to change their names on the back of their jerseys for different social justice messages. So this is just the next step. They're going beyond the symbolism because some people have criticized the symbolism there. They're going beyond the symbolism and taking more substantial and more uh, financial, uh, more expensive, I should say, action. Uh, by not showing up and not playing tonight's game. Allison? Yeah, Shaq, very impressive to see some of our athletes, some of our leagues in this country really taking a stand uh, on the issues that matter and on racism in particular. Uh, Shaquille Brewster all hitting right. all the topics today, even in spite of some minor tech troubles. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Allison. Boston University is testing all of its students for COVID-19 in its very own lab. The results should take just 48 hours. NBC News correspondent Ann Thompson shows us this innovative and efficient new program. EU has really developed a very robust testing program by which we are testing members of the community for regular testing, regardless of symptoms. These tests are very accurate. The test we're doing is a quantitative um, PCR reaction. This test is looking specifically for the RNA or for the genetic code of the virus in the nose of the person who's being swabbed. So undergraduate students right now are being tested twice weekly, and graduate students are being tested once weekly, and that's our current cadence of testing. It allows us to really sample the community in a way that gives us real-time information. So first of all, if someone is positive, we can call them and do contact tracing and get them isolated as quickly as possible. It also gives us a very fast feedback and data on how the virus may be transmitting in our community. If we start to see numbers um, going up quickly or going up in a way that is doubling too soon, um, we'll know a lot about where the virus is on campus. We are willing and 100% willing to make that sacrifice and um, limit our contact. Um, and then for the rest of the student body, we just have to hope that everybody is taking the right precautions. Part of the importance of the regular testing, even if someone doesn't adhere to those individual safety practices and they're not keeping socially distanced, we're gonna catch them on our testing. I wanna keep everybody around me safe just as I wanna keep myself safe. So um, protecting those that who have come into contact with me or other people who have tested positive and came in contact with me, I wanna know that information just as much as I wanna give it out to um, help stop the spread and just make sure everybody stays safe here piece of contact tracing is that when we notify close contacts, we don't release the name of the person they've been exposed to. Many times, some students and some individuals will have actually already reached out to their close contacts and told them proactively, but that is not something that we ever release in terms of identity unless it was a significantly extenuating circumstance and we would get the person's permission to do that. Anne joins me live now from BU. Anne, I am so impressed not only with that lab, but BU is a big school. How is the university able to process so many tests? Well, they decided to do this, Allison, back in the spring when they looked at how they could bring everybody back to campus and keep people safe. And really, the only cost-effective way they saw was to do their own testing and not just do their own testing, but to continuously test both students, 
graduate and undergrad, as well as the faculty and staff, so they could track the spread of the disease. That lab is absolutely key. Those eight robots and about a dozen people who work from 7 in the morning till about 1030 at night, and they can process up to wow. 6,000 tests a day, and they hope to get those results back in 24 hours. That kind of speed is key to containing the virus. Wow, incredible work they're doing, long hours and thousands of tests, really impressed. And I understand that BU also has pretty strict social distancing rules. What are those regulations? What happens to a student who breaks them? Boy, I'll tell you, the Dean of Students came out with a blistering letter today telling the students here at Boston University that, look, if you hold a party and there are more than 25 people, you are going to be suspended for the fall semester. That means you're kicked off campus, um, you cannot take classes remotely, and you cannot get a refund on your tuition room or board. They are absolutely serious about this. Why did they put out the letter? Because other schools that have opened before BU, and despite all the testing programs they have had, when college students do what college students like to do, and that's get together and they forget social distancing, they start drinking beer, the masks come off, they're socializing, all of a sudden you see outbreaks of COVID-19. And at BU, they are absolutely determined that is not going to happen here. Yeah, and Boston University certainly not messing around. Thank you so much for showing us what they're doing there. Take care, Allison. Millions of Americans along the Gulf Coast are bracing for a potentially catastrophic hurricane. That is Laura, of course, while they're still dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. Dr. Amesha Dalja, an infectious disease doctor and a senior scholar at Johns Hopkins, joins me now. Dr. Dalja, what advice do you have for people who are preparing for Hurricane Laura right now in this pandemic? Take the same preparations that you would take during any hurricane season. We know that hurricanes can be deadly, they can be disruptive, and we don't want people to to skimp on preparing for the hurricane because of COVID-19. I do think it's going to be challenging because of social distancing, because of emergency shelters in the COVID-19 pandemic, but it is something that we want to get right, and we don't want people to unnecessarily be harmed because they're worried about COVID-19 and not taking the appropriate precautions for the hurricane. We could see thousands of people in hurricane shelters. Obviously, social distancing is going to be a challenge there, even if they are trying to maintain it. Are you expecting to see a spike in cases in the South in the weeks to come? Anytime people socially interact and are unable to practice social distancing is going to be an opportunity for the virus to spread. So if there are a large amount of people that have to go to temporary shelters where social distancing is very difficult, you have to anticipate that there are going to be cases. And there may be public health guidance that those who are in those shelters should consider themselves exposed and get tested or self-quarantine for 14 days. Let's talk about potential vaccines. Moderna says its vaccine is showing promising results in elderly patients. How significant is that, considering the elderly are often most vulnerable to COVID-19? It is something that's promising and, and it's welcome news to many people that are following this because we know that individuals that are in the high risk group tend to be older. So we want to make sure that the vaccine works in that group. And we know other vaccines don't work so well in the elderly population. So it is really important to know whether or not neutralizing antibodies are formed and T cell immunity is formed in elderly populations. That being said, remember, this is only still a small number of people that were in this uh, report that Moderna released. So we want to see more data in bigger groups, of the po bigger groups of the population to be able to say for sure how well it works in the elderly. What other kinds of results, what things are you watching for in these vaccine trials that will be a sign of success for you? The real success is going to come in phase three clinical trials. When people who are vaccinated face the virus in their day-to-day -day life, and we see how well those antibodies, how well that T cell immunity that we've seen in earlier clinical phases fares against the real virus. And that's when we know this works. And we also want to know when you vaccinate a high number of, po of a population, tens of thousands of people, are there any side effects that are rare that you start to see that might pose a problem later on? So it's really the phase three clinical trial where we'll see everything we need to know about this vaccine and how safe it is, how effective it is, and how what much of an impact it will have on the trajectory of the pandemic. All right, Dr. Adalja, always great to see you. Thanks for being back on the show. Thank you.
You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Among the chaos, I found a father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You got to get a four year degree, but a four year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. We actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Hurricane Laura, now a powerful Category 4 storm. Forecasters warning of a potentially catastrophic strike along the Texas-Louisiana coastline. MSNBC host Ali Velshi is in Beaumont, Texas. Ali, never one to shy away from a catastrophic storm. How are things there right now? Looks calm, but I know uh, there's some rough stuff heading your way. Yeah, this is, this is very common for a head of a hurricane. You can see it's cloudy. These are some outer bands, but you can see uh, some sunlight. We are about six hours away from really feeling the effects of it. There have been rain in the bands around here. The danger here is twofold. First of all, the 5 p.m. Uh, outlook has come out about this hurricane, and it has strengthened. So they are expecting it to make landfall sometime around midnight to 1 a.m. this morning at 150 miles per hour winds. Uh, that's a strong oh, Category 4. It's only five miles lower than a category fine. So this region has not seen that. And this region has seen remarkable devastation from hurricanes that were nowhere nearly that strong, including not just the wind damage, but as you know, deaths from hurricanes largely come from flooding. And this area, particularly Beaumont, Texas, if you remember during uh, Harvey, uh, it, this flooded, the whole place flooded. So we're looking at uh, water levels that are normal right now. We're roughly at sea level. We're at 30 miles from the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, you, we are looking at, uh, if it gets to six feet above where we are, we're going to have problems. And if it gets to what they're expecting, which might be 15 feet, uh, this place is going to be cut off once again. So there's that, uh, Allison. And then if you can see over there, we've got some canals here, uh, some bayous. But you can see that yellow line across. That's a pipeline. 
This is oil country that we are in. You can see a valve head yeah. uh, right to the left of it over there. So we've had a lot of shutdown of oil producing in the Gulf of Mexico on those uh, rigs and platforms, and a lot, a lot of shutdown in refining here. So that, of course, makes this, this of nat national interest, because if oil facilities get damaged or flooded or shut down for a long time, that'll affect people well beyond this region. Ali, uh, let's talk about that. I mean, the double threat here, obviously, we're first concerned about folks being safe and getting out of that area. Sure. Second, of yeah. course, uh, the economic impact. I mean, it, it just seems like they're going to get a double whammy here. Yeah, and I'll just give you a, a picture of this. We're in Beaumont, uh, Port Arthur, which is probably going to get hit worse than we are because it's closer to the Gulf, uh, uh, about 30 miles from here, Lake Charles, east of here. Beaumont and Port Arthur form part of what's called a golden triangle. This is a massive uh, refining capacity. So I'll just give you a, a picture of it. In uh, the Gulf of Mexico, there are tens of thousands or 10,000 rigs, roughly. Um, and of that, during Hurricane Katrina, they shut down 90%. Uh, 84 percent was shut down as of this afternoon. So that's uh, somewhere close to two billion, two million barrels of production from the Gulf of Mexico. And that comes into this area to be refined. The biggest refinery in the United States is in Port Arthur. It refines 600,000 barrels a day. It's closed. Seven other refineries are closed. So that's 2.2, 2.3, something like that, million barrels a day of oil that's not getting refined. So that is not just the oil that you won't get, not just the price of gas that's going to get higher, but people who work in this. This area is employed by the oil and gas inter, inter, uh, industry. So there's that. Uh, and of course, there's the safety. There's the idea that power will go out. So people around here won't be able to operate from anywhere from three to seven days, maybe longer. I don't see them right now, but I've been watching. This is Route 10, uh, and I've been seeing uh, electric vehicles with bucket trucks uh, going by. They're positioning in place because we know there's lots of trees around here. They're going to go down. There's going to be wind damage. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong around here. And what folks were hoping for was in this la latest update, uh, which will be the last one really before we've got the hurricane coming on, it was going to show a slight weakening and it did the opposite. It showed a strengthening. Allie, one more question for you, because as you panned over there, I saw some cars going through, but have you seen much traffic? Have most people who needed to get out gotten out? Uh, so you'll see a lot less traffic than we did earlier today. Uh, generally speaking, everybody who's okay. left is going, uh, is go, who's going to leave will have left by now. Uh, there's still some traffic. You see it's mostly commercial, a lot of emergency, but there's still some people driving. That'll come to an end in the next few hours. All right, Ali Velshi, uh, thank you so much for your coverage, and please stay safe out there. I, I know you're bracing for a rough one tonight. Thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Health officials in Guatemala say eight minors on a deportation flight from the U.S. tested positive for the coronavirus. An activist group called Witness at the Border has been tracking those flights for months. NBC News caught up with the group in Brownsville, Texas, before the pandemic. I started witnessing at a place called Tornillo in West Texas, a child's detention center. I came up with the idea of going there and I rented an RV and I stayed there for three months. I believe that this is the 38th day of witnessing in Brownsville. We've been doing this a few weeks because of what we found out and that is that deportation flights are happening regularly from the Brownsville airport. So we've been getting up early because uh, we became aware that the, those flights often happen in the, uh, the pre-dawn light here. When people are not seen and they're in danger, uh, they can be forgotten, they can be lost. There's one on the way from San Antonio. It comes here and then goes to Guatemala. And that's here. at 7.30 or so? Yeah, it leaves at 7.30. Okay, let me take a look. Using an app that uh, anybody can get on their iPhone, we track the flights of Swift Air and World Atlantic. Those are the two companies that are making a hell of a lot of money working for ICE. We've learned recently that uh, the fate of people who are returned to the places that they flee. There's an article about 
people returned to El Salvador and 138 men murdered when they were returned. We realize that these flights are not just deportation flights, they are, well, I guess you'd have to say genocidal flights, because we know, we have the information that people are being killed when they get there. Since we found out about them, we've been coming out almost every day to see the buses come in full of people, to see the shackled people. Watch under that plane there, you'll see chains being laid out. All of their possessions are in clear plastic bags. So there's kind of an assembly line of people digging through those bags and doing something with the possessions. Somebody out in El Paso, who we know, who's been tracking planes for a while, came across these flights and recommended that we, uh, we see if we could get there. In El Paso at the airport, it's impossible to actually witness the planes. It's a bigger airport. This one's small enough so that we were able to actually see the, the process. They've made it harder for us now. They turn the plane around and they do all kinds of things to keep us from seeing. We don't want them to block us. We want them to be a little stealthy here, so we don't want that, okay? So we're trying to sneak. As soon as they see that, they'll pull something in front and block where we are. So the idea here is to keep moving enough and not to draw attention in certain places so that when they block one place, we have a shot at getting somewhere else to get some kind of a view. So there's a 